This is section zero of Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them, or Thrifty People and Why They Thrive, by Samuel Smiles, author of Self Help, Life of the Stevensons, The Huguenots, Character, Thrift, Duty, etc. Carefully revised, with additional matter, by Charles A. Gaskell, A. M. Chicago, U.S. Publishing House, 1883. I'm John Greenman. Preface. Probably no books of the same general type were ever written that have so much interested and inspired to worthy action the various classes to whom they were addressed as have the productions of Samuel Smiles though written for the people of great britain and containing numerous paragraphs not at all adapted to american readers yet the large proportion of matter is of such general application embracing as it does so vast a range of experience and testimony that they have already reached a large sale not only among all classes of english-speaking people but also among the people of continental europe many books of their class have been produced in this country much of the matter of which has been unscrupulously garbled from the various volumes of mr smiles it has been our purpose in the preparation of this book to place within the reach of our people all of this author's ethical works including those most recently published carefully sifting from them such matter as has been thought to be of local or purely anglican application or to be least interesting and beneficial to american readers mr smiles more lengthy and detailed biographical sketches become tiresome to many the omission of such and in some cases the substitution of lessons from the lives of certain of our own countrymen while not subtracting from its interest with the few will certainly add greatly to that with which the larger circle of readers peruse it these changes and additions have made necessary an entirely new index the laborious preparation of which none can appreciate but those who have had work of this character to do the marked interest which attaches to mr smiles productions is chiefly due to his happy use of biography readers who tire of extended biographical histories find here groups of the wise and distinguished of earth each giving testimony to the various principles the author wishes to inculcate this method of applying the accumulated experience and testimony of the past to illustrate and enforce principles although by no means new is certainly a most effective method of impressing truth the interest excited by the novel arises solely from our interest in the lives and struggles of men and women they are interesting biographies but much more interest should attach to lives actually lived and conquests actually made provided they are produced with equal care the home is the epitome of society and government the application of these principles to every member of the home the importance of their inculcation in the home where character is chiefly moulded and the value of such lessons in making every home what it may be and should be has dictated the title happy homes and the hearts that make them charles a gaskell end of preface chapter one of happy homes and the hearts that make them by samuel smiles this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by john greenman chapter one the art of living or making the most of life every one is the son of his own work cervantes the art of living deserves a place among the fine arts like literature it may be ranked with the humanities it is the art of turning the means of living to the best account of making the best of everything it is the art of extracting from life its highest enjoyment and through it of reaching its highest results 
to live happily the exercise of no small degree of art is required like poetry and painting the art of living comes chiefly by nature but all can cultivate and develop it it can be fostered by parents and teachers and perfected by self-culture without intelligence it cannot exist happiness is not like a large and beautiful gem so uncommon and rare that all search for it is vain all efforts to obtain it hopeless but it consists of a series of smaller and commoner gems grouped and set together forming a pleasing and graceful whole happiness consists in the enjoyment of little pleasures scattered along the common path of life which in the eager search for some great and exciting joy we are apt to overlook it finds delight in the performance of common duties faithfully and honorably fulfilled the art of living is abundantly exemplified in actual life take two men of equal means one of whom knows the art of living and the other not the one has the seeing eye and the intelligent mind nature is ever new to him and full of beauty he can live in the present rehearse the past or anticipate the glory of the future with him life has a deep meaning and requires the performance of duties which are satisfactory to his conscience and are therefore pleasurable he improves himself acts upon his age helps to elevate the depressed classes and is active in every good work his hand is never tired his mind is never weary he goes through life joyfully helping others to its enjoyment intelligence ever expanding gives him every day fresh insight into men and things he lays down his life full of honor and blessing and his greatest monument is the good deeds he has done and the beneficent example he has set before his fellow creatures the other has comparatively little pleasure in life he has scarcely reached manhood ere he has exhausted his enjoyments money has done everything that it could for him yet he feels life to be vacant and cheerless traveling does him no good because for him history has no meaning he is only alive to the impositions of innkeepers and couriers and the disagreeableness of travelling for days amidst great mountains among peasants and sheep cramped up in a carriage picture galleries he feels to be a bore and he looks into them because other people do when he grows old and has run the round of fashionable dissipations and there is nothing left which he can relish life becomes a masquerade in which he recognizes only knaves hypocrites and flatterers though he does not enjoy life yet he is terrified to leave it then the curtain falls with all his wealth life has been to him a failure for he has not known the art of living without which life cannot be enjoyed it is not wealth that gives the true zest to life but reflection appreciation taste culture above all the seeing eye and the feeling heart are indispensable with these the humblest lot may be made blessed labor and toil may be associated with the highest thoughts and the purest tastes the lot of labor may thus become elevated and ennobled montaigne observes that all moral philosophy is as applicable to a vulgar and private life as to the most splendid every man carries the entire form of the human condition within him even in material comfort good taste is the real economist as well as an enhancer of joy scarcely have you passed the doorstep of your friend's house when you can detect whether taste presides within it or not there is an air of neatness order arrangement grace and refinement that gives a thrill of pleasure 
though you cannot define it or explain how it is there is a flower in the window or a picture against the wall that marks the home of taste a bird sings at the window-sill books lie about and the furniture though common is tidy suitable and it may be even elegant the art of living extends to all the economies of the household it selects wholesome food and serves it with taste there is no profusion the fare may be very humble but it has a savor about it everything is so clean and neat the water so sparkles in the glass that you do not desire richer viands or a more exciting beverage look into another house and you will see profusion enough without either taste or order the expenditure is larger and yet you do not feel at home there the atmosphere seems to be full of discomfort books hats shawls and stockings in course of repair are strewed about two or three chairs are loaded with goods the rooms are in confusion no matter how much money is spent it does not mend matters taste is wanting for the manager of the household has not yet learned the art of living you see the same contrast in cottage life the lot of poverty is sweetened by taste it selects the healthiest most open neighborhood where the air is pure and the streets are clean you see at a glance by the sanded doorstep and the window panes without a speck perhaps blooming roses or geraniums shining through them that the tenant within however poor knows the art of making the best of his lot how different from the foul cottage dwellings you see elsewhere with the dirty children playing in the gutters the slattern-like women lounging by the doorstep and the air of sullen poverty that seems to pervade the place and yet the weekly income in the former home may be no greater perhaps even less than in the other how is it that of two men working in the same field or in the same shop one is merry as a lark always cheerful well clad and as clean as his work will allow him to be comes out on sunday mornings in his best suit to go to church with his family is never without a penny in his purse and has something besides in the savings bank is a reader of books and a subscriber to a newspaper besides taking in some literary journal for family reading while the other man with equal or even superior weekly wages comes to work in the mornings sour and sad is always full of grumbling is badly clad and badly shod is never seen out of his house on sundays till about midday when he appears in his shirt-sleeves his face unwashed his hair unkempt his eyes bleared and bloodshot his children left to run about the gutters with no one apparently to care for them is always at his last coin except on saturday night and then he has a long score of borrowings to repay belongs to no club has nothing saved but lives literally from hand to mouth reads none thinks none but only toils eats drinks and sleeps why is it that there is so remarkable a difference between these two men simply for this reason that the one has the intelligence and the art to extract joy and happiness from life to be happy himself and to make those about him happy whereas the other has not cultivated his intelligence and knows nothing whatever of the art of either making himself or his family happy with the one life is a scene of loving helping and sympathizing of carefulness forethought and calculation of reflection action and duty with the other it is only a rough scramble for meat and drink duty is not thought of reflection is banished prudent forethought is never for a moment entertained but look to the result the former is respected by his fellow workmen and beloved by his family he is an example of well-being and well-doing to all who are within reach of his influence whereas 
the other is as unreflective and miserable as nature will allow him to be he is shunned by good men his family are afraid at the sound of his footsteps his wife perhaps trembling at his approach he dies without having any regrets behind him except it may be on the part of his family who are left to be maintained by the charity of the public or by the pittance doled out by friends and relatives for these reasons it is worth every man's while to study the important art of living happily even the poorest man may by this means extract an increased amount of joy and blessing from life the world need not be a veil of tears unless we ourselves will it to be so we have the command to a great extent over our own lot at all events our mind is our own possession we can cherish happy thoughts there we can regulate and control our tempers and dispositions to a considerable extent we can educate ourselves and bring out the better part of our nature which in most men is allowed to sleep a deep sleep we can read good books cherish pure thoughts and lead lives of peace temperance and virtue so as to secure the respect of good men and transmit the blessing of a faithful example to our successors the art of living is best exhibited in the home the first condition of a happy home where good influences prevail over bad ones is comfort where there are carking cares carelessness untidiness slovenliness and dirt there can be little comfort either for man or woman the husband who has been working all day expects to have something as a compensation for his toil the least that his wife can do for him is to make his house snug clean and tidy against his homecoming at eve that is the truest economy the best housekeeping the worthiest domestic management which makes the home so pleasant and agreeable that a man feels when approaching it that he is about to enter a sanctuary and that when there there is no alehouse attraction that can draw him away from it we are not satisfied merely with a home it must be comfortable the most wretched indeed are those who have no homes the homeless but not less wretched are those whose homes are without comfort those of whom charles lamb once said the homes of the very poor are no homes it is comfort then that is the soul of the home its essential principle its vital element comfort does not merely mean warmth good furniture good eating and drinking it means something higher than this it means cleanliness pure air order frugality in a word house thrift and domestic government comfort is the soil in which the human being grows not only physically but morally comfort lies indeed at the root of many virtues wealth is not necessary for comfort luxury requires wealth but not comfort a poor man's home moderately supplied with the necessaries of life presided over by a cleanly frugal housewife may contain all the elements of comfortable living want of comfort is for the most part caused not so much by the absence of sufficient means as by the absence of the requisite knowledge of domestic management comfort it must be admitted is in a great measure relative what is comfort to one man would be misery to another even the commonest mechanic of this day would consider it miserable to live after the style of the nobles a few centuries ago to sleep on straw beds and live in rooms littered with rushes william the conqueror had neither a shirt to his back nor a pane of glass to his windows queen elizabeth was one of the first to wear stockings all the queens before her were stockingless comfort depends as much on persons as on things 
it is out of the character and temper of those who govern homes that the feeling of comfort arises much more than out of handsome furniture heated rooms or household luxuries and conveniences comfortable people are kindly tempered good temper may be set down as an invariable condition of comfort there must be peace mutual forbearance mutual help and disposition to make the best of everything better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith comfortable people are persons of common sense discretion prudence and economy they have a natural affinity for honesty and justice goodness and truth they do not run into debt for that is a species of dishonesty they live within their means and lay by something for a rainy day they provide for the things of their own household yet they are not wanting in hospitality and benevolence on fitting occasions and what they do is done without ostentation comfortable people do everything in order they are systematic steady sober industrious they dress comfortably they adapt themselves to the season neither shivering in winter nor perspiring in summer they do not toil after a fashionable appearance they spend more on warm stockings than on gold rings and prefer healthy good bedding to gaudy window curtains the organization of the home depends for the most part upon woman she is necessarily the manager of every family and household how much therefore must depend upon her intelligent cooperation man's life revolves round woman she is the sun of his social system she is the queen of domestic life the comfort of every home mainly depends upon her upon her character her temper her power of organization and her business management a man may be economical but unless there be economy at home his frugality will be comparatively useless a man cannot thrive the proverb says unless his wife let him house thrift is homely but beneficent though unseen of the world it makes many people happy it works upon individuals and by elevating them it elevates society itself it is in fact a recipe of infallible efficacy for conferring the greatest possible happiness upon the greatest possible number without it legislation benevolence and philanthropy are mere palliatives sometimes worse than useless because they hold out hopes which are for the most part disappointed how happy does a man go forth to his labor or his business and how doubly happy does he return from it when he knows that his means are carefully husbanded and wisely applied by a judicious and well-managing wife such a woman is not only a power in her own house but her example goes forth among her neighbors and she stands before them as a model and a pattern the habits of her children are formed after her habits her actual life becomes the model after which they unconsciously mould themselves for example always speaks more eloquently than words it is instruction in action wisdom at work first among woman's qualities is the intelligent use of her hands and fingers every one knows how useful how indispensable to the comfort of a household is the tidy managing handy woman pestalozzi with his usual sagacity has observed that half the education of a woman comes through her fingers there are wisdom and virtue at her finger ends but intellect must also accompany thrift they must go hand in hand a woman must not only be clever with her fingers but possessed of the power of organizing household work accordingly to manage a household efficiently there must be method without this work cannot be got through satisfactorily either in offices workshops or households 
by arranging work properly by doing everything at the right time with a view to the economy of labor a large amount of business can be accomplished muddle flies before method and confusion disappears there is also a method in spending in laying out money which is as valuable to the housewife as method is in accomplishing her work money slips through the fingers of some people like quicksilver we have already seen that many men are spendthrifts but many women are the same at least they do not know how to expend their husband's earnings to the best advantage you observe things very much out of place frills and ruffles and ill-darned stockings fine bonnets and clouted shoes silk gowns and dirty petticoats while the husband goes about ragged and torn with scarcely a clean thing about him industry is of course essential this is the soul of business but without method industry will be less productive industry may sometimes look like confusion but the methodical and industrious woman gets through her work in a quiet steady style without fuss or noise or dust clouds prudence is another important household qualification prudence comes from cultivated judgment it means practical wisdom it has reference to fitness to propriety it judges of the right thing to be done and of the right way of doing it it calculates the means order time and method of doing prudence learns much from experience quickened by knowledge punctuality is another eminently household qualification how many grumblings would be avoided in domestic life by a little more attention being paid to this virtue late breakfasts and late dinners too late for church and market cleanings out of time and washings protracted till midnight bills put off with a call again to-morrow engagements and promises unfulfilled what a host of little nuisances spring to mind at thought of the unpunctual housewife the unpunctual woman like the unpunctual man becomes disliked because she consumes our time interferes with our plans causes uneasy feelings and virtually tells us that we are not of sufficient importance to cause her to be more punctual to the business man time is money and to the business woman it is more it is peace comfort and domestic prosperity perseverance is another good household habit lay down a good plan and adhere to it do not be turned from it without a sufficient reason follow it diligently and faithfully and it will yield fruits in good season if the plan be a prudent one based on practical wisdom all things will gravitate toward it and a mutual dependence will gradually be established among all the parts of the domestic system we might furnish numerous practical illustrations of the truth of these remarks but our space will not permit and we must leave the reader to supply them from his or her own experience there are many other illustrations which might be adduced of the art of making life happy the management of the temper is an art full of beneficent results by kindness cheerfulness and forbearance we can be happy almost at will and at the same time spread happiness about us on every side we can encourage happy thoughts in ourselves and others we can be sober in habit what can a wife and her children think of an intemperate husband and father we can be sober in language and shun cursing and swearing the most useless unmeaning and brutal of vulgarities nothing can be so silly and unmeaning not to say shocking repulsive and sinful as the oaths so common in the mouths of vulgar swearers they are profanations without purpose impiety without provocation blasphemy without excuse this leads us to remark in passing 
that in this country we are not sufficiently instructed in the art of good manners we are rather gruff and sometimes unapproachable manners do not make the man as the proverb alleges but manners make the man much more agreeable a man may be noble in his heart true in his dealings virtuous in his conduct and yet unmannerly suavity of disposition and gentleness of manners give the finish to the true gentleman by good manners we do not mean etiquette this is only a conventional set of rules adopted by what is called good society and many of the rules of etiquette are of the essence of rudeness etiquette does not permit genteel people to recognize in the streets a man with a shabby coat though he be their brother etiquette is a liar in its not at home ordered to be told by servants to callers at inconvenient seasons good manners include many requisites but they chiefly consist in politeness courtesy and kindness they cannot be taught by rule but they may be taught by example it has been said that politeness is the art of showing men by external signs the internal regard we have for them but a man may be perfectly polite to another without necessarily having any regard for him good manners are neither more nor less than beautiful behavior it has been well said that a beautiful form is better than a beautiful face and a beautiful behavior is better than a beautiful form it gives a higher pleasure than statues or pictures it is the finest of the fine arts manner is the ornament of action indeed a good action without a good manner of doing it is stripped of half its value a poor fellow gets into difficulties and solicits help of a friend he obtains it but it is with a there take that but i don't like lending the help is given with a kind of kick and is scarcely accepted as a favor the manner of the giving long rankles in the mind of the acceptor thus good manners mean kind manners benevolence being the preponderating element in all kinds of pleasant intercourse between human beings a story is told of a poor soldier having one day called at the shop of a hairdresser who was busy with his customers and asked relief stating that he had stayed beyond his leave of absence and unless he could get a lift on the coach fatigue and severe punishment awaited him the hairdresser listened to his story respectfully and gave him a guinea god bless you sir exclaimed the soldier astonished at the amount how can i repay you i have nothing in the world but this pulling out a dirty piece of paper from his pocket it is a recipe for making blacking and it is the best that was ever seen many a half guinea i have had for it from the officers and many bottles i have sold may you be able to get something for it to repay you for your kindness to the poor soldier oddly enough that dirty piece of paper proved worth half a million of money to the hairdresser it was no less than the recipe for the famous day and martin's blacking the hairdresser being the late wealthy mr day whose manufactory is one of the nobilities of the metropolis good manners have been supposed to be a peculiar mark of gentility and that the individual exhibiting them has been born in some upper class of society but the poorest classes may exhibit good manners toward each other as well as the richest one may be polite and kind toward others without a penny in the purse politeness goes very far yet it costs nothing it is the cheapest of commodities but we want to be taught good manners as well as other things some happy natures are to the manner born but the bulk of men need to be taught manners and this can only be efficiently done in youth we have said that working men might study good manners with advantage why should they not respect themselves and each other it is by their demeanor toward each other in other words by their manners 
that self-respect and mutual respect are indicated we have been struck by the habitual politeness of even the poorest classes on the continent the workman lifts his cap and respectfully salutes his fellow workmen in passing there is no sacrifice of manliness in this but rather grace and dignity the working man in respecting his fellow respects himself and his order there is kindness in the act of recognition as well as in the manner in which it is denoted we might learn much from the french people in this matter they are not only polite to each other but they have a great respect for property some may be disposed to doubt this after the recent destruction of buildings in paris but the communists must be regarded as altogether exceptional people and to understand the french character we must look to the body of the population scattered throughout france there we find property much more respected by the people than among ourselves even the beggar respects the fruit by the roadside although there is nobody to protect it the reason of this is that france is a nation of small proprietors that property is much more generally diffused and exposed and parents of even the lowest class educate their children in carefulness of and fidelity to the property of others this respect for property is also accompanied with respect for the feelings of others which constitutes what is called good manners this is carefully inculcated in the children of all ranks in france they are very rarely rude they are civil to strangers they are civil to each other mr laying in his notes of a traveller makes these remarks this reference to the feelings of others in all that we do is a moral habit of great value when it is generally diffused and enters into the home training of every family it is an education both of the parent and child in morals carried on through the medium of external manners it is a fine distinction of the french national character and of social economy that practical morality is more generally taught through manners among and by the people themselves than in any country in europe the same kindly feeling might be observed throughout the entire social intercourse of working men with each other there is not a moment in their lives in which the opportunity does not occur for exhibiting good manners in the workshop in the street and at home provided there be a wish to please others by kind looks and ways the habit of combining good manners with every action will soon be formed it is not merely the pleasure of a man gives to others by being kind to them he receives tenfold more pleasure himself the man who gets up and offers his chair to a woman or to an old man trivial though the act may seem is rewarded by his own heart and a thrill of pleasure runs through him the moment he has performed the kindness work people need to practice good manners toward each other the more because they are under the necessity of constantly living with each other and among each other they are in constant contact with their fellow workmen whereas the richer classes need not mix with men unless they choose and then they can select whom they like the working man's happiness depends much more upon the kind looks words and acts of those immediately about him than the rich man's does it is so in the workshop and it is the same at home there the workman cannot retire into his study but must sit among his family by the side of his wife with his children about him and he must either live kindly with them performing kind and obliging acts toward his family or he must see suffer and endure the intolerable misery of reciprocal unkindness admitted that there are difficulties in the way of working men cultivating the art of good manners that their circumstances are often very limited and their position unfavorable yet no man is so poor but that he can be civil and kind if he choose and to be civil and kind is the very essence of good manners even in the most adverse circumstances a man may try to do his best 
if he do if he speak and act courteously and kindly to all the result will be so satisfactory so self-rewarding that he cannot but be stimulated to persevere in the same course he will diffuse pleasure about him in the home make friends of his work-fellows and be regarded with increased kindness and respect by every right-minded employer the civil workman will exercise increased power among his class and gradually induce them to imitate him by his persistent steadiness civility and kindness thus benjamin franklin when a workman reformed the habits of an entire workshop then besides the general pleasure arising from the exercise of good manners there is a great deal of healthful and innocent pleasure to be derived from amusements of various kinds one cannot be always working eating and sleeping there must be time for relaxation time for mental pleasures time for bodily exercise there is a profound meaning in the word amusement much more than most people are disposed to admit in fact amusement is an important part of education it is a mistake to suppose that the boy or the man who plays at some outdoor game is wasting his time amusement of any kind is not wasting time but economizing life relax and exercise frequently if you would enjoy good health if you do not relax and take no exercise the results will soon appear in bodily ailments which always accompany sedentary occupations the students says lord darby who think they have not time for bodily exercise will sooner or later find time for illness there are people in the world who would if they had the power hang the heavens about with crape throw a shroud over the beautiful and life-giving bosom of the planet pick the bright stars from the sky veil the sun with clouds pluck the silver moon from her place in the firmament shut up our gardens and fields and all the flowers with which they are bedecked and doom the world to an atmosphere of gloom and cheerlessness there is no reason or morality in this and there is still less religion temperance reformers have not sufficiently considered how much the drinking habits of the country are the consequences of gross tastes and of the too limited opportunities which exist in this country for obtaining access to amusements of an innocent and improving tendency the workman's tastes have been allowed to remain uncultivated present wants engross his thoughts the gratification of his appetites is his highest pleasure and when he relaxes it is to indulge immoderately in beer or whiskey the germans were at one time the drunkenest of nations they are now among the soberest as drunken as a german boor was a common proverb how have they been weaned from drink principally by education and music music has a most humanizing effect the cultivation of the art has a most favorable influence upon public morals it furnishes a source of pleasure in every family it gives home a new attraction it makes social intercourse more cheerful father matthew followed up his temperance movement by a singing movement he promoted the establishment of musical clubs all over ireland for he felt that as he had taken the people's whiskey from them he must give them some wholesome stimulus in its stead he gave them music singing classes were established to refine the taste soften the manners and humanize the mass of the irish people but we fear that the example set by father matthew has already been forgotten what a fullness of enjoyment says channing has our creator placed within our reach by surrounding us with an atmosphere which may be shaped into sweet sounds and yet this goodness is almost lost upon us through want of culture of the organ by which this provision is to be enjoyed 
how much would the general cultivation of the gift of music improve us as a people children ought to learn it in schools as they do in germany the voice of music would then be heard in every household our old english glees would no longer be forgotten men and women might sing in the intervals of their work as the germans do in going to and coming from their work the work would not be worse done because it was done amidst music and cheerfulness the breath of society would be sweetened and pleasure would be linked with labor why not have some elegance in even the humblest home we must of course have cleanliness which is the special elegance of the poor but why not have pleasant and delightful things to look upon there is no reason why the humbler classes should not surround themselves with the evidences of beauty and comfort in all their shapes and thus do homage alike to the gifts of god and the labors of man the taste for the beautiful is one of the best and most useful endowments it is one of the handmaids of civilization beauty and elegance do not necessarily belong to the homes of the rich they are or ought to be all pervading beauty in all things in nature in art in science in literature in social and domestic life how beautiful and yet how cheap are flowers not exotics but what are called common flowers a rose for instance is among the most beautiful of the smiles of nature the laughing flowers exclaims the poet but there is more than gaiety in blooming flowers though it takes a wise man to see the beauty the love and the adaptation of which they are full what should we think of one who had invented flowers supposing that before him flowers were unknown would he not be regarded as the opener up of a paradise of new delight should we not hail the inventor as a genius as a god and yet these lovely offsprings of the earth have been speaking to man from the first dawn of his existence until now telling him of the goodness and wisdom of the creative power which bid the earth bring forth not only that which was useful as food but also flowers the bright consummate flowers to clothe it in beauty and joy bring one of the commonest field flowers into a room place it on a table or chimney-piece and you seem to have brought a ray of sunshine into the place there is a cheerfulness about flowers what a delight they are to the drooping invalid they are a sweet enjoyment coming as messengers from the country and seeming to say come and see where we grow and let your heart be glad in our presence have a flower in the room by all means it will cost only a trifle if your ambition is moderate and the gratification it gives will be beyond price if you can have a flower for your window so much the better what can be more delicious than the sun's light streaming through flowers through the midst of crimson fuchsias or scarlet geraniums to look out into the light through flowers is not that poetry and to break the force of the sunbeams by the tender resistance of green leaves if you can train a nasturtium round the window or some sweet peas then you will have the most beautiful frame you can invent for the picture without whether it be the busy crowd or a distant landscape or trees with their lights and shades or the changes of the passing clouds any one may thus look through flowers for the price of an old song and what pure taste and refinement does it not indicate on the part of the cultivator a flower in the window sweetens the air makes the room look graceful gives the sun's light a new charm rejoices the eye and links nature with beauty the flower is a companion that will never say a cross thing to any one but will always look beautiful and smiling do not despise it because it is cheap and because everybody may have the luxury as well as yourself common things are cheap but common things are invariably the most valuable could we only have fresh air or sunshine by purchase what luxuries they would be considered but they are free to all and we think little of their blessings 
there is indeed much in nature that we do not yet half enjoy because we shut our avenues of sensation and feeling we are satisfied with the matter of fact and look not for the spirit of fact which is above it if we opened our minds to enjoyment we might find tranquil pleasures spread about us on every side we might live with the angels that visit us on every sunbeam and sit with the fairies who wait on every flower we want more loving knowledge to enable us to enjoy life and we require to cultivate the art of making the most of the common means and appliances of enjoyment which lie about us on every side a snug and clean home no matter how tiny it be so that it be wholesome windows into which the sun can shine cheerily a few good books and who need be without a few good books in these days of universal cheapness no duns at the door and the cupboard well supplied and with flowers in your room there is none so poor as not to have about him these elements of pleasure but why not besides the beauty of nature have a taste for the beauty of art why not hang up a picture in the room ingenious methods have been discovered some of them quite recently for almost infinitely multiplying works of art by means of wood engravings lithographs photographs and autotypes which render it possible for every person to furnish his rooms with beautiful pictures skill and science have thus brought art within reach of the poorest any picture print or engraving that represents a noble thought that depicts a heroic act or that brings a bit of nature from the fields or the streets into our room is a teacher a means of education and a help to self-culture it serves to make the home more pleasant and attractive it sweetens domestic life and sheds a grace and beauty about it it draws the gazer away from mere consideration of self and increases his store of delightful association with the world without as well as with the world within the portrait of a great man for instance helps us to read his life it invests him with a personal interest looking at his features we feel as if we knew him better and were more closely related to him such a portrait hung up before us daily at our meals and during our leisure hours unconsciously serves to lift us up and sustain us it is a link that in some way binds us to a higher and nobler nature it is not necessary that a picture should be high priced in order to be beautiful and good we have seen things for which hundreds of guineas have been paid that have not one hundredth part of the meaning or beauty that is to be found in linton's woodcut of raphael's madonna which may be had for tuppence the head reminds one of the observation made by hazlitt upon a picture that it seems as if an unhandsome act would be impossible in its presence it embodies the idea of mother's love womanly beauty and earnest piety as some one said of the picture it looks as if a bit of heaven were in the room picture fanciers pay not so much for the merit as for the age and rarity of their works the poorest may have the seeing eye for beauty while the rich man may be blind to it the cheapest engraving may communicate the sense of beauty to the artisan while the thousand guinea picture may fail to communicate to the millionaire anything excepting perhaps the notion that he has got possession of a work which the means of other people cannot compass does the picture give you pleasure on looking at it that is one good test of its worth you may grow tired of it your taste may outgrow it and demand something better just as the reader may grow out of montgomery's poetry into milton's then you will take down the daub and put up a picture with a higher idea in its place there may thus be a steady progress of art made upon the room walls if the picture can be put in frames so much the better but if they cannot no matter up with them 
we know that owen jones says it is not good taste to hang prints upon walls he would merely hang room papers there but owen jones may not be infallible and here we think he is wrong to our eyes a room always looks unfurnished no matter how costly and numerous the tables chairs and ottomans unless there be pictures upon the walls it ought to be and no doubt it is a great stimulus to artists to know that their works are now distributed in prints and engravings to decorate and beautify the homes of the people the woodcutter the lithographer and the engraver are the popular interpreters of the great artist thus turner's pictures are not confined to the wealthy possessors of the original works but may be diffused through all homes by the millers and brandards and wilmots who have engraved them thus landseer finds entrance through woodcuts and mezzotints into every dwelling thus cruikshank preaches temperance and ari Schaffer purity and piety the engraver is the medium by which art in the palace is conveyed into the humblest homes in the kingdom the art of living may be displayed in many ways it may be summed up in the words make the best of everything nothing is beneath its care even common and little things it turns to account it gives a brightness and grace to the home and invests nature with new charms through it we enjoy the rich man's parks and woods as if they were our own we inhale the common air and bask under the universal sunshine we glory in the grass the passing clouds and the flowers we love the common earth and hear joyful voices through all nature it extends to every kind of social intercourse it engenders cheerful good will and loving sincerity by its help we make others happy and ourselves blessed we elevate our being and ennoble our lot we rise above the groveling creatures of earth and aspire to the infinite and thus we link time to eternity where the true art of living has its final consummation end of chapter 1 read by john greenman This is Chapter 2 of Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. Chapter 2 Healthy Homes. The best security for civilization is the dwelling. B. Disraeli. Cleanliness is the elegance of the poor. English proverb virtue never dwelt long with filth count rumford health is said to be wealth indeed all wealth is valueless without health every man who lives by labor whether of mind or body regards health as one of the most valuable of possessions without it life would be unenjoyable the human system has been so framed as to render enjoyment one of the principal ends of physical life the whole arrangement structure and functions of the human system are beautifully adapted for that purpose happiness is the rule of healthy existence pain and misery are its exceptional conditions nor is pain altogether an evil it is rather a salutary warning it tells us that we have transgressed some rule violated some law disobeyed some physical obligation it is a monitor which warns us to amend our state of living it virtually says return to nature observe her laws and be restored to happiness thus paradoxical though it may seem pain is one of the conditions of the physical well-being of man as death according to dr thomas brown is one of the conditions of the enjoyment of life 
to enjoy physical happiness therefore the natural laws must be complied with to discover and observe these laws man has been endowed with the gift of reason does he fail to exercise this gift does he neglect to comply with the law of his being then pain and disease are the necessary consequence man violates the laws of nature in his own person and he suffers accordingly he is idle and overfeeds himself he is punished by gout indigestion or apoplexy he drinks too much he becomes bloated trembling and weak his appetite falls off his strength declines his constitution decays and he falls a victim to the numerous diseases which haunt the steps of the drunkard society suffers in the same way it leaves districts undrained and streets uncleaned masses of the population are allowed to live crowded together in unwholesome dens half poisoned by the mephitic air of the neighborhood then a fever breaks out or a cholera or a plague disease spreads from the miserable abodes of the poor into the comfortable homes of the rich carrying death and devastation before it the misery and suffering incurred in such cases are nothing less than willful inasmuch as the knowledge necessary to avert them is within the reach of all wherever any number of persons live together the atmosphere becomes poisoned unless means be provided for its constant change and renovation if there be not sufficient ventilation the air becomes charged with carbonic acid principally the product of respiration whatever the body discharges becomes poison to the body if introduced again through the lungs hence the immense importance of pure air a deficiency of food may be considerably less injurious than a deficiency of pure air every person above fourteen years of age requires about six hundred cubic feet of shut-up space to breathe in during the twenty-four hours if he sleeps in a room of smaller dimensions he will suffer more or less and gradually approach the condition of being smothered shut up a mouse in a glass receiver and it will gradually die by rebreathing its own breath shut up a man in a confined space and he will die in the same way english soldiers expired in the black hole of calcutta because they wanted pure air thus about half the children born in some manufacturing towns die before they are five years old principally because they want pure air humboldt tells of a sailor who was dying of fever in the close hold of a ship his comrades brought him out of the hold to die in the open air instead of dying he revived and eventually got well he was cured by the pure air the first method of raising a man above the life of an animal is to provide him with a healthy home the home is after all the best school for the world children grow up into men and women there they imbibe their best and their worst morality there and their morals and intelligence are in a great measure well or ill trained there men can only be really and truly humanized and civilized through the institution of the home domestic purity and moral life are in the good home and individual defilement and moral death in the bad one the schoolmaster has really very little to do with the formation of the characters of children these are formed in the home by the father and mother by brothers sisters and companions it does not matter how complete may be the education given in schools it may include the whole range of knowledge yet if the scholar is under the necessity of daily returning to a home which is indecent vicious and miserable all this learning will prove of comparatively little value character and disposition are the result of home training and if these are through bad physical and moral conditions deteriorated and destroyed the intellectual culture required in the school may prove an instrumentality for evil 
rather than for good the home should not be considered merely as an eating and sleeping place but as a place where self-respect may be preserved and comforts secured and domestic pleasures enjoyed three-fourths of the petty vices which degrade society and swell into crimes which disgrace it would shrink before the influence of self-respect to be a place of happiness exercising beneficial influences upon its members and especially upon the children growing up within it the home must be pervaded by the spirit of comfort cleanliness affection and intelligence and in order to secure this the presence of a well-ordered industrious and educated woman is indispensable so much depends upon the woman that we might almost pronounce the happiness or unhappiness of the home to be woman's work no nation can advance except through the improvement of the nation's homes and they can only be improved through the instrumentality of women they must know how to make homes comfortable and before they can know they must have been taught women must therefore have sufficient training to fit them for their duties in real life their education should be conducted throughout with a view to their future position as wives mothers and housewives but among all classes even the highest the education of girls is rarely conducted with this object among the working people the girls are sent out to work among the highest classes they are sent out to learn a few flashy accomplishments and men are left to pick from them very often with little judgment the future wives and mothers men themselves attach little or no importance to the intelligence or industrial skill of women and they only discover their value when they find their homes stupid and cheerless men are caught by the glance of a bright eye by a pair of cherry cheeks by a handsome figure and when they fall in love as the phrase goes they never bethink them of whether the loved one can mend a shirt or cook a pudding and yet the most sentimental of husbands must come down from his ecstatics so soon as the knot is tied and then he soon enough finds out that the clever hands of a woman are worth far more than her bright glances and if the shirt and pudding qualifications be absent then woe to the unhappy man and woe also to the unhappy woman if the substantial element of physical comfort be absent from the home it soon becomes hateful the wife notwithstanding all her good looks is neglected and the public house separates those whom the law and the church have joined together men are really desperately ignorant respecting the home department if they thought for a moment of its importance they would not be so ready to rush into premature housekeeping ignorant men select equally ignorant women for their wives and these introduce into the world families of children whom they are utterly incompetent to train as rational or domestic beings the home is no home but a mere lodging and often a very comfortless one we speak not merely of the poorest laborers but of the best paid workmen in the large manufacturing towns men earning from ten to fifteen dollars a week or more than the average pay of dry goods and grocers clerks though spending considerable amounts on beer will often grudge so small a part of their income as two dollars per week to provide decent homes for themselves and their children what is the consequence they degrade themselves and their families they crowd together in foul neighborhoods into dwellings possessing no element of health and decency where even the small rental which they pay is in excess of the accommodation they receive the results are inevitable loss of self-respect degradation of intelligence failure of physical health and premature death even the highest-minded philosopher placed in such a situation would gradually gravitate toward brutality a healthy home 
presided over by a thrifty, cleanly woman, may be the abode of comfort, of virtue, and of happiness. It may be the scene of every ennobling relation in family life. It may be endeared to a man by many delightful memories, by the affectionate voices of his wife, his children, and his neighbors. Such a home will be regarded not as a mere nest of common instinct, but as a training ground for young immortals, a sanctuary for the heart, a refuge from storms, a sweet resting place after labor, a consolation in sorrow, a pride in success, and a joy at all times. Sanitary science may be summed up in the one word, cleanliness. Pure water and pure air are its essentials. Wherever there is impurity, it must be washed away and got rid of. Thus, sanitary science is one of the simplest and most intelligible of all the branches of human knowledge. Perhaps it is because of this that, like most common things, it has continued to receive so little attention. Many still think that it requires no science at all to ventilate a chamber, to clean out a drain, and to keep house and person free from uncleanliness. Sanitary science may be regarded as an unsavory subject. It deals with dirt and its expulsion from the skin, from the house, from the street, and from the city. It is comprised in the words, Wherever there is dirt, get rid of it instantly, and with cleanliness let there be a copious supply of pure water and of pure air for the purpose of human health take for instance an unhealthy street or block of streets in a large town there you find typhoid fever constantly present cleanse and sewer the streets supply it with pure air and pure water and fever is forthwith banished is not this a much more satisfactory result than the application of drugs fifty thousand persons says mr lee annually fall victims to typhoid fever in new england originated by causes which are preventable the result is the same as if these fifty thousand persons were annually taken out of their wretched dwellings and put to death we are shocked by the news of murder by the loss of a single life by physical causes and yet we hear almost without a shudder of the reiterated statement of the loss of tens of thousands of lives yearly from physical causes in daily operation the annual slaughter from preventable causes of typhoid fever is double the amount of what was suffered by the allied armies at the battle of waterloo by neglect of the ascertained conditions of healthful living the great mass of the people lose nearly half the natural period of their lives typhoid says a physician is a curse which man inflicts upon himself by the neglect of sanitary arrangements the connection is close and intimate between physical and moral health between domestic well-being and public happiness the destructive influence of an unwholesome dwelling propagates a moral typhoid worse than a plague itself where the body is enfeebled by the depressing influence of vitiated air and bodily defilement, the mind, almost of necessity, takes the same low, unhealthy tone. Self-respect is lost. A stupid, inert, languid feeling overpowers the system. The character becomes depraved and, too often, eager to snatch even a momentary enjoyment to feel the blood bounding in the veins the miserable victim flies to the demon of strong drink for relief hence misery infamy shame crime and wretchedness mere improvement of towns as respects drainage sewerage paving water supply and abolition of cellar dwellings will affect comparatively little unless we can succeed in carrying the improvement further, namely into the houses of the people themselves. A well-devised system of sanitary measures may ensure external cleanliness, 
may provide that the soil on which the streets of houses are built shall be relieved of all superfluous moisture and that all animal and vegetable refuse shall be promptly removed so that the air circulating through the streets and floating from them into the houses of the inhabitants shall not be laden with poisonous miasmata the source of disease suffering and untimely death cellar dwellings may be prohibited and certain regulations as to the buildings that hereafter to be erected may also be enforced but here municipal authority stops it can go no further it cannot penetrate into the home and it is not necessary that it should do so the individual efforts of the community themselves are therefore needed and any legislative enactments which dispensed with these would probably be an evil the government does not build the houses in which the people dwell these are provided by employers and by capitalists small and large it is necessary therefore to enlist these interests in the cause of sanitary improvement in order to ensure success individual capitalists have already done much to provide wholesome houses for their working people and have found their account in so doing by their increased health as well as in their moral improvement in all ways capitalists imbued with a benevolent and philanthropic spirit can thus spread blessings far and wide and were a few enterprising builders in every town to take up this question practically and provide a class of houses for laborers with suitable accommodation provided with arrangements for ventilation cleanliness and separation of the sexes such as health and comfort require they would really be conferring an amount of benefit on the community at large and at the same time we believe upon themselves which it would not be easy to overestimate but there also needs the active cooperation of the dwellers in poor men's homes themselves they too must join cordially in the sanitary movement otherwise comparatively little good can be effected you may provide an efficient water supply yet if the housewife will not use the water as it ought to be used if she be lazy and dirty the house will be foul and comfortless still you may provide for ventilation yet if offensive matters be not removed and doors and windows are kept closed the pure outer air will be excluded and the house will still smell musty and unwholesome in any case there must be a cleanly woman to superintend the affairs of the house and she cannot be made so by act of congress the sanitary commissioners cannot by any notification convert the slatternly shrew into a tidy housewife nor the disorderly drunkard into an industrious home-loving husband there must therefore be individual effort on the part of the housewife in every working man's home as a recent writer on home reform observes we must begin by insisting that however much of the physical and moral evils of the working classes may be justly attributable to their dwellings it is too often the case that more ought in truth to be attributed to themselves for surely the inmate depends less on the house than the house on the inmate as mind has more power over matter than matter over mind let the dwelling be ever so poor and incommodious yet a family with decent and cleanly habits will contrive to make the best of it and will take care that there shall be nothing offensive in it which they have power to remove whereas a model house fitted up with every convenience and comfort which modern science can supply will if occupied by persons of intemperate and uncleanly habits speedily become a disgrace and a nuisance a sober industrious and cleanly couple will impart an air of decency and respectability to the poorest dwelling while the spendthrift the drunkard or the gambler will convert a palace into a scene of discomfort and disgust since therefore so much depends on the character and conduct of the parties themselves 
it is right that they should feel their responsibility in this matter and that they should know and attend to the various points connected with the improvement of their own homes homes are the manufactories of men and as the homes are so will the men be mind will be degraded by the physical influences around it decency will be destroyed by constant contact with impurity and defilement and coarseness of manners habits and tastes will become inevitable you cannot rear a kindly nature sensitive against evil careful of properties and desirous of moral and intellectual improvement amidst the darkness dampness disorder and discomfort which unhappily characterize so large a portion of the dwellings of the poor in our large towns and until we can by some means or other improve their domestic accommodation their low moral and social condition must be regarded as inevitable we want not only a better class of dwellings but we require the people to be so educated as to appreciate them a certain landlord took his tenantry out of their mud huts and removed them into comfortable dwellings which he had built for their accommodation when he returned to his estate he was greatly disappointed the houses were as untidy and uncomfortable as before the pig was still under the bed and the hens over it the concrete floor was as dirty as the mud one had been the panes of the windows were broken and the garden was full of weeds the landlord wrote to a friend in despair the friend replied you have begun at the wrong end you ought to have taught them the value of cleanliness thriftiness and comfort to begin at the beginning therefore we must teach the people the necessity of cleanliness its virtues and its wholesomeness for which purpose it is requisite that they should be intelligent capable of understanding ideas conveyed in words able to discern able to read able to think in short the people as children must first have been to school and properly taught there whereas we have allowed the majority of the working people to grow up untaught nearly half of them unable to read and write and then we expect them to display the virtues prudence judgment and forethought of well-educated beings it is of the first importance to teach people cleanly habits this can be done without teaching them either reading or writing cleanliness is more than wholesomeness it furnishes an atmosphere of self-respect and influences the moral condition of the entire household it is the best exponent of the spirit of thrift it is to the economy of the household what hygiene is to the human body it should preside at every detail of domestic service it indicates comfort and well-being it is among the distinctive attributes of civilization and marks the progress of nations we need scarcely refer to the moral as well as the physical beauty of cleanliness cleanliness which indicates self-respect and is the root of many fine virtues and especially of purity delicacy and decency we might even go further and say that purity of thought and feeling results from habitual purity of body for the mind and heart of man are to a very great extent influenced by external conditions and circumstances and habit and custom as regards outward things stamp themselves deeply on the whole character alike upon the moral feelings and the intellectual powers moses was the most practical of sanitary reformers among the eastern nations generally cleanliness is a part of religion they esteem it not only as next to godliness but as a part of godliness itself they connect the idea of internal sanctity with that of external purification they believe that it would be an insult to the maker they worship to come into his presence covered with impurity hence the mohammedans devote almost as much care to the erection of baths as to that of mosques and alongside the place of worship is usually found the place of cleansing 
so that the faithful may have the ready means of purification previous to their act of worship the common well-being of men women and children depends upon attention to what at first may appear comparatively trivial matters and unless these small matters be attended to comfort in person mind and feeling is absolutely impossible the physical satisfaction of a child for example depends upon attention to its feeding clothing and washing these are commonest of common things and yet they are of the most essential importance if the child is not properly fed and clothed it will grow up feeble and ill-conditioned and as the child is so will the man be grown people cannot be comfortable without regular attention to these matters every one needs and ought to have comfort at home and comfort is the united product of cleanliness thrift regularity industry in short a continuous performance of duties each in itself apparently trivial the cooking of a potato the baking of a loaf the mending of a shirt the darning of a pair of stockings the making of a bed the scrubbing of a floor the washing and dressing of a baby are all matters of no great moment but a woman ought to know how to do all these before the management of a household however poor is entrusted to her why asked lord ashburton in a lecture to the students of the wolvesey training schools was one mother of a family a better economist than another why could one live in abundance where another starved why in similar dwellings were the children of one parent healthy of another puny and ailing why could this laborer do with ease a task that would kill his fellow it was not luck or chance that decided those differences it was the patient observation of nature that suggested to some gifted minds rules for their guidance which had escaped the heedlessness of others it is not so much however the patient observation of nature as good training in the home and in the school that enables some women to accomplish so much more than others in the development of human beings and the promotion of human comfort and to do this efficiently women as well as men require to be instructed as to the nature of the objects upon which they work take one branch of science as an illustration the physiological in this science we hold that every woman should receive some instruction and why not because if the laws of physiology were understood by women children would grow up into better healthier happier and probably wiser men and women children are subject to certain physiological laws the observance of which is necessary for their health and comfort is it not reasonable therefore to expect that women should know something of the laws and of their operation if they are ignorant of them they will be liable to commit all sorts of blunders productive of suffering disease and death to what are we to attribute the frightful mortality of children in most of our large towns where one half of all that are born perish before they reach their fifth year if women as well as men knew something of the laws of healthy living about the nature of the atmosphere how its free action upon the blood is necessary to health of the laws of ventilation cleanliness and nutrition we cannot but think that the moral not less than the physical condition of the human beings committed to their charge would be greatly improved and promoted were anything like a proper attention given to common things there would not be such an amount of discomfort disease and mortality among the young but we accustom people to act as if there were no such provisions as natural laws if we violate them we do not escape the consequences because we have been ignorant of their mode of operation we have been provided with intelligence that we might know them and if society keep its members blind and ignorant the evil consequences will be inevitably reaped 
thus tens of thousands perish for lack of knowledge of even the smallest and yet most necessary conditions of right living much might be said in favor of household management and especially in favor of improved cookery ill-cooked meals are a source of discomfort in many families bad cooking is waste waste of money and loss of comfort whom god has joined in matrimony ill-cooked joints and ill-boiled potatoes have very often put asunder among the common things which educators should teach the rising generation this ought certainly not to be overlooked it is the most common and yet most neglected of the branches of female education the greater part of human labor is occupied in the direct production of the materials for human food the farming classes and their laborers devote themselves to the planting rearing and reaping of oats and other cereals and the grazing farmer to the production of cattle and sheep for the maintenance of the population at large all these articles corn beef mutton and such like are handed over to the female half of the human species to be converted into food for the sustenance of themselves their husbands and their families how do they use their power can they cook have they been taught to cook is it not a fact that in this country cooking is one of the lost or undiscovered arts thousands of artisans and laborers are deprived of half the actual nutriment of their food and continue half starved because their wives are utterly ignorant of the art of cooking they are yet in entire darkness as to the economizing of food and the means of rendering it palatable and digestible great would be the gain to the community if cookery were made an ordinary branch of female education to the poor the gain would be incalculable among the prizes which the bountifuls of both sexes are fond of bestowing in the country we should like to see some offered for the best boiled potato the best grilled mutton chop and the best seasoned soup or broth in writing of a well-boiled potato we are aware that we shall incur the contempt of many for attaching importance to a thing they suppose to be so common but the fact is that their contempt arises as is often the origin of contempt from their ignorance there being not one person in a hundred who has ever seen and tasted that great rarity a well-boiled potato in short we want common sense in cookery as in most other things food should be used and not abused much of it is now absolutely wasted wasted for want of a little art in cooking it food is not only wasted by bad cooking but much of it is thrown away which french women would convert into something savory and digestible health morals and family enjoyments are all connected with the question of cookery above all it is the handmaid of thrift it makes the most and the best of the bounties of god it wastes nothing but turns everything to account every woman ought to be accomplished in an art which confers so much comfort health and wealth upon the members of her household many intelligent high-minded ladies who have left disgusted at the idleness to which society condemns them have of late years undertaken the work of visiting the poor and of nursing a noble work but there is another school of usefulness which stands open to them let them study the art of common cookery and diffuse the knowledge of it among the people they will thus do an immense amount of good and bring down the blessings of many a half-hungered husband upon their benevolent heads women of the poorer classes require much help from those who are better educated or who have been placed in better circumstances than themselves the greater number of them marry young and suddenly enter upon a life for which they have not received the slightest preparation they know nothing of cookery of sewing of clothes mending or of 
economical ways of spending their husband's money hence slatternly and untidy habits and uncomfortable homes from which the husband is often glad to seek refuge in the nearest public house the following story told by joseph corbett a birmingham operative before a parliamentary committee holds true of many working people in the manufacturing districts my mother he said worked in a manufactory from a very early age she was clever and industrious and moreover she had the reputation of being virtuous she was regarded as an excellent match for the working man she was married early she became the mother of eleven children i am the eldest to the best of her ability she performed the important duties of a wife and mother but she was lamentably deficient in domestic knowledge in that most important of all instructions how to make the home and the fireside to possess a charm for her husband and children she had never received one single lesson as the family increased so everything like comfort disappeared altogether the power to make home cheerful and comfortable was never given to her she knew not the value of cherishing in my father's mind a love of domestic objects not one moment's happiness did i ever see under my father's roof all this dismal state of things i can distinctly trace to the entire and perfect absence of all training and instruction to my mother he became intemperate and his intemperance made her destitute she made many efforts to abstain from shop work but her pecuniary necessities forced her back into the shop the family was large and every moment was required at home i have known her after the close of a hard day's work sit up nearly all night for several nights together washing and mending clothes my father could have no comfort there these domestic obligations which in a well-regulated house would be done so as not to provoke the husband were to my father a sort of annoyance and he from an ignorant and mistaken notion sought comfort in an alehouse my mother's ignorance of household duties my father's consequent irritability and intemperance the frightful poverty the constant quarrelling the pernicious example to my brothers and sisters the bad effect upon the future conduct of my brothers one and all of us being forced out to work so young that our feeble earnings would produce only one shilling a week cold and hunger and the innumerable sufferings of my childhood crowd upon my mind and overpower me they keep alive a deep anxiety for the emancipation of thousands of families who are in a similar state of horrible misery my own experience tells me that the instruction of the females in the work of a house in teaching them to produce cheerfulness and comfort at the fireside would prevent a great amount of misery and crime there would be fewer drunken husbands and disobedient children female education is disgracefully neglected i attach more importance to it than to anything else for woman imparts the first impression to the young susceptible mind she moulds the child from which is formed the future man End of chapter 2 Healthy Homes Read by John Greenman This is chapter 3 of Happy Homes and the Hearts that Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Influence of Character the prosperity of a country depends not on the abundance of its revenues nor on the strength of its fortifications nor on the beauty of its public buildings but it consists in the number of its cultivated citizens in its men of education enlightenment and character here are to be found its true interest its chief strength its real power 
Martin Luther Character is one of the greatest motive powers in the world. In its noblest embodiments, it exemplifies human nature in its highest forms, for it exhibits man at his best. Men of genuine excellence in every station of life, men of industry, of integrity, of high principle, of sterling honesty of purpose, command the spontaneous homage of mankind. It is natural to believe in such men, to have confidence in them, and to imitate them. All that is good in the world is upheld by them, and without their presence in it, the world would not be worth living in. Although genius always commands admiration, character most secures respect. The former is more the product of brain power, the latter of heart power and in the long run it is the heart that rules in life men of genius stand to society in the relation of its intellect as men of character of its conscience and while the former are admired the latter are followed great men are always exceptional men and greatness itself is but comparative indeed the range of most men in life is so limited that very few have the opportunity of being great but each man can act his part honestly and honorably and to the best of his ability he can use his gifts and not abuse them he can strive to make the best of life he can be true just honest and faithful even in small things in a word he can do his duty in that sphere in which providence has placed him commonplace though it may appear this doing of one's duty embodies the highest ideal of life and character there may be nothing heroic about it but the common lot of men is not heroic and though the abiding sense of duty upholds man in his brightest attitudes it also equally sustains him in the transaction of the ordinary affairs of everyday existence man's life is centered in the sphere of common duties the most influential of all the virtues are those which are the most in request for daily use they wear the best and last the longest superfine virtues which are above the standard of common men may only be sources of temptation and danger burke has truly said that the human system which rests for its basis on the heroic virtues is sure to have a superstructure of weakness or of profligacy when dr abbott drew the character of his deceased friend thomas sackville he did not dwell upon his merits as a statesman or his genius as a poet but upon his virtues as a man in relation to the ordinary duties of life how many rare things were in him said he who more loving unto his wife who more kind unto his children who more fast unto his friend who more moderate unto his enemy who more true to his word indeed we can always better understand and appreciate a man's real character by the manner in which he conducts himself towards those who are the most nearly related to him and by his transaction of the seemingly commonplace details of daily duty than by his public exhibition of himself as an author an orator or a statesman at the same time while duty for the most part applies to the conduct of affairs in common life by the average of common men it is also a sustaining power to men of the very highest standard of character they may not have either money or property or learning or power and yet they may be strong in heart and rich in spirit honest truthful dutiful and whoever strives to do his duty faithfully in fulfilling the purpose for which he was created and building up in himself the principles of a manly character 
there are many persons of whom it may be said that they have no other possession in the world but their character and yet they stand as firmly upon it as any crowned king intellectual culture has no necessary relation to purity or excellence of character in the new testament appeals are constantly made to the heart of man and to the spirit we are of while allusions to the intellect are of very rare occurrence a handful of good life says george herbert is worth a bushel of learning not that learning is to be despised but that it must be allied to goodness intellectual capacity is sometimes found associated with the meanest moral character with abject servility to those in high places and arrogance to those of low estate a man may be accomplished in art literature and science and yet in honesty virtue truthfulness and the spirit of duty be entitled to take rank after many a poor and illiterate peasant you insist wrote perthes to a friend on respect for learned men i say ah men but at the same time don't forget that largeness of mind depth of thought appreciation of the lofty experience of the world delicacy of manner tact and energy in action love of truth honesty and amiability that all these may be wanting in a man who may yet be very learned when some one in sir walter scott's hearing made a remark as to the value of literary talents and accomplishments as if they were above all things to be esteemed and honored he observed god help us what a poor world this would be if that were the true doctrine i have read books enough and observed and conversed with enough of eminent and splendidly cultured minds too in my time but i assure you i have heard higher sentiments from the lips of poor uneducated men and women when exerting the spirit of severe yet gentle heroism under difficulties and afflictions or speaking their simple thoughts as to circumstances in the lot of friends and neighbors than i ever yet met without of the bible we shall never learn to feel and respect our real calling and destiny unless we have taught ourselves to consider everything as moonshine compared with the education of the heart still less has wealth any necessary connection with elevation of character on the contrary it is much more frequently the cause of its corruption and degradation wealth and corruption luxury and vice have very close affinities to each other wealth in the hands of men of weak purpose of deficient self-control or of ill-regulated passions is only a temptation and a snare the source it may be of infinite mischief to themselves and often to others on the contrary a condition of comparative poverty is compatible with character in its highest form a man may possess only his industry his frugality his integrity and yet stand high in the rank of true manhood the advice which burns father gave him was the best he bade me act a manly part though i had ne'er a farthing for without an honest manly heart no man was worth regarding one of the purest and noblest characters the writer ever knew was a laboring man in a northern county never amounting to more than ten shillings a week though possessed of only the rudiments of common education obtained at an ordinary parish school he was a man full of wisdom and thoughtfulness his library consisted of the bible flavel and boston books which excepting the first probably few readers have ever heard of this good man might have sat for the portrait of wordsworth's well-known wanderer 
when he had lived his modest life of work and worship and finally went to his rest he left behind him a reputation for practical wisdom for genuine goodness and for helpfulness in every good work which greater and richer men might have envied when luther died he left behind him as set forth in his will no ready money no treasure of coin of any description he was so poor at one part of his life that he was under the necessity of earning his bread by turning gardening and clock-making yet at the very time when he was thus working with his hands he was moulding the character of his country and he was morally stronger and vastly more honoured and followed than all the princes of germany character is property it is the noblest of possessions it is an estate in the general good will and respect of men and they who invest in it though they may not become rich in this world's goods will find their reward in esteem and reputation fairly and honorably won and it is right that in life good qualities should tell that industry virtue and goodness should rank the highest and that the really best men should be foremost simple honesty of purpose in a man goes a long way in life if founded on a just estimate of himself and a steady obedience to the rule he knows and feels to be right it holds a man straight gives him strength and sustenance and forms a mainspring of vigorous action no man once said sir benjamin rudyard is bound to be rich or great no nor to be wise but every man is bound to be honest but the purpose besides being honest must be inspired by sound principles and pursued with undeviating adherence to truth integrity and uprightness without principles a man is like a ship without rudder or compass left to drift hither and thither with every wind that blows he is as one without law or rule or order or government moral principles says hume are social and universal they form in a manner the party of humankind against vice and disorder its common enemy epictetus once received a visit from a certain magnificent orator going to rome on a lawsuit who wished to learn from the stoic something of his philosophy epictetus received his visitor coolly not believing in his sincerity you will only criticize my style said he not really wishing to learn principles well but said the orator if i attend to that sort of thing i shall be a mere pauper like you with no plate nor equipage nor land i don't want such things replied epictetus and besides you are poorer than i am after all patron or no patron what care i you do care i am richer than you i don't care what caesar thinks of me i flatter no one this is what i have instead of your gold and silver plate you have silver vessels but earthenware reasons principles appetites my mind to me a kingdom is and it furnishes me with abundant and happy occupation in lieu of your restless idleness all your possessions seem small to you mine seem great to me your desire is insatiate mine is satisfied talent is by no means rare in the world nor is even genius but can talent be trusted can the genius not unless based on truthfulness on veracity it is this quality more than any other that commands the esteem and respect and secures the confidence of others truthfulness is at the foundation of all personal excellence it exhibits itself in conduct it is rectitude truth in action and shines through every word and deed it means reliableness 
and convinces other men that it can be trusted and a man is already of consequence in the world when it is known that he can be relied on that when he says he knows a thing he does know it that when he says he will do a thing he can do and does do it thus reliableness becomes a passport to the general esteem and confidence of mankind in the affairs of life or of business it is not intellect that tells so much as character not brain so much as heart not genius so much as self-control patience and discipline regulated by judgment hence there is no better provision for the uses of either private or public life than a fair share of ordinary good sense guided by rectitude good sense disciplined by experience and inspired by goodness issues in practical wisdom indeed goodness in a measure implies wisdom the highest wisdom the union of the worldly with the spiritual the correspondences of wisdom and goodness says sir henry taylor are manifold and that they will accompany each other is to be inferred not only because men's wisdom makes them good but because their goodness makes them wise it is because of this controlling power of character in life that we often see men exercise an amount of influence apparently out of all proportion to their intellectual endowments they appear to act by means of some latent power some reserved force which acts secretly by mere presence as burke said of a powerful nobleman of the last century his virtues were his means the secret is that the aims of such men are felt to be pure and noble and they act upon others with a constraining power though the reputation of men of genuine character may be of slow growth their true qualities cannot be wholly concealed they may be misrepresented by some and misunderstood by others misfortune and adversity may for a time overtake them but with patience and endurance they will eventually inspire the respect and command the confidence which they really deserve it has been said of sheridan that had he possessed reliableness of character he might have ruled the world whereas for want of it his splendid gifts were comparatively useless he dazzled and amused but was without weight or influence in life or politics even the poor pantomimist of drury lane felt himself his superior thus when delpini one day pressed the manager for arrears of salary sheridan sharply reproved him telling him he had forgotten his station no indeed monsieur sheridan i have not retorted delpini i know the difference between us perfectly well in birth parentage and education you are superior to me but in life character and behavior i am superior to you unlike sheridan burke his countryman was a great man of character he was thirty-five before he gained a seat in parliament yet he found time to carve his name deep in the political history of england he was a man of great gifts and of transcendent force of character yet he had a weakness which proved a serious defect it was his want of temper his genius was sacrificed to his irritability and without this apparently minor gift of temper the most splendid endowments may be comparatively valueless to their possessor character is formed by a variety of minute circumstances more or less under the regulation and control of the individual not a day passes without its discipline whether for good or for evil there is no act however trivial but has its train of consequences as there is no hair so small but casts its shadow it was a wise saying of mrs schimmelpomink's mother never to give way to what is little or by that little however you may despise it you will be practically governed every action every thought 
every feeling contributes to the education of the temper the habits and understanding and exercises an inevitable influence upon all the acts of our future life thus character is undergoing constant change for better or for worse either being elevated on the one hand or degraded on the other there is no fault nor folly of my life says mr ruskin that does not rise up against me and take away my joy and shorten my power of possession of sight of understanding and every past effort of my life every gleam of rightness or good in it is with me now to help me in my grasp of this art and its vision says Luz in his life of goethe instead of saying that man is the creature of circumstance it would be nearer the mark to say that man is the architect of circumstance it is character which builds an existence out of circumstance our strength is measured by our plastic power from the same materials one man builds palaces another hovels one warehouses another villas bricks and mortar are mortar and bricks until the architect can make them something else thus it is that in the same family in the same circumstances one man rears a stately edifice while his brother vacillating and incompetent lives forever amid ruins the block of granite which was an obstacle on the pathway of the weak becomes a stepping-stone on the pathway of the strong the mechanical law that action and reaction are equal holds true also in morals good deeds act and react on the doers of them and so do evil not only so they produce like effects by the influence of example on those who are the subjects of them but man is not the creature so much as he is the creator of circumstances and by the exercise of his free will he can direct his actions so that they shall be productive of good rather than evil nothing can work me damage but myself said st bernard the harm that i sustain i carry about with me and i am never a real sufferer but by my own fault the best sort of character however cannot be formed without effort there needs the exercise of constant self-watchfulness self-discipline and self-control there may be much faltering stumbling and temporary defeat difficulties and temptations manifold to be battled with and overcome but if the spirit be strong and the heart be upright no one need despair of ultimate success the very effort to advance to arrive at a higher standard of character than we have reached is inspiring and invigorating and even though we may fall short of it we cannot fail to be improved by every honest effort made in an upward direction and with the light of great examples to guide us representatives of humanity in its best forms every one is not only justified but bound in duty to aim at reaching the highest standard of character not to become the richest in means but in spirit not the greatest in worldly positions but in true honor not the most intellectual but the most virtuous not the most powerful and influential but the most truthful upright and honest character exhibits itself in conduct guided and inspired by principle integrity and practical wisdom in its highest form it is the individual will acting energetically under the influence of religion morality and reason it chooses its way considerately and pursues it steadfastly esteeming duty above reputation and the approval of conscience more than the world's praise while respecting the personality of others it preserves its own individuality and independence and has the courage to be morally honest though it may be unpopular trusting tranquilly to time and experience for recognition 
although the force of example will always exercise great influence upon the formation of character the self-originating and sustaining force of one's own spirit must be the mainstay this alone can hold up the life and give individual independence and energy unless man can erect himself above himself said daniel a poet of the elizabethan era how poor a thing is man without a certain degree of practical efficient force compounded of will which is the root and wisdom which is the stem of character life will be indefinite and purposeless like a body of stagnant water instead of a running stream doing useful work and keeping the machinery of a district in motion when the elements of character are brought into action by determinate will and influenced by high purpose man enters upon and courageously perseveres in the path of duty at whatever cost of worldly interest he may be said to approach the summit of his being he then exhibits character in its most intrepid form and embodies the highest issue of manliness the acts of such a man become repeated in the life and action of others his very words live and become actions thus every word of luther's rang through germany like a trumpet as richter said of him his words were half battles and thus luther's life became transfused into the life of his country and still lives in the character of modern germany it was truly said of sheridan who with all his improvidence was generous and never gave pain that his wit in the combat as gentle as bright never carried a heart stain away on its blade such also was the character of fox who commanded the affection and service of others by his uniform heartiness and sympathy he was a man who could always be most easily touched on the side of his honor thus the story is told of a tradesman calling upon him one day for the payment of a promissory note which he presented fox was engaged at the time counting out gold the tradesman asked to be paid from the money before him no said fox i owe this money to sheridan it is a debt of honor if any accident happened to me he would have nothing to show then said the tradesman i change my debt into one of honor and he tore up the note fox was conquered by the act he thanked the man for his confidence and paid him saying then sheridan must wait yours is the debt of older standing the man of character is conscientious he puts his conscience into his work into his words into his every action when cromwell asked the parliament for soldiers in lieu of the decayed serving men who filled the commonwealth's army he required that they should be men who made some conscience of what they did and such were the men of which his celebrated regiment of ironsides was composed the man of character is also reverential the possession of this quality marks the noblest and highest type of manhood and womanhood reverence for things consecrated by the homage of generations for high objects pure thoughts and noble aims for the great men of former times and the high-minded workers among our contemporaries reverence is alike indispensable to the happiness of individuals of families and of nations without it there can be no trust no faith no confidence either in man or god neither social peace nor social progress for reverence is but another word for religion which binds men to each other and all to god energy of will self-originating force is the soul of every great character where it is there is life where it is not there is 
faintness helplessness and despondency the strong man and the waterfall says the proverb channel their own path the energetic leader of noble spirit not only wins away for himself but carries others with him his every act has a personal significance indicating vigor independence and self-reliance and unconsciously commands respect admiration and homage such intrepidity of character was possessed by luther cromwell washington pitt wellington and all great leaders of men i am convinced said mr gladstone in describing the qualities of the late lord palmerston in the house of commons shortly after his death i am convinced that it was the force of will a sense of duty and a determination not to give in that enabled him to make himself a model for all of us who yet remain and follow him with feeble and unequal steps in the discharge of our duties it was that force of will that in point of fact did not so much struggle against the infirmities of old age but actually repelled them and kept them at a distance and one other quality there is at least that may be noticed without the smallest risk of stirring in any breast a painful emotion it is this that lord palmerston had a nature incapable of enduring anger or any sentiment of wrath this freedom from wrathful sentiment was not the result of painful effort but the spontaneous fruit of the mind it was a noble gift of his original nature a gift which beyond all others it was delightful to observe delightful also to remember in connection with him who has left us and with him we have no longer to do except in endeavoring to profit by his example wherever it can lead us in the path of duty and of right and of bestowing on him those tributes of admiration and affection which he deserves at our hands the great leader attracts to himself men of kindred character drawing them towards him as the lodestone draws iron thus sir john moore early distinguished the three brothers napier from the crowd of officers by whom he was surrounded and they on their part repaid him by their passionate admiration they were captivated by his courtesy his bravery and his lofty disinterestedness and he became the model whom they resolved to imitate and if possible to emulate moore's influence says the biographer of sir william napier had a signal effect in forming and maturing their characters and it is no small glory to have been the hero of those three men while his early discovery of their mental and moral qualities is a proof of moore's own penetration and judgment of character there is a contagiousness in every example of energetic conduct the brave man is an inspiration to the weak and compels them as it were to follow him thus napier relates that at the combat of vera when the spanish centre was broken and in flight a young officer named havelock sprang forward and waving his hat called upon the spaniards within sight to follow him putting spurs to his horse he leapt the abatis which protected the french front and went headlong against them the spaniards were electrified in a moment they dashed after him cheering for el chico blanco the fair boy and with one shock they broke through the french and sent them flying down hill and so it is in ordinary life the good and the great draw others after them they lighten and lift up all who are within reach of their influence they are so many living centres of beneficent activity let a man of energetic and upright character be appointed to a position of trust and authority and all who serve under him become as it were conscious of an increase of power when chatham was appointed minister his personal influence was at once felt through all the ramifications of office 
every sailor who served under nelson and knew he was in command shared the inspiration of the hero when washington consented to act as commander-in-chief it was felt as if the strength of the american forces had been more than doubled many years later in seventeen ninety eight when washington grown old had withdrawn from public life and was living in retirement at mount vernon and when it seemed probable that france would declare war against the united states president adams wrote to him saying we must have your name if you will permit us to use it there will be more efficacy in it than in many an army such was the esteem in which the great president's noble character and eminent abilities were held by his countrymen when the dissolution of the union at one time seemed imminent and washington wished to retire into private life jefferson wrote to him urging his continuance in office the confidence of the whole union he said centers in you your being at the helm will be more than an answer to every argument which can be used to alarm and lead the people in any quarter into violence and secession there is sometimes an eminence of character on which society has such peculiar claims as to control the predilection of the individual for a particular walk of happiness and restrain him to that alone arising from the present and future benedictions of mankind this seems to be your condition and the law imposed on you by providence in forming your character and fashioning the events on which it was to operate and it is to motives like these and not to personal anxieties of mine or others who have no right to call on you for sacrifices that i appeal from your former determination and urge a revisal of it on the ground of change in the aspect of things an incident is related by the historian of the peninsular war illustrative of the personal influence exercised by a great commander over his followers the british army lay at sororan before which salt was advancing prepared to attack in force wellington was absent and his arrival was anxiously looked for suddenly a single horseman was seen riding up the mountain alone it was the duke about to join his troops one of campbell's portuguese battalions first described him and raised a joyful cry then the shrill clamor caught up by the next regiment soon swelled as it ran along the line into that appalling shout which the british soldier is wont to give upon the edge of battle and which no enemy ever heard unmoved suddenly he stopped at a conspicuous point for he desired both armies should know he was there and a double spy who was present pointed out salt who was so near that his features could be distinguished attentively wellington fixed his eyes on that formidable man and as if speaking to himself he said yonder is a great commander but he is cautious and will delay his attack to ascertain the cause of those cheers that will give time for the sixth division to arrive and i shall beat him which he did in some cases personal character acts by a kind of talismanic influence as if certain men were the organs of a sort of supernatural force if i but stamp on the ground in italy said pompey an army will appear at the voice of peter the hermit as described by the historian europe arose and precipitated itself upon asia it was said of the caliph omar that his walking-stick struck more terror into those who saw it than another man's sword the very names of some men are like the sound of a trumpet when the douglas lay mortally wounded on the field of otterburn he ordered his name to be shouted still louder than before saying there was a tradition in his family that a dead douglas should win a battle his followers inspired by the sound gathered fresh courage rallied and conquered and thus in the words of the scottish poet the douglas dead his name hath won the field there have been some men whose greatest conquests have been achieved after they themselves were dead 
never says michelet was caesar more alive more powerful more terrible than when his old and worn-out body his withered corpse lay pierced with blows he appeared then purified redeemed that which he had been despite his many stains the man of humanity never did the great character of william of orange surnamed the silent exercise greater power over his countrymen than after his assassination at delft by the emissary of the jesuits on the very day of his murder the estates of holland resolved to maintain the good cause with god's help to the uttermost without sparing gold or blood and they kept their word character embodied in thought and deed is of the nature of immortality the solitary thought of a great thinker will dwell in the minds of men for centuries until at length it works itself into their daily life and practice it lives on through the ages speaking as a voice from the dead and influencing minds living thousands of years apart thus moses and david and solomon plato and socrates and xenophon seneca and cicero and epictetus still speak to us as from their tombs they still arrest the attention and exercise an influence upon character though their thoughts be conveyed in languages unspoken by them and in their time unknown theodore parker has said that a single man like socrates was worth more to a country than many such states as south carolina that if that state went out of the world to-day she would not have done so much for the world as socrates erasmus so reverenced the character of socrates that he said when he considered his life and doctrines he was inclined to put him in the calendar of saints and to exclaim holy socrates pray for us great workers and great thinkers are the true makers of history which is but continuous humanity influenced by men of character by great leaders kings priests philosophers statesmen and patriots the true aristocracy of man indeed mr carlyle has broadly stated that universal history is at bottom but the history of great men they certainly mark and designate the epochs of national life their influence is active as well as reactive though their mind is in a measure the product of their age the public mind is also to a great extent their creation their individual action identifies the cause the institution they think great thoughts cast them abroad and the thoughts make events thus the early reformers initiated the reformation and with it the liberation of modern thought emerson has said that every institution is to be regarded as but the lengthened shadow of some great man as islamism of mohammed puritanism of calvin jesuitism of loyola quakerism of fox methodism of wesley abolitionism of clarkson great men stamp their mind upon their age and nation as luther did upon modern germany and knox upon scotland and if there be one man more than another that stamped his mind on modern italy it was dante during the long centuries of italian degradation his burning words were as a watch-fire and a beacon to all true men he was the herald of his nation's liberty braving persecution exile and death for the love of it he was always the most national of the italian poets the most loved the most read from the time of his death all educated italians had his best passages by heart and the sentiments they enshrined inspired their lives and eventually influenced the history of their nation the italians wrote byron in eighteen twenty one talk dante write dante and think and dream dante at this moment to an excess which would be ridiculous but that he deserves their admiration 
washington left behind him as one of the greatest treasures of his country the example of a stainless life of a great honest pure and noble character a model for the nation to form themselves by in all time to come and in the case of washington as in so many other great leaders of men his greatness did not so much consist in his intellect his skill and his genius as in his honor his integrity his truthfulness his high and controlling sense of duty in a word in his genuine nobility of character men such as these are the true life-blood of the country to which they belong they elevate and uphold it fortify and ennoble it and shed a glory over it by the example of life and character which they have bequeathed the names and memories of great men says an able writer are the dowry of a nation widowhood overthrow desertion even slavery cannot take away from her this sacred inheritance whenever national life begins to quicken the dead heroes rise in the memory of men and appear to the living to stand by in solemn spectatorship and approval no country can be lost which feels herself overlooked by such glorious witnesses they are the salt of the earth in death as well as in life what they did once their descendants have still and always a right to do after them and their example lives in their country a continual stimulant and encouragement for him who has the soul to adopt it but it is not great men only that have to be taken into account in estimating the qualities of a nation but the character that pervades the great body of the people when washington irving visited abbotsford sir walter scott introduced him to many of his friends and favorites not only among the neighboring farmers but the laboring peasantry i wish to show you said scott some of our really excellent plain scotch people the character of a nation is not to be learnt from its fine folks its fine gentlemen and ladies such you meet everywhere and they are everywhere the same while statesmen philosophers and divines represent the thinking power of society the men who found industries and carve out new careers as well as the common body of working people from whom the national strength and spirit are from time to time recruited must necessarily furnish the vital force and constitute the real backbone of every nation nations have their character to maintain as well as individuals and under constitutional governments where all classes more or less participate in the exercise of political power the national character will necessarily depend more upon the moral qualities of the many than of the few and the same qualities which determine the character of individuals also determine the character of nations unless they are high-minded truthful honest virtuous and courageous they will be held in light esteem by other nations and be without weight in the world to have character they must needs also be reverential disciplined self-controlling and devoted to duty the nation that has no higher god than pleasure or even dollars or calico must needs be in a poor way it were better to revert to homer's gods than be devoted to these for the heathen deities at least imagined human virtues and were something to look up to as for institutions however good in themselves they will avail but little in maintaining the standard of national character it is the individual men and the spirit which actuates them that determine the moral standing and stability of nations government in the long run is usually no better than the people governed where the mass is sound in conscience morals and habits the nations will be ruled honestly and nobly but where they are corrupt self-seeking and dishonest in heart bound neither by truth nor by law 
the rule of rogues and wire-pullers becomes inevitable the only true barrier against the despotism of public opinion whether it be of the many or of the few is enlightened individual freedom and purity of personal character without these there can be no vigorous manhood no true liberty in a nation political rights however broadly framed will not elevate a people individually depraved indeed the more complete a system of popular suffrage and the more perfect its protection the more completely will the real character of a people be reflected as by a mirror in their laws and government political morality can never have any solid existence on a basis of individual immorality even freedom exercised by a debased people would come to be regarded as a nuisance and liberty of the press but a vent for licentiousness and moral abomination nations like individuals derive support and strength from the feeling that they belong to an illustrious race that they are the heirs of their greatness and ought to be the perpetuators of their glory it is of momentous importance that a nation should have a great past to look back upon it steadies the life of the present elevates and upholds it and lightens and lifts it up by the memory of the great deeds the noble sufferings and the valorous achievements of the men of old the life of nations as of men is a great treasury of experiences which wisely used issues in social progress and improvement or misused issues in dreams delusions and failure like men nations are purified and strengthened by trials some of the most glorious chapters in their history are those containing the record of the sufferings by means of which their character has been developed love of liberty and patriotic feeling may have done much but trial and suffering nobly born more than all a great deal of what passes by the name of patriotism in these days consists of the merest bigotry and narrow-mindedness exhibiting itself in national prejudice national conceit and national hatred it does not show itself in deeds but in boastings in howlings gesticulations and shrieking helplessly for help in flying flags and singing songs and in perpetual grinding at long dead grievances and long remedied wrongs to be infested by such a patriotism as this is perhaps among the greatest curses that can befall any country but as there is an ignoble so is there a noble patriotism the patriotism that invigorates and elevates a country by noble work that does its duty truthfully and manfully that lives an honest sober and upright life and strives to make the best use of the opportunities for improvement that present themselves on every side and at the same time a patriotism that cherishes the memory and example of the great men of old who by their sufferings in the cause of religion or of freedom have won for themselves a deathless glory and for their nation those privileges of free life and free political institutions of which they are the inheritors and possessors nations are not to be judged by their size any more than individuals it is not growing like a tree in bulk doth make man better be for a nation to be great it need not necessarily be large though size is often confounded with greatness a nation may be very large in point of territory and population and yet be devoid of true greatness the people of israel were a small people yet what a great life they developed and how powerful the influence they have exercised on the destinies of mankind greece was not big the entire population of attica was less than that of illinois athens was less populous than new york and yet how great it was in art in literature in philosophy and in patriotism 
a public orator lately spoke with contempt of the battle of marathon because only one hundred and ninety two men perished on the side of the athenians whereas by improved mechanism and destructive chemicals some fifty thousand men or more may now be destroyed within a few hours yet the battle of marathon and the heroism displayed in it will probably continue to be remembered when the gigantic butcheries of modern times have been forgotten but it was the fatal weakness of athens that its citizens had no true family or home life while its freemen were greatly outnumbered by its slaves its public men were loose if not corrupt in morals its women even the most accomplished were unchaste hence its fall became inevitable and was even more sudden than its rise in like manner the decline and fall of rome was attributable to the general corruption of its people and to their engrossing love of pleasure and idleness work in the latter days of rome being regarded only as fit for slaves its citizens ceased to pride themselves on the virtues of character of their great forefathers and the empire fell because it did not deserve to live and so the nations that are idle and luxurious that will rather lose a pound of blood as old burton says in a single combat than a drop of sweat in any honest labor must inevitably die out and laborious energetic nations take their place when louis the fourteenth asked colbert how it was that ruling so great and populous a country as france he had been unable to conquer so small a country as holland the minister replied because sire the greatness of a country does not depend upon the extent of its territory but on the character of its people it is because of the industry the frugality and the energy of the dutch that your majesty has found them so difficult to overcome it is also related of spinola and richardet the ambassadors sent by the king of spain to negotiate a treaty at the hague in sixteen o eight that one day they saw some eight or ten persons land from a little boat and sitting down upon the grass proceed to make a meal of bread and cheese and beer who are those travellers asked the ambassadors of a peasant these are our worshipful masters the deputies from the states was his reply spinola at once whispered to his companion we must make peace these are not men to be conquered in fine stability of institutions must depend upon stability of character any number of depraved units cannot form a great nation the people may seem to be highly civilized and yet be ready to fall to pieces at the first touch of adversity without integrity of individual character they can have no real strength cohesion or soundness they may be rich polite and artistic and yet hovering on the brink of ruin if living for themselves only and with no end but pleasure each little self his own little god such a nation is doomed and its decay is inevitable where national character ceases to be upheld a nation may be regarded as next to lost where it ceases to esteem and to practice the virtues of truthfulness honesty integrity and justice it does not deserve to live and when the time arrives in any country where wealth has so corrupted or pleasure so depraved or faction so infatuated the people that honor order obedience virtue and loyalty have seemingly become things of the past then amidst the darkness when honest men if haply there be such left are groping about and feeling for each other's hands their only remaining hope will be in the restoration and elevation of individual character for by that alone can a nation be saved and if character be irrevocably lost then indeed there will be nothing left worth saving end of chapter 3 influence of character read by john greenman
This is Chapter Four of Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them, by Samuel Smiles, read by John Greenman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Home Power. Live as long as you may. The first twenty years is the longest half of your life. Southey. Home is the first and most important school of character. It is there that every human being receives his best moral training or his worst, for it is there that he imbibes those principles of conduct which endure through manhood and cease only with life. It is a common saying that manners make the man, and there is a second that mind makes the man, but truer than either is a third that home makes the man. For the home training includes not only manners and mind, but character. It is mainly in the home that the heart is opened, the habits are formed, the intellect is awakened, and the character moulded for good or for evil. From that source, be it pure or impure, issue the principles and maxims that govern society. Law itself is but the reflex of homes the tiniest bits of opinion sown in the minds of children in private life afterwards issue forth to the world and become its public opinion for nations are gathered out of nurseries and they who hold the leading strings of children may even exercise a greater power than those who wield the reins of government it is in the order of nature that domestic life should be preparatory to social and that the mind and character should first be formed in the home. There the individuals who afterwards form society are dealt with in detail and fashioned one by one. From the family they enter life, and advance from boyhood to citizenship. Thus the home may be regarded as the most influential school of civilization, for, after all, civilization mainly resolves itself into a question of individual training, and according as the respective members of society are well or ill-trained in youth, so will the community which they constitute be more or less humanized and civilized. The training of any man, even the wisest, cannot fail to be powerfully influenced by the moral surroundings of his early years. He comes into the world helpless and absolutely dependent upon those about him for nurture and culture from the very first breath that he draws his education begins when a mother once asked a clergyman when she should begin the education of her child then four years old he replied madam if you have not begun already you have lost those four years from the first smile that gleams upon an infant's cheek your opportunity begins however apparently trivial the influences which contribute to form the character of the child they endure through life the child's character is the nucleus of the man's all after education is but superposition the form of the crystal remains the same thus the saying of the poet holds true in a large degree the child is the father of the man or as milton puts it the childhood shows the man as morning shows the day those impulses to conduct which last the longest and are rooted the deepest always have their origin near our birth it is then that the germs of virtues or vices of feelings or sentiments are first implanted which determine the character for life the child is as it were laid at the gate of a new world and opens his eyes upon things all of which are full of novelty and wonderment at first it is enough for him to gaze, but by and by he begins to see, to observe, to compare, to learn, to store up impressions and ideas, and under wise guidance the progress which he makes is really wonderful. Lord Brougham has observed that between the ages of eighteen and thirty months a child learns more of the material world, of his own powers, of the nature of other bodies, and even of his own mind and other minds than he acquires in all the rest of his life 
the knowledge which a child accumulates and the ideas generated in his mind during this period are so important that if we could imagine them to be afterwards obliterated all the learning of a senior wrangler at cambridge or a first classman at oxford would be as nothing to it and would literally not enable its object to prolong its existence for a week it is in childhood that the mind is most open to impressions and ready to be kindled by the first spark that falls into it ideas are then caught quickly and retained thus scott is said to have received his first bent toward ballad literature from his mother's and grandmother's recitations in his hearing long before he himself had learned to read childhood is like a mirror which reflects in after life the images first presented to it the first thing continues forever with the child the first joy the first sorrow the first success the first failure the first achievement the first misadventure paint the foreground of his life all this while too the training of his character is in progress of the temper the will and the habits on which so much of the happiness of human beings in after life depends although man is endowed with a certain self-acting self-helping power of contributing to his own development independent of surrounding circumstances and of reacting upon the life around him the bias given to his moral character in early life is of immense importance place even the highest-minded philosopher in the midst of daily discomfort immorality and vileness and he will insensibly gravitate toward brutality how much more susceptible is the impressionable and helpless child amidst such sufferings it is not possible to rear a kindly nature sensitive to evil pure in mind and heart amidst coarseness discomfort and impurity thus homes which are the nurseries of children who grow up into men and women will be good or bad according to the power that governs them where the spirit of love and duty pervades the home where head and heart bear rule wisely there where the daily life is honest and virtuous where the government is sensible kind and loving then may we expect from such a home an issue of healthy useful and happy beings capable as they gain in the requisite strength of following the footsteps of their parents of walking uprightly governing themselves wisely and contributing to the welfare of those about them on the other hand if surrounded by ignorance coarseness and selfishness they will unconsciously assume the same character and grow up to adult years rude uncultivated and all the more dangerous to society if placed amidst the manifold temptations of what is called civilized life give your child to be educated by a slave said an ancient greek and instead of one slave you will then have two the child cannot help imitating what he sees everything is to him a model of manner of gesture of speech of habit of character for the child says richter the most important era of life is that of childhood when he begins to color and mold himself by companionship with others every new educator affects less than his predecessor until at last if we regard all life as an educational institution a circumnavigator of the world is less influenced by all the nations he has seen than by his nurse models are therefore of every importance in moulding the nature of the child and if we would have fine characters we must necessarily present before them fine models now the model most constantly before every child's eye is the mother one good mother said george herbert is worth a hundred schoolmasters in the home she is lodestone to all hearts a lodestar to all eyes imitation of her is constant 
imitation which bacon likens to a globe of precepts but example is far more than precept it is instruction in action it is teaching without words often exemplifying more than tongue can teach in the face of bad example the best of precepts are of but little avail the example is followed not the precepts indeed precept at variance with practice is worse than useless inasmuch as it only serves to teach the most cowardly of vices hypocrisy even children are judges of consistency and the lessons of the parent who says one thing and does the opposite are quickly seen through the teaching of the friar was not worth much who preached the virtue of honesty with a stolen goose in his sleeve by imitation of acts the character becomes slowly and imperceptibly but at length decidedly formed the several acts may seem in themselves trivial but so are the continuous acts of daily life like snowflakes they fall unperceived each flake added to the pile produces no sensible change and yet the accumulation of snowflakes makes the avalanche so do repeated acts one following another at length become consolidated in habit determine the action of the human being for good or for evil and in a word form the character it is because the mother far more than the father influences the action and conduct of the child that her good example is of so much greater importance in the home it is easy to understand how this should be so the home is the woman's domain her kingdom where she exercises entire control her power over the little subjects she rules there is absolute they look up to her for everything she is the example and model constantly before their eyes whom they unconsciously observe and imitate cowley speaking of the influence of early example and ideas early implanted in the mind compares them to letters cut in the bark of a young tree which grow and widen with age the impressions then made however slight they may seem are never effaced the ideas then implanted in the mind are like seeds dropped into the ground which lie there and germinate for a time afterwards springing up in acts and thoughts and habits thus the mother lives again in her children they unconsciously mould themselves after her manner her speech her conduct and her method of life her habits become theirs and her character is visibly repeated in them this maternal love is the visible providence of our race its influence is constant and universal it begins with the education of the human being at the outstart of life and is prolonged by virtue of the powerful influence which every good mother exercises over her children through life when launched into the world each to take part in its labors anxieties and trials they still turn to their mother for consolation if not for counsel in their time of trouble and difficulty the pure and good thoughts she has implanted in their minds when children continue to grow up into good acts long after she is dead and when there is nothing but a memory of her left her children rise up and call her blessed it is not saying too much to aver that the happiness or misery the enlightenment or ignorance the civilization or barbarism of the world depends in a very high degree upon the exercise of woman's power within her special kingdom of home indeed emerson says broadly and truly that a sufficient measure of civilization is the influence of good women posterity may be said to lie before us in the person of the child in the mother's lap what that child will eventually become mainly depends upon the training and example which he has received from his first and most influential educator woman above all other educators educates humanly man is the brain but woman is the heart of humanity he its judgment she its feeling he its strength 
she its grace ornament and solace even the understanding of the best woman seems to work mainly through her affections and thus though man may direct the intellect woman cultivates the feelings which mainly determine the character while he fills the memory she occupies the heart she makes us love what he can only make us believe and it is chiefly through her that we are enabled to arrive at virtue the respective influences of the father and the mother on the training and developing of character are remarkably illustrated in the life of st augustine while augustine's father a poor freeman of thagast proud of his son's abilities endeavored to furnish his mind with the highest learning of the schools and was extolled by his neighbors for the sacrifices he made with that object beyond the ability of his means his mother monica on the other hand sought to lead her son's mind in the direction of the highest good and with pious care counseled him entreated him advised him to chastity and amidst much anguish and tribulation because of his wicked life never ceased to pray for him until her prayers were heard and answered thus her love at last triumphed and the patience and goodness of the mother were rewarded not only by the conversion of her gifted son but also of her husband later in life and after her husband's death monica drawn by her affection followed her son to milan to watch over him and there she died when he was in his thirty-third year but it was in the earlier period of his life that her example and instruction made the deepest impression upon his mind and determined his future character there are many similar instances of early impressions made upon a child's mind springing up into good acts later in life after an intervening period of selfishness and vice parents may do all that they can to develop an upright and virtuous character in their children and apparently in vain it seems like bread cast upon the waters and lost and yet sometimes it happens that long after the parents have gone to their rest it may be twenty years or more the good precept the good example set before their sons and daughters in childhood at length springs up and bears fruit one of the most remarkable of such instances was that of the rev john newton of olney the friend of cowper the poet it was long subsequent to the death of both his parents and after leading a vicious life as a youth and as a seaman that he became suddenly awakened to a sense of his depravity and then it was that the lessons which his mother had given him when a child sprang up vividly in his memory her voice came to him as if it were from the dead and led him gently back to virtue and goodness another instance is that of john randolph the american statesman who once said i should have been an atheist if it had not been for one recollection and that was the memory of the time when my departed mother used to take my little hand in hers and cause me on my knees to say our father who art in heaven but such instances must on the whole be regarded as exceptional as the character is based in early life so it generally remains gradually assuming its permanent form as manhood is reached live as long as you may said southey the first twenty years are the longest half of your life and they are by far the most pregnant in consequences when the worn-out slanderer and voluptuary dr wolcott lay on his deathbed one of his friends asked if he could do anything to gratify him yes said the dying man eagerly give me back my youth give him but that and he would repent he would reform but it was all too late his life had become bound and enthralled by the chains of habit gretry the musical composer thought so highly of the importance of woman as an educator of character that he described a good mother as nature's masterpiece and he was right for good mothers far more than fathers tend to the perpetual renovation of mankind creating as they do 
the moral atmosphere of the home which is the nutriment of man's moral being as the physical atmosphere is of his corporeal frame by good temper suavity and kindness directed by intelligence woman surrounds the indwellers with a pervading atmosphere of cheerfulness contentment and peace suitable for the growth of the purest as of the manliest natures the poorest dwelling presided over by a virtuous thrifty cheerful and cleanly woman may thus be the abode of comfort virtue and happiness it may be the scene of every ennobling relation in family life it may be endeared to a man by many delightful associations furnishing a sanctuary for the heart a refuge from the storms of life a sweet resting-place after labor a consolation in misfortune a pride in prosperity and a joy at all times the good home is thus the best of schools not only in youth but in age there young and old best learn cheerfulness patience self-control and the spirit of service and of duty isaac walton speaking of george herbert's mother says she governed her family with judicious care not rigidly or sourly but with such a sweetness and compliance with the recreations and pleasures of youth as did incline them to spend much of their time in her company which was to her great content the home is the true school of courtesy of which woman is always the best practical instructor philanthropy radiates from the home as from a centre to love the little platoon we belong to in society said burke is the germ of all public affections the wisest and the best have not been ashamed to own it to be their greatest joy and happiness to sit behind the heads of children in the inviolable circle of home a life of purity and duty there is not the least effectual preparative for a life of public work and duty and the man who loves his home will not the less fondly love and serve his country but while homes which are the nurseries of character may be the best of schools they may also be the worst between childhood and manhood how incalculable is the mischief which ignorance in the home has the power to cause between the drawing of the first breath and the last how vast is the moral suffering and disease occasioned by incompetent mothers and nurses commit a child to the care of a worthless ignorant woman and no culture in after-life will remedy the evil you have done let the mother be idle vicious and a slattern let her home be pervaded by cavilling petulance and discontent and it will become a dwelling of misery a place to fly from rather than to fly to and the children whose misfortune it is to be brought up there will be morally dwarfed and deformed the cause of misery to themselves as well as to others napoleon bonaparte was accustomed to say that the future good or bad conduct of a child depended entirely on the mother he himself attributed his rise in life in a great measure to the training of his will his energy and his self-control by his mother at home nobody had any command over him says one of his biographers except his mother who found means by a mixture of tenderness severity and justice to make him love respect and obey her from her he learnt the virtue of obedience a curious illustration of the dependence of the character of children on that of the mother incidentally occurs in one of mr tufnell's school reports the truth he observes is so well established that it has even been made subservient to mercantile calculation i was informed he says in a large factory where many children were employed that the managers before they engaged a boy always inquired into the mother's character and if that was satisfactory they were tolerably certain her children would conduct themselves creditably no attention was paid to the character of the father 
it has also been observed that in cases where the father has turned out badly become a drunkard and gone to the dogs provided the mother is prudent and sensible the family will be kept together and the children probably make their way honorably in life whereas in cases of the opposite sort where the mother turns out badly no matter how well conducted the father may be the instances of after success in life on the part of the children are comparatively rare the greater part of the influence exercised by women on the formation of character necessarily remains unknown they accomplish their best works in the quiet seclusion of the home and the family by sustained effort and patient perseverance in the path of duty their greatest triumphs because private and domestic are rarely recorded and it is not often even in the biographies of distinguished men that we hear of the share which their mothers have had in the formation of their character and in giving them a bias towards goodness yet are they not on that account without their reward the influence they have exercised though unrecorded lives after them and goes on propagating itself in consequences for ever we do not so often hear of great women as we do of great men it is of good women that we mostly hear and it is probable that by determining the character of men and women for good they are doing even greater work than if they were to paint great pictures write great books or compose great operas it is quite true said joseph de maistre that women have produced no masterpieces they have written no iliad nor jerusalem delivered nor hamlet nor phaedra nor paradise lost nor tartuffe they have designed no church of st peter's composed no messiah carved no apollo belvedere painted no last judgment they have invented neither algebra nor telescopes nor steam engines but they have done something far greater and better than all this for it is at their knees that upright and virtuous men and women have been trained the most excellent productions in the world de maistre in his letters and writings speaks of his own mother with immense love and reverence her noble character made all other women venerable in his eyes he described her as his sublime mother an angel to whom god had lent a body for a brief season to her he attributed the bent of his character and all his bias towards good and when he had grown to mature years while acting as ambassador at the court of st petersburg he referred to her noble example and precepts as the ruling influence in his life one of the most charming features in the character of samuel johnson notwithstanding his rough and shaggy exterior was the tenderness with which he invariably spoke of his mother a woman of strong understanding who firmly implanted in his mind as he himself acknowledges his first impressions of religion he was accustomed even in the time of his greatest difficulties to contribute largely out of his slender means to her comfort and one of his last acts of filial duty was to write rasselas for the purpose of paying her little debts and defraying her funeral charges george washington was only eleven years of age the eldest of five children when his father died leaving his mother a widow she was a woman of rare excellence full of resources a good woman of business an excellent manager and possessed of much strength of character she had her children to educate and bring up a large household to govern and extensive estates to manage all of which she accomplished with complete success her good sense assiduity tenderness industry and vigilance enabled her to overcome every obstacle and as the richest reward of her solicitude and toil she had the happiness to see all her children come forward with a fair promise into life filling the spheres allotted to them in a manner equally honorable to themselves and to the parent who had been the only guide of their principles conduct and habits the biographer of cromwell says little about the protector's father but dwells upon the character of his mother 
whom he describes as a woman of rare vigor and decision of purpose a woman he says possessed of the glorious faculty of self-help when other assistance failed her ready for the demands of fortune in its extremest adverse turn of spirit and energy equal to her mildness and patience who with the labor of her own hands gave dowries to five daughters sufficient to marry them into families as honorable but more wealthy than their own whose single pride was honesty and whose passion was love who persevered in the gorgeous palace at whitehall the simple tastes that distinguished her in the old brewery at huntingdom and whose only care amidst all her splendor was for the safety of her son in his dangerous eminence we have spoken of the mother of napoleon bonaparte as a woman of great force of character not less so was the mother of the duke of wellington whom her son strikingly resembled in features person and character while his father was principally distinguished as a musical composer and performer but strange to say wellington's mother mistook him for a dunce and for some reason or other he was not such a favorite as her other children until his great deeds in after-life constrained her to be proud of him the napiers were blessed in both parents but especially in their mother lady sarah lennox who early sought to inspire their sons minds with elevating thoughts admiration of noble deeds and a chivalrous spirit which became embodied in their lives and continued to sustain them until death in the path of duty and of honor among statesmen lawyers and divines we find marked mention made of the mothers of lord chancellors bacon erskine and brougham all women of great ability and in the case of the first of great learning as well as of the mothers of canning curran and president adams of herbert paley and wesley lord brougham speaks in terms almost approaching reverence of his grandmother the sister of professor robertson as having been mainly instrumental in instilling into his mind a strong desire for information and the first principles of that persevering energy in the pursuit of every kind of knowledge which formed his prominent characteristic throughout life canning's mother was an irish woman of great natural ability for whom her gifted son entertained the greatest love and respect to the close of his career she was a woman of ordinary intellectual power indeed says canning's biographer were we not otherwise assured of the fact from direct sources it would be impossible to contemplate his profound and touching devotion to her without being led to conclude that the object of such unchanging attachment must have been possessed of rare and commanding qualities she was esteemed by the circle in which she lived as a woman of great mental energy her conversation was animated and vigorous and marked by a distinct originality of manner and a choice of topics fresh and striking and out of commonplace routine to persons who were but slightly acquainted with her the energy of her manner had even something of the air of eccentricity curran speaks with great affection of his mother as a woman of strong original understanding to whose wise counsel consistent piety and lessons of honorable ambition which she diligently enforced on the minds of her children he himself principally attributed his success in life the only inheritance he used to say that i could boast of from my poor father was the very scanty one of an unattractive face and person like his own and if the world has ever attributed to me something more valuable than face or person or than earthly wealth it was that another and a dearer parent gave her child a portion from the treasure of her mind when ex-president adams was present at the examination of a girls school in boston he was presented by the pupils with an address which deeply affected him and in acknowledging it he took the opportunity of referring to the lasting influence which womanly training and association had exercised upon his own life and character as a child he said 
i enjoyed perhaps the greatest of blessings that can be bestowed on man that of a mother who was anxious and capable to form the characters of her children rightly from her i derived whatever instruction religious especially and moral has pervaded a long life i will not say perfectly or as it ought to be but i will say because it is only justice to the memory of her i revere that in the course of that life whatever imperfection there has been or deviation from what she taught me the fault is mine and not hers the wesleys were particularly linked to their parents by natural piety though the mother rather than the father influenced their minds and developed their characters the father was a man of strong will but occasionally harsh and tyrannical in his dealings with his family while the mother with much strength of understanding and ardent love of truth was gentle persuasive affectionate and simple she was the teacher and cheerful companion of her children who gradually became moulded by her example it was through the bias given by her to her son's minds in religious matters that they acquired the tendency which even in early years drew to them the name of methodist in a letter to her son samuel wesley when a scholar at westminster in seventeen o nine she said i would advise you as much as possible to throw your business into a certain method by which means you will learn to improve every precious moment and find an unspeakable facility in the performance of your respective duties this method she went on to describe exhorting her son in all things to act upon principle and the society which the brothers john and charles afterward founded at oxford is supposed to have been in a great measure the result of her exhortations in the case of poets literary men and artists the influence of the mother's feeling and taste has doubtless had great effect in directing the genius of their sons and we find this especially illustrated in the lives of gray thompson scott southey bulwer schiller and goethe gray inherited almost complete his kind and loving nature from his mother while his father was harsh and unamiable gray was in fact a feminine man shy reserved and wanting in energy but thoroughly irreproachable in life and character the poet's mother maintained the family after her unworthy husband had deserted her and at her death gray placed on her grave an epitaph describing her as the careful tender mother of many children one of whom alone had the misfortune to survive her the poet himself was at his own desire interred beside her worshipped grave goethe like schiller owned the bias of his mind and character to his mother who was a woman of extraordinary gifts she was full of joyous flowing mother-wit and possessed in a high degree the art of stimulating young and active minds instructing them in the science of life out of the treasures of her abundant experience after a lengthened interview with her an enthusiastic traveller said now do i understand how goethe has become the man he is goethe himself affectionately cherished her memory she was worthy of life he once said of her and when he visited frankfort he sought out every individual who had been kind to his mother and thanked them all it was ari scheffer's mother whose beautiful features the painter so loved to reproduce in his pictures of beatrice st monica and others of his works that encouraged his study of art and by great self-denial provided him with the means of pursuing it while living at dordrecht in holland she first sent him to lille to study and afterwards to paris and her letters to him while absent were always full of sound motherly advice and affectionate womanly sympathy if you could but see me she wrote on one occasion kissing your picture then after a while taking it up again and with a tear in my eye calling you my beloved son 
you would comprehend what it costs me to use sometimes the stern language of authority and to occasion to you moments of pain work diligently be above all modest and humble and when you find yourself excelling others then compare what you have done with nature itself or with the ideal of your own mind and you will be secured by the contrast which will be apparent against the effects of pride and presumption long years after when ari sheffer was himself a grandfather he remembered with affection the advice of his mother and repeated it to his children and thus the vital power of good example lives on from generation to generation keeping the world ever fresh and young writing to his daughter madame margeline in eighteen forty six his departed mother's advice recurred to him and he said the word must fix it well in your memory dear child your grandmother seldom had it out of hers the truth is that through our lives nothing brings any good fruit except what is earned by either the work of the hands or by the exertion of one's self-denial sacrifices must in short be ever going on if we would obtain any comfort or happiness now that i am no longer young i declare that few passages in my life afford me so much satisfaction as those in which i made sacrifices or denied myself enjoyments the forbidden is the motto of the wise man self-denial is the quality of which jesus christ set us the example the french historian michelet makes the following touching reference to his mother in the preface to one of his most popular books the subject of much embittered controversy at the time at which it appeared while writing all this i have had in my mind a woman whose strong and serious mind would not have failed to support me in these contentions i lost her thirty years ago i was a child then nevertheless ever living in my memory she follows me from age to age she suffered with me in my poverty and was not allowed to share my better fortune when young i made her sad and now i cannot console her i know not even where her bones are i was too poor then to buy earth to bury her and yet i owe her much i feel deeply that i am the son of woman every instant in my ideas and words not to mention my features and gestures i find again my mother in myself it is my mother's blood which gives me the sympathy i feel for bygone ages and the tender remembrance of all those who are now no more what return then could i who am myself advancing towards old age make her for the many things i owe her one for which she would have thanked me this protest in favor of women and mothers but while a mother may greatly influence the poetic or artistic mind of her son for good she may also influence it for evil thus the characteristics of lord byron the waywardness of his impulses his defiance of restraint the bitterness of his hate and the precipitancy of his resentments were traceable in no small degree to the adverse influences exercised upon his mind from his birth by his capricious violent and headstrong mother she even taunted her son with his personal deformity and it was no unfrequent occurrence in the violent quarrels which occurred between them for her to take up the poker or tongs and hurl them after him as he fled from her presence it was this unnatural treatment that gave a morbid turn to byron's after-life and careworn unhappy great and yet weak as he was he carried about with him the mother's poison which he had sucked in his infancy in like manner though in a different way the character of mrs foote the actor's mother was curiously repeated in the life of her joyous jovial-hearted son though she had been heiress to a large fortune she soon spent it all and was at length imprisoned for debt in this condition she wrote to sam who had been allowing her a hundred a year out of the proceeds of his acting dear sam i am in prison for debt 
come and assist your loving mother e foot to which her son characteristically replied dear mother so am i which prevents his duty being paid to his loving mother by her affectionate son sam foot we have spoken of the mother of washington as an excellent woman of business and to possess such a quality as capacity for business is not only compatible with true womanliness but is in a measure essential to the comfort and well-being of every properly governed family habits of business do not relate to trade merely but apply to all the practical affairs of life to everything that has to be arranged or be organized to be provided for to be done and in all those respects the management of a family and of a household is as much a matter of business as the management of a shop or of a counting-house it requires method accuracy organization industry economy discipline tact knowledge and capacity for adapting means to ends all this is of the essence of business and hence business habits are as necessary to be cultivated by women who would succeed in the affairs of home in other words who would make home happy as by men in the affairs of trade of commerce or of manufacture the idea has however heretofore prevailed that women have no concern with such matters and that business habits and qualifications relate to men only take for instance the knowledge of figures mr bright has said of boys teach a boy arithmetic thoroughly and he is a made man and why because it teaches him method accuracy value proportions relations but how many girls are taught arithmetic well very few indeed and what is the consequence when the girl becomes a wife if she knows nothing of figures and is innocent of addition and multiplication she can keep no record of income and expenditure and there will probably be a succession of mistakes committed which may be prolific in domestic contention the woman not being up to her business that is the management of her domestic affairs in conformity with the simple principles of arithmetic will through sheer ignorance be apt to commit extra vagancies though unintentional which may be most injurious to her family peace and comfort method which is the soul of business is also of essential importance in the home work can only be got through by method method demands punctuality another eminently business quality the unpunctual woman like the unpunctual man occasions dislike because she consumes and wastes time and provokes the reflection that we are not of sufficient importance to make her more prompt to the business man time is money but to the business woman method is more it is peace comfort and domestic prosperity prudence is another important business quality in women as in men prudence is practical wisdom and comes of the cultivated judgment it has reference in all things to fitness to propriety judging wisely of the right thing to be done and the right way of doing it it calculates the means order time and method of doing prudence learns from experience quickened by knowledge for these among other reasons habits of business are necessary to be cultivated by all women in order to their being efficient helpers in the world's daily life and work furthermore to direct the power of the home aright women as the nurses trainers and educators of children need all the help and strength that mental culture can give them mere instinctive love is not sufficient instinct which preserves the lower creatures needs no training but human intelligence which is in constant request in a family needs to be educated the physical health of the rising generation is entrusted to woman by providence and it is in the physical nature that the moral and mental nature lies enshrined it is only by acting in accordance with the natural laws which before she can follow woman must needs understand that the blessings of health of body and health of mind and morals 
can be secured at home without a knowledge of such laws the mother's love too often finds its recompense only in a child's coffin that about one-third of all the children born in this country die under five years of age can only be attributable to ignorance of the natural laws ignorance of the human constitution and ignorance of the uses of pure air pure water and of the art of preparing and administering wholesome food there is no such mortality among the lower animals woman was not meant to be either an unthinking drudge or the merely pretty ornament of man's leisure she exists for herself as well as for others and the serious and responsible duties she is called upon to perform in life require the cultivated head as well as the sympathizing heart her highest mission is not to be fulfilled by the mastery of fleeting accomplishments on which so much useful time is now wasted for though accomplishments may enhance the charms of youth and beauty of themselves sufficiently charming they will be found of very little use in the affairs of real life the highest praise which the ancient romans could express of a noble matron was that she sat at home and spun in our own time it has been said that chemistry enough to keep the pot boiling and geography enough to know the different rooms in her house was science enough for any woman while byron whose sympathies for woman were of a very imperfect kind professed that he would limit her library to a bible and a cookery book but this view of woman's character and culture is as absurdly narrow and unintelligent on the one hand as the opposite view now so much in vogue is extravagant and unnatural on the other that woman ought to be educated so as to be as much as possible the equal of man undistinguishable from him except in sex equal to him in rights and votes and his competitor in all that makes life a fierce and selfish struggle for place and power and money speaking generally the training and discipline that are most suitable for the one sex in early life are also the most suitable for the other and the education and culture that fill the mind of the man will prove equally wholesome to the woman indeed all the arguments which have yet been advanced in favor of the higher education of men plead equally strongly in favor of the higher education of women in all the departments of home intelligence will add to woman's usefulness and efficiency it will give her thought and forethought enable her to anticipate and provide for the contingencies of life suggest improved methods of management and give her strength in every way in disciplined mental power she will find a stronger and safer protection against deception and imposture than in mere innocent and unsuspecting ignorance in moral and religious culture she will secure sources of influence more powerful and enduring than in physical attractions and in due self-reliance and self-dependence she will discover the truest sources of domestic comfort and happiness but while the mind and character of women ought to be cultivated with a view to their own well-being they ought not the less to be educated liberally with a view to the happiness of others men themselves cannot be sound in mind or morals if women be the reverse and if as we hold to be the case the moral condition of a people mainly depends upon the education of the home then the education of women is to be regarded as a matter of national importance not only does the moral character but the mental strength of man find its best safeguard and support in the moral purity and mental cultivation of woman but the more completely the powers of both are developed the more harmonious and well-ordered will society be the more safe and certain its elevation and advancement when about fifty years since the first napoleon said that the great want of france was mothers he meant in other words that the french people needed the education of homes presided over by good virtuous intelligent women indeed the first french revolution presented one of the most striking illustrations of the social mischiefs 
resulting from the neglect of the purifying influence of women when that great national outbreak occurred society was impenetrated with vice and profligacy morals religion virtue were swamped by sensualism the character of woman had become depraved conjugal fidelity was disregarded maternity was held in reproach family and home were alike corrupted domestic purity no longer bound society together france was motherless the children broke loose and the revolution burst forth amidst the yells and the fierce violence of women but the terrible lesson was disregarded and again and again france has grievously suffered from the want of that discipline obedience self-control and self-respect which can only be truly learnt at home it is said that the third napoleon attributed the recent powerlessness of france which left her helpless and bleeding at the feet of her conquerors to the frivolity and lack of principles of the people as well as to their love of pleasure which however it must be confessed he himself did not a little to foster it would thus seem that the discipline which france still needs to learn if she would be good and great is that indicated by the first napoleon home education by good mothers the influence of woman is the same everywhere her condition influences the morals manners and character of the people in all countries where she is debased society is debased where she is morally pure and enlightened society will be proportionately elevated hence to instruct woman is to instruct man to elevate her character is to raise his own to enlarge her mental freedom is to extend and secure that of the whole community for nations are but the outcomes of homes and peoples of mothers but while it is certain that the character of a nation will be elevated by the enlightenment and refinement of woman it is much more than doubtful whether any advantage is to be derived from her entering into competition with man in the rough work of business and politics women can no more do men's special work in the world than men can do women's and wherever woman has been withdrawn from her home and family to enter upon other work the result has been socially disastrous indeed the efforts of some of the best philanthropists have of late years been devoted to withdrawing women from toiling alongside of men in coal pits factories nail shops and brickyards it is still not uncommon in the north for the husbands to be idle at home while the mothers and daughters are working in the factory the result being in many cases an entire subversion of family order of domestic discipline and of home rule and for many years past in paris that state of things has been reached which some women desire to effect among ourselves the women there mainly attend to business while the men lounge about the boulevards but the result has only been homelessness degeneracy and family and social decay nor is there any reason to believe that the elevation and improvement of women are to be secured by investing them with political power there are however in these days many believers in the potentiality of votes who anticipate some indefinite good from the enfranchisement of women it is not necessary here to enter upon the discussion of this question but it may be sufficient to state that the power which women do not possess politically is far more than compensated by that which they exercise in private life by their training in the home those who whether as men or as women do all the manly as well as womanly work of the world the radical bentham has said that man even if he would cannot keep power from woman for that she already governs the world with the whole power of a despot though the power that she mainly governs by is love and to form the character of the whole human race is certainly a power far greater than that which women could ever hope to exercise 
as voters for members of parliament or even as lawmakers there is however one special department of woman's work demanding the earnest attention of all true female reformers though it is one which has hitherto been unaccountably neglected we mean the better economizing and preparation of human food the waste of which at present for want of the most ordinary culinary knowledge is little short of scandalous if that man is to be regarded as a benefactor of his species who makes two stalks of corn to grow where only one grew before not less is she to be regarded as a public benefactor who economizes and turns to the best practical account the food products of human skill and labor the improved use of even our existing supply would be equivalent to an immediate extension of the cultivatable acreage of our country not to speak of the increase in health economy and domestic comfort were our female reformers only to turn their energies in this direction with effect they would earn the gratitude of all households and be esteemed as among the greatest of all practical philanthropists End of chapter four home power read by john greenman This is Chapter Five of Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five Companionship and Example. Read by John Greenman. Keep good company, and you shall be of the number. George Herbert. The natural education of the home is prolonged far into life. Indeed, it never entirely ceases but the time arrives in the progress of years when the home ceases to exercise an exclusive influence on the formation of character and it is succeeded by the more artificial education of the school and the companionship of friends and comrades which continue to mould the character by the powerful influence of example men young and old but the young more than the old cannot help imitating those with whom they associate it was a saying of george herbert's mother intended for the guidance of her sons that as our bodies take a nourishment suitable to the meat on which we feed so do our souls as insensibly take in virtue or vice by the example or conversation of good or bad company indeed it is impossible that association with those about us should not produce a powerful influence in the formation of character for men are by nature imitators and all persons are more or less impressed by the speech the manners the gait the gestures and the very habits of thinking of their companions is example nothing said burke it is everything example is the school of mankind and they will learn at no other burke's grand motto which he wrote for the tablet of the marquis of rockingham is worth repeating it was remember resemble persevere imitation is for the most part so unconscious that its effects are almost unheeded but its influence is not the less permanent on that account it is only when an impressive nature is placed in contact with an impressionable one that the alteration in the character becomes recognizable yet even the weakest natures exercise some influence upon those about them the approximation of feeling thought and habit is constant and the action of example unceasing emerson has observed that even old couples or persons who have been housemates for a course of years grow gradually like each other so that if they were to live long enough we should scarcely be able to know them apart if this be true of the old how much more true is it of the young whose plastic natures are so much more soft and impressionable and ready to take the stamp of the life and conversation of those about them there has been observed sir charles bell in one of his letters a good deal said about education 
but they appear to me to put out of sight example which is all in all my best education was the example set me by my brothers there was in all the members of the family a reliance on self a true independence and by imitation i obtained it it is the nature of things that the circumstances which contribute to form the character should exercise their principal influence during the period of growth as years advance example and imitation become custom and gradually consolidate into habit which is of so much potency that almost before we know it we have in a measure yielded up to it our personal freedom it is related of plato that on one occasion he reproved a boy for playing at some foolish game thou reprovest me said the boy for a very little thing but custom replied plato is not a little thing bad custom consolidated into habit is such a tyrant that men sometimes cling to vices even while they curse them they have become the slaves of habits whose power they are impotent to resist hence locke has said that to create and maintain that vigor of mind which is able to contest the empire of habit may be regarded as one of the chief ends of moral discipline though much of the education of character by example is spontaneous and unconscious the young need not necessarily be the passive followers or imitators of those about them their own conduct far more than the conduct of their companions tends to fix the purpose and form the principles of their life each possesses in himself a power of will and of free activity which if courageously exercised will enable him to make his own individual selection of friends and associates it is only through weakness of purpose that young people as well as old become the slaves of their inclinations or give themselves up to a servile imitation of others it is a common saying that men are known by the company they keep the sober do not naturally associate with the drunken the refined with the coarse the decent with the dissolute to associate with depraved persons argues a low taste and vicious tendencies and to frequent their society leads to inevitable degradation of character the conversation of such persons says seneca is very injurious for even if it does not immediate harm it leaves its seeds in the mind and follows us when we have gone from the speakers a plague sure to spring up in future resurrection if young men are wisely influenced and directed and conscientiously exert their own free energies they will seek the society of those better than themselves and strive to imitate their example in companionship with the good growing natures will always find their best nourishment while companionship with the bad will only be fruitful in mischief there are persons whom to know is to love honor and admire and others whom to know is to shun and despise live with persons of elevated characters and you will feel lifted and lighted up in them live with wolves says the spanish proverb and you will learn to howl intercourse with even commonplace selfish persons may prove most injurious by inducing a dry dull reserved and selfish condition of mind more or less inimical to true manliness and breadth of character the mind soon learns to run in small grooves the heart grows narrow and contracted and the moral nature becomes weak irresolute and accommodating which is fatal to all generous ambition or real excellence on the other hand associations with persons wiser better and more experienced than ourselves is always more or less inspiring and invigorating they enchance our own knowledge of life we correct our estimates by theirs and become partners in their wisdom we enlarge our field of observation through their eyes 
profit by their experience and learn not only from what they have enjoyed but which is still more instructive from what they have suffered if they are stronger than ourselves we become participators in their strength hence companionship with the wise and energetic never fails to have a most valuable influence on the formation of character increasing our resources strengthening our resolves elevating our aims and enabling us to exercise greater dexterity and ability in our own affairs as well as more effective helpfulness of others i have often deeply regretted in myself says mrs Schemmelpenink, the great loss i have experienced from the solitude of my early habits we need no worse companion than our unregenerate selves and by living alone a person not only becomes wholly ignorant of the means of helping his fellow-creatures but is without the perception of those wants which most need help association with others when not on so large a scale as to make hours of retirement impossible may be considered as furnishing to an individual a rich multiplied experience and sympathy so drawn forth though unlike charity it begins abroad never fails to bring rich treasures home association with others is useful also in strengthening the character and in enabling us while we never lose sight of our main object to thread our way wisely and well an entirely new direction may be given to the life of a young man by a happy suggestion a timely hint or the kindly advice of an honest friend thus the life of henry martin the indian missionary seems to have been singularly influenced by a friendship which he formed when a boy at truro grammar school martin himself was of feeble frame and of a delicate nervous temperament wanting in animal spirits he took but little pleasure in school sports and being of a somewhat petulant temper the bigger boys took pleasure in provoking him and some of them in bullying him one of the bigger boys however conceiving a friendship for martin took him under his protection stood between him and his persecutors and not only fought his battles for him but helped him with his lessons though martin was rather a backward pupil his father was desirous that he should have the advantage of a college education and at the age of about fifteen he sent him to oxford to try for a corpus scholarship in which he failed he remained for two years more at the truro grammar school and then went to cambridge where he was entered at st john's college whom should he find already settled there as a student but his old companion of the truro grammar school their friendship was renewed and the elder student from that time forward acted as the mentor of the younger one martin was fitful in his studies excitable and petulant and occasionally subject to fits of almost uncontrollable rage his big friend on the other hand was a steady patient hard-working fellow and he never ceased to watch over to guide and to advise for good his irritable fellow-student he kept martin out of the way of evil company advised him to work hard not for the praise of men but for the glory of god and so successfully assisted him in his studies that at the following christmas examination he was the first of his year yet martin's kind friend and mentor never achieved any distinction himself he passed away into obscurity leading most probably a useful though unknown career his greatest wish in life having been to shape the character of his friend to inspire his soul with a love of truth and to prepare him for the noble work on which he shortly after entered of an indian missionary a somewhat similar incident is said to have occurred in the college career of dr paley when a student at christ's college cambridge he was distinguished for his shrewdness as well as his clumsiness and he was at the same time the favorite and the butt of his companions though his natural abilities were great he was thoughtless idle and a spendthrift 
and at the commencement of his third year he had made comparatively little progress after one of his usual night dissipations a friend stood by his bedside on the following morning paley said he i have not been able to sleep for thinking about you i have been thinking what a fool you are i have the means of dissipation and can afford to be idle you are poor and cannot afford it i can do nothing probably even were i to try you are capable of doing anything i have lain awake all night thinking about your folly and i have now come solemnly to warn you indeed if you persist in your indolence and go on in this way i must renounce your society altogether it is said that paley was so powerfully affected by this admonition that from that moment he became an altered man he formed an entirely new plan of life and diligently persevered in it he became one of the most industrious of students one by one he distanced his competitors and at the end of the year he came out senior wrangler what he afterwards accomplished as an author and a divine is sufficiently well known no one recognized more fully the influence of personal example on the young than did dr arnold it was the great lever with which he worked in striving to elevate the character of his school he made it his principal object first to put a right spirit into the leading boys by attracting their good and noble feelings and then to make them instrumental in propagating the same spirit among the rest by the influence of imitation example and admiration he endeavored to make all feel that they were fellow workers with himself and sharers with him in the moral responsibility for the good government of the place one of the first effects of this high-minded system of management was that it inspired the boys with strength and self-respect they felt that they were trusted there were of course wayward pupils at rugby as there are at all schools and these it was the master's duty to watch to prevent their bad example contaminating others on one occasion he said to an assistant master do you see those two boys walking together i never saw them together before you should make an especial point of observing the company they keep nothing so tells the changes in a boy's character dr arnold's own example was an inspiration as is that of every great teacher in his presence young men learned to respect themselves and out of the root of self-respect there grew up the manly virtues his very presence says his biographer seemed to create a new spring of health and vigor within them and to give to life an interest and elevation which remained with them long after they had left him and dwelt so habitually in their thoughts as a living image that when death had taken him away the bond appeared to be still unbroken and the sense of separation almost lost in the still deeper sense of a life and a union indestructible and thus it was that dr arnold trained a host of manly and noble characters who spread the influence of his example in all parts of the world so also was it said of dugald stewart that he breathed the love of virtue into whole congregations of pupils to me says the late lord cockburn his lectures were like the opening of the heavens i felt that i had a soul his noble views unfolded in glorious sentences elevated me into a higher world they changed my whole nature character tells in all conditions of life the man of good character in a workshop will give the tone to his fellows and elevate their entire aspirations thus franklin while a workman in london is said to have reformed the manners of an entire workshop so the man of bad character and debased energy will unconsciously lower and degrade his fellows captain john brown the marching on brown once said to emerson that for a settler in a new country one good believing man is worth a hundred nay worth a thousand men without character his example is so contagious that all other men are directly and beneficially influenced by him and he insensibly elevates and lifts them up to his own standard of energetic activity 
communication with the good is invariably productive of good the good character is diffusive in his influence i was common clay till roses were planted in me says some aromatic earth in the eastern fable like begets like and good makes good it is astonishing says canon mosley how much good goodness makes nothing that is good is alone nor anything bad it makes others good or others bad and that other and so on like a stone thrown into a pond which makes circles that make other wider ones and then others till the last reaches the shore almost all the good that is in the world has i suppose thus come down to us traditionally from remote times and often unknown centres of good so mr ruskin says that which is born of evil begets evil and that which is born of valor and honor teaches valor and honor hence it is that the life of every man is a daily inculcation of good or bad example to others the life of a good man is at the same time the most eloquent lesson of virtue and the most severe reproof of vice dr hooker describes the life of a pious clergyman of his acquaintance as visible rhetoric convincing even the most godless of the beauty of goodness and so the good george herbert said on entering upon the duties of his parish above all i will be sure to live well because the virtuous life of a clergyman is the most powerful eloquence to persuade all who see it to reverence and love and at least to desire to live like him and this i will do he added because i know we live in an age that hath more need of good examples than precepts it was a fine saying of the same good priest when reproached with doing an act of kindness to a poor man considered beneath the dignity of his office that the thought of such actions would prove music to him at midnight isaac walton speaks of a letter written by george herbert to bishop andrews about a holy life which the latter put into his bosom and after showing it to his scholars did always return it to the place where he first lodged it and continued so near his heart till the last day of his life great is the power of goodness to charm and to command the man inspired by it is the true kind of man drawing all hearts after him when general nicholson lay wounded on his deathbed before delhi he dictated this last message to his equally noble and gallant friend sir herbert edwards tell him said he i should have been a better man if i had continued to live with him and our heavy public duties had not prevented my seeing more of him privately i was always the better for a residence with him and his wife however short give my love to them both there are men in whose presence we feel as if we breathed a spiritual ozone refreshing and invigorating like inhaling mountain air or enjoying a bath of sunshine the power of sir thomas moore's gentle nature was so great that it subdued the bad at the same time that it inspired the good lord brooke said of his deceased friend sir philip sidney that his wit and understanding beat upon his heart to make himself and others not in word or opinion but in life and action good and great the very sight of a great and good man is often an inspiration to the young who cannot help admiring and loving the gentle the brave the truthful the magnanimous chateaubriand saw washington only once but it inspired him for life after describing the interview he says washington sank into the tomb before any little celebrity had attached to my name i passed before him as the most unknown of things he was in all his glory i in the depth of my obscurity my name probably dwelt not a whole day in his memory happy however was i that his looks were cast upon me 
i have felt warmed for it all the rest of my life there is a virtue even in the looks of a great man when niebuhr died his friend frederick perthes said of him what a contemporary the terror of all bad and base men the stay of all the sterling and honest the friend and helper of youth perthes said on another occasion it does a wrestling man good to be constantly surrounded by tried wrestlers evil thoughts are put to flight when the eye falls on the portrait of one in whose living presence one would have blushed to own them a catholic money-lender when about to cheat was wont to draw a veil over the picture of his favorite saint so hazlitt has said of the portrait of a beautiful female that it seemed as if an unhandsome action would be impossible in its presence it does one good to look upon his manly honest face said a poor german woman pointing to a portrait of the great reformer hung upon the wall of her humble dwelling even the portrait of a noble or a good man hung up in a room is companionship after a sort it gives us a closer personal interest in him looking at the features we feel as if we knew him better and were more nearly related to him it is a link that connects us with a higher and better nature than our own and though we may be far from reaching the standard of our hero we are to a certain extent sustained and fortified by his depicted presence constantly before us fox was proud to acknowledge how much he owed to the example and conversation of burke on one occasion he said of him that if he was to put all the political information he had gained from books all that he had learned from science or that the knowledge of the world and its affairs taught him into one scale and the improvement he had derived from mr burke's conversation and instruction into the other the latter would preponderate professor tyndale speaks of faraday's friendship as energy and inspiration after spending an evening with him he wrote his work excites admiration but contact with him warms and elevates the heart here surely is a strong man i love strength but let me not forget the example of its union with modesty tenderness and sweetness in the character of faraday even the gentlest natures are powerful to influence the character of others for good thus wordsworth seems to have been especially impressed by the character of his sister dorothy who exercised upon his mind and heart a lasting influence he describes her as the blessing of his boyhood as well as of his manhood though two years younger than himself her tenderness and sweetness contributed greatly to mould his nature and open his mind to the influences of poetry she gave me eyes she gave me ears and humble cares and delicate fears a heart the fountain of sweet tears and love and thought and joy thus the gentlest natures are enabled by the power of affection and intelligence to mould the characters of men destined to influence and elevate their race through all time sir william napier attributed the early direction of his character first to the impress made upon it by his mother when a boy and afterwards to the noble example of his commander sir john moore when a man moore early detected the qualities of the young officer and he was one of those to whom the general addressed the encouragement well done my majors at corinna writing home to his mother and describing the little court by which moore was surrounded he wrote where shall we find such a king it was to his personal affection for his chief that the world is mainly indebted to sir william napier for his great book the history of the peninsular war but he was stimulated to write the book by the advice of another friend the late lord langdale while one day walking with him across the fields on which belgravia is now built it was lord langdale he says who first kindled the fire within me and of sir william napier himself his biographer truly says that 
no thinking person could ever come in contact with him without being strongly impressed with the genius of the man the career of the late dr marshall hall was a lifelong illustration of the influence of character in forming character many eminent men still living trace their success in life to his suggestions and assistance without which several valuable lines of study and investigation might not have been entered on at least at so early a period he would say to young men about him take up a subject and pursue it well and you cannot fail to succeed and often he would throw out a new idea to a young friend saying i make you a present of it there is fortune in it if you pursue it with energy energy of character has always a power to evoke energy in others it acts through sympathy one of the most influential human agencies the zealous energetic man unconsciously carries others along with him his example is contagious and compels imitation he exercises a sort of electric power which sends a thrill through every fibre flows into the nature of those about him and makes them give out sparks of fire dr arnold's biographer speaking of the power of this kind exercised by him over young men says it was not so much an enthusiastic admiration for true genius or learning or eloquence which stirred within them it was a sympathetic thrill caught from a spirit that was earnestly at work in the world whose work was healthy sustained and constantly carried forward in the fear of god a work that was founded on a deep sense of its duty and its value such a power exercised by men of genius evokes courage enthusiasm and devotion it is this intense admiration for individuals such as one cannot conceive entertained for a multitude which has in all times produced heroes and martyrs it is thus that the mastery of character makes itself felt it acts by inspiration quickening and vivifying the natures subject to its influence great minds are rich in radiating force not only exerting power but communicating and even creating it thus dante raised and drew after him a host of great spirits petrarch boccaccio tasso and many more from him milton learned to bear the stings of evil tongues and the contumely of evil days and long years after byron thinking of dante under the pine trees of ravenna was incited to attune his harp to loftier strains than he had ever attempted before dante inspired the greatest painters of italy giotto organa michelangelo and raphael so ariosto and titian mutually inspired one another and lighted up each other's glory great and good men draw others after them exciting the spontaneous admiration of mankind this admiration of noble character elevates the mind and tends to redeem it from the bondage of self one of the greatest stumbling blocks to moral improvement the recollection of men who have signalized themselves by great thoughts or great deeds seems as if to create for the time a purer atmosphere around us and we feel as if our aims and purposes were unconsciously elevated tell me whom you admire said saint beuve and i will tell you what you are at least as regards your talents tastes and character do you admire mean men your own nature is mean do you admire rich men you are of the earth earthy do you admire men of title you are a toad-eater or a tuft hunter do you admire honest brave and manly men you are yourself an honest brave and manly spirit it was a fine trait in the character of prince albert that he was always so ready to express generous admiration of the good deeds of others he had the greatest delight says the ablest delineator of his character in anybody else saying a fine saying or doing a great deed 
he would rejoice over it and talk about it for days and whether it was a thing nobly said or done by a little child or by a veteran statesman it gave him equal pleasure he delighted in humanity doing well on any occasion and in any manner no quality said dr johnson will get a man more friends than a sincere admiration of the qualities of others it indicates generosity of nature frankness cordiality and cheerful recognition of merit it was to the sincere it might almost be said the reverential admiration of johnson by boswell that we owe one of the best biographies ever written one is disposed to think that there must have been some genuine good qualities in boswell to have been attracted by such a man as johnson and to have kept faithful to his worship in spite of rebuffs and snubbings innumerable macaulay speaks of boswell as an altogether contemptible person as a coxcomb and a bore weak vain pushing curious garrulous and without wit humor or eloquence but carlyle is doubtless more just in his characterization of the biographer in whom vain and foolish though he was in many respects he sees a man penetrated by the old reverent feeling of disciplineship full of love and admiration for true wisdom and excellence without such qualities carlyle insists the life of johnson never could have been written boswell wrote a good book he says because he had a heart and an eye to discern wisdom and an utterance to render it forth because of his free insight his lively talent and above all of his love and childlike open-mindedness most young men of generous mind have their heroes especially if they be book readers thus alan cunningham when a mason's apprentice in knightsdale walked all the way to edinburgh for the sole purpose of seeing sir walter scott as he passed along the street we unconsciously admire the enthusiasm of the lad and respect the impulse which impelled him to make the journey it is related of sir joshua reynolds that when a boy of ten he thrust his hand through the intervening rows of people to touch the pope as if there were a sort of virtue in the contact at a much later period the painter hayden was proud to see and to touch reynolds when on a visit to his native place rogers the poet used to tell of his ardent desire when a boy to see dr johnson but when his hand was on the knocker of the house in bolt court his courage failed him and he turned away so the late isaac disraeli when a youth called at bolt court for the same purpose and though he had the courage to knock to his dismay he was informed by the servant that the great lexicographer had breathed his last only a few hours before on the contrary small and ungenerous minds cannot admire heartily to their own great misfortune they cannot recognize much less reverence great men and great things the mean nature admires meanly the toad's highest idea of beauty is his toadess the small snob's highest idea of manhood is the great snob the slave dealer values a man according to his muscles when a guinea trader was told by sir godfrey kneller in the presence of pope that he saw before him two of the greatest men in the world he replied i don't know how great you may be but i don't like your looks i have often bought a man much better than both of you together all bones and muscles for ten guineas although rochefoucault in one of his maxims says that there is something that is not altogether disagreeable to us in the misfortunes of even our best friends it is only the small and essentially mean nature that finds pleasure in the disappointment and annoyance at the success of others there are unhappily for themselves persons so constituted that they have not the heart to be generous the most disagreeable of all people are those who sit in the seat of the scorner persons of this sort often come to regard the success of others even in a good work as a kind of 
personal offence they cannot bear to hear another praised especially if he belongs to their own art or calling or profession they will pardon a man's failures but cannot forgive his doing a thing better than they can do and where they have themselves failed they are found to be the most merciless of detractors the mean mind occupies itself with sneering copying and fault-finding and is ready to scoff at everything but impudent effrontery or successful vice the greatest consolation of such persons are the defects of men of character if the wise erred not says george herbert it would go hard with fools yet though wise men may learn of fools by avoiding their errors fools rarely profit by the example which wise men set them a german writer has said that it is a miserable temper that cares only to discover the blemishes in the character of great men or great periods let us rather judge them with the charity of bolingbroke who when reminded of one of the alleged weaknesses of marlborough observed he was so great a man that i forgot he had that defect admiration of great men living or dead naturally evokes imitation of them in a greater or less degree while a mere youth the mind of themistocles was fired by the great deeds of his contemporaries and he longed to distinguish himself in the service of his country when the battle of marathon had been fought he fell into a state of melancholy and when asked by his friends as to the cause he replied that the trophies of miltiades would not suffer him to sleep a few years later we find him at the head of the athenian army defeating the persian fleet of xerxes in the battle of artemisium and salamis his country gratefully acknowledging that it had been saved through his wisdom and valor it is related of thucydides that when a boy he burst into tears on hearing herodotus read his history and the impression made upon his mind was such as to determine the bent of his own genius and demosthenes was so fired on one occasion by the eloquence of callistratus that the ambition was roused within him of becoming an orator himself yet demosthenes was physically weak had a feeble voice indistinct articulation and shortness of breath defects which he was only enabled to overcome by diligent study and invincible determination but with all his practice he never became a ready speaker all his orations especially the most famous of them exhibiting indications of careful elaboration the art and industry of the orator being visible in almost every sentence similar illustrations of character imitating character and moulding itself by the style and manner of genius of great men are to be found pervading all history warriors statesmen orators patriots poets and artists all have been more or less unconsciously nurtured by the lives and actions of others living before them or presented for their imitation great men have evoked the admiration of kings popes and emperors francis de medici never spoke to michael angelo without uncovering and julius the third made him sit by his side while a dozen cardinals were standing charles v made way for titian and one day when the brush dropped from the painter's hand charles stooped and picked it up saying you deserve to be served by an emperor leo the tenth threatened with excommunication whoever should print and sell the poems of ariosto without the author's consent the same pope attended the deathbed of raphael as francis i did that of leonardo da vinci though haydn once archly observed that he was loved and esteemed by everybody except professors of music yet all the greatest musicians were unusually ready to recognize each other's greatness haydn himself seems to have been entirely free from petty jealousy his admiration of the famous porpora was such that he resolved to gain admission to his house and serve him as a valet having made the acquaintance of the family with whom porpora lived he was allowed to officiate in that capacity 
early each morning he took care to brush the veteran's coat polish his shoes and put his rusty wig in order at first porpora growled at the intruder but his asperity soon softened and eventually melted into affection he quickly discovered his valet's genius and by his instructions directed it into the line in which haydn eventually acquired so much distinction haydn himself was enthusiastic in his admiration of handel he is the father of us all he said on one occasion scarlatti followed handel in admiration all over italy and when his name was mentioned he crossed himself in token veneration mozart's recognition of the great composer was not less hearty when he chooses said he handel strikes the thunderbolt beethoven hailed him as the monarch of the musical kingdom when beethoven was dying one of his friends sent him a present of handel's works in forty volumes they were brought into his chamber and gazing on them with reanimated eye he exclaimed pointing at them with his finger there there is the truth haydn not only recognized the genius of the great men who had passed away but of his young contemporaries mozart and beethoven small men may be envious of their fellows but really great men seek out and love each other of mozart haydn wrote i only wish i could impress on every friend of music and on great men in particular the same depth of musical sympathy and profound appreciation of mozart's inimitable music that i myself feel and enjoy then nations would vie with each other to possess such a jewel within their frontiers prague ought not only to strive to retain this precious man but also to remunerate him for without this the history of a great genius is sad indeed it enrages me to think that the unparalleled mozart is not yet engaged by some imperial or royal court forgive my excitement but i love the man so dearly mozart was equally generous in his recognition of the merits of haydn sir said he to a critic speaking of the latter if you and i were both melted down together we should not furnish material for one haydn and when mozart first heard beethoven he observed listen to that young man be assured that he will yet make a great name in the world buffon set newton above all other philosophers and admired him so highly that he had always his portrait before him while he sat at work so schiller looked up to shakespeare whom he studied reverently and zealously for years until he became capable of comprehending nature at first hand and then his admiration became even more ardent than before pitt was canning's master and hero whom he followed and admired with attachment and devotion to one man while he lived said canning i was devoted with all my heart and all my soul since the death of mr pitt i acknowledge no leader my political allegiance lies buried in his grave the first acquaintance with a great work of art has usually proved an important event in every young artist's life when correggio first gazed on raphael's saint cecilia he felt himself an awakened power and exclaimed and i too am a painter so constable used to look back on his first sight of claude's picture of hagar as forming an epoch in his career sir george beaumont's admiration of the same picture was such that he always took it with him in his carriage when he travelled from home the example set by the great and good do not die they continue to live and speak to all the generations that succeed them it was very impressively observed by mr disraeli in the house of commons shortly after the death of mr cobden there is this consolation remaining to us when we remember our unequalled and irreparable losses that those great men are not altogether lost to us that their words will often be quoted in this house that their examples will often be referred to and appealed to and that even their expressions 
will form part of our discussions and debates there are now i may say some members of parliament who though they may not be present are still members of this house who are independent of dissolutions of caprices of constituencies and even of the course of time i think that mr cobden was one of those men it is the great lesson of biography to teach what man can be and can do at his best it may thus give each man renewed strength and confidence the humblest in sight of even the greatest may admire and hope and take courage these great brothers of ours in blood and lineage who live a universal life still speak to us from their graves and beckon us on in the paths which they have trod their example is still with us to guide to influence and to direct us for nobility of character is a perpetual bequest living from age to age and constantly tending to reproduce its like the sage say the chinese is the instructor of a hundred ages when the manners of lu are heard of the stupid become intelligent and the wavering determined thus the acted life of a good man continues to be a gospel of freedom and emancipation to all who succeed him to live in hearts we leave behind is not to die the golden words that good men have uttered the examples they have set live through all time they pass into the thoughts and hearts of their successors help them on the road of life and often console them in the hour of death and the most miserable or most painful of deaths said henry martin the commonwealth man who died in prison is as nothing compared with the memory of a well-spent life and great alone is he who has earned the glorious privilege of bequeathing such a lesson and example to his successors end of chapter five companionship and example read by john greenman this is section six of happy homes and the hearts that make them by samuel smiles this librivox recording is in the public domain happy homes and the hearts that make them chapter six work read by john greenman lost yesterday somewhere between sunrise and sunset two golden hours each set with sixty diamond minutes no reward is offered for they are gone for ever horace mann let every man be occupied and occupied in the highest employment of which his nature is capable and die with the consciousness that he has done his best sydney smith work is one of the best educators of practical character it evokes and disciplines obedience self-control attention application and perseverance giving a man deftness and skill in his special calling and aptitude and dexterity in dealing with affairs of ordinary life work is the law of our being the living principle that carries men and nations onward the greater number of men have to work with their hands as a matter of necessity in order to live but all must work in one way or another if they would enjoy life as it ought to be enjoyed labor may be a burden and a chastisement but it is also an honor and a glory without it nothing can be accomplished all that is great in man comes through work and civilization is its product were labor abolished the race of adam would be at once stricken by moral death it is idleness that is the curse of man not labor 
idleness eats the heart out of men as of nations and consumes them as rust does iron in describing the earlier social condition of italy when the ordinary occupations of rural life were considered compatible with the highest civic dignity pliny speaks of the triumphant generals and their men returning contentedly to the plough in those days the lands were tilled by the hands even of generals the soil exulting beneath the ploughshare crowned with laurels and guided by a husbandman graced with triumphs it was only after slaves became extensively employed in all departments of industry that labor came to be regarded as dishonorable and servile and so soon as indolence and luxury became the characteristics of the ruling classes of rome the downfall of the empire sooner or later was inevitable there is perhaps no tendency of our nature that has to be more carefully guarded against than indolence when mr gurney asked an intelligent foreigner who had travelled over the greater part of the world whether he had observed any one quality which more than another could be regarded as a universal characteristic of our species his answer was in broken english me tink dat all men love lazy it is characteristic of the savage as of the despot it is natural to men to endeavor to enjoy the products of labor without its toils indeed so universal is this desire that james mill has argued that it was to prevent its indulgence at the expense of society at large that the expedient of government was originally invented indolence is equally degrading to individuals as to nations sloth never made its marks in the world and never will sloth never climbed a hill nor overcame a difficulty that it could avoid indolence always failed in life and always will it is in the nature of things that it should not succeed in anything it is a burden an encumbrance and a nuisance always useless complaining melancholy and miserable burton in his quaint and curious book the only one johnson says that ever took him out of bed two hours sooner than he wished to rise describes the causes of melancholy as hinging mainly on idleness idleness he says is the bane of body and mind the nurse of naughtiness the chief mother of all mischief one of the seven deadly sins the devil's cushion his pillow and chief reposal an idle dog will be mangy and how shall an idle person escape idleness of the mind is much worse than that of the body wit without employment is a disease the rust of the soul a plague a hell itself as in a standing pool worms and filthy creepers increase so do evil and corrupt thoughts in an idle person the soul is contaminated thus much i dare boldly say he or she that is idle be they of what condition they will never so rich so well allied fortunate happy let them have all things in abundance and felicity that heart can wish and desire all contentment so long as he or she or they are idle they shall never be pleased never well in body or mind but weary still sickly still vexed still loathing still weeping sighing grieving suspecting offended with the world with every object wishing themselves gone or dead or else carried away with some foolish fantasy or other the indolent however are not wholly indolent though the body may shirk labor the brain is not idle if it do not grow corn it will grow thistles which will be found springing up all along the idle man's course in life 
the ghosts of indolence rise up in the dark ever staring the recreant in the face and tormenting him the gods are just and of our pleasant vices make instruments to scourge us dost thou love life said franklin then do not squander time for that is the stuff it is made of true happiness is never found in torpor of the faculties but in their action and useful employment it is indolence that exhausts not action in which there is life health and pleasure the spirits may be exhausted and wearied by employment but they are utterly wasted by idleness hence a wise physician was accustomed to regard occupation as one of his most valuable remedial measures nothing is so injurious said dr marshall hall as unoccupied time an archbishop of mayence used to say that the human heart is like a millstone if you put wheat under it it grinds the wheat into flour if you put no wheat it grinds on but then tis itself it wears away it has been truly said that to desire to possess without being burdened with the trouble of acquiring is as much a sign of weakness as to recognize that everything worth having is only to be got by paying its price is the prime secret of practical strength even leisure cannot be enjoyed unless it is won by effort if it have not been earned by work the price has not been paid for it there must be work before and work behind with leisure to fall back upon but the leisure without the work can no more be enjoyed than a surfeit life must needs be disgusting alike to the idle rich man as to the idle poor man who has no work to do or having work will not do it the words found tattooed on the right arm of a sentimental beggar of forty undergoing his eighth imprisonment in the jail of bourges in france might be adopted as the motto of all idlers the past has deceived me the present torments me the future terrifies me the duty of industry applies to all classes and conditions of society all have their work to do in their respective conditions of life the rich as well as the poor the gentleman by birth and education however richly he may be endowed with worldly possessions cannot but feel that he is in duty bound to contribute his quota of endeavor towards the general well-being in which he shares he cannot be satisfied with being fed clad and maintained by the labor of others without making some suitable return to the society that upholds him an honest high-minded man would revolt at the idea of sitting down to and enjoying a feast and then going away without paying his share of the reckoning to be idle and useless is neither an honor nor a privilege and though persons of small natures may be content merely to consume men of average endowment of manly aspirations and of honest purpose will feel such a condition to be incompatible with real honor and true dignity i don't believe said lord stanley at glasgow that an unemployed man however amiable and otherwise respectable ever was or ever can be really happy as work is our life show me what you can do and i will show you what you are i have spoken of love of one's work as the best preventive of merely low and vicious tastes i will go further and say that it is the best preservative against petty anxieties and the annoyances that arise out of indulged self-love men have thought before now that they could take refuge from trouble and vexation by sheltering themselves as it were in a world of their own the experiment has often been tried and always with one result you cannot escape from anxiety and labor it is the destiny of humanity those who shirk from facing trouble find that trouble comes to them 
the indolent may contrive that he shall have less than his share of the world's work to do but nature proportioning the instinct to the work contrives that the little shall be much and hard to him the man who has only himself to please finds sooner or later and probably sooner than later that he has got a very hard master and the excessive weakness which shrinks from responsibility has its own punishment too for where great interests are excluded little matters become great and the same wear and tear of mind that might have been at least usefully and healthfully expended on the real business of life is often wasted in petty and imaginary vexations such as breed and multiply in the unoccupied brain even on the lowest ground that of personal enjoyment constant useful occupation is necessary he who labors not cannot enjoy the reward of labor we sleep sound said sir walter scott and our waking hours are happy when they are employed and a little sense of toil is necessary to the enjoyment of leisure even when earned by study and sanctioned by the discharge of duty it is true there are men who die of overwork but many more die of selfishness indulgence and idleness where men break down by overwork it is most commonly from want of duly ordering their lives and neglect of the ordinary conditions of physical health lord stanley was probably right when he said in his address to the glasgow students above mentioned that he doubted whether hard work steadily and regularly carried on ever yet hurt anybody then again length of years is no proper test of length of life a man's life is to be measured by what he does in it and what he feels in it the more useful work the man does the more he thinks and feels the more he readily lives the idle useless man no matter what extent his life may be prolonged merely vegetates the early teachers of christianity ennobled the lot of toil by their example he that will not work said st paul neither shall he eat and he glorified himself in that he had labored with his hands and had not been chargeable to any man when st boniface landed in britain he came with a gospel in one hand and a carpenter's rule in the other and from england he afterwards passed over into germany carrying thither the art of building luther also in the midst of a multitude of other employments worked diligently for a living earning his bread by gardening building turning and even clock-making it was characteristic of napoleon when visiting a work of mechanical excellence to pay great respect to the inventor and on taking his leave to salute him with a low bow once at st helena when walking with mrs malcolm some servants came along carrying a load the lady in an angry tone ordered them out of the way on which napoleon interposed saying respect the burden madam even the drudgery of the general humblest laborer contributes toward the well-being of society and it was a wise saying of a chinese emperor that if there was a man who did not work or a woman that was idle somebody must suffer cold or hunger in the empire the habit of constant useful occupation is as essential for the happiness and well-being of women as of man without it women are apt to sink into a state of listless ennui and uselessness accompanied by sick headaches and attacks of nerves caroline perthes carefully warned her married daughter louisa to beware of giving away to such listlessness i myself she said when the children are gone out for a half holiday sometimes feel as stupid and dull as an owl by daylight but one must not yield to this which happens more or less to all young wives the best relief is work engaged in with interest and diligence work then 
constantly and diligently at something or other for idleness is the devil's snare for small and great as your grandfather says and he says true constant useful occupation is thus wholesome not only for the body but for the mind while the slothful man drags himself indolently through life and the better part of his nature sleeps a deep sleep if not morally and spiritually dead the energetic man is a source of activity and enjoyment to all who come within reach of his influence even an ordinary drudgery is better than idleness fuller says of sir francis drake who was early sent to sea and kept close to his work by his master that such pains and patience in his youth knit the joints of his soul and made them more solid and compact schiller used to say that he considered it a great advantage to be employed in the discharge of some daily mechanical duty some regular routine of work that rendered steady application necessary thousands can bear testimony to the truth of the saying of greuze the french painter that work is one of the great secrets of happiness cossabon was once induced by the entreaties of his friends to take a few days entire rest but he returned to his work with the remark that it was easier to bear illness doing something than doing nothing when charles lamb was released for life from his daily drudgery of desk work at the india office he felt himself the happiest of men i would not go back to my prison he said to a friend ten years longer for ten thousand pounds he also wrote in the same ecstatic mood to bernard barton i have scarce steadiness of head to compose a letter he said i am free free as air i will live another fifty years would i could sell you some of my leisure positively the best thing a man can do is nothing and next to that perhaps good works two years two long and tedious years passed and charles lamb's feelings had undergone an entire change he now discovered that official even humdrum work the appointed round the daily task had been good for him though he knew it not time had formerly been his friend it had now become his enemy to bernard barton he again wrote i assure you no work is worse than overwork the mind preys on itself the most unwholesome of food i have ceased to care for almost anything never did the waters of heaven pour down upon a forlorner head what i can do and overdo is to walk i am a sanguinary murderer of time but the oracle is silent no man could be more sensible of the practical importance of industry than sir walter scott who was himself one of the most laborious and indefatigable of men indeed lockhart says of him that taking all ages and countries together the rare example of tireless energy in union with serene self-possession of mind and matter such as scott's must be sought for in the role of great sovereigns or great captains rather than in that of literary genius scott himself was most anxious to impress upon the minds of his own children the importance of industry as a means of usefulness and happiness in the world to his son charles when at school he wrote i cannot too much impress upon your mind that labor is the condition which god has imposed on us in every station of life there is nothing worth having that can be had without it from the bread which the peasant wins with the sweat of his brow to the sports by which the rich man must get rid of his ennui as for knowledge it can no more be planted in the human mind without labor than a field of wheat can be produced without the previous use of a plough there is indeed the great difference that chance or circumstances may so cause it that another shall reap what the farmer sows 
but no man can be deprived whether by accident or misfortune of the fruits of his own studies and liberal and extended acquisitions of knowledge which he makes are all for his own use labor therefore my dear boy and improve the time in youth our steps are light and our minds are ductile and knowledge is easily laid up but if we neglect our spring our summers will be useless and contemptible our harvest will be chaff and the winter of our old age unrespected and desolate southey was as laborious a worker as scott indeed work might almost be said to form part of his religion he was only nineteen when he wrote these words nineteen years certainly a fourth part of my life and yet i have been of no service to society the clown who scares crows for tuppence a day is a more useful man he preserves the bread which i eat in idleness and yet southey had not been idle as a boy on the contrary he had been a most diligent student he had not only read largely in english literature but was well acquainted through translations with tasso ariosto homer and ovid he felt however as if his life had been purposeless and he determined to do something he began and from that time forward he pursued an unremitting career of literary labor down to the close of his life daily progressing in learning to use his own words not so learned as he is poor not so poor as proud not so proud as happy the memoirs of men who have thrown their opportunities away would constitute a painful but memorable volume for the world's instruction no strong man in good health says ebenezer elliott can be neglected if he be true to himself for the benefit of the young i wish we had a correct account of the number of persons who fail of success in a thousand who resolutely strive to do well i do not think it exceeds one per cent men grudge success but it is only the last term of what looked like a series of failures they failed at first then again and again but at last their difficulties vanished and success was achieved the desire to possess without being burdened with the trouble of acquiring is a great sign of weakness and laziness everything that is worth enjoying or possessing can only be got by the pleasure of working this is the great secret of practical strength one may very distinctly prefer industry to indolence the healthful exercise of all one's faculties to allowing them to rest unused in drowsy torpor in the long run we shall probably find that the exercise of the faculties has of itself been the source of a more genuine happiness than has followed the actual attainment of what the exercise was directed to procure the weakest living creature says carlyle by concentrating his powers on a single object can accomplish something whereas the strongest by dispersing his over many may fail to accomplish anything have we difficulties to contend with then work through them no exorcism charms like labor idleness of mind and body resembles rust it wears more than work i would rather work out than rust out said a noble worker schiller said that he found the greatest happiness in life to consist in the performance of some mechanical duty it is because application to business teaches method most effectually that it is so useful as an educator of character the highest working qualities are best trained by active and sympathetic contact with others in the affairs of daily life it does not matter whether the business relates to the management of a household or of a nation indeed as we have endeavored to show in a preceding chapter the able housewife must necessarily be an efficient woman of business 
she must regulate and control the details of her home keep her expenditure within her means arrange everything according to plan and system and wisely manage and govern those subject to her rule efficient domestic management implies industry application method moral discipline forethought prudence practical ability insight into character and power of organization all of which are required in the efficient management of business of whatever sort business qualities have indeed a very large field of action they mean aptitude for affairs competency to deal successfully with the practical work of life whether the spur of action lie in domestic management in the conduct of a profession in trade or commerce in social organization or in political government and the training which gives efficiency in dealing with these various affairs is of all others the most useful in practical life moreover it is the best discipline of character for it involves the exercise of diligence attention self-denial judgment tact knowledge of and sympathy with others like other great captains wellington had an almost boundless capacity for work he drew up the heads of a dublin police bill being still the secretary for ireland when tossing off the mouth of the mondego with juno and the french army waiting for him on the shore so caesar another of the greatest commanders is said to have written an essay on latin rhetoric while crossing the alps at the head of his army and wallenstein when at the head of sixty thousand men and in the midst of a campaign with the enemy before him dictated from headquarters the medical treatment of his poultry yard washington also was an indefatigable man of business from his boyhood he diligently trained himself in habits of application of study and of methodical work his manuscript school books which are still preserved show that as early as the age of thirteen he occupied himself voluntarily in copying out such things as forms of receipts notes of hand bills of exchange bonds indentures leases land warrants and other dry documents all written out with great care and the habits which he thus early acquired were in a great measure the foundation of those admirable business qualities which he afterwards successfully brought to bear in the affairs of government most of the early english writers were men of affairs trained to business for no literary class as yet existed excepting it might be the priesthood chaucer the father of english poetry was first a soldier and afterwards a comptroller of petty customs the office was no sinecure either for he had to write up all the records with his own hand and when he had done his reckonings at the custom-house he returned with delight to his favorite studies at home poring over his books until his eyes were dazed and dull indeed habits of business instead of unfitting a cultivated mind for scientific or literary pursuits are often the best training for them voltaire insisted with truth that the real spirit of business and literature are the same the perfection of each being the union of energy and thoughtfulness of cultivated intelligence and practical wisdom of the active and contemplative essence a union commended by lord bacon as the concentrated excellence of man's nature it has been said that even the man of genius can write nothing worth reading in relation to human affairs unless he has been in some way or other connected with the serious everyday business of life hence it has happened that many of the best books extant have been written by men of business with whom literature was a pastime rather than a profession gifford 
the editor of the quarterly who knew the drudgery of writing for a living once observed that a single hour of composition won from the business of the day is worth more than the whole day's toil of him who works at the trade of literature in the one case the spirit comes joyfully to refresh itself like a heart to the water brooks in the other it pursues its miserable way panting and jaded with the dogs and hunger of necessity behind samuel richardson successfully combined literature with business writing his novels in his back shop in salisbury court fleet street and selling them over the counter in his front shop william hutton of birmingham also successfully combined the occupations of bookselling and authorship he says in his autobiography that a man may live half a century and not be acquainted with his own character he did not know that he was an antiquarian until the world informed him of it from having read his history of birmingham and then he said he could see it himself benjamin franklin was alike eminent as a printer and bookseller an author a philosopher and a statesman montaigne has said of true philosophers that if they were great in science they were yet much greater in action and whenever they have been put upon the proof they have been seen to fly to so high a pitch as made it very well appear their souls were strangely elevated and enriched with the knowledge of things thales speaking against the pains and care men put themselves to to become rich was answered by one in the company that he did like the fox who found fault with what he could not obtain thereupon thales had a mind for the jest's sake to show them the contrary and having upon this occasion for once made a master of all his wits wholly to employ them in the service of profit he set a traffic on foot which in one year brought him in so great riches that the most experienced in that trade could hardly in their whole lives with all their industry have raked so much together niebuhr the historian was distinguished for his energy and success as a man of business he proved so efficient as secretary and accountant to the african consulate to which he had been appointed by the danish government that he was afterwards selected as one of the commissioners to manage the national finances and he quitted that office to undertake the joint directorship of a bank at berlin it was in the midst of his business occupations that he found time to study roman history to master the arabic russian and other slovakian languages and to build up the great reputation as an author by which he is now chiefly remembered men of trained working faculty so contract their habit of labor that idleness becomes intolerable to them and when driven by circumstances from their own special line of occupation they find refuge in other pursuits the diligent man is quick to find employment for his leisure and he is able to make leisure when the idle man finds none he hath no leisure says george herbert who useth it not the most active or busy man that has been or can be says bacon has many vacant times of leisure except he be either tedious and of no dispatch or lightly and unworthily ambitious to meddle with things that may be better done by others thus many great things have been done during such vacant times of leisure by men to whom industry had become a second nature and who found it easier to work than to be idle one of the most able and laborious of our recent statesmen with whom literature was a hobby as well as a pursuit was the late sir george cornwall lewis he was an excellent man of business diligent exact and painstaking he filled by turns the offices of president of the poor law board the machinery of which he created chancellor of the exchequer home secretary and secretary at war in each he achieved the reputation of a thoroughly successful administrator in the intervals of his official labors 
he occupied himself with inquiries into a wide range of subjects history politics philology anthropology and antiquarianism his works on the astronomy of the ancients and essays on the formation of the romantic languages might have been written by the profoundest of german scholars he took especial delight in pursuing the abstruser branches of learning and found in them his chief pleasure and recreation lord palmerston sometimes remonstrated with him telling him he was taking too much out of himself by laying aside official papers after office hours in order to study books palmerston himself declaring that he had no time to read books that the reading of manuscript was quite enough for him doubtless sir george lewis rode his hobby too hard and for his devotion to study his useful life would probably have been prolonged whether in or out of office he read wrote and studied he relinquished the editorship of the edinburgh review to become chancellor of the exchequer and when no longer occupied in preparing budgets he proceeded to copy out a mass of greek manuscripts at the british museum he took particular delight in pursuing any difficult inquiry in classical antiquity one of the odd subjects with which he occupied himself was an examination into the truth of reported cases of longevity which according to his custom he doubted or disbelieved this subject was uppermost in his mind while pursuing his canvass of herefordshire in 1852 on applying to a voter one day for his support he was met by a decided refusal i am sorry was the candidate's reply that you can't give me your vote but perhaps you can tell me whether anybody in your parish has died at an extraordinary age a fair measure of work is good for mind as well as body man is an intelligence sustained and preserved by bodily organs and their active exercise is necessary to the enjoyment of health it is not work but overwork that is hurtful and it is not hard work that is injurious so much as monotonous work fagging work hopeless work all hopeful work is healthful and to be usefully and hopefully employed is one of the great secrets of happiness brain work in moderation is no more wearing than any other kind of work duly regulated it is as promotive of health as bodily exercise and where due attention is paid to the physical system it seems difficult to put more upon a man than he can bear merely to eat and drink and sleep one's way idly through life is vastly more injurious the wear and tear of rust is even faster than the tear and wear of work but overwork is always bad economy it is in fact great waste especially if conjoined with worry indeed worry kills far more than work does it frets it excites it consumes the body as sand and grit which occasion excessive friction wear out the wheels of a machine overwork and worry have both to be guarded against for over brain work is strain work and it is exhausting and destructive according as it is in excess of nature and the brain worker may exhaust and overbalance his mind by excess just as the athlete may overstrain his muscles and break his back by attempting feats beyond the strength of his physical system end of chapter 6 work read by john greenman This is section 7 of Happy Homes and the Hearts that Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Helping Oneself. The worth of a state, in the long run, is the worth of the individuals composing it. J. S. Mill. 
we put too much faith in systems and look too little to men b disraeli heaven helps those who help themselves is a well-tried maxim embodying a small compass with the results of vast human experience the spirit of self-help is the root of all genuine growth in the individual and exhibited in the lives of many it constitutes the true source of national vigor and strength help from without is often enfeebling in its effects but help from within invariably invigorates whatever is done for men or classes to a certain extent takes away the stimulus and necessity of doing for themselves and where men are subjected to over guidance and over government the inevitable tendency is to render them comparatively helpless even the best institutions can give a man no active help perhaps the most they can do is to leave him free to develop himself and improve his individual condition but in all times men have been prone to believe that their happiness and well-being were to be secured by means of institutions rather than by their own conduct hence the value of legislation as an agent in human advancement has usually been much overestimated to constitute the millionth part of a legislature by voting for one or two men once in three or five years however conscientiously this duty may be performed can exercise but little active influence upon any man's life and character moreover it is every day becoming more clearly understood that the function of government is negative and restrictive rather than positive and active being resolvable principally into protection protection of life liberty and property laws wisely administered will secure men the enjoyment of the fruits of their labor whether of mind or body at a comparatively small personal sacrifice but no laws however stringent can make the idle industrious the thriftless provident or the drunken sober such reforms can only be effected by means of individual action economy and self-denial by better habits rather than by greater rights the government of a nation itself is usually found to be but the reflex of the individuals composing it the government that is ahead of the people will inevitably be dragged down to their level as the government that is behind them will in the long run be dragged up in the order of nature the collective character of a nation will as surely find its befitting results in its law and government as water finds its own level the noble people will be nobly ruled and the ignorant and corrupt ignobly indeed all experience serves to prove that the worth and strength of a state depend far less upon the form of its institutions than upon the character of its men for the nation is only an aggregate of individual conditions and civilization itself is but a question of the personal improvement of the men women and children of whom society is composed national progress is the sum of individual industry energy and uprightness as national decay is of individual idleness selfishness and vice what we are accustomed to decry as great social evils will for the most part be found to be but the outgrowth of man's own perverted life and though we may endeavor to cut them down and extirpate them by means of law they will only spring up again with fresh luxuriance in some other form unless the conditions of personal life and character are radically improved if this view be correct then it follows that the highest patriotism and philanthropy consist not so much in altering laws and modifying institutions as in helping and stimulating men to elevate and improve themselves by their own free and independent individual action it may be of comparatively little consequence how a man is governed from without whilst everything depends upon how he governs himself from within 
the greatest slave is not he who is ruled by a despot great though that evil be but he who is the thrall of his own moral ignorance selfishness and vice nations who are thus enslaved at heart cannot be freed by any mere changes of masters or of institutions and so long as the fatal delusion prevails that liberty solely depends upon the and consists in government so long will such changes no matter at what cost they may be effected have as little practical and lasting result as the shifting of the figures in a phantasmagoria the solid foundations of liberty must rest upon individual character which is also the only sure guarantee for social security and national progress john stuart mill truly observes that even despotism does not produce its worst effects so long as individuality exists under it and whatever crushes individuality is despotism by whatever name it be called old fallacies as to human progress are constantly turning up some call for caesars others for nationalities and others for acts of parliament we are to wait for caesars and when they are found happy the people who recognize and follow them this doctrine shortly means everything for the people nothing by them a doctrine which if taken as a guide must by destroying the free conscience of a community speedily prepare the way for any form of despotism caesarism is human idolatry in its worst form a worship of mere power as degrading in its effects as the worship of mere wealth would be a far healthier doctrine to inculcate among the nations would be that of self-help and so soon as it is thoroughly understood and carried into action caesarism will be no more all nations have been made what they are by the thinking and the working of many generations of men patient and persevering laborers in all ranks and conditions of life cultivators of the soil and explorers of the mine inventors and discoverers manufacturers mechanics and artisans poets philosophers and politicians all have contributed towards the grand result one generation building upon another's labors and carrying them forward to still higher stages this constant succession of noble workers the artisans of civilization has served to create order out of chaos in industry science and art and the living race has thus in the course of nature become the inheritor of the rich estate provided by the skill and industry of our forefathers which is placed in our hands to cultivate and to hand down not only unimpaired but improved to our successors james watt was one of the most industrious of men and the story of his life proves what all experience confirms that it is not the man of the greatest natural vigor and capacity who achieves the highest results but he who employs his powers with the greatest industry and the most carefully disciplined skill the skill that comes by labor application and experience many men in his time knew far more than what but none labored so assiduously as he did to turn all that he did know to useful practical purposes he was above all things most persevering in his pursuits of facts he cultivated carefully that habit of active attention on which all the higher working qualities of the mind mainly depend indeed mr edgeworth entertained the opinion that the difference of intellect in men depends more upon the early cultivation of this habit of attention than upon any great disparity between the powers of one individual and another even when a boy watt found science in his toys the quadrants lying about his father's carpenter's shop led him to the study of optics and astronomy his ill health induced him to pry into the secrets of physiology and his solitary walks through the country 
attracted him to the study of botany and history while carrying on the business of a mathematical instrument maker he received an order to build an organ and though without an ear for music he undertook the study of harmonics and successfully constructed the instrument and in like manner when the little model of newcomen's steam engine belonging to the university of glasgow was placed in his hands to repair he forthwith set himself to learn all that was then known about heat evaporation and condensation at the same time plodding his way in mechanics and the science of construction the results of which he at length embodied in his condensing steam engine for ten years he went on contriving and inventing with little hope to cheer him and with few friends to encourage him he went on meanwhile earning bread for his family by making and selling quadrants making and mending fiddles flutes and musical instruments measuring mason work surveying roads superintending the construction of canals or doing anything that turned up and offered a prospect of honest gain at length watt found a fit partner in another eminent leader of industry matthew bolton of birmingham a skilful energetic and far-seeing man who vigorously undertook the enterprise of introducing the condensing engine into general use as a working power and the success of both is now a matter of history the instances of men in this and other countries who by dint of persevering application and energy have raised themselves from the humblest ranks of industry to eminent positions of usefulness and influence in society are so numerous that they have long ceased to be regarded as exceptional looking at some of the more remarkable it might almost be said that early encounter with difficulty and adverse circumstances was the necessary and indispensable condition of success the british house of commons and the united states congress have always contained a considerable number of such self-raised men fitting representatives of the industrial character of the people and it is to the credit of our legislatures that they have been welcomed and honored there men who like lincoln and garfield have risen from the humblest condition to great renown are by no means exceptional in the great republic of the west where worth rather than birth forms the basis for promotion and influence james a garfield was a typical american born in poverty and obscurity he struggled forward and upward against a sea of obstacles and won his way by such gentleness of demeanor coupled with such patience and courage that he seems not to have provoked the enmity of any man mr garfield had a hard time of it as a boy he toiled hard on the farm early and late in summer and worked at the carpenter's bench in winter the best of it was that he liked work he had an absorbing ambition to get an education and the only road open to this end seemed that of manual labor ready money was hard to get in those days the ohio canal ran not far from where he lived and finding that the boatmen got their pay in cash and earned better wages than he could make at farming or carpentry he hired out as a driver on the towpath and soon got up to the dignity of holding the helm of a boat then he determined to ship as a sailor on the lakes but an attack of fever and ague interfered with his plans he was ill three months and when he recovered he decided to go to school his mother had saved a small sum of money which she gave him together with a few cooking utensils and a stock of provisions he hired a small room and cooked his own food to make his expenses as light as possible he paid his own way after that never calling on his mother for any more assistance by working at the carpenter's bench mornings and evenings and vacation times and teaching country schools during the winter he managed to attend the academy during the spring and fall terms and to save a little money towards going to college he had excellent health a robust frame and a capital memory and the attempt to combine mental and physical work did not harm him when he was twenty-three years of age he concluded he had got about all there was to be had in the obscure crossroads academy he calculated he had saved about half enough money to get through college 
provided he could begin, as he hoped, with the junior year. He got a life insurance policy and assigned it to a gentleman as security for a loan to make up the amount he lacked. In the fall of 1854, he entered the junior class of Williams College, Massachusetts, and graduated in 1856 with the metaphysical honors of his class. When Garfield returned to Ohio, it was natural that he should soon gravitate to the struggling little college at Hiram, Portage County, near his boyhood's home. He became professor of Latin and Greek, and threw himself, with the energy and industry which were leading traits in his character, into the work of building up the institution. Before he had been two years in his professorship, he was appointed president of the college. Hiram is a lonesome country village, three miles from a railroad, built upon a high hill, overlooking twenty miles of cheese-making country to the southward. It contains fifty or sixty houses clustered around the green, in the center of which stands the homely red-brick college structure. Plain living and high thinking was the order of things at Hiram College in those days. The teachers were poor, but there was a great deal of hard, faithful study done, and many ambitious plans formed. The young president taught, lectured, and preached, and all the time studied as diligently as any acolyte in the temple of knowledge. During his professorship, Garfield married Miss Lucretia Rudolph, daughter of a farmer in the neighborhood, whose acquaintance he had made while at the academy, where she was also a pupil. She was a quiet, thoughtful girl, of singularly sweet and refined disposition fond of study and reading, possessing a warm heart and a mind with the capacity of steady growth. The marriage was a love affair on both sides, and has been a thoroughly happy one. Much of General Garfield's subsequent success in life may be attributed to the never-failing sympathy and intellectual companionship of his wife, and the stimulus of a loving home circle. The young couple bought a neat little cottage fronting on the college campus, and began their wedded life poor and in debt, but with brave hearts. In 1859, the college president was elected to the state senate, from the counties of Portage and Summit. He did not resign his presidency, because he looked upon a few months in the legislature as an episode not likely to change the course of his life. But the war came to alter his plans, during the winter of 1861 he was active in the passage of measures for arming the state militia, and his eloquence and energy made him a conspicuous leader of the Union Party. Early in the summer of 1861 he was elected colonel of an infantry regiment raised in northern Ohio, many of the soldiers in which had been students at Hiram. He took the field in eastern Kentucky, was soon put in command of a brigade, and, by making one of the hardest marches ever made by recruits, surprised and routed the rebel forces under Humphrey Marshall at Piketon. From eastern Kentucky General Garfield was transferred to Louisville, and from that place hastened to join the army of General Buell, which he reached with his brigade in time to participate in the second day's fighting at Pittsburgh Landing. He took part in the siege of Corinth, and in the operations along the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. In January 1863 he was appointed Chief of Staff of the Army of the Cumberland, and bore a prominent share in all the campaigns in the Middle Tennessee in the spring and summer of that year. His last conspicuous military service was at the Battle of Chickamauga. For his conduct in that battle he was promoted to a major generalship. The congressional district in which Garfield lived was the one long made famous by Joshua R. Giddings. His supporters nominated him while he was in the field, without asking his consent. That was in 1862. When he heard of the nomination, Garfield reflected that it would be fifteen months before the Congress would meet to which he would be elected, and, believing, as did everyone else, that the war could not possibly last a year longer, concluded to accept. He often expressed regret that he did not help to fight the war through, and said that he never would have left the army to go to Congress had he foreseen the struggle would continue beyond the year 1863. He continued his military service up to the time Congress met. 
on entering congress in december eighteen sixty three general garfield was placed upon the committee on military affairs with schenck and farnsworth who were also fresh from the field he took an active part in the debates of the house and won a recognition which few new members succeed in gaining he was not popular among his fellow members during his first term they thought him something of a pedant because he sometimes showed his scholarship in his speeches and they were jealous of his prominence his solid attainments and able social qualities enabled him to overcome this prejudice during his second term and he became on terms of close friendship with the best men in both houses his committee service during his second term was on the ways and means which was quite to his taste for it gave him an opportunity to prosecute the studies in finance and political economy which he had always felt a fondness for he was a hard worker and a great reader in those days going home with his arms full of books from the congressional library and sitting up late nights to read them it was then that he laid the foundations of the convictions on the subject of national finance which he since held so firmly amid all the storms of political agitation in the fortieth congress general garfield was the chairman of the committee on military affairs in the forty-first he was given the chairmanship of banking and currency which he liked much better because it was in the line of his financial studies his next promotion was to the chairmanship of the appropriations committee which he held until the democrats came into power in the house in eighteen seventy five his chief work on that committee was a steady and judicious reduction of the expenses of the government in all the political struggles in congress he bore a leading part his clear vigorous and moderate style of argument making him one of the most effective debaters in either house when james g blaine went to the senate in eighteen seventy seven the mantle of republican leadership in the house was by common consent placed upon garfield in january eighteen eighty general garfield was elected to the senate he received the unanimous vote of the republican caucus an honor never before given to any man of any party in the state of ohio of his industry and studious habits a great deal might be said but a single illustration will have to suffice here once during the busiest part of a very busy session at washington a visitor found him in his library behind a big barricade of books this was no unusual sight but when the caller glanced at the volumes he saw that they were all different editions of horace or books relating to that poet i find that i am overworked and need recreation said the general now my theory is that the best way to rest the mind is not to let it be idle but to put it at something quite outside of the ordinary line of its employment so i am resting by learning all the congressional library can show about horace and the various editions and translations of his poems the circumstances of general garfield's nomination for the presidency at chicago are thus told by one of his many biographers there were some indications as the thirtieth ballot progressed on tuesday june eighth that the lesser candidates were giving way the next ballot demonstrated that the grant lines could not be broken and the blaine lines were at this time wavering it was apparent the convention was on the edge of a break the next ballot which was finished by half past twelve was without exciting event the close of the thirty-fourth was marked with some excitement growing out of a break to garfield wisconsin casting him sixteen votes this was the beginning of the end to make up this number washburn blaine and sherman were drawn upon when the result was declared general garfield arose and addressed the chair the chairman inquired for what purpose the gentleman rose to a question of order said garfield the gentleman will state it said the chair i challenge said mr garfield the correctness of the announcement that contains votes for me no man has a right without the consent of the person voted for to have his name announced and voted for in this convention such consent i have not given this was overruled by the chairman amidst laughter against garfield who had made the point on the vote cast for him by wisconsin then 
the thirty-fifth ballot was taken it was apparent that the blaine men had broken up the thirty-sixth ballot was taken amidst breathless excitement it proved to be the last it resulted grant three hundred and six blaine forty two sherman three washburn six garfield three hundred and ninety nine the late mr fox was accustomed to introduce his recollections of past times with the words when i was working as a weaver boy at norwich and there are other members of parliament still living whose origin has been equally humble mr lindsay the well-known shipowner once told the simple story of his life to the electors of weymouth in answer to an attack upon him by his political opponents he had been left an orphan at fourteen and when he left glasgow for liverpool to push his way in the world not being able to pay the usual fare the captain of the steamer agreed to take his labor in exchange and the boy worked his passage by trimming the coals in the coal hole at liverpool he remained for seven weeks before he could obtain employment during which time he lived in sheds and fared hardly until at last he found shelter on board a west indiaman he entered as a boy and before he was nineteen by steady good conduct had risen to the command of a ship at twenty-three he retired from the sea and settled on shore after which his progress was rapid he had prospered he said by steady industry by constant work and by ever keeping in view the great principle of doing to others as you would be done by among like men of the same class may be ranked the late richard cobden whose start in life was equally humble the son of a small farmer in midhurst in sussex he was sent at an early age to london and employed as a boy in a warehouse in the city he was diligent well conducted and eager for information his master a man of the old school warned him against too much reading but the boy went on in his own course storing in his mind with the wealth found in books he was promoted from one position of trust to another became a traveller for his house secured a large connection and eventually started in business as a calico printer in manchester taking an interest in public questions more especially in popular education his attention was gradually drawn to the subject of the corn laws to the repeal of which he may be said to have devoted his fortune and his life it may be mentioned as a curious fact that the first speech he delivered in public was a total failure but he had great perseverance application and energy and with persistency and practice he became at length one of the most persuasive and effective public speakers extorting the disinterested eulogy of even sir robert peel himself a french ambassador has eloquently said of mr cobden that he was a living proof of what merit perseverance and labor can accomplish one of the most complete examples of those men who sprung from the humblest ranks of society raised themselves to the highest rank in public estimation by the effect of their own worth and of their own services finally one of the rarest examples of the solid qualities inherent in the english character in all these cases strenuous individual application was the price paid for distinction excellence of any sort being invariably placed beyond the reach of indolence it is the diligent hand and head alone that maketh rich in self-culture growth in wisdom and in business even when men are born to wealth and high social position any solid reputation which they may individually achieve can only be attained by energetic application for though an inheritance of acres may be bequeathed an inheritance of knowledge and wisdom cannot the wealthy man may pay others for doing his work for him but it is impossible to get his thinking done for him by another or to purchase any kind of self-culture indeed the doctrine that excellence in any pursuit is only to be achieved by laborious application holds as true in the case of the man of wealth as that of drew and gifford whose only school was a cobbler's stall or hugh miller whose only college was a cromarty stone quarry riches and ease it is perfectly clear 
are not necessary for a man's highest culture else had not the world been so largely indebted in all times to those who have sprung from the humbler ranks an easy or luxurious existence does not train men to effort or encounter with difficulty nor does it awaken that consciousness of power which is so necessary for energetic and effective action in life indeed so far from poverty being a misfortune it may by vigorous self-help be converted even into a blessing rousing a man to that struggle with the world in which though some may purchase ease by degradation the right-minded and true-hearted find strength confidence and triumph bacon says many seem neither to understand their riches nor their strength of the former they believe greater things than they should of the latter much less self-reliance and self-denial will teach a man to drink out of his own cistern and eat his own sweet bread and to learn and labor truly to get his living and carefully to expend the good things committed to his trust a very impressive example of the success to which a system of self-help vigorously pursued invariably leads is presented in the life of our renowned contemporary thomas a edison his parents were poor and he received not more than two months of regular schooling but was taught in the elementary branches by his mother he had a passion for reading and before he was twelve years old he had read gibbon's rome hume's england and the penny cyclopedia he also read some books on chemistry in early life and so strong was his thirst for knowledge that at one time he resolved to read every book in the public library of detroit in execution of his purpose he read newton's principia Uyr's scientific dictionaries burton's anatomy of melancholy and other important works he early became a newsboy on the grand trunk railway opposite detroit this position gave him the opportunity of reading many miscellaneous books he became much interested in chemistry and put up a laboratory in one of the cars but his enthusiastic efforts in this direction were soon brought to an end by an unfortunate explosion which came near setting the train on fire and which led the conductor to throw the apparatus and chemicals out of the car not content with selling papers edison next bought some old type and began to print on the cars a little paper called the grand trunk herald while acting as newsboy he got acquainted with the telegraph operators along the line and became ambitious to be an operator himself the station master at mount clemens station offered to give him the necessary instruction and for five months the young newsboy returned to this point after his day's work and received nightly instruction in telegraphy at the end of this time he was qualified to accept a position in the telegraph office at port huron while at adrian michigan discharging his duties as operator he spent much time in repairing instruments and at other mechanical employments for which he had made a small workshop and furnished it with tools he soon went to indianapolis where he invented an automatic repeater by which a message might be transferred from one wire to another without the aid of an operator going in turn to cincinnati memphis louisville and new orleans he returned to Cincinnati in 1867, where at the age of twenty he became absorbed in projects of invention. He had now become one of the most expert operators in the service, and was soon put into the leading position in the Boston office. Here he fitted up a small shop and continued his experiments. In 1870 he went to Rochester, New York, to test between that city and Boston the practicability of his invention of the duplex telegraph but the experiment did not prove successful he next entered the service of the gold indicator company in new york of which he was soon made superintendent here he introduced improved apparatus and invented the gold printer and other devices about this time he established in newark new jersey a factory for the purpose of making the machines and apparatus he had invented about three hundred men were employed in this establishment but the demands made on his time by the business 
left him so little opportunity for pursuing his experiments and making inventions that he abandoned the enterprise and in eighteen seventy six established a shop for experimenting at menlo park a small station on the pennsylvania railroad about twenty-four miles from new york although mr edison is still a very young man his inventions are exceedingly numerous he has taken out several hundred patents the most wonderful and famous of these are the carbon telephone and the phonograph his micro tassimeter designed for detecting very slight variations of temperature was successfully used during the total eclipse of the sun in july eighteen seventy eight to demonstrate the existence of heat in the corona the aerophone which has not yet been perfected is a contrivance for amplifying sound its purpose is to increase the loudness of words spoken without impairing the distinctness of articulation the phonometer is an instrument for measuring the mechanical force of sound waves produced by the human voice mr edison's experiments upon the electric light are likely soon to result in a complete revolution in our present methods of illumination he has already discovered a means of subdividing the electrical current indefinitely so as to make the light practicable for small areas he has also invented an harmonic engine with which he proposes to use compressed air as a motor for propelling sewing machines and other light machinery it is said to be in advance of other electric engines and through its agency electricity may yet be utilized as a motive power among mr edison's other important inventions are the electric pen for multiplying copies of letters or drawings and the quadruplex system of telegraphy by which four communications may be sent in opposite directions over one wire at the same time both these latter inventions are now extensively used mr prescott says of him the great number and variety of subjects to which mr edison has given his attention is scarcely less surprising than the marked success with which his labors have been crowned electricity alone although receiving the most attention has furnished but a single field of his versatile powers his path has been through extended portions of physics and chemistry and is clearly marked by characteristic inventions in these vast domains without doubt mr edison is more than usually endowed with what the world terms genius his intellectual powers are of no ordinary kind but it should be clearly understood that his great success is the result not so much of the divine gift of genius alone as of his ceaseless activity and indomitable perseverance under all circumstances these are unquestionably the most remarkable characteristics of his nature and the real elements of his success the author can state from personal knowledge what is now becoming more generally known regarding mr edison's extraordinary propensities for work very few if favored with like powers of endurance would be willing to apply themselves so assiduously during the earlier experiments with the quadruplex system of telegraphy which took place under his own supervision and which required a vast amount of time and application for its perfection it was a very common thing to find mr edison working through the entire night his only rest being such as a brief interval of sleep just before day might afford taken in the experimenting rooms night after night he has worked in this manner and been found in the morning with nothing but his coat for a pillow and the table or desk for his couch the indefatigable industry of lord brougham became almost proverbial his public labors extended over a period of upwards of sixty years during which he ranged over many fields of law literature politics and science and achieved distinction in them all how he contrived it has been to many a mystery once when sir samuel romilly was requested to undertake some new work he excused himself by saying that he had no time but he added go with it to that fellow brougham he seems to have time for everything the secret of it was that he never left a minute unemployed with all he possessed a constitution of iron 
when arrived at an age at which most men would have retired from the world to enjoy their hard-earned leisure perhaps to doze away their time in an easy chair lord brougham commenced and prosecuted a series of elaborate investigations as to the laws of light and he submitted the results to the most scientific audiences that paris and london could muster about the same time he was passing through the press his admirable sketches of the men of science and literature of the reign of george the third and taking his full share of the law business and the political discussions in the house of lords sidney smith once recommended him to confine himself to only the transaction of so much business as three strong men could get through but such was brougham's love of work long become a habit that no amount of application seems to have been too great for him and such was his love of excellence that it has been said of him that if his station in life has been only that of a shoe-black he would never have rested satisfied until he had become the best shoe-black in england mr disraeli affords a similar instance of the power of industry and application in working out an eminent public career his wondrous tale of alroy and revolutionary epic were laughed at and regarded as indications of literary lunacy but he worked on in other directions and his coningsby sibyl and tancred proved the sterling stuff of which he was made as an orator too his first appearance in the house of commons was a failure it was spoken of as more screaming than an adelphi farce though composed in a grand and ambitious strain every sentence was hailed with loud laughter hamlet played as a comedy were nothing to it but he concluded with a sentence which embodied a prophecy writhing under the laughter with which his studied eloquence had been received he exclaimed i have begun several times many things and have succeeded in them at last i will sit down now but the time will come when you will hear me the time did come and how disraeli succeeded in at length commanding the attention of the first assembly of the gentlemen in the world affords a striking illustration of what energy and determination will do for disraeli earned his position by dint of patient industry he did not as many young men do having once failed retire dejected to mope and whine in a corner but diligently set himself to work he carefully unlearnt his faults studied the character of his audience practised sedulously the art of speech and industriously filled his mind with the elements of parliamentary knowledge he worked patiently for success and it came but slowly then the house laughed with him instead of at him the recollection of his early failure was effaced and by general consent he was at length admitted to be one of the most finished and effective parliamentary speakers end of chapter seven helping oneself read by john greenman This is section eight of Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them by Samuel Smiles. Chapter eight. Leaders of Industry, Inventors, and Producers. Read by John Greenman. Who best can suffer best can do. Milton deduct all that men of the humbler classes have done for england in the way of inventions only and see where she would have been but for them arthur helps one of the most strongly marked features of the english-speaking people is their spirit of industry standing out prominent and distinct in their past history and as strikingly characteristic of them now as at any former period it is this spirit which has laid the foundations and built up the industrial greatness of our country this vigorous growth of the nation has been mainly the result of the free energy of individuals and it has been contingent upon the number of hands and minds from time to time 
actively employed within it whether as cultivators of the soil producers of articles of utility contrivers of tools and machines writers of books or creators of works of art and while this spirit of active industry has been the vital principle of the nation it has also been its saving and remedial one counteracting from time to time the effects of errors in our laws and imperfections in our constitution the career of industry which the nation has pursued has also proved its best education as steady application to work is the healthiest training for every individual so is it the best discipline of a state honorable industry travels the same road with duty and providence has closely linked both with happiness the gods says the poet have placed labor and toil on the way leading to the elysian fields certain it is that no bread eaten by man is so sweet as that earned by his own labor whether bodily or mental by labor the earth has been subdued and man redeemed from barbarism nor has a single step in civilization been made without it labor is not only a necessity and a duty but a blessing only the idler feels it to be a curse the duty of work is written on the thews and muscles of the limbs the mechanisms of the hand the nerves and lobes of the brain the sum of whose healthy action is satisfaction and enjoyment in the school of labor is taught the best practical wisdom it so happens that the history of pottery furnishes some of the most remarkable instances of patient industry and perseverance to be found in the whole range of biography though the art of making common vessels of clay was known to most of the ancient nations that of manufacturing enameled earthenware was much less common it was however practiced by the ancient etruscans specimens of whose ware are still to be found in antiquarian collections but it became a lost art and was only recovered at a comparatively recent date the etruscan ware was very valuable in ancient times a vase being worth its weight in gold in the time of augustus the reviver or rediscoverer of the art of enamelling in italy was luca della robbia a florentine sculptor vasari describes him as a man of great perseverance working with his chisel all day and practicing drawing during the greater part of the night he pursued the latter art with so much assiduity that when working late to prevent his feet from freezing with the cold he was accustomed to provide himself with a basket of shavings in which he placed them to keep himself warm and enable him to proceed with his drawings nor says vasari am i the least astonished at this since no man ever becomes distinguished in any art whatsoever who does not early begin to acquire the power of supporting heat cold hunger thirst and other discomforts whereas those persons deceive themselves altogether who suppose that when taking their ease and surrounded by all the enjoyments of the world they may still attain to honorable distinction for it is not by sleeping but by waking watching and laboring continually that proficiency is attained and reputation acquired but luca notwithstanding all his application and industry did not succeed in earning enough money by sculpture to enable him to live by the art and the idea occurred to him that he might nevertheless be able to pursue his modeling in some material more facile and less dear than marble hence it was that he began to make his models in clay and to endeavor by experiment so to coat and bake the clay as to render those models durable after many trials he at length discovered a method of covering the clay with a material which when exposed to the intense heat of a furnace became converted into an almost imperishable enamel he afterwards made the further discovery of a method of imparting color to the enamel 
thus greatly adding to its beauty the fame of luca's work extended throughout europe and specimens of his art became widely diffused many of them were sent into france and spain where they were greatly prized at that time coarse brown jars were almost the only articles of earthenware produced in france and this continued to be the case with comparatively small improvement until the time of palissy a man who toiled and fought against stupendous difficulties with a heroism that sheds a glow almost of romance over the events of his chequered life bernard palissy is supposed to have been born in the south of france about the year fifteen ten his father was probably a worker in glass to which trade bernard was brought up his parents were poor people too poor to give him the benefit of any school education i had no other books said he afterwards than heaven and earth which are open to all he learned however the art of glass painting to which he added that of drawing and afterwards reading and writing when about eighteen years old the glass trade becoming decayed palissy left his father's house with his wallet on his back and went out into the world to search whether there was any place in it for him he first travelled towards gascony working at his trade where he could find employment and occasionally occupying part of his time in land measuring then he travelled northwards sojourning for various periods at different places in france flanders and lower germany thus palissy occupied about ten more years of his life after which he married and ceased from his wanderings settling down to practice glass painting and land measuring at the small town of saint there children were born to him and not only his responsibilities but his expenses increased while do what he could his earnings remained too small for his needs it was therefore necessary for him to bestir himself probably he felt capable of better things than drudging in an employment so precarious as glass painting and hence he was induced to turn his attention to the kindred art of painting and enamelling earthenware yet on this subject he was wholly ignorant for he had never seen earth baked before he began his operations he had therefore everything to learn by himself without any helper but he was full of hope eager to learn of unbounded perseverance and inexhaustible patience it was the sight of an elegant cup of italian manufacture most probably one of luca della robbia's make which first set palissy thinking about the new art a circumstance so apparently insignificant would have produced no effect upon an ordinary mind or even upon palissy himself at an ordinary time but occurring as it did when he was meditating a change of calling he at once became inflamed with the desire of imitating it the sight of this cup disturbed his whole existence and the determination to discover the enamel with which it was glazed thenceforward possessed him like a passion had he been a single man he might have travelled into italy in search of the secret but he was bound to his wife and his children and could not leave them so he remained by their side groping in the dark in the hope of finding out the process of making and enamelling earthenware at first he could merely guess the materials of which the enamel was composed and he proceeded to try all manner of experiments to ascertain what they really were he pounded all the substances which he supposed were likely to produce it then he bought common earthen pots broke them into pieces and spreading his compounds over them subjected them to the heat of a furnace which he erected for the purpose of baking them his experiments failed and the results were broken pots and a waste of fuel drugs time and labor women do not readily sympathize with experiments whose only tangible effect is to dissipate the means of buying clothes and food for their children and palissy's wife however dutiful in other respects could not be reconciled to the purchase of more earthen pots which seemed to her to be bought only to be broken yet she must needs submit for palissy had become thoroughly possessed by the determination to master the secret of the enamel and would not let it alone 
for many successive months and years palissy pursued his experiments the first furnace having proved a failure he proceeded to erect another out of doors there he burnt more wood spoiled more drugs and pots and lost more time until poverty stared him and his family in the face thus said he i fooled away several years with sorrow and sighs because i could not at all arrive at my intention in the intervals of his experiments he occasionally worked at his former callings painting on glass drawing portraits and measuring land but his earnings from these sources were very small at length he was no longer able to carry on his experiments in his own furnace because of the heavy cost of fuels but he bought more potsherds broke them up as before into three or four hundred pieces and covered them with chemicals carried them to a tile-work a league and a half distant from sants there to be baked in an ordinary furnace after the operation he went to see the pieces taken out and to his dismay the whole of the experiments were failures but though disappointed he was not yet defeated for he determined on the very spot to begin afresh his business as a land measurer called him away for a brief season from the pursuit of his experiments in conformity with an edict of the state it became necessary to survey the salt marshes in the neighborhood of sants for the purpose of levying the land tax palissy was employed to make this survey and prepare the requisite map the work occupied him some time and he was doubtless well paid for it but no sooner was it completed than he proceeded with redoubled zeal to follow up his old investigations in the track of the enamels he began by breaking three dozen new earthen pots the pieces of which he covered with different materials which he had compounded and then took them to a neighboring glass furnace to be baked the results gave him a glimmer of hope the greater heat of the glass furnace had melted some of the compounds but though palissy searched diligently for the white enamel he could find none for two more years he went on experimenting without any satisfactory result until the proceeds of his survey of the salt marshes having become nearly spent he was reduced to poverty again but he resolved to make a last great effort and he began by breaking more pots than ever more than three hundred pieces of pottery covered with his compounds were sent to the glass furnace and thither he himself went to watch the results of the baking four hours passed during which he watched and then the furnace was opened the material on one only of the three hundred pieces of potsherd had melted and it was taken out to cool as it hardened it grew white white and polished the piece of potsherd was covered with white enamel described by palissy as singularly beautiful and beautiful it must no doubt have been in his eyes after all his weary waiting he ran home with it to his wife feeling himself as he expressed it quite a new creature but the prize was not yet won far from it the partial success of this intended last effort merely had the effect of luring him on to a succession of further experiments and failures in order that he might complete the invention which he now believed to be at hand he resolved to build for himself a glass furnace near his dwelling where he might carry on his operations in secret he proceeded to build the furnace with his own hands carrying the bricks from the brickfield upon his back he was bricklayer laborer and all from seven to eight more months passed at last the furnace was built and ready for use palissy had in the meantime fashioned a number of vessels of clay in readiness for the laying on of the enamel after being subjected to a preliminary process of baking they were covered with the enamel compound and again placed in the furnace for the grand crucial experiment although his means were nearly exhausted palissy had been for some time accumulating a great store of fuel for the final effort and he thought it was enough at last the fire was lit and the operation proceeded all day he sat by the furnace feeding it with fuel he sat there watching and feeding all through the long night but the enamel did not melt the sun rose upon his labors 
his wife brought him a portion of the scanty morning meal for he would not stir from the furnace into which he continued from time to time to heave more fuel the second day passed and still the enamel did not melt the sun set and another night passed the pale haggard unshorn baffled yet not beaten palissy sat by his furnace eagerly looking for the melting of the enamel a third day and night passed a fourth a fifth and even a sixth yes for six long days and nights did the unconquerable palissy watch and toil fighting against hope and still the enamel would not melt it then occurred to him that there might be some defect in the materials for the enamel perhaps something wanting in the flux so he set to work to pound and compound fresh materials for a new experiment thus two or three more weeks passed but how to buy more pots for those which he had made with his own hands for the purpose of the first experiment were by long baking irretrievably spoiled for the purposes of a second his money was now all spent but he could borrow his character was still good though his wife and the neighbors thought him foolishly wasting his means in futile experiments nevertheless he succeeded he borrowed sufficient from a friend to enable him to buy more fuel and more pots and he was again ready for a further experiment the pots were covered with the new compound placed in the furnace and the fire was again lit it was the last and most desperate experiment of the whole the fire blazed up the heat became intense but still the enamel did not melt the fuel began to run short how to keep up the fire there were the garden palings these would burn they must be sacrificed rather than that the great experiment should fail the garden palings were pulled up and cast into the furnace they were burnt in vain the enamel had not yet melted ten minutes more heat might do it fuel must be had at whatever cost there remained the household furniture and shelving a crashing noise was heard in the house and amidst the screams of his wife and children who now feared palissy's reason was giving way the tables were seized broken up and heaved into the furnace the enamel had not melted yet there remained the shelving another noise of the wrenching of timber was heard within the house and the shelves were torn down and hurled after the furniture into the fire wife and children then rushed from the house and went frantically through the town calling out that poor palissy had gone mad and was breaking up his very furniture for firewood for an entire month his shirt had not been off his back and he was utterly worn out wasted with toil anxiety watching and want of food he was in debt and seemed on the verge of ruin but he had at length mastered the secret for the last great burst of heat had melted the enamel the common brown household jars when taken out of the furnace after it had become cool were found covered with a white glaze for this he could endure reproach contumely and scorn and wait patiently for the opportunity of putting his discovery into practice as better days came round palissy next hired a potter to make some earthen vessels after the designs which he furnished while he himself proceeded to model some medallions in clay for the purpose of enamelling them but how to maintain himself and his family until the wares were made and ready for sale fortunately there remained one man in st who still believed in the integrity if not the judgment of palissy an innkeeper who agreed to feed and lodge him for six months while he went on with his manufacture as for the working potter whom he had hired palissy soon found that he could not pay him the stipulated wages having already stripped his dwelling he could but strip himself and he accordingly parted with some of his clothes to the potter in part payment of the wages which he owed him palissy next erected an improved furnace but he was so unfortunate as to build part of the inside with flints when it was heated these flints cracked and burst and the spinculi were scattered over the pieces of pottery sticking to them though the enamel came out right the work was irretrievably spoilt and thus 
six more months labor was lost persons were found willing to buy the articles at a low price notwithstanding the injury they had sustained but palissy would not sell them considering that to have done so would be to decry and abase his honor and so he broke in pieces the entire batch nevertheless says he hope continued to inspire me and i held on manfully sometimes when visitors called i entertained them with pleasantry while i was really sad at heart at this stage of his affairs palissy became melancholy and almost hopeless and seems to have all but broken down he wandered gloomily about the fields near saint his clothes hanging in tatters and himself worn to a skeleton in a curious passage in his writings he describes how the calves of his legs had disappeared and were no longer able with the help of garters to hold up his stockings which fell about his heels when he walked the family continued to reproach him for his recklessness and his neighbors cried shame upon him for his obstinate folly so he returned for a time to his former calling and after a year's diligent labor during which he earned bread for his household and somewhat recovered his character among his neighbors he again resumed his darling enterprise but though he had already spent about ten years in the search for the enamel it cost him nearly eight more years of experimental plodding before he perfected his invention he gradually learnt dexterity and certainty of result by experience gathering practical knowledge out of many failures every mishap was a fresh lesson to him teaching him something new about the nature of enamels the qualities of argillaceous earths the tempering of clays and the construction and management of furnaces at last after about sixteen years labor palissy took heart and called himself potter these sixteen years had been his term of apprenticeship to the art during which he had wholly to teach himself beginning at the very beginning he was now able to sell his wares and thereby maintain his family in comfort but he never rested satisfied with what he had accomplished he proceeded from one step of improvement to another always aiming at the greatest perfection possible he studied natural objects for patterns and with such success that the great buffon spoke of him as so great a naturalist as nature only can produce his ornamental pieces are now regarded as rare gems and sell at almost fabulous prices the ornaments on them are for the most part accurate models from life of wild animals lizards and plants found in the fields about science and tastefully combined as ornaments into the texture of a plate or a vase we have not however come to an end of the sufferings of palissy respecting which a few words remain to be said being a protestant at a time when religious persecution waxed hot in the south of france and expressing his views without fear he was regarded as a dangerous heretic his enemies having informed against him his house at saint was entered by the officers of justice and his workshop was thrown open to the rabble who entered and smashed his pottery while he himself was hurried off by night and cast into a dungeon at bordeaux to wait his turn at the stake or the scaffold he was condemned to be burnt but a powerful noble the constable de montmorency interposed to save his life not because he had any special regard for palissy or his religion but because no other artist could be found capable of executing the enameled pavement for his magnificent dwelling then in course of erection at Ecouen, near paris he was liberated and returned to his home at saint only to find it devastated and broken up his workshop was open to the sky and his works lay in ruins shaking the dust of saint from his feet he left the place never to return to it and removed to paris to carry on the works ordered of him by the constable and the queen mother besides carrying on the manufacture of pottery with the aid of his two sons palissy during the latter part of his life wrote and published several books on the potter's art with a view to the instruction of his countrymen and in order that they might avoid the many mistakes which he himself had made 
He also wrote on agriculture, on fortification, and natural history, on which latter subject he even delivered lectures to a limited number of persons. He waged war against astrology, alchemy, witchcraft, and like impostures. This stirred up against him many enemies, who pointed the finger at him as a heretic, and he was again arrested for his religion and imprisoned in the Bastille. He was now an old man of seventy-eight, trembling on the verge of the grave, but his spirit was as brave as ever. He was threatened with death unless he recanted, but he was as obstinate in holding to his religion as he had been in hunting out the secret of the enamel the king henry the third even went to see him in prison to induce him to abjure his faith my good man said the king you have now served my mother and myself for forty-five years we have put up with your adhering to your religion amidst fires and massacres now i am so pressed by the guise party as well as by my own people that i am constrained to leave you in the hands of your enemies and to-morrow you will be burnt unless you become converted sire answered the unconquerable old man i am ready to give my life for the glory of god you have said many times that you have pity on me and now i have pity on you who have pronounced the words i am constrained it is not spoken like a king it is what you and those who constrain you can never effect upon me for i know how to die Palissy did indeed die shortly after, a martyr, though not at the stake. He died in the Bastille, after enduring about a year's imprisonment, there peacefully terminating a life distinguished for heroic labor, extraordinary endurance, inflexible rectitude, and the exhibition of many rare and noble virtues. The career of Josiah Wedgwood, the English potter, was less checkered and more prosperous than that of Palissy, and his lot was cast in happier times. Down to the middle of last century, England was behind most other nations of the first order in Europe in respect of skilled industry. Although there were many potters in Staffordshire, their productions were of the rudest kind, for the most part only plain brownware, with the patterns scratched in while the clay was wet josiah wedgwood was one of those industrious men who from time to time spring from the ranks of the common people and by their energetic character not only practically educate the working population in habits of industry but by the example of diligence and perseverance which they set before them largely influence the public activity in all directions and contribute in a great degree to form the national character he was like arkwright the youngest of a family of thirteen children. His grandfather and granduncle were both potters, as was also his father, who died when he was a mere boy, leaving him a patrimony of twenty pounds. He had learned to read and write at the village school, but on the death of his father he was taken from it and set to work as a thrower in a small pottery carried on by his elder brother. There he began life, his working life, to use his own words, at the lowest round of the ladder, when only eleven years old. He was shortly after seized by an attack of virulent smallpox, from the effects of which he suffered during the rest of his life, for it was followed by a disease in the right knee, which recurred at frequent intervals, and was only got rid of by the amputation of the limb many years later. When he had completed his apprenticeship with his brother, Josiah joined partnership with another workman, and carried on a small business in making knife-hafts, boxes, and sundry articles for domestic use. But he made comparatively little progress until he began business on his own account at Burslem. There he diligently pursued his calling, introducing new articles to the trade, and gradually extending his business what he chiefly aimed at was to manufacture cream-coloured ware of a better quality than was then produced in staffordshire as regarded shape colour glaze and durability to understand the subject thoroughly he devoted his leisure to the study of chemistry and he made numerous experiments on fluxes glazes and various sorts of clay 
being a close inquirer and accurate observer he noticed that a certain earth containing silica which was black before calcination became white after exposure to the heat of a furnace this fact observed and pondered on led to the idea of mixing silica with the red powder of the potteries and to the discovery that the mixture becomes white when calcined he had but to cover this material with a vitrefaction of transparent glaze to obtain one of the most important products of fictile art that which under the name of english earthenware was to attain the greatest commercial value and become the most extensive utility wedgwood was for some time much troubled by his furnaces though nothing like to the same extent that palissy was and he overcame his difficulties in the same way by repeated experiments and unfaltering perseverance his first attempts at making porcelain for table use were a succession of disastrous failures the labors of months being often destroyed in a day it was only after a long series of trials in the course of which he lost time money and labor that he arrived at the proper sort of glaze to be used but he would not be denied and at last he conquered success through patience the improvement of pottery became his passion and was never lost sight of for a moment even when he had mastered his difficulties and become a prosperous man manufacturing white stoneware and cream-colored ware in large quantities for home and foreign use he went forward perfecting his manufactures until his example extending in all directions the actions of the entire district was stimulated and a great branch of british industry was eventually established on firm foundations he aimed throughout at the highest excellence declaring his determination to give over manufacturing any article whatsoever it might be rather than to degrade it wedgwood called to his aid the crucible of the chemist the knowledge of the antiquary and the skill of the artist he found out flaxman when a youth and while he liberally nurtured his genius drew from him a large number of beautiful designs for his pottery and porcelain converting them by his manufacture into objects of taste and excellence and thus making them instrumental in the diffusion of art among the people by careful experiment and study he was even enabled to rediscover the art of painting on porcelain or earthenware vases and similar articles an art practised by the ancient etruscans but which had been lost since the time of pliny the result of wedgwood's labors was that the manufacture of pottery which he found in the very lowest condition became one of the staples of england and instead of importing what we needed for home use from abroad england became a large exporter to other countries supplying them with earthenware even in the face of enormous prohibitory duties on articles of british produce wedgwood gave evidence as to his manufacture before parliament in seventeen eighty five only some thirty years after he had begun his operations from which it appeared that instead of providing only casual employment to a small number of inefficient and badly remunerated workmen about twenty thousand persons then derived their bread directly from the manufacture of earthenware without taking into account the increased numbers to which it gave employment in coal mines and in the carrying trade by land and sea and the stimulus which it gave to employment in many ways in various parts of the country yet important as had been the advances made in his time mr wedgwood was of the opinion that the manufacture was but in its infancy and that the improvements which he had effected were but of small moment compared with those to which the art was capable of attaining through the continued industry and growing intelligence of the manufacturers and the natural facilities and political advantages enjoyed by great britain an opinion which has been fully borne out by the progress which has since been effected in this important branch of industry in eighteen fifty two not fewer than eighty-four million pieces of pottery were exported from england to other countries besides what were made for home use but it is not merely the quantity and value of the produce that is entitled to consideration 
but the improvement of the condition of the population by whom this great branch of industry is conducted when wedgwood began his labors the staffordshire district was only in a half civilized state the people were poor uncultivated and few in number when wedgwood's manufacture was firmly established there was found ample employment at good wages for three times the number of population while their moral advancement had kept pace with their material improvement men such as these are fairly entitled to take rank as the industrial heroes of the civilized world their patient self-reliance amidst trials and difficulties their courage and perseverance in the pursuit of worthy objects are not less heroic than the bravery and devotion of the soldier and the sailor one of the first grand results of watt's invention which placed an almost unlimited power at the command of the producing classes was the establishment of the cotton manufacture the person most closely identified with the foundation of this great branch of industry was unquestionably sir richard arkwright whose practical energy and sagacity were perhaps even more remarkable than his mechanical inventiveness arkwright like most of our great mechanicians sprang from the ranks he was born in preston in seventeen thirty two his parents were very poor and he was the youngest of thirteen children he was never at school the only education he received he gave to himself and to the last he was only able to write with difficulty when a boy he was apprenticed to a barber and after learning the business he set up for himself in bolton where he occupied an underground cellar over which he put up the sign come to the subterraneous barber he shaves for a penny the other barbers found their customers leaving them and reduced their prices to his standard when arkwright determined to push his trade announced his determination to give a clean shave for a half a penny after a few years he quitted his cellar and became an itinerant dealer in hair at that time wigs were worn and wig making formed an important branch of the barbering business arkwright went about buying hair for the wigs he was accustomed to attend the hiring fairs throughout lancashire resorted to by young women for the purpose of securing their long tresses and it is said that in negotiations of this sort he was very successful he also dealt in a chemical hair dye which he used adroitly and thereby secured a considerable trade but he does not seem notwithstanding his pushing character to have done more than earn a bare living the fashion of wig wearing having undergone a change distress fell upon the wig makers and arkwright being of a mechanical turn was consequently induced to turn machine inventor or conjurer as the pursuit was then popularly termed many attempts were made about that time to invent a spinning machine and our barber determined to launch his little bark on the sea of invention with the rest like other self-taught men of the same bias he had already been devoting his spare time to the invention of a perpetual motion machine and from that the transition to a spinning machine was easy he followed his experiment so assiduously that he neglected his business lost the little money he had saved and was reduced to great poverty his wife for he had by this time married was impatient at what she conceived to be a wanton waste of time and money and in a moment of sudden wrath she seized upon and destroyed his models hoping thus to remove the cause of the family privations arkwright was a stubborn and enthusiastic man and he was provoked beyond measure by this conduct of his wife from whom he immediately separated in traveling about the country arkwright had become acquainted with a person named k a clockmaker at warrington who assisted him in constructing some of the parts of his perpetual motion machinery it is supposed that he was informed by k of the principle of spinning by rollers but it is also said that the idea was first suggested to him by accidentally observing a red-hot piece of iron become elongated by passing through iron rollers however this may be the idea at once took firm possession of his mind and he proceeded to devise the process by which it was to be accomplished arkwright now abandoned his business of hair collecting and devoted himself to the perfecting of his machine 
a model of which, constructed by K under his directions, he set up in the parlor of the Free Grammar School at Preston. Being a burgess of the town, he voted at the contested election at which General Burgoyne was returned, but such was his poverty and such the tattern state of his dress that a number of persons subscribed a sum sufficient to have him put in a state fit to appear in the poll-room. The exhibition of his machine in a town where so many workpeople lived by the exercise of manual labor proved a dangerous experiment. Ominous growlings were heard outside the schoolroom from time to time, and Arkwright, remembering the fate of Kay, who was mobbed and compelled to fly from Lancashire because of his invention of the fly shuttle, and of poor Hargreaves, whose spinning jenny had been pulled to pieces only a short time before by a Blackburn mob, wisely determined on packing up his model and removing to a less dangerous locality. He went accordingly to Nottingham, where he applied to some of the local bankers for pecuniary assistance, and the Messrs. Wright consented to advance him a sum of money on condition of sharing in the profits of the invention the machine however not being perfected so soon as they had anticipated the bankers recommended arkwright to apply to messrs strutt and need the former of whom was the ingenious inventor and patentee of the stocking frame mr strutt at once appreciated the merits of the invention and a partnership was entered into with arkwright whose road to fortune was now clear the patent was secured in the name of richard arkwright of nottingham clockmaker and it is a circumstance worthy of note that it was taken out in seventeen sixty nine the same year in which watt secured the patent for his steam engine a cotton mill was first erected at nottingham driven by horses and another was shortly after built on a much larger scale turned by a water wheel from which circumstance the spinning machine came to be called the water frame arkwright's labors however were comparatively speaking only begun he had still to perfect all the working details of his machine it was in his hands the subject of constant modification and improvement until eventually it was rendered practicable and profitable in an eminent degree but success was only secured by long and patient labor for some years indeed the speculation was disheartening and unprofitable swallowing up a very large amount of capital without any result when success began to appear more certain then the lancashire manufacturers fell upon arkwright's patent to pull it in pieces as the cornish miners fell upon bolton and watt to rob them of the profits of their steam engine arkwright was even denounced as the enemy of the working people and a mill which he built near chorley was destroyed by a mob in the presence of a strong force of police and military the lancashire men refused to buy his materials though they were confessedly the best in the market then they refused to pay patent right for the use of his machine and combined to crush him in the courts of law to the disgust of right-minded people arkwright's patent was upset after the trial when passing the hotel at which his opponents were staying one of them said loud enough to be heard by him well we've done the old shaver at last to which he coolly replied never mind i've a razor left that will shave you all he established new mills in lancashire derbyshire and new lanark in scotland the mills of crumfort also came into his hands at the expiration of his partnership with strutt and the amount of the excellence of his products were such that in a short time he obtained so complete a control of the trade that the prices were fixed by him and he governed the main operations of the other cotton spinners arkwright was a man of great force of character indomitable courage much worldly shrewdness with a business faculty almost amounting to genius at one period his time was engrossed by severe and continuous labor occasioned by the organizing and conducting of his numerous manufactories sometimes from four in the morning till nine at night at fifty years of age he set to work to learn english grammar and improve himself in writing and orthography after overcoming every obstacle he had the satisfaction of reaping the reward of his enterprise eighteen years after he had constructed his first machine 
he rose to such estimation in derbyshire that he was appointed high sheriff of the county and shortly after george the third conferred upon him the honor of knighthood he died in seventeen ninety two arkwright was the founder of the modern factory system a branch of industry which has unquestionably proved a source of immense wealth to individuals and to the nation among other distinguished founders of industry the rev william lee inventor of the stocking frame and john heathcote inventor of the bobbin net machine are worthy of notice as men of great mechanical skill and perseverance through whose labors a vast amount of remunerative employment has been provided william lee was born about the year fifteen sixty three he was a poor scholar and had to struggle with poverty from his earliest years at the time when lee invented the stocking frame he was officiating as curate of calverton near nottingham and it is alleged that being married and poor his wife was under the necessity of contributing to their joint support by knitting and that lee while watching the motion of his wife's fingers conceived the idea of imitating their movements by a machine for three years he devoted himself to the prosecution of the invention sacrificing everything to his new idea as the prospect of success opened before him he abandoned his curacy and devoted himself to the art of stocking making by machinery whatever may have been the actual facts as to the origin of the invention of the stocking loom there can be no doubt as to the extraordinary mechanical genius displayed by its inventor that a clergyman living in a remote village whose life had for the most part been spent with books should contrive a machine of such delicate and complicated movements and at once advance the art of knitting from the tedious process of linking threads in a chain of loops by three needles in the fingers of a woman to the beautiful and rapid process of weaving by the stocking frame was indeed an astonishing achievement which may be pronounced almost unequaled in the history of mechanical invention lee's merit was all the greater as the handicraft art were then in their infancy and little attention had as yet been given to the contrivance of machinery for the purposes of manufacture he was under the necessity of extemporizing the parts of his machine as he best could and adopting various expedients to overcome difficulties as they arose his tools were imperfect and his materials were imperfect and he had no skilled workmen to assist him the first frame he made was a twelve gauge without lead sinkers and it was almost wholly of wood the needles being also stuck in bits of wood one of lee's principal difficulties consisted in the formation of the stitch for want of needle eyes but this he eventually overcame by forming eyes to the needles with a three square file at length one difficulty after another was successfully overcome and after three years labor the machine was sufficiently complete to be fit for use the quondam curate full of enthusiasm for his art now began stocking weaving in the village of calverton and he continued to work there for several years instructing his brother james and several of his relations in the practice of the art having brought his frame to a considerable degree of perfection and being desirous of securing the patronage of queen elizabeth whose partiality for knitted silk stockings was well known lee proceeded to london to exhibit the loom before her majesty he first showed it to several members of the court and was through their instrumentality at length admitted to an interview with the queen and worked the machine in her presence elizabeth however did not give him the encouragement that he had expected and she is said to have opposed the invention on the ground that it was calculated to deprive a large number of poor people of their employment of hand knitting lee was no more successful in finding other patrons and considering himself and his invention treated with contempt he embraced the offer made to him by sully the sagacious minister of henry the fourth to proceed to rouen and instruct the operatives of that town in the construction and use of the stocking frame lee accordingly transferred himself and his machines to france in sixteen o five taking with him his brother and seven workmen he met with a cordial reception at rouen 
and was proceeding with the manufacture of stockings on a large scale when unhappily misfortune again overtook him henry the fourth his protector on whom he relied for the rewards honors and promised grant of privileges which had induced lee to settle in france was murdered by the fanatic ravaillac and the encouragement and protection which had heretofore been extended to him were at once withdrawn to press his claims at court lee proceeded to paris but being a protestant as well as a foreigner his representations were treated with neglect and worn out with vexation and grief this distinguished inventor shortly after died at paris in a state of extreme poverty and distress lee's brother with seven of the workmen succeeded in escaping from france with their frames leaving two behind on james lee's return to nottinghamshire he was joined by one ashton a miller of thornton who had been instructed in the art of framework knitting by the inventor himself before he left england these two with the workmen and their frames began the stocking manufacture at thornton and carried it on with considerable success the place was favorably situated for the purpose as the sheep pastured in the neighboring district of sherwood yielded a kind of wool of the longest staple the number of looms employed in different parts of england gradually increased and the machine manufacture of stockings eventually became an important branch of the national industry john heathcote was the son of a cottage farmer at long walton leicestershire where he was born in seventeen eighty four he was taught to read and write at the village school but was shortly removed from it to be put apprentice to a framesmith in a neighboring village the boy soon learnt to handle tools with dexterity and he acquired a minute knowledge of the parts of which the stocking frame was composed as well as of the more intricate warp machine at his leisure he studied how to introduce improvements in them and his friend mr baisley m p states that as early as the age of sixteen he conceived the idea of inventing a machine by which lace might be made similar to buckingham or french lace then all made by hand the first practical improvement he succeeded in introducing was in the warp frame when by means of an ingenious apparatus he succeeded in producing mitts of a lacy appearance and it was this success which determined him to pursue the study of mechanical lace-making when a little over twenty-one years of age heathcote married and went to nottingham in search of work he then found employment as a smith and setter up of hosiery and warp frames he also continued to pursue the subject on which his mind had before been occupied it was a long and laborious task requiring the exercise of great perseverance and no little ingenuity his master elliot described him at that time as plodding patient self-denying and taciturn undaunted by failures and mistakes full of resources and expedients and entertaining the most perfect confidence that his application of mechanical principles would eventually be crowned with success during this time his wife was kept in almost as great anxiety as himself she well knew of his struggles and difficulties and she began to feel the pressure of poverty on her household for while he was laboring at his invention he was frequently under the necessity of laying aside the work that brought in the weekly wages many years after when all difficulties had been successfully overcome the conversation which took place between husband and wife one eventful saturday evening was vividly remembered well john said the anxious wife looking in her husband's face will it work no anne was the sad answer i have had to take it all in pieces again though he could still speak hopefully and cheerfully his poor wife could restrain her feelings no longer but sat down and cried bitterly she had however only a few more weeks to wait for success long labored for and richly deserved came at last and a proud and happy man was john heathcote when he brought home the first narrow strip of bobbin net made by his machine and placed it in the hands of his wife it is difficult to describe in words an invention so complicated as the bobbin net machine 
it was indeed a mechanical pillow for making lace imitating in an ingenious manner the motions of the lace-maker's fingers in intersecting or tying the meshes of the lace upon her pillow long after he said the single difficulty of getting the diagonal threads to twist in the allotted space was so great that if it had now to be done i should probably not attempt its accomplishment at the age of twenty-four he was enabled to secure his invention by a patent as in the case of nearly all inventions which have proved productive heathcote's rights as a patentee were disputed and his claims as an inventor called in question on the supposed invalidity of the patent the lace-makers boldly adopted the bobbin net machine and set the inventor at defiance but other patents were taken out for alleged improvements and adaptations and it was only when these new patentees fell out and went to law with each other that heathcote's rights became established one lace manufacturer having brought an action against another for an alleged infringement of his patent the jury brought in a verdict for the defendant in which the judge concurred on the ground that both the machines in question were infringements of heathcote's patent after the trial was over mr heathcote on inquiry found about six hundred machines at work after his patent and he proceeded to levy royalty upon the owners of them which amounted to a large sum but the profits realized by the manufacturers of lace were very great and the use of the machines rapidly extended while the price of the article was reduced from five pounds the square yard to about five pence in the course of twenty-five years during the same period the average annual returns of the lace trade have been at least four millions sterling and it gives remunerative employment to about a hundred and fifty thousand workpeople in eighteen o nine we find him established as a lace manufacturer at loughborough in leicestershire there he carried on a prosperous business giving employment to a large number of operatives at wages varying from twenty five dollars to fifty dollars a week not only did he carry on the manufacture of lace but the various branches of business connected with it yarn doubling silk spinning net making and finishing he also established an iron foundry and works for the manufacture of agricultural implements which proved of great convenience to the district it was a favorite idea of his that steam power was capable of being applied to perform all the heavy drudgery of life and he labored for a long time at the invention of a steam plough in eighteen thirty two he so far completed his invention as to be enabled to take out a patent for it and heathcote's steam plough though it has since been superseded by fowler's was considered the best machine of the kind that had up to that time been invented mr heathcote was a man of great natural gifts he possessed a sound understanding quick perception and a genius for business of the highest order with these he combined uprightness honesty and integrity qualities which are the true glory of human character himself a diligent self-educator he gave ready encouragement to deserving youths in his employment stimulating their talents and fostering their energies during his own busy life he contrived to save time to master french and italian of which he acquired an accurate and grammatical knowledge his mind was largely stored with the results of a careful study of the best literature and there was few subjects on which he had not formed for himself shrewd and accurate views the two thousand workpeople in his employment regarded him almost as a father and he carefully provided for their comfort and improvement prosperity did not spoil him as it does so many nor close his heart against the claims of the poor and struggling who were always sure of his sympathy and help to provide for the education of the children of his workpeople he built schools for them at the cost of about thirty thousand dollars he was also a man of singularly cheerful and buoyant disposition a favorite with men of all classes and most admired and beloved by those who knew him best in eighteen thirty one the electors of tiverton of which town mr heathcote had proved himself so genuine a benefactor returned him to represent them in parliament and he continued their member for nearly thirty years during a great part of that time he had lord palmerston for his colleague 
and a noble lord on more than one public occasion expressed the high regard which he entertained for his venerable friend on retiring from the representation in eighteen fifty nine thirteen hundred of his workmen presented him with a silver inkstand and gold pen in token of their esteem he enjoyed his leisure for only two more years dying in january eighteen sixty one at the age of seventy seven and leaving behind him a character for probity virtue manliness and mechanical genius of which his descendants may well be proud End of chapter eight leaders of industry inventors and producers read by john greenman This is section nine of Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them by Samuel Smiles. Read by John Greenman. Chapter nine. Application and Perseverance. Our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. Confucius learn as if you were to live forever live as if you were to die to-morrow ancillus de insulis the greatest results in life are usually attained by simple means and the exercise of ordinary qualities the common life of every day with its cares necessities and duties affords ample opportunity for acquiring experience of the best kind and its most beaten paths provide the true worker with abundant scope for effort and room for self-improvement the road of human welfare lies along the old highway of steadfast well-doing and they who are the most persistent and work in the truest spirit will usually be the most successful fortune has often been blamed for her blindness but fortune is not so blind as men are those who look into practical life will find that fortune is usually on the side of the industrious as the winds and waves are on the side of the best navigators in the pursuit of even the highest branches of human inquiry the commoner qualities are found the most useful such as common sense attention application and perseverance genius may not be necessary though even genius of the highest sort does not disdain the use of these ordinary qualities the very greatest men have been among the least believers in the power of genius and as worldly wise and persevering as successful men of the commoner sort some have even defined genius to be only common sense intensified a distinguished teacher and president of a college spoke of it as the power of making efforts john foster held it to be the power of lighting one's own fire buffon said of genius it is patience newton's was unquestionably a mind of the very highest order and yet when asked by what means he had worked out his extraordinary discoveries he modestly answered by always thinking unto them at another time he thus expressed his method of study i keep the subject continually before me and wait till the first dawnings open slowly by little and little into a full and clear light it was in newton's case as in every other only by diligent application and perseverance that his great reputation was achieved even his recreation consisted in change of study laying down one subject to take up another to dr bentley he said if i have done the public any service it is due to nothing but industry and patient thought when the late president garfield began the study of finance he discovered that many of the best books upon that subject were written in the french language he immediately set himself at work to learn it and amid his diversified duties soon found time to so far conquer this language as to be able to both read and speak it well dalton the chemist repudiated the notion of his being a genius attributing everything which he had accomplished to simple industry and accumulation 
john hunter said of himself my mind is like a beehive but full as it is of buzz and apparent confusion it is yet full of order and regularity and food collected with incessant industry from the choicest stores of nature we have indeed but to glance at the biographies of great men to find that the most distinguished inventors artists thinkers and workers of all kinds owe their success in a great measure to their patient industry and application they were men who turned all things to gold even time itself disraeli the elder held that the secret of success consisted in being master of your subject such mastery being attainable only through continuous application and study hence it happens that the men who have most moved the world have not been so much men of genius strictly so called as men of intense mediocre abilities and untiring perseverance not so often the gifted of naturally bright and shining qualities as those who have applied themselves diligently to their work in whatsoever line that might lie hence a great point to be aimed at is to get the working quality well trained when that is done the race will be found comparatively easy we must repeat and again repeat facility will come with labor not even the simplest art can be accomplished without it and what difficulties it is found capable of achieving it was by early discipline and repetition that the late sir robert peel cultivated those remarkable though still mediocre powers which rendered him so illustrious an ornament of the british senate when a boy at drayton manor his father was accustomed to set him up at table to practice speaking extemporary and he early accustomed himself to repeat as much of the sunday sermon as he could remember little progress was made at first but by steady perseverance the habit of attention became powerful and the sermon was at length repeated almost verbatim when afterwards replying in succession to the arguments of his parliamentary opponents an art in which he was perhaps unrivalled it was little surmised that the extraordinary power of accurate remembrance which he displayed on such occasions had been originally trained under the discipline of his father in the parish church of drayton progress however of the best kind is comparatively slow great results cannot be achieved at once and we must be satisfied to advance in life as we walk step by step de Maistre said that to know how to wait is the great secret of success we must sow before we can reap and often have to wait long content meanwhile to look patiently forward in hope the fruit best worth waiting for often ripening the slowest but time and patience says the eastern proverb change the mulberry leaf to satin to wait patiently however men must work cheerfully cheerfulness is an excellent working quality imparting great elasticity to the character as a bishop has said temper is nine-tenths of christianity so are cheerfulness and diligence nine-tenths of practical wisdom they are the life and soul of success as well as of happiness perhaps the very highest pleasure in life consisting in clear brisk conscious working energy confidence and every other good quality mainly depending upon it sydney smith when laboring as a parish priest at foston le clay in yorkshire though he did not feel himself to be in his proper element went cheerfully to work in the firm determination to do his best i am resolved he said to like it and reconcile myself to it which is more manly than to feign myself above it and to send up complaints by the post of being thrown away and being desolate and such like trash so dr hook when leaving leeds for a new sphere of labor said wherever i may be i shall by god's blessing do with my might what my hand findeth to do and if i do not find work i shall make it it was a maxim of dr young the philosopher that any man can do what any other man has done 
and it is unquestionable that he himself never recoiled from any trials to which he determined to subject himself it is related of him that the first time he mounted a horse he was in company with the grandson of mr barclay of uri the well-known sportsman when the horsemen who preceded them leapt a high fence young wished to imitate him but fell off his horse in the attempt without saying a word he remounted made a second effort and was again unsuccessful but this time was not thrown further off than on the horse's neck to which he clung at the third trial he succeeded and cleared the fence the story of timur the tartar learning a lesson of perseverance under adversity from the spider is well known not less interesting is the anecdote of audubon the american ornithologist as related by himself an accident he says which happened to two hundred of my original drawings nearly put a stop to my researches in ornithology i shall relate it merely to show how far enthusiasm for by no other name can i call my perseverance may enable the preserver of nature to surmount the most disheartening difficulties i left the village of henderson in kentucky situated on the banks of the ohio where i resided for several years to proceed to philadelphia on business i looked to my drawings before my departure placed them carefully in a wooden box and gave them in charge of a relative with injunctions to see that no injury should happen to them my absence was of several months and when i returned after having enjoyed the pleasures of home for a few days i inquired after my box and what i was pleased to call my treasure the box was produced and opened but reader feel for me a pair of norway rats had taken possession of the whole and reared a young family among the gnawed bits of paper which but a month previous represented nearly a thousand inhabitants of air the burning heat which instantly rushed through my brain was too great to be endured without affecting my whole nervous system i slept for several nights and the days passed like days of oblivion until the animal powers being recalled into action through the strength of my constitution i took up my gun my notebook and my pencils and went forth to the woods as gaily as if nothing had happened i felt pleased that i might now make better drawings than before and ere a period not exceeding three years had elapsed my portfolio was again filled the accidental destruction of sir isaac newton's papers by his little dog diamond upsetting a lighted taper upon his desk by which the elaborate calculations of many years were in a moment destroyed is a well-known anecdote and need not be repeated it is said that the loss caused the philosopher such profound grief that it seriously injured his health and impaired his understanding an accident of a somewhat similar kind happened to the manuscript of mr carlyle's first volume of his french revolution he had lent the manuscript to a literary neighbor to peruse by some mischance it had been left lying on the parlor floor and become forgotten weeks ran on and the historian sent for his work the printers being loud for copy inquiries were made and it was found that the maid of all work finding what she conceived to be a bundle of waste paper on the floor had used it to light the kitchen and parlor fires such was the answer to return to mr carlyle and his feelings may be imagined there was however no help for him but to set resolutely to work to rewrite the book and he turned to and did it he had no draught and was compelled to rake up from his memory facts ideas and expressions which had been long since dismissed the composition of the book in the first instance had been a work of pleasure the writing of it a second time was one of pain and anguish almost beyond belief that he persevered and finished the volume under such circumstances affords an instance of determination of purpose which has seldom been surpassed the lives of eminent inventors are eminently illustrative of the same quality of perseverance george stephenson when addressing young men 
was accustomed to sum up his best advice to them in the words do as i have done persevere he had worked at the improvement of his locomotive for some fifteen years before achieving his decisive victory at rainhill and watt was engaged for some thirty years upon the condensing engine before he brought it to perfection but there are equally striking illustrations of perseverance to be found in every other branch of science art and industry perhaps one of the most interesting is that connected with the disentombment of the nineveh marbles and the discovery of the long-lost cuneiform or arrow-headed character in which the inscriptions on them are written a kind of writing which had been lost to the world since the period of the macedonian conquest of persia an intelligent cadet of the east india company stationed at kermanshah in persia had observed the curious cuneiform inscriptions on the old monuments in the neighborhood so old that all historical traces of them had been lost and amongst the inscriptions which he copied was that of the celebrated rock of behistun a perpendicular rock rising abruptly some seventeen hundred feet from the plain the lower part bearing inscriptions for the space of about three hundred feet in three languages persian scythian and assyrian comparison of the known with the unknown of the language which survived with the language that had been lost enabled this cadet to acquire some knowledge of the cuneiform character and even to form an alphabet mr rawlinson sent his tracings home for examination no professors in colleges as yet knew anything of the cuneiform character but there was a clerk of the east india house a modest unknown man by the name of norris who had made this little understood subject his study to whom the tracings were submitted and so accurate was his knowledge that though he had never seen the behistun rock he pronounced that the cadet had not copied the puzzling inscription with proper exactness rawlinson who was still in the neighborhood of the rock compared his copy with the original and found that norris was right and by further comparison and careful study the knowledge of the cuneiform writing was thus greatly advanced but to make the learning of these two self-taught men of avail a third laborer was necessary in order to supply them with material for the exercise of their skill such a laborer presented himself in the person of austin layard originally an articled clerk in the office of a london solicitor one would scarcely have expected to find in these three men a cadet an india house clerk and a lawyer's clerk the discoverers of a forgotten language and of the buried history of babylon yet it was so layard was a youth of only twenty-two travelling in the east when he was possessed with a desire to penetrate the region beyond the euphrates accompanied by a single companion trusting to his arms for protection and what was better to his cheerfulness politeness and chivalrous bearing he passed safely amidst tribes at deadly war with each other and after the lapse of many years with comparatively slender means at his command but aided by application and perseverance resolute will and purpose and almost sublime patience borne up throughout by his passionate enthusiasm for discovery and research he succeeded in laying bare and digging up an amount of historical treasures the like of which has probably never before been collected by the industry of any one man not less than two miles of bas-reliefs were thus brought to light by mr layard the selection of these valuable antiquities now placed in the british museum was found so curiously corroborative of the scriptural records of events which occurred some three thousand years ago that they burst upon the world almost like a new revelation and the story of the disentombment of these remarkable works as told by mr layard himself in his monuments of nineveh will always be regarded as one of the most charming and unaffected records which we possess of individual enterprise industry and energy the career of the comte de buffon presents another remarkable illustration of the power of patient industry as well as of his own saying that genius is patience notwithstanding the great results achieved by him in natural history buffon when a youth was regarded as of mediocre talents 
his mind was slow in forming itself and slow in reproducing what it had acquired he was also constitutionally indolent and being born to good estate it might be supposed that he would indulge his liking for ease and luxury instead of which he early formed the resolution of denying himself pleasure and devoting himself to study and self-culture regarding time as a treasure that was limited and finding that he was losing many hours by lying abed in the mornings he determined to break himself of the habit he struggled hard against it for some time but failed in being able to rise at the hour he had fixed he then called his servant joseph to his help and promised him the reward of a crown every time he succeeded in getting him up before six at first when called buffon declined to rise pleaded that he was ill or pretended anger at being disturbed and on the count at length getting up joseph found that he had earned nothing but reproaches for having permitted his master to lay a bed contrary to his express orders at length the valet determined to earn his crown and again and again he forced buffon to rise notwithstanding his entreaties expostulations and threats of immediate discharge from his service one morning buffon was unusually obstinate and joseph found it necessary to resort to the extreme measure of dashing a basin of ice-cold water under the bedclothes the effect of which was instantaneous by the persistent use of such means buffon at length conquered his habit and he was accustomed to say that he owed to joseph three or four volumes of his natural history for forty years of his life buffon worked every morning at his desk from nine till two and again in the evening from five till nine his diligence was so continuous and so regular that it became habitual his biographer has said of him work was his necessity his studies were the charm of his life and towards the last years of his glorious career he frequently said that he still hoped to be able to consecrate to them a few more years he was a most conscientious worker always studying to give the reader his best thoughts expressed in the very best manner he was never wearied with touching and retouching his compositions so that his style may be pronounced almost perfect he wrote the epoque de la nature not fewer than eleven times before he was satisfied with it although he had thought over the work about fifty years he was a thorough man of business most orderly in everything and he was accustomed to say that genius without order lost three-fourths of its power his great success as a writer was the result mainly of his painstaking labor and diligent application buffon observed madame necker strongly persuaded that genius is the result of a profound attention directed to a particular subject said that he was thoroughly wearied out when composing his first writings but compelled himself to return to them and go over them carefully again even when he thought he had already brought them to a certain degree of perfection and that at length he found pleasure instead of weariness in this long and elaborate correction it ought also to be added that buffon wrote and published all his great works while afflicted by one of the most painful diseases to which the human frame is subject true wisdom and humility are such that the more a man really knows the less conceited he is the student at trinity college who went up to his professor to take leave of him because he had finished his education was wisely rebuked by the professor's reply indeed i am only beginning mine the superficial person who has obtained a smattering of many things but knows nothing well may pride himself upon his gifts but the sage humbly confesses that all he knows is that he knows nothing or like newton that he has been only engaged in picking shells by the seashore while the great ocean of truth lies all unexplored before him loudon the landscape gardener was a man of extraordinary working power the son of a farmer near edinburgh he was early inured to work his skill in drawing plans and making sketches of scenery induced his father to train him for a landscape gardener 
during his apprenticeship he sat up two whole nights every week to study yet he worked harder during the day than any laborer in the course of his night studies he learnt french and before he was eighteen he translated a life of abelard for an encyclopedia he was so eager to make progress in life that when only twenty while working as a gardener in england he wrote down in his notebook i am now twenty years of age and perhaps a third part of my life has passed away and yet what have i done to benefit my fellow men an unusual reflection for a youth of only twenty from french he proceeded to learn german and rapidly mastered that language having taken a large farm for the purpose of introducing scotch improvements in the art of agriculture he shortly succeeded in realizing a considerable income the continent being thrown open at the end of the war he travelled abroad for the purpose of inquiring into the system of gardening and agriculture in other countries he twice repeated his journeys and the results were published in his encyclopedias which are among the most remarkable works of their kind distinguished for the immense mass of useful matter which they contain collected by an amount of industry and labor which has rarely been equalled the career of samuel drew is not less remarkable than any of those which we have cited his father was a hard-working laborer of cornwall though poor he contrived to send his two sons to a penny-a-week school jabez the elder took delight in learning and made great progress in his lessons but samuel the younger was a dunce notoriously given to mischief and playing truant when he was eight years old he was put to manual labor earning three halfpence a day at ten he was apprenticed to a shoemaker and while in this employment he endured much hardship living as he used to say like a toad under a harrow he often thought of running away and becoming a pirate or something of the sort and he seems to have grown in recklessness as he grew in years in robbing orchards he was usually a leader and as he grew older he delighted to take part in any poaching or smuggling adventure when about seventeen before his apprenticeship was out he ran away intending to enter on board a man-of-war but sleeping in a hayfield at night cooled him a little and he returned to his trade drew next removed to the neighborhood of plymouth to work at the shoemaking business while there he had nearly lost his life in a smuggling exploit which he had joined partly induced by the love of adventure and partly by the love of gain for his regular wages were not more than eight shillings a week one night notice was given throughout crafthole that a smuggler was off the coast ready to land her cargo on which the male population of the place nearly all smugglers made for the shore one party remained on the rocks to make signals and dispose of the goods as they were landed and another manned the boats drew being of the latter party the night was intensely dark and very little of the cargo had been landed when the wind rose with a heavy sea the men in the boats however determined to persevere and several trips were made between the smuggler now standing farther out to sea and the shore one of the men in the boat in which drew was had his hat blown off by the wind and in attempting to recover it the boat was upset three of the men were immediately drowned the others clung to the boat for a time but finding it drifting out to sea they took to swimming they were two miles from land and the night was intensely dark after being about three hours in the water drew reached a rock near the shore with one or two others where he remained benumbed with cold till morning when he and his companions were discovered and taken off more dead than alive this was a very unpromising beginning of a life and yet this same drew scapegrace orchard robber shoemaker and smuggler outlived the recklessness of his youth and became distinguished as a minister of the gospel and a writer of good books happily before it was too late the energy which characterized him was turned into a more healthy direction and rendered him as eminent in usefulness as he had been before in wickedness his father again took him back and found employment for him as a journeyman shoemaker 
perhaps his recent escape from death had tended to make the young man serious as we shortly find him attracted by the forcible preaching of dr adam clark his brother having died about the same time the impression of seriousness was deepened and thenceforward he was an altered man he began anew the work of education for he had almost forgotten how to read and write and even after several years practice a friend compared his writing to the traces of a spider dipped in ink set to crawl upon paper speaking of himself about that time drew afterwards said the more i read the more i felt my own ignorance and the more i felt my ignorance the more invincible became my energy to surmount it every leisure moment was now employed in reading one thing or another having to support myself by manual labor my time for reading was but little and to overcome this disadvantage my usual method was to place a book before me while at meat and at every repast i read five or six pages the perusal of locke's essay on understanding gave the first metaphysical turn to his mind it awakened me from my stupor he said and induced me to form a resolution to abandon the groveling views which i had been accustomed to entertain drew began business on his own account with a capital of a few shillings but his character for steadiness was such that a neighboring miller offered him a loan which was accepted and success attending his industry the debt was repaid at the end of a year he started with a determination to owe no man anything and he held to it in the midst of many privations often he went to bed supperless to avoid rising in debt his ambition was to achieve independence by industry and economy and in this he gradually succeeded in the midst of incessant labor he sedulously strove to improve his mind studying astrology history and metaphysics he was induced to pursue the latter study chiefly because it required fewer books to consult than either of the others it appeared to be a thorny path he said but i determined nevertheless to enter and accordingly began to read it added to his labors in shoemaking and metaphysics drew became a local preacher and a class leader he took an eager interest in politics and his shop became a favorite resort with the village politicians and when they did not come to him he went to them to talk over public affairs this so encroached upon his time that he found it necessary sometimes to work until midnight to make up for the hours lost during the day his political fervor became the talk of the village while busy one night hammering away at a shoe sole a little boy seeing a light in the shop put his mouth to the keyhole of the door and called out in a shrill pipe shoemaker shoemaker work by night and run about by day a friend to whom drew afterwards told the story asked and did not you run after the boy and strap him no no was the reply had a pistol been fired off at my ear i could not have been more dismayed or confounded i dropped my work and said to myself true true but you shall never have that to say of me again to me that cry was as the voice of god and it has been a word in season throughout my life i learnt from it not to leave till to-morrow the work of to-day or to idle when i ought to be working from that moment drew dropped politics and stuck to his work reading and studying in his spare hours but he never allowed the latter pursuit to interfere with his business though it frequently broke in upon his rest he married and thought of emigrating to america but he remained working on his literary taste first took the direction of poetical composition and from some of the fragments which have been preserved it appears that his speculations as to the immateriality and immortality of the soul had their origin in these poetical musings his study was the kitchen where his wife's bellows served him for a desk and he wrote amidst the cries and cradlings of his children Paine's age of reason having appeared about this time and excited much interest he composed a pamphlet in refutation of its arguments which was published he used afterwards to say that it was the age of reason that made him an author 
various pamphlets from his pen shortly appeared in rapid succession and a few years later while still working at shoemaking he wrote and published his admirable essay on the immateriality and immortality of the human soul which he sold for twenty pounds a great sum in his estimation at the time the book went through many editions and is still prized drew was in no wise puffed up by his success as many young authors are but long after he had become celebrated as a writer used to be seen sweeping the street before his door or helping his apprentices to carry in the winter's coal nor could he for some time bring himself to regard literature as a profession to live by his first care was to secure an honest livelihood by his business and to put into the lottery of literary success as he termed it only the surplus of his time at length however he devoted himself wholly to literature more particularly in connection with the wesleyan body editing one of their magazines and superintending the publication of several of their denominational works he also wrote in the eclectic review and compiled and published a valuable history of his native county cornwall with numerous other works towards the close of his career he said of himself raised from one of the lowest stations in society i have endeavored through life to bring my family into a state of respectability by honest industry frugality and a high regard for my moral character divine providence has smiled on my exertions and crowned my wishes with success End of chapter 9 Application and Perseverance Read by John Greenman This is section 10 of Happy Homes and the Hearts that Make Them. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Happy Homes and the Hearts that Make Them by Samuel Smiles read by john greenman chapter ten helps and opportunities scientific pursuits opportunity has hair in front behind she is bald but if you seize her by the forelock you may hold her but if suffered to escape not jupiter himself can catch her again from the latin accident does very little towards the production of any great result in life though sometimes what is called a happy hit may be made by a bold venture the common highway of steady industry and application is the only safe road to travel it is said of the landscape painter wilson that when he had nearly finished a picture in a tame correct manner he would step back from it his pencil fixed at the end of a long stick and after gazing earnestly on the work he would suddenly walk up and by a few bold touches give a brilliant finish to the painting but it will not do for every one who would produce an effect to throw his brush at the canvas in the hope of producing a picture the capability of putting in these last vital touches is acquired only by the labor of a life and the probability is that the artist who has not carefully trained himself beforehand in attempting to produce a brilliant effect at a dash will only produce a blotch sedulous attention and painstaking industry always mark the true worker the greatest men are not those who despise the day of small things but those who improve them the most carefully michael angelo was one day explaining to a visitor to his studio what he had been doing at a statue since his previous visit i have retouched this part polished that softened this feature brought out that muscle given some expression to this lip and more energy to that limb but these are trifles remarked the visitor it may be so replied the sculptor but recollect that trifles make perfection and perfection is no trifle so it was said of nicholas poussin the painter that the rule of his conduct was that whatever was worth doing at all was worth doing well 
and when asked late in life by a friend by what means he had gained so high a reputation among the painters of italy poussin emphatically answered because i have neglected nothing although there are discoveries which are said to have been made by accident if carefully inquired into it will be found that there has really been very little that was accidental about them for the most part these so-called accidents have only been opportunities carefully improved by genius the fall of the apple at newton's feet has often been quoted in proof of the accidental character of some discoveries but newton's whole mind had already been devoted for years to the laborious and patient investigation of the subject of gravitation and the circumstances of the apple falling before his eyes was suddenly apprehended only as genius could apprehend it and served to flash upon him the brilliant discovery then opening to his sight in like manner the brilliantly colored soap bubbles blown from a common tobacco pipe though trifles light as air in most eyes suggested to dr young his beautiful theory of interferences and led to his discovery relating to the diffraction of light although great men are popularly supposed only to deal with great things men such as newton and young were ready to detect the significance of the most familiar and simple facts their greatness consisting mainly in their wise interpretation of them the difference between men consists in a great measure in the intelligence of their observation the russian proverb says of the non-observant man he goes through the forest and sees no firewood the wise man's eyes are in his head says solomon but the fool walketh in darkness sir said johnson on one occasion to a fine gentleman just returned from italy some men will learn more in the hampstead stage than others in the tour of europe it is the mind that sees as well as the eye where unthinking gazers observe nothing men of intelligent vision penetrate into the very fibre of the phenomena presented to them attentively noting differences making comparisons and recognizing their underlying idea many before galileo had seen a suspended weight swing before their eyes with a measured beat but he was the first to detect the value of the fact one of the vergers in the cathedral at pisa after replenishing with oil a lamp which hung from the roof left it swing to and fro and galileo then a youth of only eighteen noting it attentively conceived the idea of applying it to the measurement of time fifty years of study and labor however elapsed before he completed the invention of his pendulum the importance of which in the measurement of time and in astronomical calculations can scarcely be overrated in like manner galileo having casually heard that a dutch spectacle maker had presented to count maurice an instrument by means of which distant objects appeared nearer to the beholder addressed himself to the cause of such a phenomenon which led to the invention of the telescope and proved the beginning of the modern science of astronomy discoveries such as these could never have been made by a negligent observer or by a mere passive listener while captain brown was occupied in studying the construction of bridges with a view of contriving one of a cheap description to be thrown across the tweed near which he lived he was walking in his garden one dewy autumn morning when he saw a tiny spider's net suspended across his path the idea immediately occurred to him that a bridge of iron ropes or chains might be constructed in like manner and the result was the invention of his suspension bridge sir james watt when consulted about the mode of carrying water by pipes under the clyde along the unequal bed of the river turned his attention one day to the shell of a lobster presented at table and from that model he invented an iron tube which when laid down was found effectually to answer the purpose sir isambert brunel took his first lessons in forming the thames tunnel from the tiny shipworm he saw how the little creature perforated the wood with its well-armed head first in one direction and then in another till the archway was complete and then daubed over the roof and sides 
with a kind of varnish and by copying this work exactly on a larger scale brunel was at length enabled to construct his shield and accomplish his great engineering work it is the intelligent eye of the careful observer which gives these apparently trivial phenomena their value so trifling a matter as the sight of seaweed floating past his ship enabled columbus to quell the mutiny which arose amongst his sailors at not discovering land and to assure them that the eagerly sought new world was not far off there is nothing so small that it should remain forgotten and no fact however trivial but may prove useful in some way or other if carefully interpreted who could have imagined that the famous chalk cliffs of albion had been built up by tiny insects detected only by the help of the microscope of the same order of creatures that have gemmed the sea with islands of coral and who that contemplates such extraordinary results arising from infinitely minute operations will venture to question the power of little things it is the close observation of little things which is the secret of success in business in art in science and in every pursuit of life human knowledge is but an accumulation of small facts made by successive generations of men the little bits of knowledge and experience carefully treasured up by them growing at length into a mighty pyramid though many of these facts and observations seemed in the first instance to have but slight significance they are all found to have their eventual uses and to fit into their proper places even many speculations seemingly remote turn out to be the basis of results the most obviously practical in the case of the conic sections discovered by apollonius pergaeus twenty centuries elapsed before they were made the basis of astronomy a science which enables the modern navigator to steer his way through unknown seas and traces for him in the heavens an unerring path to his appointed haven and had not mathematicians toiled for so long and to uninstructed observers apparently so fruitlessly over the abstract relations of lines and surfaces it is probable that but few of our mechanical inventions would have seen the light the secret of garfield's great success in life of his culture of his learning and of his growth in statesmanship was disclosed in a brief speech to the students of hiram college delivered many years ago he said i was thinking young ladies and gentlemen as i sat here this morning that life is almost wholly made up of margins the bulk itself of almost anything is not what tells that exists anyway that is expected that is not what gives the profit or makes the distinguishing difference the grocer cares little for the great bulk of the price of his tea it is the few cents between the cost and selling price which he calls the margin that particularly interests him is this to be great or small is the thing of importance millions of dollars change hands in our great marts of trade just on the question of margins this same thing is all important in the subject of thought one mind is not greater than another perhaps in the great bulk of its contents but its margin is greater that's all i may know just as much as you do about the general details of a subject but you can go just a little further than i can you have a greater margin than i you can tell me of some single thought just beyond where i have gone your margin has got me i must succumb to your superiority a good way to carry out the same idea and better illustrate it is by globes did you ever see two globes whose only difference was that one had half an inch larger diameter than the other the larger one although there is so little difference will entirely enclose the other and have a quarter of an inch in every direction to spare besides let those globes be minds with a living principle of some kind at their centers which throws out its little tentacle-like arms in every direction as if to explore for knowledge the one goes a certain distance and stops it can reach no farther it has come to a standstill 
it has reached its maximum of knowledge in that direction the other sends its arms out and can reach just a quarter of an inch farther so far as the first mind is able to tell the other has gone infinitely farther than it can reach it goes out to its farthest limit and must stop the other tells him things he did not know before many minds you may consider wonderful in their capacity they may be able to go only a quarter of an inch beyond you what an incentive this should be for any young man to work to make his margin as great as if not greater than the margin of his fellows i recall a good illustration of this when i was in college a certain young man was leading the class in latin i thought i was studying hard i couldn't see how he got the start of us all so to us he seemed to have an infinite knowledge he knew more than we did finally one day i asked him when he learned his latin lesson at night he replied i learned mine at the same time his window was not far from mine and i could see him from my own i had finished my lesson the next night as well as usual and feeling sleepy was about to go to bed i happened to saunter to my window and there i saw my classmate still bending diligently over his book there's where he gets the margin on me i thought but he shall not have it for once i resolved i will study just a little longer than he does to-night so i took down my books again and opening to the lesson went to work with renewed vigor i watched for the light to go out in my classmate's room in fifteen minutes it was all dark there is his margin i thought it was fifteen minutes more time it was hunting out fifteen minutes more of rules and root derivatives how often when a lesson is well prepared just five minutes spent in perfecting it will make one the best in the class the margin in such a case as that is very small but it is all important the world is made up of little things when franklin made his discovery of the identity of lightning and electricity it was sneered at and people asked of what use is it to which his reply was what is the use of a child it may become a man when galvani discovered that a frog's leg twitched when placed in contact with different metals it could scarcely have been imagined that so apparently insignificant a fact could have led to important results yet therein lay the germ of the electric telegraph which binds the intelligence of continents together and probably before many years have elapsed will put a girdle round the globe so too little bits of stone and fossil dug out of the earth intelligently interpreted has issued in the science of geology and the practical operations of mining in which large capitals are invested and vast numbers of persons profitably employed the gigantic machinery employed in pumping our mines working our mills and manufacturers and driving our steamships and locomotives in like manner depends for its supply of power upon so slight an agency as little drops of water expanded by heat that familiar agency called steam which we see issuing from that common tea-kettle spout but which when pent up within an ingeniously contrived mechanism displays a force equal to that of millions of horses and contains a power to rebuke the waves and set even the hurricane at defiance the same power at work within the bowels of the earth has been the cause of those volcanoes and earthquakes which have played so mighty a part in the history of the globe it is said that the marquis of worcester's attention was first accidentally directed to the subject of steam power by the tight cover of a vessel containing hot water having been blown off before his eyes when confined a prisoner in the tower he published the result of his observations in his century of inventions which formed a sort of textbook for inquiries into the powers of steam for a time until savary newcomen and others applying it to practical purposes brought the steam engine to the state in which watt found it when called upon to repair a model of newcomen's engine which belonged to the university of glasgow this accidental circumstance was an opportunity for watt which he was not slow to improve 
and it was the labor of his life to bring the steam engine to perfection this art of seizing opportunities and turning even accidents to accounts bending them to some purpose is a great secret of success dr johnson has defined genius to be a mind of large general powers accidentally determined in some particular direction men who are resolved to find a way for themselves will always find opportunities enough and if they do not lie ready to their hand they will make them it is not those who have enjoyed the advantages of colleges museums and public galleries that have accomplished the most for science and art nor have the greatest mechanics and inventors been trained in mechanics institutes necessity oftener than facility has been the mother of invention and the most prolific school of all has been the school of difficulty some of the very best workmen have had the most indifferent tools to work with but it is not tools that make the workman but the trained skill and perseverance of the man himself indeed it is proverbial that the bad workman never yet had a good tool someone asked opie by what wonderful process he mixed his colors i mix them with my brains sir was his reply it is the same with every workman who would excel ferguson made marvelous things such as his wooden clock that accurately measured the hours by means of a common penknife a tool in everybody's hand but then everybody is not a ferguson a pan of water and two thermometers were the tools by which dr black discovered latent heat and a prism a lens and a sheet of pasteboard enabled newton to unfold the composition of light and the origin of colors an eminent foreign savant once called upon dr wollaston and requested to be shown over his laboratories in which science had been enriched by so many important discoveries when the doctor took him into a little study and pointing to an old tea-tray on the table containing a few watch-glasses test papers a small balance and a blow-pipe said there is all the laboratory that i have stoddard learned the art of combining colors by closely studying butterflies wings he would often say that no one knew what he owed to these tiny insects a burnt stick and a barn door served wilkie in lieu of pencil and canvas bewick first practised drawing on the cottage walls of his native village which he covered with his sketches in chalk and benjamin west made his first brushes out of the cat's tail ferguson laid himself down in the fields at night in a blanket and made a map of the heavenly bodies by means of a thread with small beads on it stretched between his eye and the stars franklin first robbed the thundercloud of its lightning by means of a kite made with two cross sticks and a silk handkerchief watt made his first model of the condensing steam engine out of an old anatomist syringe used to inject the arteries previous to dissection gifford worked his first problems in mathematics when a cobbler's apprentice upon small scraps of leather which he beat smooth for the purpose whilst rittenhouse the astronomer first calculated eclipses on his plough handle the most ordinary occasions will furnish a man with opportunities or suggestions for improvement if he be but prompt to take advantage of them professor lee was attracted to the study of hebrew by finding a bible in that tongue in a synagogue while working as a common carpenter at the repairs of the benches he became obsessed with a desire to read the book in the original and buying a cheap second-hand copy of a hebrew grammar he sat to work and learned the language for himself as edmund stone said to the duke of argyle in answer to his grace's inquiry how he a poor gardener's boy had contrived to be able to read newton's principia in latin one needs only to know the twenty-four letters of the alphabet in order to learn everything else that one wishes application and perseverance and the diligent improvement of opportunities will do the rest sir walter scott found opportunities for self-improvement in every pursuit and turned even accidents to account 
thus it was in the discharge of his functions as a writer's apprentice that he first visited the highlands and formed those friendships among the surviving heroes of seventeen forty five which served to lay the foundation of a large class of his works later in life when employed as quartermaster of the edinburgh light cavalry he was accidentally disabled by the kick of a horse and confined for some time to his house but scott was a sworn enemy to idleness and he forthwith set his mind to work in three days he had composed the first canto of the lay of the last minstrel which he shortly after finished his first great original work the attention of dr priestley the discoverer of so many gases was accidentally drawn to the subject of chemistry through his living in the neighborhood of a brewery when visiting the place one day he noted the peculiar appearances attending the extinction of lighted chips in the gas floating over the fermented liquor he was forty years old at the time and knew nothing of chemistry he consulted books to ascertain the cause but they told him little for as yet nothing was known on the subject then he began to experiment with some rude apparatus of his own contrivance the curious results of his first experiments led to others which in his hands shortly became the science of pneumatic chemistry about the same time scheele was obscurely working in the same direction in a remote swedish village and he discovered several new gases with no more effective apparatus at his command than a few apothecaries vials and pigs bladders sir humphrey davy when an apothecary's apprentice performed his first experiments with instruments of the rudest description he extemporized the greater part of them himself out of the motley materials which chance threw in his way the pots and pans of the kitchen and the vials and vessels of his master's surgery it happened that a french ship was wrecked off the land's end and the surgeon escaped bearing with him his case of instruments amongst which was an odd-fashioned glyster apparatus this article he presented to davy with whom he had become acquainted the apothecary's apprentice received it with great exultation and forthwith employed it as a part of a pneumatic apparatus which he contrived afterwards using it to perform the duties of an air-pump in one of his experiments on the nature and sources of heat in like manner professor faraday sir humphrey davy's scientific successor made his first experiments in electricity by means of an old bottle while he was still a working bookbinder and it is a curious fact that faraday was first attracted to the study of chemistry by hearing one of sir humphrey davy's lectures on the subject at the royal institution a gentleman who was a member calling one day at the shop where faraday was employed in binding books found him poring over the article electricity in an encyclopedia placed in his hands to bind the gentleman having made inquiries found that the young bookbinder was curious about such subjects and gave him an order of admission to the royal institution where he attended a course of four lectures delivered by sir humphrey he took notes of them which he showed to the lecturer who acknowledged their scientific accuracy and was surprised when informed of the humble position of the reporter faraday then expressed his desire to devote himself to the prosecution of chemical studies from which sir humphrey at first endeavored to dissuade him but the young man's persisting he was at length taken into the royal institution as an assistant and eventually the mantle of the brilliant apothecary's boy fell upon the worthy shoulders of the equally brilliant bookbinder's apprentice the words which davy entered in his notebook when about twenty years of age working in dr beddoe's laboratory at bristol were eminently characteristic of him i have neither riches nor power nor birth to recommend me yet if i live i trust i shall not be of less service to mankind and my friends than if i had been born with all these advantages davy possessed the capability of devoting the whole power of his mind to the practical and experimental investigation of a subject in all its bearings and such a mind will rarely fail by dint of mere industry and patient thinking in producing results of the highest order coleridge said of davy 
there is an energy and elasticity in his mind which enables him to seize on and analyze all questions pushing them to their legitimate consequences every subject in davy's mind has the principle of vitality living thoughts spring up like turf under his feet davy on his part said of coleridge whose abilities he greatly admired with the most exalted genius enlarged views sensitive heart and enlightened mind he will be the victim of a want of order precision and regularity the great cuvier was a singularly accurate careful and industrious observer when a boy he was attracted to the subject of natural history by the sight of a volume of buffon which accidentally fell in his way he at once proceeded to copy the drawings and to color them after the description given in the text while still at school one of the teachers made him a present of linnaeus's system of nature and for more than ten years this constituted his library of natural history at eighteen he was offered the situation of tutor in a family residing in normandy living close to the seashore he was brought face to face with the wonders of marine life strolling along the sands one day he observed a stranded cuttlefish he was attracted by the curious object took it home to dissect and thus began the study of the molluscae in the pursuit of which he achieved so distinguished a reputation he had no books to refer to excepting only the great book of nature which lay open before him the study of the novel and interesting objects which it daily presented to his eyes made a much deeper impression on his mind than any written or engraved descriptions could possibly have done three years thus passed during which he compared the living species of marine animals with the fossil remains found in the neighborhood dissected the specimens of marine life that came under his notice and by careful observation prepared the way for a complete reform in the classification of the animal kingdom it is not accident then that helps a man in the world so much as purpose and persistent industry to the feeble the sluggish and the purposeless the happiest accidents will avail nothing they pass them by seeing no meaning in them but it is astonishing how much can be accomplished if we are prompt to seize and improve the opportunities for action and effort which are constantly presenting themselves watt taught himself chemistry and mechanics while working at his trade of a mathematical instrument maker at the same time that he was learning german from a swiss dyer stevenson taught himself arithmetic and mensuration while working as an engine man during the night shifts and when he could snatch a few moments in the intervals allowed for meals during the day he worked his sums with a bit of chalk upon the sides of the colliery wagons dalton's industry was the habit of his life he began from his boyhood for he taught a little village school when he was only about twelve years old keeping the school in winter and working upon his father's farm in the summer he would sometimes urge himself and companions to study by the stimulus of a bet and on one occasion by his satisfactory solution of a problem he won as much as enabled him to buy a winter's store of candles he continued his meteorological observations until a day or two before he died having made and recorded upwards of two hundred thousand in the course of his life with perseverance the very odds and ends of time may be worked up into results of the greatest value an hour in every day withdrawn from frivolous pursuits would if profitably employed enable a person of ordinary capacity to go far towards mastering a science it would make an ignorant man a well-informed one in less than ten years time should not be allowed to pass without yielding fruits in the form of something learned worthy of being known some good principle cultivated or some good habit strengthened dr mason good translated lucretius while riding in his carriage in the streets of london going the round of his patients dr darwin composed nearly all his works in the same way while driving about in his sulky from house to house in the country writing down his thoughts on little scraps of paper which he carried about with him for the purpose hale wrote his contemplations 
while traveling on circuit dr burney learned french and italian while traveling on horseback from one musical pupil to another in the course of his profession kirk white learned greek while walking to and from a lawyer's office and we personally know a man of eminent position who learned latin and french while going messages as an errand boy in the streets of manchester d'agso one of the great chancellors of france by carefully working up his odd bits of time wrote a bulky and able volume in the successive intervals of waiting for dinner and madame de genlis composed several of her charming volumes while waiting for the princess to whom she gave her daily lessons elihu burritt attributed his first success in self-improvement not to genius which he disclaimed but simply to the careful employment of those invaluable fragments of time called odd moments while working and earning his living as a blacksmith he mastered some eighteen ancient and modern languages and twenty-two european dialects what a solemn and striking admonition to youth is that inscribed on the dial at all souls oxford the hours perish and are laid to our charge time is the only little fragment of eternity that belongs to man and like life it can never be recalled in the dissipation of worldly treasure says jackson of exeter the frugality of the future may balance the extravagance of the past but who can say i will take from minutes to-morrow to compensate for those i have lost to-day melanchthon noted down the time lost by him that he might thereby reanimate his industry and not lose an hour an italian scholar put over his door an inscription intimating that whosoever remained there should join in his labors we are afraid said some visitor to baxter that we break in upon your time to be sure you do replied the disturbed and blunt divine time was the estate out of which these great workers and all other workers formed that rich treasury of thoughts and deeds which they have left to their successors the mere drudgery undergone by some men in carrying on their undertakings has been something extraordinary but the drudgery they regarded as the price of success addison amassed as much as three folios of manuscript materials before he began his spectator newton wrote his chronology fifteen times over before he was satisfied with it and gibbon wrote out his memoir nine times hale studied for many years at the rate of sixteen hours a day and when wearied with the study of the law he would recreate himself with philosophy and the study of the mathematics hume wrote thirteen hours a day while preparing his history of england montesquieu speaking of one part of his writings said to a friend you will read it in a few hours but i assure you it has cost me so much labor that it has whitened my hair the practice of writing down thoughts and facts for the purpose of holding them fast and preventing their escape into the dim region of forgetfulness has been much resorted to by thoughtful and studious men lord bacon left behind him many manuscripts entitled sudden thoughts set down for use erskine made great extracts from burke and eldon copied coke upon littleton twice over with his own hand so that the book became as it were part of his own mind the late dr pye smith when apprenticed to his father as a bookbinder was accustomed to make copious memoranda of all the books he read with extracts and criticisms this indomitable industry in collecting materials distinguished him through life his biographer describing him as always at work always in advance always accumulating these notebooks afterwards proved like richter's quarries the great storehouse from which he drew his illustrations the same practice characterized the eminent john hunter who adopted it for the purpose of supplying the defects of memory he was accustomed thus to illustrate the advantages which one derives from putting one's thoughts in writing it resembles he said a tradesman taking stock without which he never knows either what he possesses or in what he is deficient 
john hunter whose observation was so keen that abernethy was accustomed to speak of him as the argus eyed furnished an illustrious example of the power of patient industry he received little or no education till he was about twenty years of age and it was with difficulty that he acquired the arts of reading and writing he worked for some years as a carpenter at glasgow after which he joined his brother william who had settled in london as a lecturer and anatomical demonstrator john entered his dissecting room as an assistant but soon shot ahead of his brother partly by virtue of his great natural ability but mainly by reason of his patient application and indefatigable industry he was one of the first in this country to devote himself assiduously to the study of comparative anatomy and the objects he dissected and collected took the eminent professor owen no less than ten years to arrange the collection contains some twenty thousand specimens and is the most precious treasure of the kind that has ever been accumulated by the industry of one man hunter used to spend every morning from sunrise until eight o'clock in his museum and throughout the day he carried on his extensive private practice performed his laborious duties as surgeon to st george's hospital and deputy surgeon general to the army delivered lectures to students and superintended a school of practical anatomy at his own house finding leisure amidst all for elaborate experiments on the animal economy and the composition of various works of great scientific importance to find time for this gigantic amount of work he allowed himself only four hours of sleep at night and an hour after dinner when once asked what method he had adopted to insure success in his undertakings he replied my rule is deliberately to consider before i commence whether the thing be practicable if it be not practicable i do not attempt it if it be practical i can accomplish it if i give sufficient pains to it and having begun i never stop till the thing is done to this rule i owe all my success hunter occupied a great deal of his time in collecting definite facts respecting matters which before his day were regarded as exceedingly trivial thus it was supposed by many of his contemporaries that he was only wasting his time and thought in studying so carefully as he did the growth of a deer's horn but hunter was impressed with the conviction that no accurate knowledge of scientific facts is without its value by the study referred to he learned how arteries accommodate themselves to circumstances and enlarge as occasion requires and the knowledge thus acquired emboldened him in a case of aneurysm in a branch artery to tie the main trunk where no surgeons before him had dared to tie it and the life of his patient was saved like many original men he worked for a long time as it were underground digging and laying foundations harvey was as zealous a laborer as any we have named he spent not less than eight long years of investigation and research before he published his views of the circulation of the blood he repeated and verified his experiments again and again probably anticipating the opposition he would have to encounter from the profession in making known his discovery the tract in which he at length announced his views was a modest one but simple perspicuous and conclusive it was nevertheless received with ridicule as the utterance of a cracked-brained impostor for some time he did not make a single convert and gained nothing but contumely and abuse he had called in question the revered authority of the ancients and it was even averred that his views were calculated to subvert the authority of the scriptures and undermine the very foundation of morality and religion his little practice fell away and he was left almost without a friend this lasted for some years until the great truth held fast by harvey amidst all his adversity and which had dropped into many thoughtful minds gradually ripened by further observation and after a period of about twenty-five years it became generally recognized as an established scientific truth 
the difficulties encountered by dr jenner in promulgating and establishing his discovery of vaccination as a preventative of smallpox were even greater than those of harvey many before him had witnessed the cowpox and had heard of the report current among the milkmaids in gloucestershire that whoever had taken that disease was secure against smallpox it was a trifling vulgar rumor supposed to have no significance whatever and no one had thought it worthy of investigation until it was accidentally brought under the notice of jenna he was a youth pursuing his studies at sodbury when his attention was arrested by the casual observation made by a country girl who came to his master's shop for advice the smallpox was mentioned when the girl said i can't take that disease for i have had cowpox the observation immediately riveted jenner's attention and he forthwith set about inquiring and making observations on the subject his professional friends to whom he mentioned his views as to the prophylactic virtues of cowpox laughed at him and even threatened to expel him from their society if he persisted in harassing them with the subject in london he was so fortunate as to study under john hunter to whom he communicated his views the advice of the great anatomist was thoroughly characteristic don't think but try be patient be accurate jenner's courage was supported by the advice which conveyed to him the true art of philosophical investigation he went back to the country to practice his profession and make observations and experiments which he continued to pursue for a period of twenty years his faith in his discovery was so implicit that he vaccinated his own son on three several occasions at length he published his views in a quarto of about seventy pages in which he gave the details of twenty-three cases of successful vaccination of individuals in whom it was found afterwards impossible to communicate the smallpox either by contagion or inoculation it was in seventeen ninety eight that this treatise was published though he had been working out his ideas since the year seventeen seventy five when they had begun to assume a definite form how was the discovery received first with indifference then with active hostility jenner proceeded to london to exhibit to the profession the process of vaccination and its results but not a single medical man could be induced to make trial of it and after fruitlessly waiting for nearly three months he returned to his native village he was even caricatured and abused for his attempt to bestialize his species by the introduction into their systems of diseased matter from the cow's udder vaccination was denounced from the pulpit as diabolical it was averred that vaccinated children became ox-faced that abscesses broke out to indicate sprouting horns and that the countenance was gradually transmuted into the visage of a cow the voice into the bellowing of bulls vaccination however was a truth and notwithstanding the violence of the opposition belief in it spread slowly in one village where a gentleman tried to introduce the practice the first persons who permitted themselves to be vaccinated were absolutely pelted and driven into their houses if they appeared out of doors two ladies of title had the courage to vaccinate their children and the prejudices of the day were at once broken through the medical profession gradually came round and there were several who even sought to rob dr jenner of the merit of the discovery when its importance came to be recognized jenner's cause at last triumphed and he was publicly honored and rewarded in his prosperity he was as modest as he had been in his obscurity he was invited to settle in london and told that he might command a practice of fifty thousand dollars a year but his answer was no in the morning of my days i sought the sequestered and lowly path of life the valley and not the mountain and now in the evening of my days it is not meet for me to hold myself up as an object for fortune and for fame during jenner's own lifetime the practice of vaccination became adopted all over the civilized world and when he died his title as a benefactor of his kind was recognized far and wide cuvier has said if vaccine were the only discovery of the epoch it would serve to render it illustrious 
for ever yet it knocked twenty times in vain at the doors of the academies not less patient resolute and persevering was sir charles bell in the prosecution of his discoveries relating to the nervous system previous to his time the most confused notions prevailed as to the functions of the nerves and this branch of study was little more advanced than it had been at the time of democritus and anaxagoras three thousand years before sir charles bell in the valuable series of papers the publication of which was commenced in eighteen twenty one took an entirely original view of the subject based upon a long series of careful accurate and oft-repeated experiments elaborately tracing the development of the nervous system up from the lowest order of animated being to man the lord of the animal kingdom he displayed it to use his own words as plainly as if it were written in our mother tongue his discovery consisted in the fact that the spinal nerves are double in their function and arise by double roots from the spinal marrow volition being conveyed by that part of the nerves springing from the one root and sensation by the other the subject occupied the mind of sir charles bell for a period of forty years when in eighteen forty he laid his last paper before the royal society as in the case of harvey and jenner when he had lived down the ridicule and opposition with which his views were first received and their truth came to be recognized numerous claims for priority in making the discovery were set up at home and abroad like them too he lost practice by the publication of his papers and he left it on record that after every step in his discovery he was obliged to work harder than ever to preserve his reputation as a practitioner the great merits of sir charles bell were however at length fully recognized and cuvier himself when on his deathbed finding his face distorted and drawn to one side pointed out the symptom to his attendants as a proof of the correctness of sir charles bell's theory the life of sir william herschel affords another remarkable illustration of the force of perseverance in another branch of science his father was a poor german musician who brought up his four sons to the same calling william came over to england to seek his fortune and he joined the band of the durham militia in which he played the oboe the regiment was lying at doncaster where dr miller first became acquainted with herschel having heard him perform a solo on the violin in a surprising manner the doctor entered into conversation with the youth and was so pleased with him that he urged him to leave the militia and take up his residence at his house for a time herschel did so and while at doncaster was principally occupied as a violin player at concerts availing himself of the advantages of dr miller's library to study at his leisure hours a new organ having been built for the parish church at halifax an organist was advertised for on which herschel applied for the office and was selected leading the wandering life of an artist he was next attracted to bath where he played in the pump room band and also officiated as organist in the octagon chapel some recent discoveries in astronomy having arrested his mind and awakened in him a powerful spirit of curiosity he sought and obtained from a friend the loan of a two-foot gregorian telescope so fascinated was the poor musician by the science that he even thought of purchasing a telescope but the price asked by the london optician was so alarming that he determined to make one those who know what a reflecting telescope is and the skill which is required to prepare the concave metallic speculum which forms the most important part of the apparatus will be able to form some idea of the difficulty of this undertaking nevertheless herschel succeeded after long and painful labor in completing a five-foot reflector with which he had the gratification of observing the ring and satellites of saturn not satisfied with his triumph he proceeded to make other instruments in succession of seven ten and even twenty feet in constructing the seven-foot reflector he finished no fewer than two hundred specula before he produced one that would bear any power that was applied to it a striking instance of the persevering laboriousness of the man 
while gauging the heavens with his instruments he continued patiently to earn his bread by piping to the fashionable frequenters of the pump-room so eager was he in his astronomical observations that he would steal away from the room during an interval of the performance give a little turn at his telescope and contentedly return to his oboe thus working away herschel discovered the georgium sidus the orbit and rate of motion of which he carefully calculated and sent the result to the royal society when the humble oboe player found himself at once elevated from obscurity to fame he was shortly after appointed astronomer royal and by the kindness of george the third was placed in a position of honorable competency for life he bore his honors with the same meekness and humility which had distinguished him in the days of his obscurity so gentle and patient and withal so distinguished and successful a follower of science under difficulties perhaps cannot be found in the entire history of biography hugh miller was a man of like observant faculties who studied literature as well as science with zeal and success while hugh was but a child his father who was a sailor was drowned at sea and he was brought up by his widowed mother he had a school training after a sort but his best teachers were the boys with whom he played the men amongst whom he worked the friends and relatives with whom he lived he read much and miscellaneously and picked up odd sorts of knowledge from many quarters from workmen carpenters fishermen and sailors and above all from the old boulders strewn along the shores of cromarty frith with the big hammer which had belonged to his great-grandfather an old buccaneer the boy went about chipping the stones and accumulating specimens of mica porphyry garnet and such like sometimes he had a day in the woods and there too the boy's attention was excited by the peculiar geological curiosities which came in his way when of a suitable age he was apprenticed to the trade of his choice that of a working stonemason and he began his laboring career in a quarry looking out upon the cromarty frith this quarry proved one of his best schools the remarkable geological formation which it displayed awakened his curiosity the bar of deep red stone beneath and the bar of pale red clay above were noted by the young quarryman who even in such unpromising subjects found matter of observation and reflection where other men saw nothing he detected analogies differences and peculiarities which set him thinking he simply kept his eyes and his mind open was sober diligent and persevering and this was the secret of his intellectual growth his curiosity was excited and kept alive by the curious organic remains principally of old and extinct species of fish ferns and ammonites which were revealed along the coast by the washings of the waves or were exposed by the strokes of his mason's hammer he never lost sight of the subject but went on accumulating observations and comparing formations until at length many years afterwards when no longer a working mason he gave to the world his highly interesting works on the old redstone sandstone which at once established his reputation as a scientific geologist but this work was the fruit of long years of patient observation and research as he modestly states in his autobiography the only merit to which i lay claim in the case is that of patient research a merit in which whoever wills may rival or surpass me and this humble faculty of patience when rightly developed may lead to more extraordinary developments of idea than even genius itself not long ago sir roderick murchison discovered in the far north of scotland a profound geologist in the person of a baker named robert dick when sir roderick called upon him at the bakehouse in which he baked and earned his bread robert dick delineated to him by means of flour upon the board the geographical features and geological phenomena of his native country pointing out the imperfections in the existing maps which he had ascertained by travelling over the country in his leisure hours on further inquiry sir roderick ascertained that the humble individual before him was not only a capital baker and geologist 
but a first-rate botanist i found said the president of the geographical society to my great humiliation that the baker knew more of botanical science i ten times more than i did and that there were only some twenty or thirty specimens of flowers which he had not collected some he had obtained as presents some he had purchased but the greater portion he had accumulated by his industry in his native county of caithness and the specimens were all arranged in the most beautiful order with their scientific names affixed end of chapter ten helps and opportunities scientific pursuits read by john greenman this is chapter eleven of happy homes and the hearts that make them this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven energy and will read by john greenman kites rise against not with the wind no man ever worked his passage anywhere in a dead calm john neal there is a famous speech recorded of an old norseman thoroughly characteristic of the teuton i believe neither in idols nor demons said he i put my sole trust in my own strength of body and soul either i will find a way or make one was an exposition of the same sturdy independence which to this day distinguishes the descendants of the northmen indeed nothing could be more characteristic of the scandinavian mythology than that it had a god with a hammer a man's character is seen in small matters and from even so slight a test as the mode in which a man wields a hammer his energy may in some measure be inferred thus an eminent frenchman hit off in a single phrase the characteristic quality of the inhabitants of a particular district in which a friend of his proposed to settle and buy beware said he of making a purchase there i know the men of that department the pupils who come from it to our veterinary school at paris do not strike hard upon the anvil they want energy and you will not get a satisfactory return on any capital you may invest there a fine and just appreciation of character indicating the thoughtful observer and strikingly illustrative of the fact that it is the energy of the individual men that gives strength to a state and confers a value even upon the very soil which they cultivate the cultivation of this quality is of the greatest importance resolute determination in the pursuit of worthy objects being the foundation of all true greatness of character energy enables a man to force his way through irksome drudgery and dry details and carries him onward and upward in every station in life it accomplishes more than genius with not one half the disappointment and peril it is not eminent talent that is required to ensure success in any pursuit so much as purpose not merely the power to achieve but the will to labor energetically and perseveringly hence energy of will may be defined to be the very central power of character in a man in a word it is the man himself it gives impulse to his very action and soul to every effort true hope is based on it and it is hope that gives the real perfume to life woe unto him that is faint-hearted says the son of sirach there is indeed no blessing equal to the possession of a stout heart even if a man fail in his efforts it will be a satisfaction to him to enjoy the consciousness of having done his best in humble life nothing can be more cheering and beautiful than to see a man combating suffering by patience triumphing in his integrity and who when his feet are bleeding and his limbs failing him still walks upon his courage when luther said to erasmus you desire to walk upon eggs without crushing them and among glasses 
without breaking them the timorous hesitating erasmus replied i will not be unfaithful to the cause of christ at least so far as the age will permit me luther was of a very different character i will go to worms though devils were combined against me as thick as the tiles upon the housetops nothing that is of real worth can be achieved without courageous working man owes his growth chiefly to that active striving of the will that encounter with difficulty which we call effort and it is astonishing to find how often results apparently impractical are thus made possible an intense anticipation itself transforms possibility into reality our desires being often but the precursors of the things which we are capable of performing on the contrary the timid and hesitating find everything impossible chiefly because it seems so it is related of a young french officer that he used to walk about his apartment exclaiming i will be marshal of france and a great general his ardent desire was the presentiment of his success for the young officer did become a distinguished commander and he died a marshal of france you are now at the age said lamenet once addressing a gay youth at which a decision must be formed by you a little later and you may have to groan within the tomb which you yourself have dug without the power of rolling away the stone that which the easiest becomes a habit in us is the will learn then to will strongly and decisively thus fix your floating life and leave it no longer to be carried hither and thither like a withered leaf by every wind that blows buxton held the conviction that a young man might be very much what he pleased provided he formed a strong resolution and held to it writing to one of his sons he said to him you are now at that period of life in which you must make a turn to the right or to the left you must now give proofs of principle determination and strength of mind or you must sink into idleness and acquire the habits and character of a desultory ineffective young man and if once you fall to that point you will find it no easy matter to rise again i am sure that a young man may be very much what he pleases in my own case it was so much of my happiness and all my prosperity in life has resulted from the change i made at your age if you seriously resolve to be energetic and industrious depend upon it that you will for your whole life have reason to rejoice that you are wise enough to form and to act upon that determination as will considered without regard to direction is simply constancy firmness perseverance it will be obvious that everything depends upon right direction and motives directed towards the enjoyment of the senses the strong will may be a demon and the intellect merely its debased slave but directed towards good the strong will is a king and the intellect the minister of man's highest well-being where there is a will there is a way is an old and true saying he who resolves upon doing a thing by that very resolution often scales the barriers to it and secures its achievement to think we are able is almost to be so to determine upon attainment is frequently attainment itself thus earnest resolution has often seemed to have about it almost a savor of omnipotence the strength of suarau's character lay in his power of willing and like most resolute persons he preached it up as a system you can only half will he would say to people who failed like richelieu and napoleon he would have the word impossible banished from the dictionary i don't know i can't and impossible were words which he detested above all others learn do try he would exclaim his biographer has said of him that he furnished a remarkable illustration of what may be effected by the energetic development and exercise of faculties the germs of which at least are in every human heart one of napoleon's favorite maxims was the truest wisdom is a resolute determination 
his life beyond most others vividly showed what a powerful and unscrupulous will could accomplish he threw his whole force of body and mind direct upon his work imbecile rulers and the nations they governed went down before him in succession he was told that the alps stood in the way of his armies there shall be no alps he said and the road across the simplon was constructed through a district formerly almost inaccessible impossible said he is a word only to be found in the dictionary of fools he was a man who toiled terribly sometimes employing and exhausting four secretaries at a time he spared no one not even himself his influence inspired other men and put a new life into them i made my generals out of mud he said but all was of no avail for napoleon's intense selfishness was his ruin and the ruin of france which he left a prey to anarchy his life taught the lesson that power however energetically wielded without beneficence is fatal to its possessor and its subjects and that knowledge without goodness is but the incarnate principle of evil our own wellington was a far greater man not resolute firm and persistent but more self-denying conscientious and truly patriotic napoleon's aim was glory wellington's watchword like nelson's was duty the former word it is said does not once occur in his dispatches the latter often but never accompanied by any high-sounding professions the greatest difficulties could neither embarrass nor intimidate wellington his energy invariably rising in proportion to the obstacles to be surmounted the patience the firmness the resolution with which he bore through the maddening vexations and gigantic difficulties of the peninsular campaigns is perhaps one of the sublimest things to be found in history though his natural temper was irritable in the extreme his high sense of duty enabled him to restrain it and to those about him his patience seemed absolutely inexhaustible his great character stands untarnished by ambition avarice or any low passion though a man of powerful individuality he yet displayed a great variety of endowment the equal of napoleon in generalship he was as prompt vigorous and daring as clive as wise a statesman as cromwell and as pure and high-minded as washington the great wellington left behind him an enduring reputation founded on toilsome campaigns won by skilful combination by fortitude which nothing could exhaust by sublime daring and perhaps by still sublimer patience energy usually displays itself in promptitude and decision when ledyard the traveller was asked by the african association when he would be ready to set out for africa he immediately answered to-morrow morning blucher's promptitude obtained for him the cognomen of marshal forward throughout the prussian army when john jervis afterwards earl st vincent was asked when he would be ready to join his ship he replied directly and when sir colin campbell appointed to the command of the indian army was asked when he could set out his answer was to-morrow an earnest of his subsequent success for it is rapid decision and a similar promptitude in action such as taking instant advantage of an enemy's mistakes that so often wins battles at arcola said napoleon i won the battle with twenty-five horsemen i seized a moment of lassitude gave every man a trumpet and gained the day with this handful two armies are two bodies which meet and endeavor to frighten each other a moment of panic occurs and that moment must be turned to advantage every moment lost said he at another time gives an opportunity for misfortune and he declared that he beat the austrians because they never knew the value of time another great but sullied name is that of warren hastings a man of dauntless will and untiring industry his family was ancient and illustrious but their vicissitudes of fortune and ill-requited loyalty in the cause of the stuarts brought them to poverty 
and the family estate at dalesford of which they had been lords of the manor for hundreds of years at length passed from their hands the last hastings of dalesford had however presented the parish living to his second son and it was in his house many years later that warren hastings his grandson was born the boy learned his letters at the village school on the same bench with the children of the peasantry he played in the fields which his fathers had owned and what the loyal and brave hastings of dalesford had been was ever in the boy's thoughts his young ambition was fired and it is said that one summer's day when only seven years old as he laid him down on the bank of the stream which flowed through the domain he formed in his mind the resolution that he would yet recover possession of the family lands it was the romantic vision of a boy yet he lived to realize it the dream became a passion rooted in his very life and he pursued his determination through youth up to manhood with that calm but indomitable force of will which was the most striking peculiarity of his character the orphan boy became one of the most powerful men of his time he retrieved the fortunes of his line bought back the old estate and rebuilt the family mansion sir charles napier was another indian leader of extraordinary courage and determination he once said of the difficulties with which he was surrounded in one of his campaigns they only make my feet go deeper into the ground his battle of meany was one of the most extraordinary feats in history with two thousand men of whom only four hundred were europeans he encountered an army of thirty-five thousand hardy and well-armed beluchis it was an act apparently of the most daring temerity but the general had faith in himself and in his men he marched the beluch center up a high bank which formed their rampart in front and for three mortal hours the battle raged each man of that small force inspired by the chief became for the time a hero the beluchis though twenty to one were driven back but with their faces to the foe it is this sort of pluck tenacity and determined perseverance which wins soldiers battles and indeed every battle it is the one neck nearer that wins the race that shows the blood it is the one march more that wins the campaign the five minutes more persistent courage that wins the fight though your force be less than another's you equal and outmaster your opponent if you continue it longer and concentrate it more the reply of the spartan father who said to his son when complaining that his sword was too short add a step to it is applicable to everything in life napier took the right method of inspiring his men with his own heroic spirit he worked as hard as any private in the ranks the great art of commanding he said is to take a fair share of the work the man who leads an army cannot succeed unless his whole mind is thrown into his work the more trouble the more labor must be given the more danger the more pluck must be shown till all is overpowered a young officer who accompanied him in his campaigns in the kutchi hills once said when i see that old man incessantly on his horse how can i be idle who am young and strong i would go into a loaded cannon's mouth if he ordered me this remark when repeated to napier he said was ample reward for his toils the anecdote of his interview with the indian juggler strikingly illustrates his cool courage as well as his remarkable simplicity and honesty of character on one occasion after the indian battles a famous juggler visited the camp and performed his feats before the general his family and staff among other performances this man cut in two with a stroke of his sword a lime or lemon placed in the hand of his assistant napier thought there was some collusion between the juggler and his retainer to divide by a sweep of the sword on a man's hand so small an object without touching the flesh he believed to be impossible though a similar incident is related by scott in his romance of the talisman to determine the point the general offered his own hand for the experiment and he stretched out his right arm the juggler looked attentively at the hand and said he would not make the trial 
i thought i would find you out exclaimed napier but stop added the other let me see your left hand the left hand was submitted and the man then said firmly if you hold your arm steady i will perform the feat but why the left hand and not the right because the right is hollow to the center and there is a risk of cutting off the thumb the left is high and the danger will be less napier was startled i got frightened he said i saw it was an actual feat of delicate swordsmanship and if i had not abused the man as i did before my staff and challenged him to the trial i honestly acknowledge i would have retired from the encounter however i put the lime on my hand and held out my arm steadily the juggler balanced himself and with a swift stroke cut the lime in two pieces i felt the edge of the sword on my hand as if a cold thread had been drawn across it so much he added for the brave swordsmen of india whom our fine fellows defeated at Miani. patriotism and nobility culminate in the life of washington the leader and deliverer of his country he was one of the greatest men of the eighteenth century not so much by his genius as by his purity and trustworthiness his english descent was a goodly heritage he came from an anglican stock settled in the county of durham from thence his ancestors emigrated to america and settled in virginia about year sixteen fifty seven the character of george washington was such that at an early age he was appointed to positions of great trust and confidence at the age of nineteen he was appointed one of the adjutants general of virginia with the rank of major nor did he ever deceive those who put trust in him he was ever prompt obedient and dutiful at the age of twenty-three he was appointed colonel and commander-in-chief of all the forces raised in virginia for cooperation with the english troops in the defense of the western territory against the french he was trained not only in success but in failure which evoked his indomitable spirit no man could be more pure no man could be more self-denying in victory he was self-controlled in defeat he was unshaken throughout he was magnanimous and pure in general washington it is difficult to know which to admire the most the nobility of his character the ardor of his patriotism or the purity of his conduct toward the close of his address to the governors of the several states on resigning his position of commander-in-chief he said i make it my constant prayer that god would have you and the state over which you preside in his holy protection that he would incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government to entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another for their fellow citizens of the united states at large and particularly for their brethren who have served in the field and finally that he would most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice to love mercy and to demean ourselves with that charity humility and pacific temper of mind which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion without a humble imitation of whose example in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation how simple truthful and beautiful are the words of washington it is not the size of a country but the character of its people that gives it sterling value we find men constantly calling for liberty but who do nothing to deserve it they remain inert lazy and selfish there is a so-called patriotism that has no more dignity in it than the howling of wolves true patriotism is of another sort it is based on honesty truthfulness generosity self-sacrifice and genuine love of freedom look for instance at the little republic of switzerland which has been hemmed in by tyrannical governments for hundreds of years but the people are brave and frugal honest and self-helping they would have no master but governed themselves they elected their representatives as at appenzell by show of hands in the public market-places they proclaimed liberty of conscience and switzerland like england has always been the refuge of the persecuted for conscience sake 
it was not without severe struggles that switzerland conquered its independence the leaders of these brave men have often sacrificed themselves for the good of their country take for instance the example of arnold von winkelried in fourteen eighty one the austrians invaded switzerland and a comparatively small number of men determined to resist them near the little town of sempach the austrians were observed advancing in a solid compact body presenting an unbroken line of spears the swiss met them but their spears were shorter and being much fewer in number they were compelled to give way observing this arnold von winkelried seeing that all the efforts of the swiss to break the ranks of their enemy had failed exclaimed to his countrymen i will open a path to freedom protect dear comrades my wife and children he rushed forward and gathering in his arms as many spears as he could grasp he buried them in his bosom he fell but a gap was made and the swiss rushed in and achieved an exceeding great victory arnold von winkelried died but saved his country the little mountain republic preserved its liberty the battle took place on the ninth of july and to this day the people of the country assemble to celebrate their deliverance from the austrians through the self-sacrifice of their leader the career of dr livingston is one of the most interesting his ancestors were poor but honest highlanders and it is related of one of them renowned in his district for wisdom and prudence that when on his deathbed he called his children around him and left them these words the only legacy he had to bequeath in my lifetime said he i have searched most carefully through all the traditions i could find of our family and i never could discover that there was a dishonest man among our forefathers if therefore any of you or any of your children should take to dishonest ways it will not be because it runs in our blood it does not belong to you i leave this precept with you be honest at the age of ten livingston was sent to work in a cotton factory near glasgow as a piecer with part of his first week's wages he bought a latin grammar and began to learn that language pursuing the study for years at a night school he would sit up conning his lessons till twelve or later when not sent to bed by his mother for he had to be up and at work in the factory every morning by six in this way he plodded through virgil and horace also reading extensively all books excepting novels that came in his way but more especially scientific works and books of travels he occupied his spare hours which were but few in the pursuit of botany scouring the neighborhood to collect plants he even carried on his reading amidst the roar of the factory machinery so placing the book upon the spinny jenny which he worked that he could catch sentence after sentence as he passed it in this way the persevering youth acquired much youthful knowledge and as he grew older the desire possessed him of becoming a missionary to the heathen with this object he set himself to obtain a medical education in order the better to be qualified for the work he accordingly economized his earnings and saved as much money as enabled him to support himself while attending the medical and greek classes as well as the divinity lectures at glasgow for several winters working as a cotton spinner during the remainder of each year he thus supported himself during his college career entirely by his own earnings as a factory workman never having received a farthing of help from any source looking back now he honestly says at that life of toil i cannot but feel thankful that it formed such a material part of my early education and were it possible i should like to begin life over again in the same lowly style and to pass through the same hardy training at first he thought of going to china but the war then waging with that country prevented his following out the idea and having offered his services to the london missionary society he was by them sent out to africa which he reached in eighteen forty he had intended to proceed to china by his own efforts and he says the only pang he had in going to africa at the charge of the london missionary society was because it was not quite agreeable to one accustomed to work his own way to become in a manner 
dependent upon others arrived in africa he set to work with great zeal he could not brook the idea of merely entering upon the labors of others but cut out a large sphere of independent work preparing himself for it by undertaking manual labor in building and other handicraft employment in addition to teaching which he says made me generally as much exhausted and unfit for study in the evenings as ever i had been when a cotton spinner whilst laboring amongst the bequanas he dug canals built houses cultivated fields reared cattle and taught the natives to work as well as worship john howard was another of the many patient and persevering men who have made england what it is content simply to do with energy the work they have been appointed to do and to go to their rest thankfully when it is done leaving no memorial but a world made better by their lives his sublime life proved that even physical weakness could remove mountains in the pursuit of an end recommended by duty the idea of ameliorating the condition of prisoners engrossed his whole thoughts and possessed him like a passion and no toil no danger no bodily suffering could turn him from that great object of his life though a man of no genius and but moderate talent his heart was pure and his will was strong even in his own time he achieved a remarkable degree of success and his influence did not die with him for it has continued powerfully to affect not only the legislation of england but of all civilized nations down to the present hour andrew marvel was a patriot of the old roman build he lived in troublous times he was born at hull at the beginning of the reign of charles i when a young man he spent four years at trinity college cambridge he afterwards travelled through europe in italy he met milton and continued his friend through life on his return to england the civil war was raging it does not appear that he took any part in the struggle though he was always a defender and promoter of liberty in sixteen sixty he was elected member of parliament for his native town and during his membership he wrote to the mayor and his constituents by almost every post telling them of the course of affairs in parliament marvel did not sympathize with milton's anti-monarchical tendencies his biographer styles him the friend of england liberty and magna carta he had no objections to a properly restricted monarchy and therefore favored the restoration the people longed for it believing that the return of charles the second would prove the restoration of peace and loyalty they were much mistaken marvel was appointed to accompany lord carlisle on an embassy to russia showing that he was not reckoned an enemy to the court during his absence much evil had been done the restored king was constantly in want of money he took every method by selling places and instituting monopolies to supply his perpetual need in one of marvel's letters to his constituents he said the court is at the highest pitch of want and luxury and the people are full of discontent the king continued to raise money unscrupulously by means of his courtiers and apostate patriots he bought them up by bribes of thousands of pounds but marvel was not to be bought his satires upon the court and its parasites were published they were read by all classes from the king to the tradesman the king determined to win him over he was threatened he was flattered he was thwarted he was caressed he was beset with spies he was waylaid by ruffians and courted by beauties but no delilah could discover the secret of his strength his integrity was proof alike against danger and against corruption against threats and bribes pride is the ally of principle in a court which held no man to be honest and no woman chaste this soft sorcery was cultivated to perfection but marvel revering and respecting himself was proof against its charms it has been said that lord treasurer danby thinking to buy over his old schoolfellow called upon marvel in his garret at parting the lord treasurer slipped into his hand an order on the treasury for five thousand dollars and then went to his chariot marvel looking at the paper calls after the treasurer 
my lord i request another moment they went up again to the garret and jack the servant boy was called jack child what had i for dinner yesterday don't you remember sir you had the little shoulder of mutton that you ordered me to bring from a woman in the market very right child what have i for dinner to-day don't you know sir that you bid me lay by the blade bone to broil tis so very right child go away my lord said marvel turning to the treasurer do you hear that andrew marvel's dinner is provided there's your piece of paper i want it not i knew the sort of kindness you intended i live here to serve my constituents the ministry may seek men for their purpose i am not one buxton was a dull heavy boy distinguished for his strong self-will which first exhibited itself in violent domineering and headstrong obstinacy his father died when he was a child but fortunately he had a wise mother who trained his will with great care constraining him to obey but encouraging the habit of deciding and acting for himself in matters which might safely be left to him his mother believed that a strong will directed upon worthy objects was a valuable manly quality if properly guided and she acted accordingly when others about her commented on the boy's self-will she would merely say never mind he is self-willed now you will see it will turn out well in the end fowl learned very little at school and was regarded as a dunce and an idler he got other boys to do his exercises for him while he romped and scrambled about he returned home at fifteen a great growing awkward lad fond only of boating shooting riding and field sports spending his time principally with the gamekeeper a man possessed of a good heart an intelligent observer of life and nature though he could neither read nor write buxton had excellent raw material in him but he wanted culture training and development at this juncture of his life when his habits were being formed for good or evil he was happily thrown into the society of the gurney family distinguished for their fine social qualities not less than for their intellectual culture and public-spirited philanthropy this intercourse with the gurneys he used afterwards to say gave the coloring to his life they encouraged his efforts at self-culture and when he went to the university of dublin and gained high honors there the animating passion in his mind he said was to carry back to them the prizes which they prompted and enabled him to win he married one of the daughters of the family and started in life commencing as a clerk his power of will which made him so difficult to deal with as a boy now formed the backbone of his character and made him most industrious and energetic in whatever he undertook he threw his whole strength and bulk right down upon his work and the great giant elephant buxton they called him for he stood some six feet four in height became one of the most vigorous and practical of men there was invincible energy and determination in whatever he did admitted a partner he became the active manager of the concern and the vast business which he conducted felt his influence through every fibre and prospered far beyond its previous success nor did he allow his mind to lie fallow for he gave his evenings diligently to self-culture studying and digesting blackstone montesquieu and solid commentaries on english law his maxims in reading were never to begin a book without finishing it never to consider a book finished until it is mastered and to study everything with the whole mind when only thirty-two buxton entered parliament and at once assumed that position of influence there of which every honest earnest well-informed man is secure who enters that assembly buxton was no genius not a great intellectual leader nor discoverer but mainly an earnest straightforward resolute energetic man indeed his whole character is most forcibly expressed in his own words which every young man might well stamp upon his soul the longer i live said he the more i am certain that the great difference between men between the feeble and the powerful the great and the insignificant is energy 
invincible determination a purpose once fixed and then death or victory that quality will do anything that can be done in this world and no talents no circumstances no opportunities will make a two-legged creature a man without it end of chapter eleven energy and will read by john greenman This is section 12 of Happy Homes and the Hearts that Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 Self Culture, Facilities, and Difficulties. Read by John Greenman. Every person has two educations one which he receives from others, and one, more important, which he gives to himself. Gibbon is there one whom difficulties dishearten who bends to the storm he will do little is there one who will conquer that kind of man never fails john hunter the best part of man's education said sir walter scott is that which he gives to himself the late sir benjamin brodie delighted to remember this saying and he used to congratulate himself on the fact that professionally he was self-taught but this is necessarily the case with all men who have acquired distinction in letters science or art the education received at school or college is but a beginning and is valuable mainly inasmuch as it trains the mind and habituates it to continuous application and study that which is put into us by others is always far less ours than that which we acquire by our own diligent and persevering effort knowledge conquered by labor becomes a possession a property entirely our own our own active effort is the essential thing and no facilities no books no teachers no amount of lessons learnt by rote will enable us to dispense with it the best teachers have been the readiest to recognize the importance of self-culture and of stimulating the student to acquire knowledge by the active exercise of his own faculties they have relied more upon training than upon telling and sought to make their pupils themselves active parties to the work in which they were engaged thus making teaching something far higher than the mere passive reception of the scraps and details of knowledge this was the spirit in which the great dr arnold worked he strove to teach his pupils to rely upon themselves and develop their powers by their own active efforts himself merely guiding directing stimulating and encouraging them i would far rather he said send a boy to van diemen's land where he must work for his bread then send him to oxford to live in luxury without any desire in his mind to avail himself of his advantages if there be one thing on earth he observed on another occasion which is truly admirable it is to see god's wisdom blessing an inferiority of natural powers when they have been honestly truly and zealously cultivated speaking of a pupil of this character he said i would stand to that man hat in hand once at Lalham, when teaching a rather dull boy arnold spoke somewhat sharply to him on which the pupil looked up in his face and said why do you speak angrily sir indeed i am doing the best i can years afterwards arnold used to tell the story to his children and added i never felt so much in my life that look and that speech i have never forgotten practical success in life depends more upon physical health than is generally imagined hodson writing home to a friend in england said i believe if i get on well in india it will be owing physically speaking to a sound digestion the use of early labor in self-imposed mechanical employments may be illustrated by the boyhood of sir isaac newton though comparatively a dull scholar he was very assiduous in the use of his saw hammer and hatchet knocking and hammering in his lodging room making models of 
windmills carriages and machines of all sorts and as he grew older he took delight in making little tables and cupboards for his friends smeaton watt and stevenson were equally handy with tools when mere boys and but for such kind of self-culture in their youth it is doubtful whether they would have accomplished so much in their manhood such was also the early training of the great inventors and mechanics described in the preceding pages whose contrivance and intelligence were practically trained by the constant use of their hands in early life elihu burritt says he found hard labor necessary to enable him to study with effect and more than once he gave up school teaching and study and taking to his leather apron again went back to his blacksmith's forge and anvil for his health of body and mind's sake the training of young men in the use of tools would at the same time that it educated them in common things teach them the use of their hands and arms familiarize them with healthy work exercise their faculties upon things tangible and actual give them some practical acquaintance with mechanics impart to them the ability of being useful and implant in them the habit of persevering physical effort this is an advantage which the working classes strictly so called certainly possess over the leisure classes that they are in early life under the necessity of applying themselves laboriously to some mechanical pursuit or other thus acquiring manual dexterity and the use of their physical powers the chief disadvantage attached to the calling of the laborious classes is not that they are employed in physical work but that they are too exclusively so employed often to the neglect of their moral and intellectual faculties while the youths of the leisure classes having been taught to associate labor with servility have shunned it and been allowed to grow up practically ignorant the poorer classes confining themselves within the circle of their laborious callings have been allowed to grow up in a large proportion of cases absolutely illiterate it seems possible however to avoid both these evils by combining physical training or physical work with intellectual culture and there are various signs abroad which seem to mark the gradual adoption of this healthier system of education while it is necessary then in the first place to secure this solid foundation of physical health it must also be observed that the cultivation of the habit of mental application is quite indispensable for the education of the student the maxim that labor conquers all things holds especially true in the case of the conquest of knowledge the road into learning is alike free to all who will give the labor and the study requisite to gather it nor are there any difficulties so great that the student of resolute purpose may not surmount and overcome them it was one of the characteristic expressions of chatterton that god had sent his creatures into the world with arms long enough to reach anything if they chose to be at the trouble in study as in business energy is the great thing we must not only strike the iron while it is hot but strike it till it is made hot it is astonishing how much may be accomplished in self-culture by the energetic and the persevering who are careful to avail themselves of opportunities and use up the fragments of spare time which the idle permit to run to waste thus ferguson learned astronomy from the heavens while wrapped in a sheepskin on the highland hills thus stone learned mathematics while working as a journeyman gardener thus drew studied the highest philosophy in the intervals of cobbling shoes and thus miller taught himself geology while working as a day laborer in a quarry sir joshua reynolds as we have already observed was so earnest a believer in the force of industry that he held that all men might achieve excellence if they would but exercise the power of assiduous and patient working he held that drudgery lay on the road to genius and that there was no limit to the proficiency of an artist except the limit of his own painstaking he would not believe in what is called inspiration but only in study and labor excellence he said is never granted to a man but as the reward of labor if you have great talents industry will improve them 
if you have but moderate abilities industry will supply their deficiency nothing is denied to well-directed labor nothing is to be obtained without it sir fowl buxton was an equal believer in the power of study and he entertained the modest idea that he could do as well as other men if he devoted to the pursuit double the time and labor that they did he placed his great confidence in ordinary means and extraordinary application thoroughness and accuracy are two principal points to be aimed at in study francis horner in laying down rules for the cultivation of his mind placed great stress upon the habit of continuous application to one subject for the sake of mastering it thoroughly he confined himself with this object to only a few books and resisted with the greatest firmness every approach to a habit of desultory reading the value of knowledge to any man consists not in its quantity but mainly in the good uses to which he can apply it hence a little knowledge of an exact and perfect character is always found to be more valuable for practical purposes than any extent of superficial learning one of ignatius loyola's maxims was he who does well one work at a time does more than all by spreading our efforts over too large a surface we inevitably weaken our force hinder our progress and acquire a habit of fitfulness and ineffective working lord st leonards once communicated to sir fowl buxton the mode in which he had conducted his studies and thus explained the secret of his success i resolved said he when beginning to read law to make everything i acquired perfectly my own and never to go to a second thing till i had entirely accomplished the first many of my competitors read as much in a day as i read in a week but at the end of twelve months my knowledge was as fresh as the day it was acquired while theirs had glided away from recollection it is not the quantity of study that one gets through or the amount of reading that makes a wise man but the appositeness of the study to the purpose for which it is pursued the concentration of the mind for the time being on the subject under consideration and the habitual discipline by which the whole system of mental application is regulated the most profitable study is that which is conducted with a definite aim and object by thoroughly mastering any given branch of knowledge we render it more available for use at any moment hence it is not enough merely to have books or to know where to read for information as we want it practical wisdom for the purposes of life must be carried about with us and be ready for use at call it is not sufficient that we have a fund laid up at home but not a farthing in the pocket we must carry about with us a store of the current coin of knowledge ready for exchange on all occasions else we are comparatively helpless when the opportunity for using it occurs decision and promptitude are as requisite in self-culture as in business the growth of these qualities may be encouraged by accustoming young people to rely upon their own resources leaving them to enjoy as much freedom of action in early life as is practicable too much guidance and restraint hinder the formation of habits of self-help they are like bladders tied under the arms of one who has not taught himself to swim want of confidence is perhaps a greater obstacle to improvement than is generally imagined dr johnson was accustomed to attribute his success to confidence in his own powers true modesty is quite compatible with a due estimate of one's own merits and does not demand the abnegation of all merit though there are those who deceive themselves by putting a false figure before their ciphers the want of confidence the want of faith in oneself and consequently the want of promptitude in action is a defect of character which is found to stand very much in the way of individual progress and the reason why so little is done is generally because so little is attempted it is the use we make of the powers entrusted to us which constitutes our only just claim to respect 
he who employs his one talent aright is as much to be honored as he to whom ten talents have been given there is really no more personal merit attaching to the possession of superior intellectual powers than there is in the succession to a large estate how are those powers used how is that estate employed the mind may accumulate large stores of knowledge without any useful purpose but the knowledge must be allied to goodness and wisdom and embodied in upright character else it is naught pestalozzi even held intellectual training by itself to be pernicious insisting that the roots of all knowledge must strike and feed in the soil of the rightly governed will the acquisition of knowledge may it is true protect a man against the meaner felonies of life but not in any degree against its selfish vices unless fortified by sound principles and habits hence do we find in daily life so many instances of men who are well informed in intellect but utterly deformed in character filled with the learning of the schools yet possessing little practical wisdom and offering examples for warning rather than imitation an often quoted expression at this day is that knowledge is power but so also are fanaticism despotism and ambition knowledge of itself unless wisely directed might merely make bad men more dangerous and the society in which it was regarded as the highest good little better than a pandemonium it is also to be borne in mind that the experience gathered from books though often valuable is but of the nature of learning whereas the experience gained from actual life is of the nature of wisdom and a small store of the latter is worth vastly more than any stock of the former lord bolingbroke truly said that whatever study tends neither directly nor indirectly to make us better men and citizens is at best but a specious and ingenious sort of idleness and the knowledge we acquire by it only a creditable kind of ignorance nothing more useful and instructive though good reading may be it is yet only one mode of cultivating the mind and is much less influential than practical experience and good examples in the formation of character there were wise valiant and true-hearted men bred in england long before the existence of a reading public magna carta was secured by men who signed the deed with their marks though altogether unskilled in the art of deciphering the literary signs by which the principles were denominated upon paper yet they understood and appreciated and boldly contended for the things themselves thus the foundations of english liberty were laid by men who though illiterate were nevertheless of the very highest stamp of character and it must be admitted that the chief object of culture is not merely to fill the mind with other men's thoughts and to be the passive recipient of their impressions of things but to enlarge our individual intelligence and render us more useful and efficient workers in the sphere of life to which we may be called many of our most energetic and useful workers have been but sparing readers brindley and stevenson did not learn to read and write until they reached manhood and yet they did great works and lived manly lives john hunter could barely read or write when he was twenty years old though he could make tables and chairs with any carpenter in the trade when told that one of his contemporaries has charged him with being ignorant of the dead languages he said i would undertake to teach him that on the dead body which he never knew in any language dead or living it is not then how much a man may know that is of importance but the end and purpose for which he knows it the object of knowledge should be to mature wisdom and improve character to render us better happier and more useful more benevolent more energetic and more efficient in the pursuit of every high purpose in life when people once fall into the habit of admiring and encouraging ability as such without reference to moral character they are on the highway to all sorts of degradation 
we must ourselves be and do and not rest satisfied merely with reading and meditating over what other men have been and done our best light must be made life and our best thought action at least we ought to be able to say as richter did i have made as much out of myself as could be made of the stuff and no man should require more for it is every man's duty to discipline and guide himself with god's help according to his responsibilities and the faculties with which he has been endowed self-respect is the noblest garment with which a man may clothe himself the most elevating feeling with which the mind can be inspired one of pythagoras's wisest maxims in his golden verses is that with which he enjoins the pupil to reverence himself born up by this high idea he will not defile his body by sensuality nor his mind by servile thoughts this sentiment carried into daily life will be found at the root of all the virtues cleanliness sobriety chastity morality and religion the pious and just honoring of ourselves said milton may be thought the radical moisture and fountainhead from whence every laudable and worthy enterprise issues forth to think meanly of oneself is to sink in one's own estimation as well as in the estimation of others and as the thoughts are so will the acts be man cannot aspire if he look down if he will rise he must look up the very humblest may be sustained by the proper indulgence of this feeling poverty itself may be lifted and lighted up by self-respect and it is truly a noble sight to see a poor man hold himself upright amidst his temptations and refuse to demean himself by low actions self-culture may not however end in eminence as in the numerous instances above cited the great majority of men in all times however enlightened must necessarily be engaged in the ordinary avocations of industry and no degree of culture which can be conferred upon the community at large will ever enable them even were it desirable which it is not to get rid of the daily work of society which must be done but this we think may also be accomplished we can elevate the condition of labor by allying it to noble thoughts which confer a grace upon the lowliest as well as the highest rank for no matter how poor or humble a man may be the great thinker of this and other days may come in and sit down with him and be his companion for the time though his dwelling be the meanest hut it is thus that the habit of well-directed reading may become a source of the greatest pleasure and self-improvement and exercise a gentle coercion with the most beneficial results over the whole tenor of a man's character and conduct and even though self-culture may not bring wealth it will at all events give one the companionship of elevated thoughts a noble man once contemptuously asked of a sage what have you got by all your philosophy at least i have got society in myself was the wise man's reply but many are apt to feel despondent and become discouraged in the work of self-culture because they do not get on in the world so fast as they think they deserve to do having planted their acorn they expect to see it grow into an oak at once they have perhaps looked upon knowledge in the light of a marketable commodity and are consequently mortified because it does not sell as they expected it would do mr tremon here in one of his education reports states that a schoolmaster in norfolk finding his school rapidly falling off made inquiry into the cause and ascertained that the reason given by the majority of the parents for withdrawing their children was that they had expected education was to make them better off than they were before but that having found it had done them no good they had taken their children from school and would give themselves no further trouble about education the same low idea of self-culture is but too prevalent in other classes and is encouraged by the false views of life which are always more or less current in society 
but to regard self-culture either as a means of getting past others in the world or of intellectual dissipation and amusement rather than as a power to elevate the character and expand the spiritual nature is to place it on a very low level to use the words of bacon knowledge is not a shop for profit or sale but a rich storehouse for the glory of the creator and the relief of man's estate it is doubtless most honorable for a man to labor to elevate himself and to better his condition in society but this is not to be done at the sacrifice of himself to make the mind the mere drudge of the body is putting it to a very servile use and to go about whining and bemoaning our pitiful lot because we fail in achieving that success in life which after all depends rather upon habits of industry and attention to business details than upon knowledge is the mark of a small and often of a sour mind such a temper can not better be reproved than in the words of robert southey who thus wrote to a friend who sought his counsel i would give you advice if it could be of use but there is no curing those who choose to be diseased a good and wise man may at times be angry with the world at times grieved for it but be sure no man was ever discontented with the world if he did his duty in it if a man of education who has health eyes hands and leisure wants an object it is only because god almighty has bestowed all those blessings upon a man who does not deserve them amusement in moderation is wholesome and to be commended but amusement in excess vitiates the whole nature and is a thing to be carefully guarded against the maxim is often quoted of all work and no play makes jack a dull boy but all play and no work makes him something greatly worse nothing can be more hurtful to a youth than to have his soul surfeited with pleasure the best qualities of his mind are impaired common enjoyments become tasteless his appetite for the higher kind of pleasure is vitiated and when he comes to face the work and the duties of life the result is usually aversion and disgust fast men waste and exhaust the powers of life and dry up the sources of true happiness having forestalled their spring they can produce no healthy growth of either character or intellect a child without simplicity a maiden without innocence a boy without truthfulness are not more piteous sights than the man who has wasted and thrown away his youth in self-indulgence mirabeau said of himself my early years have already in a great measure disinherited the succeeding ones and dissipated a great part of my vital powers as the wrong done to another to-day returns upon ourselves to-morrow so the sins of our youth rise up in our age to scourge us i assure you wrote giusti the italian to a friend i pay a heavy price for existence it is true that our lives are not at our own disposal nature pretends to give them gratis at the beginning and then sends in her account the worst of useful indiscretions is not that they destroy health so much as that they sully manhood the dissipated youth becomes a tainted man and often he can not be pure even if he would if cure there be it is only to be found in inoculating the mind with a fervent spirit of duty and in energetic application to useful work robert nichol wrote to a friend after reading the recollections of coleridge what a mighty intellect was lost in that man for want of a little energy a little determination nichol himself was a true and brave spirit who died young but not before he had encountered and overcome great difficulties in life at his outset while carrying on a small business as a bookseller he found himself weighed down with a debt of only twenty pounds which he said he felt weighing like a millstone round his neck and that if he had it paid he never would borrow again from mortal man writing to his mother at the time he said fear not for me dear mother for i feel myself daily growing firmer and more hopeful in spirit 
the more i think and reflect and thinking not reading is now my occupation i feel that whether i be growing richer or not i am growing a wiser man which is far better pain poverty and all the other wild beasts in life which so frighten others i am so bold as to think i could look in the face without shrinking without losing respect for myself faith in man's high destinies or trust in god there is a point which it costs much mental toil and struggling to gain but which when once gained a man can look down from as a traveller from a lofty mountain on storms raging below while he is walking in sunshine that i have yet gained this point in life i will not say but i feel myself daily nearer to it it is not ease but effort not facility but difficulty that makes men there is perhaps no station in life in which difficulties have not to be encountered and overcome before any decided measure of success can be achieved those difficulties are however our best instructors as our mistakes are often our best experience charles james fox was accustomed to say that he hoped more from a man who failed and yet went on in spite of his failure than from the buoyant career of the successful it is all very well said he to tell me that a young man has distinguished himself by a brilliant first speech he may go on or he may be satisfied with his first triumph but show me a young man who has not succeeded at first and nevertheless has gone on and i will back that young man to do better than most of those who have succeeded at the first trial we learn wisdom from failure much more than from success we often discover what will do by finding out what will not do and probably he who never made a mistake never made a discovery it was the failure in the attempt to make a sucking pump act when the working bucket was more than thirty-three feet above the surface of the water to be raised that led observant men to study the law of atmospheric pressure and opened a new field of research to the genius of galileo torricelli and boyle john hunter used to remark that the art of surgery would not advance until professional men had the courage to publish their failures as well as their successes watt the engineer said of all things most wanted in mechanical engineering was a history of failures we want he said a book of blots when sir humphrey davy was once shown a dexterously manipulated experiment he said i thank god i was not made a dexterous manipulator for the most important of my discoveries have been suggested to me by failures another distinguished investigator in physical science has left it on record that whenever in the course of his researches he encountered an apparently insuperable obstacle he generally found himself on the brink of some discovery the very greatest things great thoughts great discoveries inventions have usually been nurtured in hardship often pondered over in sorrow and at length established with difficulty beethoven said of rossini that he had in him the stuff to have made a good musician if he had only when a boy been well flogged but that he had been spoilt by the facility with which he produced men who feel their strength within them need not fear to encounter adverse opinions they have far greater reason to fear undue praise and too friendly criticism when mendelssohn was about to enter the orchestra at birmingham on the first performance of his elijah he said laughingly to one of his friends and critics stick your claws into me don't tell me what you like but what you don't like it has been said and truly that it is the defeat that tries the general more than the victory washington lost more battles than he gained but he succeeded in the end the romans in their most victorious campaigns almost invariably began with defeats moreau used to be compared by his companions to a drum which nobody hears of except it be beaten wellington's military genius was perfected by encounter with difficulties of apparently the most overwhelming character but which only served to move his resolution and 
bring out more prominently his great qualities as a man and a general so the skilful mariner obtains his best experience amidst storms and tempests which train him to self-reliance courage and the highest discipline and we probably owe to rough seas and wintry nights the best training of the race of british seamen who are certainly not surpassed by any in the world sweet indeed are the uses of adversity they reveal to us our powers and call forth our energies if there be real worth in the character like sweet herbs it will give forth its finest fragrance when pressed crosses says the old proverb are the ladders that lead to heaven what is even poverty itself asks richter that a man should murmur under it it is but as the pain of piercing a maiden's ear and you hang precious jewels in the wound in the experience of life it is found that the wholesome discipline of adversity in strong natures usually carries with it a self-preserving influence many are found capable of bravely bearing up under privations and cheerfully encountering obstructions who are afterwards found unable to withstand the more dangerous influences of prosperity it is only a weak man whom the wind deprives of his cloak a man of average strength is more in danger of losing it when assailed by the beams of a too genial sun thus it often needs a higher discipline and a stronger character to bear up under good fortune than under adverse some generous natures kindle and warm with prosperity but there are many on whom wealth has no such influence base hearts it only hardens making those who were mean and servile mean and proud but while prosperity is apt to harden the heart to pride adversity in a man of resolution will serve to ripen it into fortitude to use the words of burke difficulty is a severe instructor set over us by the supreme ordinance of a parental guardian and instructor who knows us better than we know ourselves as he loves us better too he that wrestles with us strengthens our nerves and sharpens our skill our antagonist is thus our helper without the necessity of encountering difficulty life might be easier but men would be worth less for trials wisely improved train the character and teach self-help thus hardship itself may often prove the wholesome discipline for us though we recognize it not the battle of life is in most cases fought uphill and to win it without a struggle were perhaps to win it without honor if there were no difficulties there would be no success if there were nothing to struggle for there would be nothing to be achieved difficulties may intimidate the weak but they act only as a wholesome stimulus to men of resolution and valor all experience of life indeed serves to prove that the impediments thrown in the way of human advancement may for the most part be overcome by steady good conduct honest zeal activity perseverance and above all by a determined resolution to surmount difficulties and stand up manfully against misfortune the school of difficulty is the best school of moral discipline for nations as for individuals indeed the history of difficulty would be but a history of all the great and good things that have yet been accomplished by men it is hard to say how much northern nations owe to their encounter with a comparatively rude and changeable climate and an originally sterile soil which is one of the necessities of their condition involving a perennial struggle with difficulties such as the natives of sunnier climes know nothing of and thus it may be that though our finest products are exotic the skill and industry which have been necessary to rear them have issued in the production of a native growth of men not surpassed on the globe wherever there is difficulty the individual man must come out for better or for worse encounter with it will train his strength and discipline his skill heartening him for future effort as the racer by being trained to run against the hill at length courses with facility 
the road to success may be steep to climb and it puts to the proof the energies of him who would reach the summit but by experience a man soon learns that obstacles are to be overcome by grappling with them that the nettle feels as soft as silk when it is boldly grasped and that the most effective help towards realizing the object proposed is the moral conviction that we can and will accomplish it thus difficulties often fall away of themselves before the determination to overcome them much will be done if we do but try nobody knows what he can do till he has tried and few try their best till they have been forced to do it if i could do such and such a thing sighs the desponding youth but nothing will be done if he only wishes the desire must ripen into purpose and effort and one energetic attempt is worth a thousand aspirations it is these thorny ifs which so often hedge around the field of possibility and prevent anything being done or even attempted a difficulty said lord lyndhurst is a thing to be overcome grapple with it at once facility will come with practice and strength and fortitude with repeated effort thus the mind and character may be trained to an almost perfect discipline and enabled to act with a grace spirit and liberty almost incomprehensible to those who have not passed through a similar experience carissimi when praised for the ease and grace of his melodies exclaimed ah you little know with what difficulty this ease has been acquired sir joshua reynolds when once asked how long it had taken him to paint a certain picture replied all my life henry clay the american orator when giving advice to young men thus described to them the secret of his success in the cultivation of his art i owe my success in life said he chiefly to one circumstance that at the age of twenty-seven i commenced and continued for years the process of daily reading and speaking upon the contents of some historical or scientific book these off-hand efforts were made sometimes in a cornfield at others in the forest and not unfrequently in some distant barn with a horse and the ox for my auditors it is to this early practice of the art of all arts that i am indebted for the primary and leading impulses that stimulated me onward and have shaped and moulded my whole subsequent destiny curran the irish orator when a youth had a strong defect in his articulation and at school he was known as stuttering jack curran while he was engaged in the study of the law and still struggling to overcome his defect he was stung into eloquence by the sarcasms of a member of a debating club who characterized him as orator mum for like cowper when he stood up to speak curran had not on a previous occasion been able to utter a word but the taunt raised his pluck and he replied with a triumphant speech this accidental discovery in himself of the gift of eloquence encouraged him to proceed in his studies with additional energy and vigor he corrected his enunciation by reading aloud emphatically and distinctly the best passages in literature for several hours every day studying his features before a mirror and adopting a method of gesticulation suited to his rather awkward and ungraceful figure he also proposed cases to himself which he argued with as much care as if he had been addressing a jury curran began business with the qualification which lord eldon stated to be the first requisite for distinction that is to be not worth a shilling while working his way laboriously at the bar still oppressed by the diffidence which had overcome him in his debating club he was on one occasion provoked by the judge into making a very severe retort in the case under discussion curran observed that he had never met the law as laid down by his lordship in any book in his library that may be sir said the judge in a contemptuous tone but i suspect that your library is very small his lordship was notoriously a furious political partisan the author of several anonymous pamphlets characterized by unusual violence and dogmatism curran roused by the allusion to his straitened circumstances replied thus 
it is very true my lord that i am poor and the circumstance has certainly curtailed my library my books are not numerous but they are select and i hope they have been perused with proper dispositions i have prepared myself for this high profession by the study of a few good works rather than by the composition of a great many bad ones i am not ashamed of my poverty but i should be ashamed of my wealth could i have stooped to acquire it by servility and corruption if i rise not to rank i shall at least be honest and should i ever cease to be so many an example shows me that an ill-gained elevation by making me the more conspicuous would only make me the more universally and the more notoriously contemptible the extremest poverty has been no obstacle in the way of men devoted to the duty of self-culture professor alexander murray the linguist learned to write by scribbling his letters on an old wool card with the end of a burned feather stem the only book which his father who was a poor shepherd possessed was a penny catechism but that being thought too valuable for common use was carefully preserved in a cupboard for sunday catechizing professor moore when a young man being too poor to purchase newton's principia borrowed the book and copied the whole of it with his own hand many poor students while laboring daily for their living have only been able to snatch an atom of knowledge here and there at intervals as birds do their food in winter time when the fields are covered with snow they have struggled on and faith and hope have come to them a well-known author and publisher william chambers of edinburgh speaking before an assemblage of young men in that city thus briefly described to them his humble beginnings for their encouragement i stand before you he said a self-educated man my education is that which is supplied at the humble parish schools of scotland and it was only when i went to edinburgh a poor boy that i devoted my evenings after the labors of the day to the cultivation of that intellect which the almighty has given me from seven or eight in the morning till nine or ten at night was i at my business as a bookseller's apprentice and it was only during hours after these stolen from sleep that i could devote myself to study i did not read novels my attention was devoted to physical science and other useful matters i also taught myself french i look back to those times with great pleasure and am almost sorry i have not to go through the same experience again for i reaped more pleasure when i had not a sixpence in my pocket studying in a garret in edinburgh than i now find when sitting amidst all the elegancies and comforts of a parlor william cobbett's account of how he learned english grammar is full of interest and instruction for all students laboring under difficulties i learned grammar said he when i was a private soldier on the pay of sixpence a day the edge of my berth or that of my guard bed was my seat to study in my knapsack was my bookcase a bit of board lying on my lap was my writing table and the task did not demand anything like a year of my life i had no money to purchase candle or oil in winter time it was rarely that i could get any evening light but that of the fire and only my turn even at that and if i under such circumstances and without parent or friend to advise or encourage me accomplished this undertaking what excuse can there be for any youth however poor however pressed with business or however circumstance as to room or other convenience to buy a pen or a sheet of paper i was compelled to forego some portion of food though in a state of half starvation i had no amount of time that i could call my own and i had to read and write amidst the talking laughing singing whistling and brawling of at least half a score of the most thoughtless of men and that too in the hours of their freedom from all control think not lightly of the farthing that i had to give now and then for ink pen or paper that farthing was alas a great sum to me i was as tall as i am now i had great health and great exercise the whole of the money not expended for us at market was four cents a week for each man i remember and well i may 
that on one occasion i after all necessary expenses had on a friday made shifts to have a halfpenny in reserve which i had destined for the purchase of a red herring in the morning but when i pulled off my clothes at night so hungry then as to be hardly able to endure life i found that i had lost my halfpenny i buried my head under the miserable sheet and rug and cried like a child and again i say if i under circumstances like these could encounter and overcome this task can there be in the whole world a youth to find an excuse for the non-performance we have been informed of an equally striking instance of perseverance and application in learning on the part of a french political exile in london his original occupation was that of a stonemason at which he found employment for some time but work becoming slack he lost his place and poverty stared him in the face in his dilemma he called upon a fellow exile profitably engaged in teaching french and consulted him what he ought to do to earn a living the answer was become a professor a professor answered the mason i who am only a workman speaking but a patois surely you are jesting on the contrary i am quite serious said the other and again i advise you become a professor place yourself under me and i will undertake to teach you how to teach others no no replied the mason it is impossible i am too old to learn i am too little of a scholar i cannot be a professor he went away and again he tried to obtain employment at his trade from london he went into the provinces and travelled several hundred miles in vain he could not find a master returning to london he went direct to his former adviser and said i have tried everywhere for work and failed i will now try to be a professor he immediately placed himself under instruction and being a man of close application and quick apprehension and vigorous intelligence he speedily mastered the elements of grammar the rules of construction and composition and the correct pronunciation of classical french when his friend and instructor thought him sufficiently competent to undertake the teaching of others an appointment advertised as vacant was applied for and obtained and behold our artisan at length become professor it so happened that the seminary to which he was appointed was situated in a suburb of london where he had formerly worked as a stonemason every morning the first thing which met his eyes on looking out of his dressing-room window was a stack of cottage chimneys which he had himself built he feared for a time lest he should be recognized in the village as the quondam workman and thus bring discredit to his seminary which was of high standing but he need have been under no such apprehension as he proved a most efficient teacher and his pupils were on more than one occasion publicly complimented for their knowledge of french meanwhile he secured the respect and friendship of all who knew him fellow professors as well as pupils and when the story of his struggles his difficulties and his past history became known to them they admired him more than ever sir samuel romilly was not less persevering as a self-cultivator the son of a jeweller descended from a french refugee he received little education in his early years but overcame all his disadvantages by unwearied application and by efforts constantly directed towards the same end i determined he said in his autobiography when i was between fifteen and sixteen years of age to apply myself seriously to learning latin of which i at that time knew little more than some of the most familiar rules of grammar in the course of three or four years during which i thus applied myself i had read almost every prose writer of the age of pure latinity i had gone three times through the whole of livy sallust and tacitus i had studied the most celebrated orations of cicero and translated a great deal of homer terence virgil horace ovid and juvenal i had read over and over again he also studied geography natural history and natural philosophy and obtained a considerable acquaintance with general knowledge at sixteen he was articled to a clerk in chancery worked hard was admitted to the bar and his industry and perseverance ensured success 
he became solicitor general under the fox administration in 1806 and steadily worked his way to the highest celebrity in his profession yet he was always haunted by a painful and almost oppressive sense of his own disqualifications and never ceased laboring to remedy them his autobiography is a lesson of instructive facts worth volumes of sentiment and well deserves a careful perusal sir walter scott was accustomed to cite the case of his young friend john Leyden as one of the most remarkable illustrations of the power of perseverance which he had ever known the son of a shepherd in one of the wildest valleys of roxburghshire he was almost entirely self-educated like many scotch shepherd sons like hogg who taught himself to write by copying the letters of a printed book as he lay watching his flock on the hillside like cairns who from tending sheep on the lammer moors raised himself by dint of application and industry to the professor's chair which he now so worthily holds like maury ferguson and many more Leyden was early inspired by a thirst for knowledge when a poor barefooted boy he walked six or eight miles across the moors daily to learn reading at the little village schoolhouse at kirkton and this was all the education he received the rest he acquired for himself he found his way to edinburgh to attend the college there setting the extremest penury at defiance he was first discovered as the frequenter of a small bookseller's shop kept by archibald constable afterwards so well known as a publisher he would pass hour after hour perched on a ladder in mid-air with some great folio in his hand forgetful of the scanty meal of bread and water which awaited him at his miserable lodging access to books and lectures comprised all within the bounds of his wishes thus he toiled and battled at the gates of science until his unconquerable perseverance carried everything before it before he had attained his nineteenth year he had astonished all the professors in edinburgh by his profound knowledge of greek and latin and the general mass of information he had acquired having turned his views to india he sought employment in the civil service but failed he was however informed that a surgeon's assistance commission was open to him but he was no surgeon and knew no more of the profession than a child he could however learn then he was told that he must be ready to pass in six months nothing daunted he sat to work to acquire in six months what usually required three years at the end of six months he took his degree with honor scott and a few friends helped to fit him out and he sailed for india after publishing his beautiful poem the scenes of infancy in india he promised to become one of the greatest oriental scholars but was unhappily cut off by fever caught by exposure and died at an early age the life of the late dr lee professor of hebrew at cambridge furnishes one of the most remarkable instances in modern times of the power of patient perseverance and resolute purpose in working out an honorable career in literature he received his education at a charity school at lognor near shrewsbury but so little distinguished himself there that his master pronounced him one of the dullest boys that ever passed through his hands he was put apprentice to a carpenter and worked at that trade until he arrived at manhood to occupy his leisure hours he took to reading and some of his books containing latin quotations he became desirous of ascertaining what they meant he bought a latin grammar and proceeded to learn latin as stone the duke of argyle's gardener said long before does one need to know more than twenty-four letters in order to learn everything else that one wishes lee rose early and sat up late and he succeeded in mastering the latin before his apprenticeship was out whilst working one day in some place of worship a copy of a greek testament fell in his way and he was immediately filled with a desire to learn that language he accordingly sold some of his latin books and purchased a greek grammar and lexicon taking pleasure in learning he soon mastered the language then he sold his greek books and bought hebrew ones and learned that language unassisted by any instructor without any hope of fame or reward but simply following the bent of his genius 
he next proceeded to learn the chaldee syriac and samaritan dialects his character as a tradesman became excellent his business improved and his means enabled him to marry which he did when twenty-eight years old he determined now to devote himself to the maintenance of his family and to renounce the luxury of literature accordingly he sold all his books he might have continued a working carpenter all his life had not the chest of tools upon which he depended for subsistence been destroyed by fire and destitution stared him in the face he was too poor to buy new tools so he bethought him of teaching children their letters a profession requiring the least possible capital but though he had mastered many languages he was so defective in the common branches of knowledge that at first he could not teach them resolute of purpose however he assiduously set to work and taught himself arithmetic and writing to such a degree as to be able to impart the knowledge of these branches to little children his unaffected simple and beautiful character gradually attracted friends and the acquirements of the learned carpenter became bruited abroad dr scott a neighboring clergyman obtained for him the appointment of master of a charity school and introduced him to a distinguished oriental scholar these friends supplied him with books and lee successively mastered arabic persic and hindustani he continued to pursue his studies while on duty as a private in the local militia of the country gradually acquiring greater proficiency in languages at length his kind patron dr scott enabled lee to enter queen's college cambridge and after a course of study in which he distinguished himself by his mathematical acquirements a vacancy occurring in the professorship of arabic and hebrew he was worthily elected to fill the honorable office besides ably performing his duties as a professor he voluntarily gave much of his time to the instruction of missionaries going forth to preach the gospel to eastern tribes in their own tongue he also made translations of the bible into several asiatic dialects and having mastered the new zealand language he arranged the grammar and vocabulary for two new zealand chiefs who were then in england which books are now in daily use in the new zealand schools such in brief is the remarkable history of dr samuel lee and it is but the counterpart of numerous similarly instructive examples of the power of perseverance in self-culture as displayed in the lives of many of the most distinguished of our literary and scientific men there are many other illustrious names which might be cited to prove the truth of the common saying that it is never too late to learn even at advanced years men can do much if they will determine on making a beginning sir henry spellman did not begin the study of science until he was between fifty and sixty years of age franklin was fifty before he fully entered into the study of natural philosophy dryden and scott were not known as authors until each was in his fortieth year boccaccio was thirty-five when he commenced his literary career and alfieri was forty-six when he began the study of greek dr arnold learned german at an advanced age for the purpose of reading niebuhr in the original and in like manner james watt when about forty while working at his trade of an instrument maker in glasgow learned french german and italian to enable himself to peruse the valuable works on mechanical philosophy which existed in those languages thomas scott was fifty-six before he began to learn hebrew robert hall was once found lying upon the floor racked by pain learning italian in his old age to enable him to judge of the parallel drawn by macaulay between milton and dante handel was forty-eight before he published any of his great works indeed hundreds of instances might be given of men who struck out an entirely new path and successfully entered on new studies at a comparatively advanced time of life none but the frivolous or the indolent will say i am too old to learn and here we would repeat what we have said before that it is not men of genius who move the world and take the lead in it so much as men of steadfastness purpose and industry 
notwithstanding the many undeniable instances of the precocity of men of genius it is nevertheless true that early advancement gives no indication of the height to which the grown man will reach precocity is sometimes a symptom of disease rather than of intellectual vigor what becomes of all the remarkably forward children trace them through life and it will frequently be found that the dull boys who were beaten at school have shot ahead of them the precocious boys are rewarded but the prizes which they gain by their greater quickness and facility do not always prove of use to them what ought rather to be rewarded is the endeavor the struggle and the obedience for it is the youth who does his best though endowed with an inferiority of natural powers that ought above all others to be encouraged an interesting chapter might be written on the subject of illustrious dunces dull boys but brilliant men newton when at school stood at the bottom of the lowest form but one the boy above newton having kicked him the dunce showed his pluck by challenging him to a fight and beat him then he set to work with a will and determined also to vanquish his antagonist as a scholar which he did rising to the top of his class isaac barrow when a boy at the charterhouse school was notorious chiefly for his strong temper pugnacious habits and proverbial idleness as a scholar and he caused such grief to his parents that his father used to say that if it pleased god to take from him any of his children he hoped it might be isaac the least promising of them all adam clark when a boy was proclaimed by his father to be a grievous dunce dean swift was plucked at dublin university and only obtained his recommendation to oxford by special favor the well-known dr chalmers and dr cook were boys together at the parish school of st andrews and they were found so stupid and mischievous that the master irritated beyond measure dismissed them both as incorrigible dunces the brilliant sheridan showed so little capacity as a boy that he was presented to a tutor by his mother with the complimentary accompaniment that he was a hopeless dunce walter scott was all but a dunce when a boy always much readier for sport than apt at his lessons at the edinburgh university professor dalzell pronounced upon him the sentence that dunce he was and dunce he would remain chatterton was returned on his mother's hands as a fool of whom nothing could be made burns was a dull boy good only at athletic exercises goldsmith spoke of himself as a plant that flowered late alfieri left college no wiser than he entered it and did not begin the studies by which he distinguished himself until he had run half over europe robert clive was a dunce if not a reprobate when a youth but always full of energy even in badness his family glad to get rid of him shipped him off to madras and he lived to lay the foundations of the british power in india napoleon and wellington were both dull boys not distinguishing themselves in any way at school ulysses grant the commander-in-chief of the united states was called useless grant by his mother he was so dull and unhandy when a boy and stonewall jackson lee's greatest lieutenant was in his youth chiefly noted for his slowness while a pupil at west point military academy he was however equally remarkable for his application and perseverance when a task was set him he never left it until he had mastered it nor did he ever feign to possess knowledge which he had not entirely acquired again and again wrote one who knew him when called upon to answer questions in the recitation of the day he would reply i have not yet looked at it i have been engaged in mastering the recitation of yesterday or the day before the result was that he graduated seventeenth in a class of seventy there was probably in the whole class not a boy to whom jackson at the outset was not inferior in knowledge and attainments but at the end of the race he had only sixteen before him and had outstripped no fewer than fifty-three it used to be said of him by his contemporaries that if the course had been for ten years instead of four jackson would have graduated the head of his class 
john howard the philanthropist was another illustrious dunce learning next to nothing during the seven years that he was at school watt was a dull scholar notwithstanding the stories told about his precocity but he was what was better patient and perseverant and it was by such qualities and by his carefully cultivated inventiveness that he was enabled to perfect his steam engine what dr arnold says of boys is equally true of men that the difference between one boy and another consists not so much in talent as in energy given perseverance and energy soon becomes habitual provided the dunce has persistency and application he will inevitably head the cleverer fellow without those qualities slow but sure wins the race it is perseverance that explains how the position of boys at school are so often reversed in real life and it is curious to note how some who were then so clever have since become so commonplace while others dull boys of whom nothing was expected slow in their faculties but sure in their pace have assumed the position of leaders of men the tortoise in the right road will beat a racer in the wrong it matters not though a youth be slow if he be but diligent quickness of parts may even prove a defect inasmuch as the boy who learns readily will often forget as readily and also because he finds no need of cultivating that quality of application and perseverance which the slower youth is compelled to exercise and which proves so valuable an element in the formation of every character davy said what i am i have made myself and the same holds true universally to conclude the best culture is not obtained from teachers when at school or college so much as by our own diligent self-education when we have become men hence parents need not be in too great haste to see their children's talents forced into bloom let them watch and wait patiently letting good example and quiet training do their work and leave the rest to providence let them see to it that the youth is provided by free exercise of his bodily powers with a full stock of physical health set him fairly on the road of self-culture carefully train his habits of application and perseverance and as he grows older if the right stuff be in him he will be enabled vigorously and effectively to cultivate himself end of chapter twelve Self-Culture, Facilities, and Difficulties Read by John Greenman This is Section 13 of Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Workers in Art read by john greenman if what shone afar so grand turn to nothing in thy hand on again the virtue lies in the struggle not the prize m m moore excellence in art as in everything else can only be achieved by dint of painstaking labor there is nothing less accidental than the painting of a picture or the chiseling of a noble statue. Every skilled touch of the artist's brush or chisel, though guided by genius, is the product of unremitting study. Sir Joshua Reynolds was such a believer in the force of industry that he held that artistic excellence, however expressed by genius, taste, or the gift of heaven, may be acquired writing to barry he said whoever is resolved to excel in painting or indeed any other art must bring all his mind to bear upon that one object from the moment that he rises till he goes to bed and on another occasion he said those who are resolved to excel must go to their work willing or unwilling morning noon and night they will find it no play but very hard labor like sir joshua reynolds 
Michael Angelo was a great believer in the force of labor, and he held that there was nothing which the imagination conceived that could not be embodied in marble, if the hand were made vigorous to obey the mind. He was himself one of the most persevering of workers, and he attributed his power of studying for a greater number of hours than most of his contemporaries to his spare habits of living. A little bread and wine was all he required for the chief part of the day when employed at his work, and very frequently he rose in the middle of the night to resume his labors. On these occasions it was his practice to fix the candle, by the light of which he chiseled, on the summit of a pasteboard cap which he wore. Sometimes he was too wearied to undress, and he slept in his clothes, ready to spring to his work as soon as refreshed by sleep. He had a favorite device of an old man in a go-cart, with an hour-glass upon it, bearing the inscription, Still I am learning. Titian also was an earnest worker. His celebrated Pietro Martire was eight years in hand, and his Last Supper seven in his letter to charles v he said i send your majesty the last supper after working at it almost daily for seven years few think of the patient labor and long training involved in the greatest works of the artist they seem easy and quickly accomplished yet with how great difficulty has this ease been acquired you charge me fifty sequins said the venetian nobleman to the sculptor for a bust that cost you only ten days' labor. You forget, said the artist, that I have been thirty years learning to make that bust in ten days. It was eminently characteristic of the industry of the late Sir Augustus Colcott that he made not fewer than forty separate sketches in the composition of his famous picture of Rochester. This constant repetition is one of the main conditions of success in art, as in life itself no matter how generous nature has been in bestowing the gift of genius the pursuit of art is nevertheless a long and continuous labor many artists have been precocious but without diligence their precocity would have come to nothing the anecdote related of west is well known when only seven years old struck with the beauty of the sleeping infant of his eldest sister whilst watching by its cradle he ran to seek some paper and forthwith drew its portrait in red and black ink the little incident revealed the artist in him and it was found impossible to draw him from his bent west might have been a greater a painter had he not been injured by too early success his fame though great was not purchased by study trials and difficulties and it has not been enduring. Sir Joshua Reynolds, when a boy, forgot his lessons and took pleasure only in drawing, for which his father was accustomed to rebuke him. The boy was destined for the profession of physic, but his strong instinct for art could not be suppressed, and he became a painter. Gainsborough, when a schoolboy, went sketching in the woods, and at twelve he was a confirmed artist. He was a keen observer and a hard worker, no picturesque feature of any scene he had once looked upon escaping his diligent pencil. William Blake, a hosier's son, employed himself in drawing designs on the backs of his father's shop bills, and making sketches for the purpose of meeting with character. By this careful storing of his mind, he was afterwards enabled to crowd an immense amount of thought and treasured observation into his work. Hence it is that Hogarth's pictures are so truthful a memorial of the character, the manners, and even the very thoughts of the times in which he lived. True painting, he himself observed, can only be learned in one school, and that is kept by nature. But he was not a highly cultivated man, except in his own walk. His school education had been of the slenderest kind, scarcely even perfecting him in the art of spelling his self-culture did the rest for a long time he was in very straitened circumstances but nevertheless worked on with a cheerful heart 
poor though he was he contrived to live within his small means and he boasted with becoming pride that he was a punctual paymaster when he had conquered all his difficulties and become a famous and thriving man he loved to dwell upon his early labors and privations and to fight over again the battle which ended so honorably to him as a man and so gloriously as an artist i remember the time said he on one occasion when i have gone moping into the city with scarcely a shilling but as soon as i have received ten guineas there for a plate i have returned home put on my sword and sallied out with all the confidence of a man who had thousands in his pockets industry and perseverance was the motto of the sculptor banks which he acted on himself and strongly recommended to others his well-known kindness induced many aspiring youths to call upon him and ask for his advice and assistance and it is related that one day a boy called at his door to see him with this object but the servant angry at the loud knock he had given scolded him and was about sending him away when banks overhearing her himself went out the little boy stood at the door with some drawings in his hand what do you want with me asked the sculptor i want sir if you please to be admitted to draw at the academy banks explained that he himself could not procure his admission but he asked to look at the boy's drawings examining them he said time enough for the academy my little man go home mind your schooling try to make a better drawing of the apollo and in a month come again and let me see it the boy went home sketched and worked with redoubled diligence and at the end of the month called again on the sculptor the drawing was better but again banks sent him back with good advice to work and study in a week the boy was again at his door his drawing much improved and banks bid him be of good cheer for if spared he would distinguish himself the boy was mulready and the sculptor's augury was amply fulfilled turner was destined by his father for his own trade of a barber which he carried on in london until one day the sketch which the boy had made of a coat of arms on a silver salver having attracted the notice of a customer whom his father was shaving the latter was urged to allow his son to follow his bias and he was eventually permitted to follow art as a profession like all young artists turner had many difficulties to encounter and they were all the greater that his circumstances were so straitened but he was always willing to work and to take pains with his work no matter how humble it might be he was glad to hire himself out at half a crown a night to wash in skies in india ink upon other people's drawings getting his supper into the bargain thus he earned money and acquired expertness then he took to illustrating guide-books almanacs and any sort of books that wanted cheap frontispieces what could i have done better said he afterwards it was first-rate practice he did everything carefully and conscientiously never slurring over his work because he was ill remunerated for it he aimed at learning as well as living always doing his best and never leaving a drawing without having made a step in advance upon his previous work a man who thus labored was sure to do much and his growth in power and grasp of thought was to use ruskin's words as steady as the increasing light of sunrise but turner's genius needs no panegyric his best monument is the noble gallery of pictures bequeathed by him to the nation which will ever be the most lasting memorial of his fame very romantic and adventurous was the career of benvenuto cellini the marvellous gold worker painter sculptor engraver engineer and author his life as told by himself is one of the most extraordinary autobiographies ever written giovanni cellini his father was one of the court musicians at florence and his highest ambition concerning his son was that he should become an expert player on the flute but giovanni having lost his appointment found it necessary to send his son to learn some trade and he was apprenticed to a goldsmith 
the boy had already displayed a love of drawing and of art and applying himself to his business he soon became a dexterous workman having got mixed up in a quarrel with some of the townspeople he was banished for six months during which period he worked with a goldsmith at siena gaining further experience in jewelry and gold working his father still insisting on his becoming a flute player benvenuto continued to practice on the instrument though he detested it his chief pleasure was in art which he pursued with enthusiasm returning to florence he carefully studied the best designs and still further to improve himself in gold working he went on foot to rome where he met with a variety of adventures he returned to florence with the reputation of being a most expert worker in the precious metals and his skill was soon in great request during his residence in rome cellini met with extensive patronage and he was taken into the pope's service in the double capacity of goldsmith and musician he was constantly studying and improving himself by acquaintance with the works of the best masters he mounted jewels finished enamels engraved seals and designed and executed works in gold silver and bronze in such a style as to excel all other artists whenever he heard of a goldsmith who was famous in any particular branch he immediately determined to surpass him thus it was that he rivalled the medals of one the enamels of another and the jewelry of a third in fact there was not a branch of his business that he did not feel impelled to excel in working in this spirit it is not so wonderful that cellini should have been able to accomplish so much he was a man of ceaseless activity and was constantly on the move at one time we find him at florence at another at rome then he is at mantua at rome at naples and back to florence again then at venice and in paris making all his long journeys on horseback he could not carry much luggage with him so wherever he went he usually began by making his own tools he not only designed his works but executed them himself hammered and carved and cast and shaped them with his own hands indeed his works have the impress of genius so clearly stamped upon them that they could never have been designed by one person and executed by another the humblest article a buckle for a lady's girdle a seal a locket a brooch a ring or a button became in his hands a beautiful work of art cellini was remarkable for his readiness and dexterity in handicraft one day a surgeon entered the shop of the goldsmith to perform an operation on his daughter's hand on looking at the surgeon's instruments cellini who was present found them rude and clumsy as they usually were in those days and he asked the surgeon to proceed no further with the operation for a quarter of an hour he then ran to his shop and taking a piece of the finest steel wrought out of it a beautifully finished knife with which the operation was successfully performed among the statues executed by cellini the most important are the silver figure of jupiter and perseus john flaxman was the son of a humble seller of plaster casts when a child he was such an invalid that it was his custom to sit behind his father's shop counter propped by pillows amusing himself with drawing and reading a benevolent clergyman the rev mr matthews calling at the shop one day saw the boy trying to read a book and on inquiring what it was found it to be cornelius nepos which his father had picked up for a few pence at a bookstall the gentleman after some conversation with the boy said that was not the proper book for him to read but that he would bring him one the next day he called with translations of homer and don quixote which the boy proceeded to read with great avidity his mind was soon filled with the heroism which breathed through the pages of the former and with the stucco ajaxes and achilleses about him ranged along the shop shelves the ambition took possession of him that he too would design and embody in poetic forms those majestic heroes like all youthful efforts his first designs were crude the proud father one day showed some of them to rubiliac the sculptor who turned from them with a contemptuous pshaw but the boy had the right stuff in him 
he had industry and patience and he continued to labor incessantly at his books and drawings he then tried his young powers in modeling figures in plaster of paris wax and clay some of these early works are still preserved not because of their merit but because they are curious as the first healthy efforts of patient genius it was long before the boy could walk and he only learned to do so by hobbling along upon crutches at length he became strong enough to walk without them the kind mr matthews invited him to his house where his wife explained homer and milton to him they helped him also in his self-culture giving him lessons in greek and latin the study of which he prosecuted at home by dint of patience and perseverance his drawing improved so much that he obtained a commission from a lady to execute six original drawings in black chalk of subjects in homer his first commission what an event in the artist's life the boy at once proceeded to execute the order and he was both well praised and well paid for his work at fifteen flaxman entered a pupil at the royal academy notwithstanding his retiring disposition he soon became known among the students and great things were expected of him nor were their expectations disappointed in his fifteenth year he gained the silver prize the next year he became a candidate for the gold one everybody prophesied that he would carry off the medal for there were none who surpassed him in ability and industry yet he lost it and the gold medal was adjudged to a pupil who was not afterwards heard of this failure on the part of the youth was really of service to him for defeats do not long cast down the resolute hearted but only serve to call forth their real powers give me time said he to his father and i will yet produce works that the academy will be proud to recognize he redoubled his efforts spared no pains designed and modeled incessantly and made steady if not rapid progress but meanwhile poverty threatened his father's household the plaster cast trade yielded a very bare living and young flaxman with resolute self-denial curtailed his hours of study and devoted himself to helping his father in the humble details of his business he laid aside his homer to take up the plaster trowel he was willing to work in the humblest department of the trade so that his father's family might be supported and the wolf kept from the door to this drudgery of his art he served a long apprenticeship but it did him good it familiarized him with steady work and cultivated in him the spirit of patience the discipline may have been hard but it was wholesome happily young flaxman's skill in design had reached the knowledge of josiah wedgwood who sought him out for the purpose of employing him to design improved patterns of china and earthenware it may seem a humble department of a art for such a genius as flaxman to work in but it really was not so an artist may be laboring truly in his vocation while designing a common teapot or water jug articles in daily use amongst the people which are before their eyes at every meal may be made the vehicles of education to all and minister to their highest culture the most ambitious artist may thus confer a greater practical benefit on his countrymen than by executing an elaborate work which he may sell for thousands of pounds to be placed in some wealthy man's gallery where it is hidden away from public sight before wedgwood's time the designs which figured upon our china and stoneware were hideous both in drawing and in execution and he determined to improve both flaxman did his best to carry out the manufacturer's views he supplied him from time to time with models and designs of various pieces of earthenware the subjects of which were principally from ancient verse and history many of them are still in existence and some are equal in beauty and simplicity to his after designs for marble the celebrated etruscan vases specimens of which were to be found in public museums and in cabinets of the curious furnished him with the best examples of form and these he embellished with his own elegant devices stuart's athens then recently published furnished him with specimens of the purest shaped greek utensils 
of these he adopted the best and worked them into new shapes of elegance and beauty flaxman then saw that he was laboring in a great work no less than the promotion of popular education and he was proud in after life to allude to his early labors in this walk by which he was enabled at the same time to cultivate his love of the beautiful to diffuse a taste for art among the people and to replenish his own purse while he promoted the prosperity of his friend and benefactor when twenty-seven years of age he quitted his father's roof and rented a small house and studio and what was more he married Anne denman was the name of his wife and a cheerful bright-souled noble woman she was he believed that in marrying her he should be able to work with an intenser spirit for like him she had a taste for poetry and art and besides was an enthusiastic admirer of her husband's genius yet when sir joshua reynolds himself a bachelor met flaxman shortly after his marriage he said to him so flaxman i am told you were married if so sir i tell you you are ruined for an artist flaxman went straight home sat down beside his wife took her hand in his and said anne i am ruined for an artist how so john how has it happened and who has done it it happened he replied in the church and anne denman has done it he then told her of sir joshua's remark whose opinion was well known and had often been expressed that if students would excel they must bring the whole power of their mind to bear upon their art from the moment they rose until they went to bed and also that no man could be a great artist unless he studied the grand works at rome and florence and i said flaxman drawing up his little figure to its full height i would be a great artist and a great artist you shall be said his wife and visit rome too if that be really necessary to make you great but how asked flaxman work and economize rejoined the brave wife i will never have it said that anne denman ruined john flaxman for an artist and so it was determined by the pair that the journey to rome was to be made when their means would admit i will go to rome said flaxman and show the president that wedlock is for a man's good rather than his harm and you anne shall accompany me patiently and happily the affectionate couple plodded on during five years in their humble little home always with a long journey to rome before them it was never lost sight of for a moment and not a penny was uselessly spent that could be saved towards the necessary expenses they said no word to any one about their project solicited no aid from the academy but trusted only to their own patient labor and love to pursue and achieve their object during this time flaxman exhibited very few works he could not afford marble to experiment in original designs but he obtained frequent commissions for monuments by the profits of which he maintained himself he still worked for wedgwood who was a prompt paymaster and on the whole he was thriving happy and hopeful at length flaxman and his wife having accumulated a sufficient store of savings set out for rome arrived there he applied himself diligently to study maintaining himself like other poor artists by making copies from the antique english visitors sought his studio and gave him commissions and it was then that he composed his beautiful designs illustrated of homer aeschylus and dante he then prepared to return to england his taste improved and cultivated by careful study but before he left italy the academies of florence and carrara recognized his merit by electing him a member his fame had preceded him to london where he soon found abundant employment while at rome he had been commissioned to execute his famous monument in memory of lord mansfield and it was erected in the north transept of westminster abbey shortly after his return it stands there in majestic grandeur a monument to the genius of flaxman himself calm simple and severe no wonder that banks the sculptor then at the zenith of his fame exclaimed when he saw it this little man cuts us all out 
when the members of the royal academy heard of flaxman's return and especially when they had an opportunity of seeing and admiring his portrait statue of mansfield they were eager to have him enrolled among their number he allowed his name to be proposed in the candidate's list of associates and was immediately elected shortly after he appeared in an entirely new character the little boy who had began his studies behind the plaster cast cellar's shop counter was now a man of high intellect and recognized supremacy in art instructing students in the character of professor of sculpture to the royal academy and no man better deserved to fill that distinguished office for none is so able to instruct others as he who for himself and by his own efforts has learned to grapple with and overcome difficulties after a long peaceful and happy life flaxman found himself growing old the loss which he sustained by the death of his affectionate wife anne was a severe shock to him but he survived her several years during which he executed his celebrated shield of achilles and his noble archangel michael vanquishing satan perhaps his two greatest works the same honest and persistent industry was throughout distinctive of the career of david wilkie the son of a scotch minister he gave early indications of an artistic turn and though he was a negligent and inept scholar he was a sedulous drawer of faces and figures a silent boy he already displayed that quiet concentrated energy of character which distinguished him through life he was always on the lookout for an opportunity to draw and the walls of the manse or the smooth sand by the riverside were alike convenient for his purpose any sort of tool would serve him like giotto he found a pencil in a burnt stick a prepared canvas in any smooth stone and the subject for a picture in every ragged mendicant he met when he visited a house he generally left his mark on the walls as an indication of his presence sometimes to the disgust of cleanly housewives in short notwithstanding the aversion of his father the minister to the sinful profession of painting wilkie's strong propensity was not to be thwarted and he became an artist working his way manfully up the steep of difficulty though rejected on his first application as a candidate for admission to the scottish academy at edinburgh on account of the rudeness and inaccuracy of his introductory specimens he persevered in producing better until he was admitted but his progress was slow he applied himself diligently to the drawing of the human figure and held on with a determination to succeed as if with a resolute confidence as to the result he displayed none of the eccentric humor and fitful application of many youths who conceive themselves geniuses but kept up the routine of steady application to such an extent that he himself was afterwards accustomed to attribute his success to his dogged perseverance rather than to any higher innate power the single element he said in all the progressive movements of my pencil was persevering industry at edinburgh he gained a few premiums thought of turning his attention to portrait painting with a view to its higher and more certain remuneration but eventually went boldly into the line in which he earned his fame and painted his pitlessy fair what was bolder still he determined to proceed to london on account of its presenting so much wider a field for study and work and the poor scotch lad arrived in town and painted his village politicians while living in a humble lodging on eighteen shillings a week notwithstanding the success of this picture and the commissions which followed it wilkie long continued poor the prices which his works realized were not great for he bestowed upon them so much time and labor that his earnings continued comparatively small for many years every picture was carefully studied and elaborated beforehand nothing was struck off at a heat many occupied him for years touching retouching and improving them until they finally passed out of his hands as with reynolds his motto was work 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 and like him he expressed great dislike for talking artists talkers may sow but the silent reap 
let us be doing something was his oblique mode of rebuking the loquacious and admonishing the idle he once related to his friend constable that when he studied at the scottish academy graham the master of it was accustomed to say to the students in the words of reynolds if you have genius industry will improve it if you have none industry will supply its place so said wilkie i was determined to be very industrious for i knew i had no genius he also told constable that when linnell and burnett his fellow students in london were talking about art he always contrived to get as close to them as he could to hear all they said for said he they know a great deal and i know very little this was said with perfect sincerity for wilkie was habitually modest one of the first things that he did with the sum of thirty pounds which he obtained from lord mansfield for his village politicians was to buy a present of bonnets shawls and dresses for his mother and sister at home though but little able to afford it at the time wilkie's early poverty had trained him in the habits of strict economy which were however consistent with a noble liberality many artists have had to encounter privations which have tried their courage and endurance to the utmost before they succeeded what number may have sunk under them we can never know martin encountered difficulties in the course of his career such as perhaps fall to the lot of few more than once he found himself on the verge of starvation while engaged on his first great picture it is related of him that on one occasion he found himself reduced to his last shilling a bright shilling which he had kept because of its very brightness but at length he found it necessary to exchange it for bread he went to a baker's shop bought a loaf and was taking it away when the baker snatched it from him and tossed back the shilling to the starving painter the bright shilling had failed him in his hour of need it was a bad one returning to his lodgings he rummaged his trunk for some remaining crust to satisfy his hunger upheld throughout by the victorious power of enthusiasm he pursued his design with unsubdued energy he had the courage to work on and to wait and when a few days after he found an opportunity to exhibit his picture he was from that time famous like many other great artists his life proves that despite outward circumstances genius aided by industry will be its own protector and that fame though she comes late will never ultimately refuse her favors to real merit another striking exemplification of perseverance and industry in the cultivation of art in humble life is presented in the career of james sharples a working blacksmith at blackburn he was one of a family of thirteen children his father was a working iron founder the boys received no school education but were all sent to work as soon as they were able and at about ten james was placed in a foundry where he was employed for about two years as a smithy boy after that he was sent into the engine shop where his father worked as engine smith the boy's employment was to heat and carry rivets for the boiler makers though his hours of labor were very long often from six in the morning until eight at night his father contrived to give him some little teaching after working hours and it was thus that he partially learned his letters an incident occurred in the course of his employment among the boiler makers which first awakened in him the desire to learn drawing he had occasionally been employed by the foreman to hold the chalked line with which he made the designs of boilers upon the floor of the workshop and on such occasions the foreman was accustomed to hold the line and direct the boy to make the necessary dimensions james soon became so expert at this as to be of considerable service to the foreman and at his leisure hours at home his great delight was to practice drawing designs of boilers upon his mother's floor on one occasion when a female relative was expected from manchester to pay the family a visit and the house had been made as decent as possible for her reception the boy on coming in from the foundry in the evening began his usual operations upon the floor he had proceeded some way with his design of a large boiler in chalk 
when his mother arrived with the visitor and to her dismay found the boy unwashed and the floor chalked all over the relative however professed to be pleased with the boy's industry praised his design and recommended his mother to provide the little sweep as she called him with paper and pencils encouraged by his elder brother he began to practice figure and landscape drawing making copies of lithographs but as yet without any knowledge of the rules of perspective and the principles of light and shade he worked on however and gradually acquired expertness in copying at sixteen he entered the bury mechanics institution in order to attend the drawing class taught by an amateur who followed the trade of a barber there he had a lesson a week during three months the teacher recommended him to obtain from the library burnett's practical treatise on painting but as he could not yet read with ease he was under the necessity of getting his mother and sometimes his elder brother to read passages from the book for him while he sat by and listened feeling hampered by his ignorance of the art of reading and eager to master the contents of burnett's book he ceased attending the drawing class at the institute after the first quarter and devoted himself to learning reading and writing at home in this he soon succeeded and when he again entered the institute and took out burnett a second time he was not only able to read it but to make written extracts for future use so ardently did he study the volume that he used to rise at four o'clock in the morning to read it and copy out passages after which he went to the foundry at six worked until six and sometimes eight in the evening and returned home to enter with fresh zest upon the study of burnett which he continued often until a late hour parts of his nights were also occupied in drawing and making copies of drawings on one of these he spent an entire night he went to bed indeed but his mind was so engrossed with the subject that he could not sleep and rose again to resume his pencil he next proceeded to try his hand at painting in oil for which purpose he procured some canvas from a draper stretched it on a frame coated it over with white lead and began painting on it with colors bought from a house painter but his work proved a total failure for the canvas was rough and knotty and the paint would not dry in his extremity he applied to his old teacher the barber from whom he first learnt that prepared canvas was to be had and that there were colors and varnishes made for the special purpose of oil painting as soon therefore as his means would allow he bought a small stock of the necessary articles and began afresh his amateur master showing him how to paint and the pupil succeeded so well that he excelled the master's copy his first picture was a copy from an engraving called sheep shearing and was afterwards sold by him for half a crown aided by a shilling guide to oil painting he went on working at his leisure hours and gradually acquired a better knowledge of his materials he made his own easel and palette palette knife and paint chest he bought his paint brushes and canvas as he could raise the money by working overtime this was the slender fund which his parents consented to allow him for the purpose the burden of supporting a very large family precluding them from doing more often he would walk to manchester and back in the evenings to buy two or three shillings worth of paint and canvas returning almost at midnight after his eighteen miles walk sometimes wet through and completely exhausted but borne up throughout by his inexhaustible hope and invincible determination the further progress of the self-taught artist is best narrated in his own words the next pictures i painted he says were a landscape by moonlight a fruit piece and one or two others after which i conceived the idea of painting the forge i had for some time thought about it but had not attempted to embody the conception in a drawing i now however made a sketch of the subject upon paper and then proceeded to paint it on canvas the picture simply represents the interior of a large workshop such as i have been accustomed to work in although not of any particular shop it is therefore to this extent an original conception 
having made an outline of the subject i found that before i could proceed with it successfully a knowledge of anatomy was indispensable to enable me accurately to delineate the muscles of the figure my brother peter came to my assistance at this juncture and kindly purchased for me flaxman's anatomical studies a work altogether beyond my means at the time for it cost twenty-four shillings this book i looked upon as a great treasure and i studied it laboriously rising at three o'clock in the morning to draw after it and occasionally getting my brother peter to stand for me as a model at that untimely hour although i gradually improved myself by this practice it was some time before i felt sufficient confidence to go on with my picture i also felt hampered by my want of knowledge of perspective which i endeavored to remedy by carefully studying taylor's principles and shortly after i resumed my painting while engaged in the study of perspective at home i used to apply for and obtain leave to work at the heavier kinds of smith work at the foundry and for this reason the time required for heating the heaviest iron work is so much longer than that required for heating the lighter that it enabled me to secure a number of spare minutes in the course of each day which i carefully employed in making diagrams in perspective upon the sheet-iron casings in front of the hearth at which i worked thus assiduously working and studying james sharples steadily advanced in his knowledge of the principles of art and acquired greater facility in its practice some eighteen months after the expiration of his apprenticeship he painted a portrait of his father which attracted considerable notice in the town as also did the picture of the forge which he finished soon after his success in portrait painting obtained for him a commission from the foreman of the shop to paint a family group and sharples executed it so well that the foreman not only paid him the agreed price of eighteen pounds but thirty shillings to boot while engaged on this group he ceased to work at the foundry and he had thoughts of giving up his trade altogether and devoting himself exclusively to painting but not obtaining sufficient employment at portraits to occupy his time or give him the prospect of a steady income he had the good sense to resume his leather apron and go on working at his honest trade of a blacksmith employing his leisure hours in engraving his picture of the forge since published the execution of this work occupied sharple's leisure evening hours during a period of five years and it was only when he took the plate to the printer that he for the first time saw an engraved plate produced by any other man to this unvarnished picture of industry and genius we add one other trait and it is a domestic one i have been married seven years says he and during that time my greatest pleasure after i have finished my daily labor at the foundry has been to resume my pencil or graver frequently until a late hour of the evening my wife meanwhile sitting by my side and reading to me from some interesting book a simple but beautiful testimony to the thorough common sense as well as the genuine right-heartedness of this most interesting and deserving workman haydn speaking of his art said it consists in taking up a subject and pursuing it work said mozart is my chief pleasure beethoven's favorite maxim was the barriers are not erected which can say to aspiring talents and industry thus far and no farther when moscheles submitted his score of fidelio for the pianoforte to beethoven the latter found written at the bottom of the last page finis with god's help beethoven immediately wrote underneath o oh man help thyself this was the motto of his artistic life john sebastian bach said of himself i was industrious whoever is equally sedulous will be equally successful of meyerbeer bale thus wrote he is a man of some talent but no genius he lives solitary working fifteen hours a day at music years passed and meyerbeer's hard work fully brought out his genius as displayed in his huguenots and other works confessedly amongst the greatest operas which have been produced in modern times end of chapter thirteen workers in art read by john greenman
This is section 14 of Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Men of Business Read by John Greenman Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. Proverbs of Solomon That man is but of the lower part of the world, that is not brought up to business and affairs. Owen Feltham Hazlitt, in one of his clever essays, represents the man of business as a mean sort of person put in a go-cart, yoked to a trade or profession, alleging that all he has to do is not to go out of the beaten track, but merely to let his affairs take their own course. The great requisite, he says, for the prosperous management of ordinary business is the want of imagination, or of any ideas but those of custom and interest on the narrowest scale. But nothing could be more one-sided and in effect untrue than such a definition. Of course there are narrow-minded men of business, as there are narrow-minded scientific men, literary men, and legislators but there are also business men of large and comprehensive minds capable of action on the very largest scale as burke said in his speech on the india bill he knew statesmen who were peddlers and merchants who acted in the spirit of statesmen if we take into account the qualities necessary for the successful conduct of any important undertaking that it requires special aptitude promptitude of action on emergencies capacity for organizing the labors often of large numbers of men, great tact and the knowledge of human nature, constant self-culture, and growing experience in the practical affairs of life, it must, we think, be obvious that the school of business is by no means so narrow as some writers would have us believe. Mr. Helps has gone much nearer the truth when he said that consummate men of business are as rare almost as great poets, rarer perhaps than veritable saints and martyrs. Indeed, of no other pursuit can it so emphatically be said as of this, that business makes men. It has, however, been a favorite fallacy with dunces in all times, that men of genius are unfitted for business, as well as that business occupations unfit men for the pursuits of genius. The unhappy youth who committed suicide a few years since, because he had been born to be a man and condemned to be a grocer, proved by the act that his soul was not equal even to the dignity of a grocer. For it is not the calling that degrades a man, but the man that degrades the calling. All work that brings honest gain is honorable, whether it be of hand or mind. The fingers may be soiled, yet the heart remain pure for it is not material so much as moral dirt that defiles, greed far more than crime, and vice than vertigris. The greatest have not disdained to labor honestly and usefully for a living, though at the same time aiming after higher things. Thales, the first of the seven sages, Solon, the second founder of Athens, and Hyperides, the mathematician, were all traders plato called the divine by reason of the excellence of his wisdom defrayed his travelling expenses in egypt by the profits derived from the oil which he sold during his journey spinoza maintained himself by polishing glasses while he pursued his philosophical investigations linnaeus the great botanist prosecuted his studies while hammering leather and making shoes shakespeare was a successful manager of a theatre perhaps priding himself more upon his practical qualities in that capacity than on his writing of plays and poetry. Pope was of opinion that Shakespeare's principal object in cultivating literature was to secure an honest independence. Indeed, he seems to have been altogether indifferent to literary reputation. It is not known that he superintended the publication of a single play, or even sanctioned the printing of one, and the chronology of his writings is still a mystery. 
it is certain however that he prospered in his business and he realized sufficient to enable him to retire upon a competency to his native town we have abundant illustrations in our own day of the fact that the highest intellectual power is not incompatible with the active and efficient performance of routine duties grote the great historian of greece was a london banker and it is not long since john stuart mill one of our greatest living thinkers retired from the examiner's department of the east india company carrying with him the admiration and esteem of his fellow officers not on account of his high views of philosophy but because of the high standard of efficiency which he had established in his office and the thoroughly satisfactory manner in which he had conducted the business of his department the path of success in business is usually the path of common sense patient labor and application are as necessary here as in the acquisition of knowledge or the pursuit of science the old greeks said to become an able man in any profession three things are necessary nature study and practice in business practice wisely and diligently improved is the great secret of success some may make what are called lucky hits but like money earned by gambling such hits may only serve to lure one to ruin every youth should be made to feel that his happiness and well-doing in life must necessarily rely mainly on himself and the exercise of his own energies rather than upon the help and patronage of others the late lord melbourne embodied a piece of useful advice in a letter which he wrote to lord john russell in reply to an application for a provision for one of moore the poet's sons my dear john he said i return you moore's letter i shall be ready to do what you like about it when we have the means i think whatever is done should be done for moore himself this is more distinct direct and intelligible making a small provision for young men is hardly justifiable and it is of all things the most prejudicial to themselves they think what they have much larger than it really is and they make no exertion the young should never hear any language but this you have your own way to make and it depends upon your own exertions whether you starve or not believe me etc melbourne practical industry wisely and vigorously applied always produces its due effects it carries a man onward brings out his individual character and stimulates the actions of others all may not rise equally yet each on the whole very much according to his deserts though all cannot live on the piazza as the tuscan proverb has it every one may feel the sun on the whole it is not good that human nature should have the road of life made too easy better to be under the necessity of working hard and faring meanly than to have everything done ready to our hand and a pillow of down to repose upon indeed to start in life with comparatively small means seems so necessary as a stimulus to work that it may almost be set down as one of the conditions essential to success in life hence an eminent judge when asked what contributed most to success at the bar replied some succeed by great talent some by high connections some by miracle but the majority by commencing without a shilling we have heard of an architect of considerable accomplishments a man who had improved himself by long study and travel in the classical lands of the east who came home to commence the practice of his profession he determined to begin anywhere provided he could be employed and he accordingly undertook a business connected with dilapidations one of the lowest and least remunerative departments of the architect's calling but he had the good sense not to be above his trade and he had the resolution to work his way upward so that he only got a fair start one hot day in july a friend found him sitting astride of a house roof occupied with his dilapidation business drawing his hand across his perspiring countenance he exclaimed here's a pretty business for a man who has been all over greece however he did his work such as it was thoroughly and well 
he persevered until he advanced by degrees to more remunerative branches of employment and eventually he rose to the highest walks of his profession the necessity of labor may indeed be regarded as the main root and spring of all that we call progress in individuals and civilizations in nations and it is doubtful that any heavier curse could be imposed on man than the gratification of all his wishes without effort on his part leaving nothing for his hopes desires or struggles the feeling that life is destitute of any motive or necessity for action must be of all others the most distressing and insupportable to a rational being the marquis de spinola asking sir horace vere what his brother died of sir horace replied he died sir of having nothing to do alas said spinola that is enough to kill any general of us all those who fail in life are however very apt to assume a tone of injured innocence and conclude too hastily that everybody excepting themselves has had a hand in their personal misfortune there is a russian proverb which says that misfortune is next door to stupidity and it will often be found that men who are constantly lamenting their luck are in some way or other reaping the consequences of their own neglect mismanagement improvidence or want of application dr johnson who came up to london with a single guinea in his pocket and who once accurately described himself in his signature to a letter addressed to a noble lord as impransus or dinnerless has honestly said all the complaints which are made of the world are unjust i never knew a man of merit neglected it was generally by his own fault that he failed of success washington irving held like views as for the talk he said about modest merit being neglected it is too often a cant by which the indolent and irresolute men seek to lay their want of success at the door of the public modest merit is however too apt to be inactive or negligent or uninstructed merit well matured and well disciplined talent is always sure of a market provided it exerts itself but it must not cower at home and expect to be sought for there is a good deal of cant too about the success of forward and impudent men while men of retiring worth are passed over with neglect but it usually happens that those forward men have that valuable quality of promptness and activity without which worth is a mere inoperative property a barking dog is often more useful than a sleeping lion attention application accuracy method punctuality and dispatch are the principal qualities required for the efficient conduct of business of any sort these at first sight may appear to be small matters and yet they are of essential importance to human happiness well-being and usefulness they are little things it is true but human life is made up of comparative trifles it is the repetition of little acts which constitutes not only the sum of human character but which determines the character of nations and where men or nations have broken down it will almost invariably be found that neglect of little things was the rock on which they split every human being has duties to be performed and therefore has need of cultivating the capacity for doing them whether the sphere of action be the management of a household the conduct of a trade or profession or the government of a nation the examples we have already given of great workers in various branches of industry art and science render it unnecessary further to enforce the importance of persevering application in any department of life it is the result of everyday experience that steady attention to matters of detail lies at the root of human progress and that diligence above all is the mother of good luck accuracy is also of much importance and an invariable mark of good training in a man accuracy in observation accuracy in speech accuracy in the transaction of affairs what is done in business must be well done for it is better to accomplish perfectly a small amount of work than to half do ten times as much 
a wise man used to say stay a little that we may make an end the sooner too little attention however is paid to this highly important quality of accuracy as a man eminent in practical sciences lately observed to us it is astonishing how few people i have met with the course of my experience who can define a fact accurately yet in business affairs it is the manner in which even small matters are transacted that often decides men for or against you with virtue capacity and good conduct in other respects the person who is habitually inaccurate cannot be trusted his work has to be gone over again and he thus causes an infinity of annoyance vexation and trouble it was one of the characteristic qualities of charles james fox that he was thoroughly painstaking in all that he did when appointed secretary of state being piqued at some observation as to his bad writing he actually took a writing master and wrote copies like a schoolboy until he had sufficiently improved himself method is essential and enables a larger amount of work to be got through with satisfaction method said the rev richard cecil is like packing things in a box a good packer will get in half as much again as a bad one cecil's dispatch of business was extraordinary his maxim being the shortest way to do many things is to do only one thing at once and he never left a thing undone with a view of recurring to it at a period of more leisure when business pressed he rather chose to encroach on his hours of meals and rest than omit any part of his work de witt's maxim was like cecil's one thing at a time if said he i have any necessary dispatches to make i think of nothing else till they are finished if any domestic affairs require my attention i give myself wholly up to them till they are set in order a french minister who was alike remarkable for his dispatch of business and his constant attendance at places of amusement being asked how he contrived to combine both objects replied simply by never postponing till to-morrow what should be done to-day men are apt to rely upon agents who are not always to be relied upon important affairs must be attended to in person if you want your business done says the proverb go and do it if you don't want it done send someone else an indolent country gentleman had a freehold estate producing about five hundred a year becoming involved in debt he sold half the estate and let the remainder to an industrious farmer for twenty years about the end of the term the farmer called to pay his rent and asked the owner whether he would sell the farm will you buy it asked the owner surprised yes if we can arrange about the price that is exceedingly strange observed the gentleman pray tell me how it happens that while i could not live upon twice as much land for which i paid no rent you are regularly paying me two hundred a year for your farm and are able in a few years to purchase it the reason is plain was the reply you sat still and said go i got up and said come you lay in bed and enjoyed your estate i rose in the morning and minded my business promptitude in action may be stimulated by a due consideration of the value of time an italian philosopher was accustomed to call time his estate an estate which produces nothing of value without cultivation but duly improved never fails to recompense the labors of the diligent worker allowed to lie waste the product will be only noxious weeds and vicious growths of all kinds one of the minor uses of steady employment is that it keeps one out of mischief for truly an idle brain is the devil's workshop and a lazy man the devil's bolster to be occupied is to be possessed as by a tenant whereas to be idle is to be empty and when the doors of the imagination are opened temptation finds a ready access and evil thoughts come trooping in it is observed at sea that men are never so much disposed to grumble and mutiny as when least employed hence an old captain when there was nothing else to do would issue the order to scour the anchor men of business are accustomed to quote the maxim that time is money but it is more 
the proper improvement of it is self-culture self-improvement and growth of character an hour wasted daily on trifles or in indolence would if devoted to self-improvement make an ignorant man wise in a few years and employed in good works would make his life fruitful and death a harvest of worthy deeds fifteen minutes a day devoted to self-improvement will be felt at the end of the year good thoughts and carefully gathered experience take up no room and may be carried about as our companions everywhere without cost or encumbrance an economical use of time is the true mode of securing leisure it enables us to get through business and carry it forward instead of being driven by it on the other hand the miscalculation of time involves us in perpetual hurry confusion and difficulties and life becomes a mere shuffle of expedients usually followed by disaster nelson once said i owe all my success in life to having been always a quarter of an hour before my time some take no thought of the value of money until they have come to an end of it and many do the same with their time the hours are allowed to flow by unemployed and then when life is fast waning they bethink themselves of the duty of making a wiser use of it but the habit of listlessness and idleness may already have become confirmed and they are unable to break the bonds with which they have permitted themselves to become bound lost wealth may be replaced by industry lost knowledge by study lost health by temperance or medicine but lost time is gone forever a proper consideration of the value of time will also inspire habits of punctuality nothing begets confidence in a man sooner than the practice of this virtue and nothing shakes confidence sooner than the want of it he who holds to his appointment and does not keep you waiting for him shows that he has regard for your time as well as for his own thus punctuality is one of the modes by which we testify our personal respect for those whom we are called upon to meet in the business of life it is also conscientiousness in a measure for an appointment is a contract express or implied and he who does not keep it breaks faith as well as dishonestly uses other people's time and thus inevitably loses character we naturally come to the conclusion that the person who is careless about time is careless about business and that he is not the one to be trusted with the transaction of matters of importance when washington's secretary excused himself for the lateness of his attendance and laid the blame upon his watch his master quietly said then you must get another watch or i another secretary the truth of the good old maxim that honesty is the best policy is upheld by the daily experience of life uprightness and integrity being found as successful in business as in everything else integrity of word and deed ought to be the very cornerstone of all business transactions to the tradesman the merchant and manufacturer it should be what honor is to the soldier and charity is to the christian in the humblest calling there will always be found scope for the exercise of this uprightness of character hugh miller speaks of the mason with whom he served his apprenticeship as one who put his conscience into every stone that he laid so the true mechanic will pride himself upon the thoroughness and solidity of his work and the high-minded contractor upon the honesty of performance of his contract in every particular the upright manufacturer will find not only honor and reputation but substantial success in the genuineness of the article which he produces and the merchant in the honesty of what he sells and that it really is what it seems to be baron dupin speaking of the general probity of englishmen which he held to be a principal cause of their success observed we may succeed for a time by fraud by surprise by violence but we can succeed permanently only by means directly opposite it is not alone the courage the intelligence the activity of the merchant and manufacturer which maintains the superiority of their productions and the character of their country it is far more their wisdom 
their economy, and above all, their probity. If ever in the British islands the useful citizen should lose these virtues, we may be sure that for England, as for every other country, the vessels of a degenerate commerce, repulsed from every shore, would speedily disappear from those seas whose surface they now cover with the treasures of the universe, bartered for the treasures of the industry of the three kingdoms. It must be admitted that trade tries character, perhaps, more severely than any other pursuit in life. It puts to the severest tests honesty, self-denial, justice, and truthfulness, and men of business who pass through such trials unstained are perhaps worthy of as great honor as soldiers who prove their courage amidst the fire and perils of battle. And, to the credit of the multitudes of men engaged in the various departments of trade, we think it must be admitted that on the whole they pass through their trials nobly. If we reflect but for a moment on the vast amount of wealth daily entrusted even to the subordinate persons who themselves probably earn but a bare competency, the loose cash which is constantly passing through the hands of shopmen, agents, brokers, and clerks in banking-houses, and note how comparatively few are the breaches of trust which occur amidst all this temptation, it will probably be admitted that this steady daily honesty of conduct is more honorable to human nature if it do not even tempt us to be proud of it. The same trust and confidence reposed by men of business in each other, as implied by the system of credit, which is mainly based upon the principle of honor, would be surprising if it were not so much a matter of ordinary practice in business transactions. Dr. Chalmers has well said that the implicit trust with which merchants are accustomed to confide in distant agents, separated from them perhaps by half the globe, often consigning vast wealth to persons recommended only by their character, whom perhaps they have never seen, is probably the finest act of homage which men can render to one another. The fortunes of the House of Rothschild were based upon the honesty of their founder, Meyer Anselm. He was born in Frankfurt on the Main in 1743. His parents were Jews. What a frightful history might be written of the persecutions, tortures, and martyrdoms of the Jews in the Middle Ages, and even down to our own times. At Frankfurt, as well as at other towns and cities in Germany, the Jews were compelled to resort to their quarters at a certain hour in the evening under penalty of death. The Judengasse at Frankfurt was shut in by gates, which were locked at night. Napoleon blew them down with cannon, one of the best things he ever did. Yet the persecutions of the Jews continued. Young Anselm lost his parents at eleven, and had to fight his way through life alone. After a slight modicum of education, the boy had the good fortune to find a place as clerk to a small banker and money-changer at Hanover. He returned to Frankfurt in 1772, and established himself as a broker and money-lender. Over his shop he hung the sign of the Red Shield, in German, Rothschild. He collected ancient and rare coins, and among the amateurs who frequented his shop was the Langrave William, afterward Elector of Hesse. When Napoleon overran Europe, William of Hesse was driven from his states, and left all the money he could gather together in the hands of Anselm, his agent. It amounted to one million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. How to take care of this money and make it grow in his hands was Anselm's greatest object. Money in those days was very dear. It returned twelve or even twenty per cent on good security. The war went on. Russia was invaded by Napoleon. His army was all but lost in the snow. The Battle of Leipzig was fought, and Napoleon and his army were hurled across the Rhine. The Landgrave of Hesse then returned to his states. A few days after, the eldest son of Meyer Anselm presented himself at court and handed over to the Landgrave the three millions of florins which his father had taken care of. The Landgrave was almost beside himself with joy. He looked upon the restored money as a windfall. In his exultation he knighted the young Rothschild at once. Such honesty, his highness exclaimed, had never been known in the world. 
at the congress of vienna where he went shortly after he could talk of nothing else than the honesty of the rothschilds anselm had a large family they followed his example and thus the rothschilds became the largest money-lenders in the world end of chapter fourteen men of business read by john greenman This is section 15 of Happy Homes and the Hearts that Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Money, Its Use, and Abuse. Read by John Greenman. Not for to hide it in a hedge, nor for a train attendant, but for the glorious privilege of being independent. Burns neither a borrower nor a lender be for loan oft loses both itself and friend and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry shakespeare whoever has a sixpence is sovereign over all men to the extent of that sixpence commands cooks to feed him philosophers to teach him kings to guard over him to the extent of that sixpence carla how a man uses money makes it saves it and spends it is perhaps one of the best tests of practical wisdom although money ought by no means to be regarded as the chief end of man's life neither is it a trifling matter to be held in philosophic contempt representing as it does to so large an extent the means of physical comfort and social well-being indeed some of the finest qualities of human nature are intimately related to the right use of money such as generosity honesty justice and self-sacrifice as well as the practical virtues of economy and providence on the other hand there are their counterparts of avarice fraud injustice and selfishness as displayed by the inordinate lovers of gain and the vices of thriftlessness extravagance and improvidence on the part of those who misuse and abuse the means entrusted to them so that as is wisely observed by henry taylor in his thoughtful notes from life a right measure and manner in getting saving spending giving taking lending borrowing and bequeathing would almost argue a perfect man comfort in worldly circumstances is a condition which every man is justified in striving to attain by all worthy means it secures that physical satisfaction which is necessary for the culture of the better part of his nature and enables him to provide for those of his own household without which says the apostle a man is worse than an infidel nor ought the duty to be any the less pleasing to us that the respect which our fellow-men entertain for us in no slight degree depends upon the manner in which we exercise the opportunities which present themselves for our honourable advancement in life the very effort required to be made to succeed in life with this object is of itself an education stimulating a man's sense of self-respect bringing out his practical qualities and disciplining him in the exercise of patience perseverance and such like virtues the provident and careful man must necessarily be a thoughtful man for he lives not merely for the present but with provident forecast makes arrangements for the future he must also be a temperate man and exercise the virtue of self-denial than which nothing is so much calculated to give strength to the character john sterling says truly that the worst education which teaches self-denial is better than the best which teaches everything else and not that hence the lesson of self-denial the sacrificing of a present gratification for a future good is one of the last that is learned those classes which work the hardest might naturally be expected to value the most the money which they earn 
yet the readiness with which so many are accustomed to eat up and drink up their earnings as they go renders them to a great extent helpless and dependent upon the frugal there are large numbers of persons among us who though enjoying sufficient means of comfort and independence are often found to be barely a day's march ahead of actual want when a time of pressure occurs and hence a great cause of social helplessness and suffering on one occasion a deputation waited on lord john russell respecting the taxation levied on the working classes of the country when the noble lord took the opportunity of remarking you may rely upon it that the government of this country does not tax the working classes to anything like the extent to which they tax themselves in their expenditure upon intoxicating drinks alone providence frugality and good management said samuel drew the philosophical shoemaker are excellent artists for mending bad times they occupy but little room in any dwelling but would furnish a more effectual remedy for the evils of life than any reform bill that ever passed the houses of parliament socrates said let him that would move the world move first himself any class of men that lives from hand to mouth will ever be an inferior class they will necessarily remain impotent and helpless hanging on to the skirts of society the sport of times and seasons having no respect for themselves they will fail in securing the respect of others in commercial crisis such men must inevitably go to the wall wanting that husbanded power with a store of savings no matter how small invariably gives them they will be at every man's mercy and if possessed of right feelings they cannot but regard with fear and trembling the future possible fate of their wives and children the world said mr cobden has always been divided into two classes those who have saved and those who have spent the thrifty and the extravagant the building of all the houses the mills the bridges and the ships and the accomplishment of all other great works which have rendered man civilized and happy has been done by the savers the thrifty and those who have wasted their resources have always been their slaves it has been the law of nature and of providence that this should be so and i were an impostor if i promised any class that they would advance themselves if they were improvident thoughtless and idle equally sound was the advice given by mr bright to an assembly of working men when after expressing his belief that so far as honesty was concerned it was to be found in pretty equal amount among all classes he used the following words there is only one way that is safe for any man or any number of men by which they can maintain their present position if it be a good one or raise themselves above it if it be a bad one that is by the practice of the virtues of industry frugality temperance and honesty there is no royal road by which men can raise themselves from a position which they feel to be uncomfortable and unsatisfactory as regards their mental or physical condition except by the practice of those virtues by which they find numbers amongst them are continually advancing and bettering themselves there is no reason why the condition of the average workman should not be a useful honorable respectable and happy one the whole body of the working classes might be as frugal virtuous well informed and well conditioned as many individuals of the same class have already made themselves what some men are all without difficulty might be employ the same means and the same results will follow the healthy spirit of self-help created amongst working people would more than any other measure serve to raise them as a class and this not by pulling down others but by leveling them up to a higher and still advancing standard of religion intelligence and virtue all moral philosophy says montaigne is as applicable to a common and private life as to the most splendid every man carries the entire form of the human condition with him 
when a man casts his glance forward he will find that the three chief temporal contingencies for which he has to provide are want of employment sickness and death the two first he may escape but the last is inevitable it is however the duty of the prudent man so to live and so to arrange that the pressure of suffering in the event of either contingencies occurring shall be mitigated to as great an extent as possible not only to himself but also to those who are dependent upon him for their comfort and subsistence viewed in this light the honest earning and the frugal use of money are of the greatest importance rightly earned it is the representative of patient industry and untiring effort of temptation resisted and hope rewarded and rightly used it affords indications of prudence forethought and self-denial the true basis of manly character though money represents a crowd of objects without any real worth or utility it also represents many things of great value not only food clothing and household satisfaction but personal self-respect and independence thus a store of savings is to the working man as a barricade against want it secures him a footing and enables him to wait it may be in cheerfulness and hope until better days come round the very endeavor to gain a firmer position in the world has certain dignity in it and tends to make a man stronger and better at all events it gives him greater freedom of action and enables him to husband his strength for future effort but the man who is always hovering on the verge of want is in a state not far removed from that of slavery he is in no sense his own master but is in constant peril of falling under the bondage of others and accepting the terms which they dictate to him he cannot help being in a measure servile for he dares not look the world boldly in the face and in adverse times he must look either to alms or the poor's rates if work fails him altogether he has not the means of moving to another field of employment to secure independence the practice of simple economy is all that is necessary economy requires neither superior courage nor eminent virtue it is satisfied with ordinary energy and the capacity of average minds economy at bottom is but the spirit of order applied in the administration of domestic affairs it means management regularity prudence and the avoidance of waste francis horner's father gave him this advice on entering life whilst i wish you to be comfortable in every respect i cannot too strongly inculcate economy it is a necessary virtue to all and however the shallow part of mankind may despise it it certainly leads to independence which is a grand object to every man of a high spirit it was a maxim of lord bacon that when it was necessary to economize it was better to look after petty savings than to descend to petty gettings the loose cash which many persons throw away uselessly and worse would often form a basis of fortune and independence for life these wasters are their own worst enemies though generally found amongst the ranks of those who rail at the injustice of the world but if a man will not be his own friend how can he expect that others will orderly men of the moderate means have always something left in their pockets to help others whereas your prodigal and careless fellows who spend all never find an opportunity for helping anybody it is poor economy however to be a scrub narrow-mindedness in living and in dealing is generally short-sighted and leads to failure the penny soul it is said never came to tuppence generosity and liberality like honesty prove the best policy after all the proverb says that an empty bag cannot stand upright neither can a man who is in debt it is also difficult for a man who is in debt to be truthful hence it is said that lying rides on debt's back 
the debtor has to frame excuses to his creditor for postponing payment of the money he owes him and probably also to contrive falsehoods it is easy enough for a man who will exercise a healthy resolution to avoid incurring the first obligation but the facility with which that has been occurred often becomes a temptation to a second and very soon the unfortunate borrower becomes so entangled that no late exertion of industry can set him free the first step in debt is like the first step in falsehoods almost involving the necessity of proceeding in the same course debt following debt as lie follows lie hayden the painter dated his decline from the day on which he first borrowed money he realized the truth of the proverb who goes a borrowing goes a sorrowing the significant entry in his diary is here began debt and obligation out of which i have never been and never shall be extricated as long as i live his autobiography shows but too painfully how embarrassment in money matters produces poignant distress of mind utter incapacity for work and constantly recurring humiliations the written advice which he gave to a youth when entering the navy was as follows never purchase any enjoyment if it cannot be procured without borrowing of others never borrow money it is degrading i do not say never lend but never lend if by lending you render yourself unable to pay what you owe but under any circumstances never borrow fichte the poor student refused to accept even presents from his still poorer parents dr johnson held that early debt is ruin his words on the subject are weighty and worthy of being held in remembrance do not said he accustom yourself to consider debt only as an inconvenience you will find it a calamity poverty takes away so many means of doing good and produces so much inability to resist evil both natural and moral that it is by all virtuous means to be avoided let it be your first care then not to be in any man's debt resolve not to be poor whatever you have spend less poverty is a great enemy to human happiness it certainly destroys liberty and it makes some virtues impracticable and others extremely difficult frugality is not only the basis of quiet but of beneficence no man can help others that wants help himself we must have enough before we have to spare it is the bounden duty of every man to look his affairs in the face and to keep an account of his incomings and outgoings in money matters the exercise of a little simple arithmetic in this way will be found of great value prudence requires that we shall pitch our scale of living a degree below our means but this can only be done by carrying out faithfully a plan of living by which both ends may be made to meet john locke strongly advised this course nothing said he is likelier to keep a man within compass than having constantly before his eyes the state of his affairs in a regular course of account the duke of wellington kept an accurate detailed account of all the money received and expended by him washington was very particular in matters of business detail and it is a remarkable fact that he did not disdain to scrutinize the smallest outgoings of his household determined as he was to live honestly within his means even when holding the high office of president of the american union admiral jervis has told the story of his early struggles and amongst other things of his determination to keep out of debt my father had a very large family said he with limited means he gave me twenty pounds at starting and that was all he ever gave me after i had been a considerable time at the station i drew for twenty more but the bill came back protested i was mortified at this rebuke and made a promise which i have ever kept that i would never draw another bill without a certainty of it being paid i immediately changed my mode of living quitted my mess lived alone 
and took up the ship's allowance which i found quite sufficient washed and mended my own clothes made a pair of trousers out of the ticking of my bed and having by these means saved as much money as would redeem my honor i took up my bill and from that time to this i have taken care to keep within my means jervis for six years endured pinching privation but preserved his integrity studied his profession with success and gradually and steadily rose by merit and bravery to the highest rank middle-class people are too apt to live up to their incomes if not beyond them affecting a degree of style which is most unhealthy in its effects upon society at large there is an ambition to bring up boys as gentlemen or rather genteel men though the result frequently is only to make them gents they acquire a taste for dress style luxuries and amusements which can never form any solid foundation for manly or gentlemanly character and the result is that we have a vast number of gingerbread young gentry thrown upon the world who remind one of the abandoned hulls sometimes picked up at sea with only a monkey on board there is a dreadful ambition abroad for being genteel we keep up appearances too often at the expense of honesty and though we may not be rich yet we must seem to be so we must be respectable though only in the meanest sense in mere vulgar outward show we have not the courage to go patiently onward in the condition in life in which it has pleased god to call us but must needs live in some fashionable state to which we ridiculously please to call ourselves and to gratify the vanity of that unsubstantial genteel world of which we form a part there is a constant struggle and pressure for front seats in the social amphitheatre in the midst of which all noble self-denying resolve is trodden down and many fine natures are inevitably crushed to death what waste what misery what bankruptcy come from all this ambition to dazzle others with the glare of apparent worldly success we need not describe the mischievous results show themselves in a thousand ways in the rank frauds committed by men who dare to be dishonest but do not dare to seem poor there are rogues innumerable who are ready to sell their bodies and souls for money and for drink who has not heard of the elections which have been made void through bribery and corruption this is not the way to enjoy liberty or to keep it the men who sell themselves are slaves their buyers are dishonest and unprincipled freedom has its humbugs i'm standing on the soil of liberty said an orator you ain't replied a bootmaker in the audience you are standing on a pair of boots you never paid me for the ignorant and careless are at the mercy of the unprincipled and the ignorant are as yet greatly in the majority when a french quack was taken before the correctional tribunal at paris for obstructing the pont neuf the magistrate said to him sirrah how is it you draw such crowds about you and extract so much money from them in selling your infallible rubbish my lord replied the quack how many people do you think cross the pont neuf in the hour i don't know said the drudge then i can tell you about ten thousand and how many of these do you think are wise oh perhaps a hundred it is too many said the quack but i leave the hundred persons to you and take the nine thousand nine hundred for my customers aristides was called the just from his unbending integrity his sense of justice was spotless and his self-denial unimpeachable he fought at marathon at salamis and commanded at the battle of platea though he had borne the highest offices in the state he died poor nothing could buy him nothing could induce him to swerve from his duty it is said that the athenians became more virtuous from contemplating his bright example 
in the representation of one of the tragedies of aeschylus a sentence was uttered in favor of moral goodness on which the eyes of the audience turned involuntarily from the actor to aristides phocion the athenian general a man of great bravery and foresight was surnamed the good alexander the great when overrunning greece endeavored to win him from his loyalty he offered him riches and a choice of four cities in asia the answer of phocion bespoke the spotless character of the man if alexander really esteems me he said let him leave me my honesty yet demosthenes the eloquent could be bought when harpalus one of alexander's chiefs came to athens the orators had an eye upon his gold demosthenes was one of them what is eloquence without honesty on his visit to harpalus the chief perceived that demosthenes was much pleased with one of the king's beautiful engraved cups he desired him to take it in his hand that he might feel its weight how much might it bring asked demosthenes it will bring you twenty talents replied harpalus that night the cup was sent to demosthenes with twenty talents in it the present was not refused the circumstance led to the disgrace of the orator and he soon after poisoned himself cicero on the other hand refused all presents from friends as well as from the enemies of his country some time after his assassination caesar found one of his grandsons with a book of cicero's in his hands the boy endeavored to hide it but caesar took it from him after having run over it he returned it to the boy saying my dear child this was an eloquent man and a lover of his country goldsmith also was a man who would not be bought he had known the depths of poverty he had wandered over europe paying his way with his flute he had slept in bonds and under the open sky he tried acting ushering doctoring he starved amid them all then he tried authorship and became a gentleman but he never quite escaped from the clutches of poverty he described himself as in a garret writing for bread and expecting to be dunned for a milk score one day johnson received a message from goldsmith stating that he was in great distress the doctor went to see him and found that his landlady had arrested him for his rent the only thing he had to dispose of was a packet of manuscript johnson took it up and found it to be the vicar of wakefield having ascertained its merit johnson took it to a bookseller and sold it for sixty pounds poor though he was then and poor though he was at the end of his life for he died in debt goldsmith could not be bought he refused to do dirty political work about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars annually was then expended by sir robert walpole in secret service money daily scribblers were suborned to write up the acts of the administration and to write down those of their opponents in the time of lord north junius was in opposition it was resolved to hire goldsmith to baffle his terrible sarcasm dr scott chaplain to lord sandwich was deputed to negotiate with him i found him says dr scott in a terrible suite of chambers in the temple i told him my authority i told him how i was empowered to pay for his exertions and would you believe it he was so absurd as to say i can earn as much as will supply my wants without writing for any party the assistance you offer is therefore unnecessary to me and so i left him in his garret nothing is more creditable to american statesmanship than the fact that most of our presidents at death have left their families in very moderate circumstances garfield and lincoln whose positions would have enabled them by accepting gifts and bribes to have accumulated immense wealth died poor and in debt although they were rich in the affection of a grateful people the same is true of our most honored statesmen that bribery and corruption exists in our politics and often controls legislation cannot be denied but it should also be said to the great credit of a vigilant popular censorship that corrupt and venal statesmen when they become known as such are promptly relegated to private life 
the young man as he passes through life advances through a long line of tempters ranged on either side of him and the inevitable effect of yielding is degradation in a greater or less degree contact with them tends insensibly to draw away from him some portion of the divine electric element with which his nature is charged and his only mode of resisting them is to utter and act out his no manfully and resolutely he must decide at once not waiting to deliberate and balance reasons for the youth like the woman who deliberates is lost temptation will come to try the young man's strength and once yielded to the power to resist grows weaker and weaker yield once and a portion of virtue is gone resist manfully and the first decision will give strength for life repeated it will become a habit it is in the outworks of the habits formed in early life that the real strength of the defense must lie for it has been wisely ordained that the machinery of moral existence should be carried on principally through the medium of the habits so as to save the wear and tear of the great principles within it is good habits which insinuate themselves into the thousand inconsiderable acts of life that really constitute by far the greater part of man's moral conduct hugh miller has told how by an act of youthful decision he saved himself from one of the strong temptations so peculiar to a life of toil when employed as a mason it was usual for his fellow workmen to have an occasional treat of drink and one day two glasses of whiskey fell to his share which he swallowed when he reached home he found on opening his favorite book bacon's essays that the letters danced before his eyes and that he could no longer master the sense the condition he says into which i had brought myself was i felt one of degradation i had sunk by my own act for the time to a lower level of intelligence than that on which it was my privilege to be placed and though the state could have been no very favorable one for forming a resolution i in that hour determined that i should never again sacrifice my capacity of intellectual enjoyment to a drinking usage and with god's help i was enabled to hold by the determination it is such decisions as this that often form the turning points in a man's life and furnish the foundation of his future character and this rock on which hugh miller might have been wrecked if he had not at the right moment put forth his moral strength to strike away from it is one that youth and manhood alike need to be constantly on their guard against it is about one of the worst and most deadly as well as extravagant temptations which lie in the way of youth sir walter scott used to say that of all vices drinking is the most incompatible with greatness not only so but it is incompatible with economy decency health and honest living dr johnson said referring to his own habits sir i can abstain but i can't be moderate many popular books have been written for the purpose of communicating to the public the grand secret of making money but there is no secret whatever about it as the proverbs of every nation abundantly testify take care of the pennies and the pounds will take care of themselves diligence is the mother of good luck no pains no gains no sweat no sweet work and thou shalt have the world is his who has patience and industry better go to bed supperless than rise in debt such are specimens of the proverbial philosophy embodying the hoarded experience of many generations as to the best means of thriving in the world they were current in people's mouths long before books were invented and like other popular proverbs they were the first popular morals moreover they have stood the test of time and the experience of every day still bears witness to their accuracy force and soundness the proverbs of solomon are full of wisdom as to the force of industry and the use and abuse of money he that is slothful in work is brother to him that is a great waster 
go to the ant thou sluggard consider her ways and be wise poverty says the preacher shall come upon the idler as one that travelleth and want as an armed man but of the industrious and upright the hand of the diligent maketh rich the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags seest thou a man diligent in his business he shall stand before kings but above all it is better to get wisdom than gold for wisdom is better than rubies and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it simple industry and thrift will go far towards making any person of ordinary working faculty comparatively independent in his means even a working man may be so provided he will carefully husband his resources and watch the little outlets of useless expenditure a penny is a very small matter yet the comfort of thousands of families depends upon the proper spending and saving of pennies if a man allows the little pennies the results of his hard work to slip out of his fingers some to the beer shop some this way and some that he will find that his life is little raised above one of mere animal drudgery on the other hand if he takes care of the pennies putting some weekly into a savings bank and confiding the rest to his wife to be carefully laid out with a view to the comfortable maintenance and education of his family he will soon find that this attention to small matters will abundantly repay him in increasing means growing comfort at home and a mind comparatively free from fears as to the future and if a working man have high ambition and possess richness in spirit a kind of wealth which far transcends all mere worldly possessions he may not only help himself but be a profitable helper of others in his path through life that this is no impossible thing even for a common laborer in a workshop may be illustrated by the remarkable career of thomas wright of manchester who not only attempted but succeeded in the reclamation of many criminals while working for weekly wages in a foundry accident first directed thomas wright's attention to the difficulty encountered by liberated convicts in returning to habits of honest industry his mind was shortly possessed by the subject and to remedy the evil became the purpose of his life though he worked from six in the morning till six at night still there were leisure minutes that he could call his own more especially his sundays and these he employed in the service of convicted criminals a class then far more neglected than they are now but a few minutes a day well employed can effect a great deal and it will scarcely be credited that in ten years this working man by steadfastly holding to his purpose succeeded in rescuing not fewer than three hundred felons from continuance in a life of villainy he came to be regarded as the moral physician of the manchester old bailey and where the chaplain and all others failed thomas wright often succeeded children he thus restored reformed to their parents sons and daughters otherwise lost to their homes and many a returned convict did he contrive to settle down to honest and industrious pursuits the task was by no means easy it required money time energy prudence and above all character and the confidence which character invariably inspires the most remarkable circumstance was that wright relieved many of these poor outcasts out of the comparatively small wages earned by him at foundry work he did all this on an income which did not average during his working career five hundred dollars per annum and yet while he was able to bestow substantial aid on criminals to whom he owed no more than the service of kindness which every human being owes to another he also maintained his family in comfort and was by frugality and carefulness enabled to lay by a store of savings against his approaching old age every week he apportioned his income with deliberate care so much for the indispensable necessaries of food and clothing so much for the landlord so much for the schoolmaster so much for the poor and needy and the lines of distribution were resolutely observed 
by such means did this humble workman pursue his great work with the results we have so briefly described indeed his career affords one of the most remarkable and striking illustrations of the force of purpose in a man of the might of small means carefully and sedulously applied and above all of the power which an energetic and upright character invariably exercises upon the lives and conduct of others there is no discredit but honor in every right walk of industry whether it be in tilling the ground making tools weaving fabrics or selling the products behind a counter a youth may handle a yardstick or measure a piece of ribbon and there will be no discredit in doing so unless he allows his mind to have no higher range than the stick and ribbon to be as short as the one and as narrow as the other let not those blush who have said fuller but those who have not a lawful calling and bishop hall said sweet is the destiny of all trades whether of the brow or of the mind one of our presidents when asked what was his coat of arms remembering that he had been a hewer of wood in his youth replied a pair of shirt sleeves nothing is more common than energy in money-making quite independent of any higher object than its accumulation a man who devotes himself to this pursuit body and soul can scarcely fail to become rich very little brains will do spend less than you earn add guinea to guinea scrape and save and the pile of gold will gradually rise john foster has cited a striking illustration of what determination will do in money-making a young man who ran through his patrimony spending it in profligacy was at length reduced to utter want and despair he rushed out of his house intending to put an end to his life and stopped on arriving at an eminence overlooking what were once his estates he sat down ruminated for a time and rose with the determination that he would recover them he returned to the streets saw a load of coal which had been shot out of a cart on to the pavement before a house offered to carry it in and was employed he thus earned a few pence requested some meat and drink as a gratuity which was given him and the pennies were laid by pursuing this menial labor he earned and saved more pennies accumulated sufficient to enable him to purchase some cattle the value of which he understood and these he sold to advantage he proceeded by degrees to undertake larger transactions until at length he became rich the result was that he more than recovered his possessions and died an inveterate miser when he was buried mere earth went to earth with a nobler spirit the same determination might have enabled such a man to be a benefactor to others as well as to himself but the life and its end in this case were alike sordid to provide for others and for our own comfort and independence in old age is honorable and greatly to be commended but to hoard for mere wealth's sake is the characteristic of the narrow-souled and the miserly it is against the growth of this habit of inordinate saving that the wise man needs most carefully to guard himself else what in youth was simple economy may in old age grow into avarice and what was a duty in the one case may become a vice in the other it is one of the defects of business too exclusively followed that it insensibly tends to a mechanism of character the business man gets into a rut and often does not look beyond it if he lives for himself only he becomes apt to regard other human beings only in so far as they minister to his ends take a leaf from such a man's ledger and you have his life respectability in its best sense is good the respectable man is one worthy of regard literally worth turning to look at but the respectability that consists in merely keeping up appearances is not worth looking at in any sense far better and more respectable is the good poor man than the bad rich one better the humble silent man than the agreeable well-appointed rogue who keeps his gig a well-balanced and well-stored mind 
a life full of useful purpose whatever the position occupied in it may be is of far greater importance than average worldly respectability the highest object of life we take to be to form a manly character and to work out the best development possible of body and spirit of mind conscience heart and soul this is the end all else ought to be regarded but as the means accordingly that is not the most successful life in which a man gets the most pleasure the most money the most power or place honor or fame but that in which a man gets the most manhood and performs the greatest amount of useful work and of human duty money is power after its sort it is true but intelligence public spirit and moral virtue are powers too and far nobler ones when sir humphrey davy after great labor invented his safety lamp for the purpose of mitigating the dangers to colliers working in inflammable gas he would not take out a patent for it but made it over to the public a friend said to him you might as well have secured this invention by a patent and received your five or ten thousand a year for it no my good friend said davy i never thought of such a thing my sole object was to serve the cause of humanity i have enough for all my views and purposes more wealth might distract my attention from my favorite pursuits more wealth could not increase either my fame or my happiness it might undoubtedly enable me to put four horses to my carriage but what would it avail me to have it said that sir humphrey drives his carriage in four the making of a fortune may no doubt enable some people to enter society as it is called but to be esteemed there they must possess qualities of mind manners or heart else they are merely rich people nothing more there are men in society now as rich as croesus who have no consideration extended towards them and elicit no respect for why they are but as money-bags their only power is in their till the men of mark in society the guides and rulers of opinion the really successful and useful men are not necessarily rich men but men of sterling character of disciplined experience and of moral excellence even the poor man like thomas wright though he possess but little of this world's goods may in the enjoyment of a cultivated nature of opportunities used and not abused of a life spent to the best of his means and ability look down without the slightest feeling of envy upon the person of mere worldly success the man of money-bags and acres end of chapter fifteen money its use and abuse read by john greenman this is section sixteen of happy homes and the hearts that make them this librivox recording is in the public domain happy homes and the hearts that make them by samuel smiles chapter sixteen habits of thrift read by john greenman we are taxed twice as heavily by our pride as by the state poor richard economy is of itself a great revenue cicero thrift or private economy began with civilization it began when men found it necessary to provide for tomorrow as well as for today. It began long before money was invented. While it is the object of private economy to create and promote the well-being of individuals, it is the object of political economy to create and increase the wealth of nations. Private and public wealth have the same origin. Wealth is obtained by labor it is preserved by savings and accumulations and it is increased by diligence and perseverance it is the savings of individuals which compose the wealth and well-being of every nation on the other hand it is the wastefulness of individuals 
which occasions the impoverishment of states so that every thrifty person may be regarded as a public benefactor and every thriftless person as a public enemy prodigality is much more natural to man than thrift the savage is the greatest of spendthrifts for he has no forethought no tomorrow the prehistoric man saved nothing he lived in caves or in hollows of the ground covered with branches he subsisted on shellfish which he picked up on the seashore or upon fruits which he gathered in the woods he killed animals with stones he lay in wait for them or ran them down on foot then he learned to use stones as tools making stone arrowheads and spear points thereby utilizing his labor and killing birds and animals more quickly the original savage knew nothing of agriculture it was only in comparatively recent times that men gathered seeds for food and saved a portion of them for next year's crop when minerals were discovered and fire was applied to them and the minerals became smelted into metal man made an immense stride he could then fabricate hard tools chisel stone build houses and proceed by unwearying industry to devise the manifold means and agencies of civilization the dweller by the ocean burned a hollow in a felled tree launched it went to sea in it and fished for food the hollow tree became a boat held together with iron nails the boat became a galley a ship a paddle boat a screw steamer and the world was opened up for colonization and civilization man would have continued a savage but for the results of the useful labors of those who preceded him the soil was reclaimed by them and made to grow food for human uses they invented tools and fabrics and we reap the useful results they discovered art and science and we succeed to the useful effects of their labors the history of industry is uniform in the character of its illustrations industry enables the poorest man to achieve honor if not distinction the greatest names in the history of art literature and science are those of laboring men by the working man we do not mean merely the man that labors with his muscles and sinews a horse can do this but he is preeminently the working man who works with his brain also and whose whole physical system is under the influence of his higher faculties the man who paints a picture who writes a book who makes a law who creates a poem is a working man of the highest order not so necessary to the physical sustainment of the community as the ploughman or the shepherd but not less important as providing for society its highest intellectual nourishment having said so much of the importance and the necessity of industry let us see what uses are made of the advantages derivable from it it is clear that man would have continued a savage but for the accumulations of savings made by our forefathers the savings of skill of art of invention and of intellectual culture it is the savings of the world that have made the civilization of the world savings are the result of labor and it is only when laborers begin to save that the results of civilization accumulate we have said that thrift began with civilization we might almost have said that thrift produced civilization thrift produces capital and capital is the conserved result of labor the capitalist is merely a man who does not spend all that is earned by work but a large proportion of men do not provide for the future they do not remember the past they think only of the present they preserve nothing they spend all that they earn they do not provide for themselves nor for their families they may make high wages but eat and drink the whole of what they earn such people are constantly poor and hanging on the verge of destitution the men who economize by means of labor become the owners of capital which sets other labor in motion capital accumulates in their hands 
and they employ other laborers to work for them thus trade and commerce begin the thrifty build houses warehouses and mills they fit manufactories with tools and machines they build ships and send them to various parts of the world they put their capital together and build railroads harbors and docks they open up mines of coal iron and copper and erect pumping engines to keep them clear of water they employ laborers to work the mines and thus give rise to an immense amount of employment all this is the result of thrift it is the result of economizing money and employing it for beneficial purposes the thriftless man has no share in the progress of the world he spends all that he gets and can give no help to anybody no matter how much money he makes his position is not in any respect raised he husbands none of his resources he is always calling for help he is in fact the born slave of the thrifty competence and comfort lie within the reach of most people were they to take the adequate means to secure and enjoy them men who are paid good wages might also become capitalists and take their fair share in the improvement and well-being of the world but it is only by the exercise of labor energy honesty and thrift that they can advance their own position or that of their class society at present suffers far more from waste of money than from want of money it is easier to make money than to know how to spend it it is not what a man gets that constitutes his wealth but his manner of spending and economizing and when a man obtains by his labor more than enough for his personal and family wants and can lay by a little store of savings besides he unquestionably possesses the elements of social well-being the savings may amount to little but they may be sufficient to make him independent there is no reason why the highly paid workman of to-day may not save a store of capital it is merely a matter of self-denial and private economy indeed the principal industrial leaders of to-day consist for the most part of men who have sprung directly from the ranks thrift of time is equal to thrift of money franklin said time is gold if one wishes to earn money it may be done by the proper use of time but time may also be spent in doing many good and noble actions it may be spent in learning in study in art in science in literature time can be economized by system system is an arrangement to secure certain ends so that no time may be lost in accomplishing them every business man must be systematic and orderly so must every housewife there must be a place for everything and everything in its place there must also be a time for everything and everything must be done in time thrift does not require superior courage superior intellect nor any superhuman virtue it merely requires common sense and the power of resisting selfish enjoyments in fact thrift is merely common sense in everyday working action it needs no fervent resolution but only a little patient self-denial begin is its device the more the habit of thrift is practiced the easier it becomes and the sooner it compensates the self-denier for the sacrifices which it has imposed the question may be asked is it possible for a man working for small wages to save anything and lay it by in a savings bank when he requires every penny for the maintenance of his family but the fact remains that it is done by many industrious and sober men that they do deny themselves and put their spare earnings into savings banks and the other receptacles provided for poor men's savings and if some can do this all may do it under similar circumstances without depriving themselves of any genuine pleasure or any real enjoyment how intensely selfish is it for any one in the receipt of good pay to spend everything upon himself or if he has a family to spend his whole earnings from week to week 
and lay nothing by when we hear that a man who has been in the receipt of a good salary has died and left nothing behind him that he has left his wife and family destitute left them to chance to live or perish anywhere we can not but regard it as the most selfish thriftlessness and yet comparatively little is thought of such cases perhaps the hat goes round subscriptions may produce something perhaps nothing and the ruined remnants of the unhappy family sink into poverty and destitution money represents a multitude of objects without value or without real utility but it also represents something much more precious and that is independence in this light it is of great moral importance no class ever accomplished anything that lived from hand to mouth people who spend all that they earn are ever hanging on to the brink of destitution they must necessarily be weak and impotent the slaves of time and circumstance they keep themselves poor they lose self-respect as well as the respect of others it is impossible that they can be free and independent to be thriftless is enough to deprive one of all manly spirit and virtue but a man with something saved no matter how little is in a different position the little capital he has stored up is always a source of power he is no longer the sport of time and fate he can boldly look the world in the face he is in a manner his own master he can dictate his own terms he can neither be bought nor sold he can look forward with cheerfulness to an old age of comfort and happiness what a serious responsibility does the man incur who marries not many seriously think of this responsibility perhaps this is wisely ordered for much serious thinking might end in the avoidance of married life and its responsibilities but once married a man ought forthwith to determine that so far as his own efforts are concerned want shall never enter his household and that his children shall not in the event of his being removed from the scene of life and labor be left a burden upon society when economy is looked upon as a thing that must be practised it will never be felt as a burden and those who have not before observed it will be astonished to find what a few pence or shillings laid aside weekly will do towards securing moral elevation mental culture and personal independence there is a dignity in every attempt to economize its very practice is improving it indicates self-denial and imparts strength to the character it produces a well-regulated mind it fosters temperance it is based on forethought it makes prudence the dominating characteristic it gives virtue the mastery over self-indulgence above all it secures comfort drives away care and dispels many vexations and anxieties which might otherwise prey upon us the number of well-paid workmen in this country has become very large who might easily save and economize to the improvement of their moral well-being of their respectability and independence and of their status in society as men and citizens they are improvident and thriftless to an extent which proves not less hurtful to their personal happiness and domestic comfort than it is injurious to the society of which they form so important a part in prosperous times they spend their gains recklessly and when adverse times come they are at once plunged in misery money is not used but abused and when people should be providing against old age or for the wants of a growing family they are in too many cases feeding folly dissipation and vice let no one say that this is an exaggerated picture it is enough to look around in any neighborhood and see how much is spent and how little is saved what a large proportion of savings goes to the beer shop and how little to the savings bank prosperous times are very often the least prosperous of all times there are demands for higher wages and the higher wages when obtained are spent as soon as earned 
intemperate habits are formed and once formed the habit of intemperance continues increased wages instead of being saved are for the most part spent in drink thus when a population are thoughtless and improvident no kind of material prosperity will benefit them unless they exercise forethought and economy they will alternately be in a state of hunger and burst when trade falls off as it does after exceptional prosperity they will not be comforted by the thought of what they might have saved had it ever occurred to them that the prosperous times might not have proved permanent where are all the workmen said a master to his four men on going the rounds among his builders this work must be pushed on and covered in while the fine weather lasts why sir said the foreman this is monday and they have not spent all their money yet the difference in thriftiness between the english working people and the inhabitants of guernsey is thus referred to by mr dennison the difference between poverty and pauperism is brought home to us very strongly by what i see here in england we have people faring sumptuously while they are getting good wages and coming on the parish as paupers the moment those wages are suspended here people are never dependent on any support but their own but they live of their own free will in a style of frugality which a landlord would be hooted at for suggesting to his cottagers we pity hodge reduced to bacon and greens and to meat only once a week the principal meal of a guernsey farmer consists of cabbage and peas stewed with a little dripping this is the daily dinner of men who own perhaps three or four cows a pig or two and poultry but the produce and flesh of these creatures they sell in the market investing their gains in extension of land or stock or in rent charges on land certificates of which are readily bought and sold in the market no one can reproach the american workman with want of industry he works harder and more skillfully than the workman of any other country and he might be more comfortable and independent in his circumstances were he as prudent as he is laborious but improvidence is unhappily the defect of the class even the best paid american workmen though earning more money than the average of professional men are still for the most part poor because of their thoughtlessness in prosperous times they are not accustomed to make provision for adverse times and when a period of social pressure occurs they are rarely found more than a few weeks ahead of positive want franklin with his shrewd common sense observed the taxes are indeed very heavy and if those laid on by the government were the only ones we had to pay we might more easily discharge them but we have many others and much more grievous to some of us we are taxed quite as much by our idleness three times as much by our pride and four times as much by our folly and from these taxes the commissioners cannot ease or deliver us by allowing an abatement it is difficult to account for the waste and extravagance of working people it must be the hereditary remnant of the original savage it must be a survival the savage feasts and drinks until everything is gone and then he hunts or goes to war or it may be the survival of slavery in the state slavery was one of the first human institutions the strong man made the weak man work for him the warlike race subdued the less warlike race and made them their slaves thus slavery existed from the earliest times in greece and rome the fighting was done by freemen the labor by helots and bondsmen but slavery also existed in the family the wife was the slave of her husband as much as the slave whom he bought in the public market matters have now become entirely different the workman no matter what his trade is comparatively free the worst slavery from which he suffers is his passion for drink in this respect he still resembles the eskimo and the north american indians 
would he be really free then he must exercise the powers of a free responsible man he must exercise self-control and self-restraint and sacrifice present personal gratifications for prospective enjoyments of a much higher kind it is only by self-respect and self-control that the position of the workman can be really elevated thrift is the spirit of order applied to domestic management and organization its object is to manage frugally the resources of the family to prevent waste and avoid useless expenditure thrift is under the influence of reason and forethought and never works by chance or by fits it endeavors to make the most and the best of everything it does not save money for saving's sake it makes cheerful sacrifices for the present benefits of others or it submits to voluntary privation for some future good mrs inchbald author of the simple story was by dint of thrift able to set apart the half of her small income for the benefit of her infirm sister there were thus about two pounds a week for the maintenance of each many times she says during the winter when i was crying with cold have i said to myself thank god my dear sister need not leave her chamber she will find her fire ready for her each morning for she is now far less able than i am to endure privation mrs inchbald's family were for the most part very poor and she felt it right to support them during their numerous afflictions there is one thing that may be said of benevolence that it has never ruined any one though selfishness and dissipation have ruined thousands the words waste not want not carved in stone over sir walter scott's kitchen fireplace at abbotsford expresses in a few words the secret of order in the midst of abundance order is most useful in the management of everything of a household of a business of a manufactory of an army its maxim is a place for everything and everything in its place order is wealth for whoever properly regulates the use of his income almost doubles his resources disorderly persons are rarely rich and orderly persons are rarely poor order is the best manager of time for unless work is properly arranged time is lost and once lost is gone forever thrift is the spirit of order in human life it is the prime agent in private economy it preserves the happiness of many a household and as it is usually woman who regulates the order of the household it is mainly upon her that the well-being of society depends it is therefore all the more necessary that she should early be educated in orderly habits upon an income not exceeding two hundred a year the tenth earl of buchan brought up a numerous family of children one of whom afterwards rose to be lord chancellor of england it is not the amount of income so much as the good use of it that marks the true man and viewed in this light good sense good taste and sound mental culture are among the best of all economists the late dr ayton said that his father brought a still larger family up on only half the income of the earl of buchan the following dedication prefixed to his work on clerical economics is worthy of being remembered this work is respectfully dedicated to a father now in the eighty-third year of his age who on an income which never exceeded a hundred pounds yearly educated out of a family of twelve children four sons to liberal professions and who has often sent his last shilling to each of them in their turn when they were at college many men in order to advance themselves in the world and to raise themselves in society have scorned delights and lived laborious days they have lived humbly and frugally in order to accomplish greater things they have supported themselves by their hand labor until they could support themselves by their head labor when lord elko 
addressed the east lothian colliers he named several men who had raised themselves from the coal pit and first of all he referred to mr macdonald member for stafford the beginning of my acquaintance with mr macdonald he said was when i was told a miner wanted to see me in the lobby of the house of commons i went out and saw mr macdonald who gave me a petition from his district which he asked me to present i entered into conversation with him and was much struck by his intelligence he told me that he had begun life as a boy in the pit at lanarkshire and that the money he saved as a youth in the summer he spent at glasgow university in the winter and that is where he got whatever book learning or power of writing he possesses i say that is an instance that does honor to the miners of scotland another instance was that dr hogg who began as a pitman in this country worked in the morning attended school in the afternoon then went to the university for four years and to the theological hall for five years and afterward in consequence of his health failing he went abroad and is now engaged as a missionary in upper egypt or take the case of mr elliot member for north durham who has represented the miners all the better for having had practical knowledge of their work he began as a miner in the pit and he worked his way up till he has in his employment many thousand men he has risen to his great wealth and station from the humblest position as every man who now hears me is capable of doing to a greater or lesser degree if he will only be thrifty and industrious george stevenson worked his way from the pit-head to the highest position as an engineer george began his life with industry and when he had saved a little money he spent it in getting a little learning what a happy man he was when his wages were increased to twelve shillings a week he declared upon that occasion that he was a made man for life he was not only enabled to maintain himself upon his earnings but to help his poor parents and to pay for his own education when his skill had increased and his wages had advanced to a pound a week he immediately began like a thoughtful intelligent workman to lay by his surplus money and when he had saved his first guinea he proudly declared to one of his colleagues that he was now a rich man and he was right for the man who after satisfying his wants has something to spare is no longer a poor man it is certain that from that day stevenson never looked back his advance as a self-improving man was as steady as the light of sunrise a person of large experience has indeed stated that he never knew among working people a single instance of a man having out of his small earnings laid by a pound who had in the end become a pauper when stevenson proposed to erect his first locomotive he had not sufficient means to defray its cost but in the course of his life as a workman he had established a character he was trusted he was faithful he was a man who could be depended on accordingly when the earl of ravensworth was informed of stevenson's desire to erect a locomotive he at once furnished him with the means for enabling him to carry his wishes into effect watt also when inventing the condensing steam engine maintained himself by making and selling mathematical instruments he made flutes organs compasses anything that would maintain him until he had completed his invention at the same time he was perfecting his own education learning french german mathematics and the principles of natural philosophy this lasted for many years and by the time watt developed his steam engine and discovered matthew bolton he had by his own efforts become an accomplished and scientific man these great workers did not feel ashamed of laboring with their hands for a living but they also felt within themselves the power of doing headwork as well as handwork and while thus laboring with their hands they went on with their inventions the perfecting of which has proved of so much advantage to the world hugh miller furnished in his own life 
an excellent instance of that practical common sense in the business of life which he so strongly recommended to others when he began to write poetry and felt within him the growing powers of a literary man he diligently continued his labor as a stone-cutter a man who feels he has some good work in him which study and labor might yet bring out is fully justified in denying himself and in applying his energies to the culture of his intellect and it is astonishing how much carefulness thrift the reading of books and diligent application will help such men onward franklin long maintained himself by his trade of printing he was a hard-working man thrifty frugal and a great saver of time he worked for character as much as for wages and when it was found that he could be relied on he prospered at length he was publicly recognized as a great statesman and as one of the most scientific men of his time samuel richardson while writing his novels stuck to his trade of a bookseller he sold his books in the front shop while he wrote them in the back he would not give himself up to authorship because he loved his independence you know he said to his friend defreval how my business engages me you know by what snatches of time i write in order that i may preserve that independence which is the comfort of my life i never sought out of myself for patrons my own industry and god's providence have been my whole reliance the great are not great to me unless they are good and it is a glorious privilege that a middling man enjoys who has preserved his independence and can occasionally tell the world what he thinks of that world in hopes to contribute by his might to mend it lo the english sculptor is another instance of self-denial and hard work when a boy he was fond of drawing at school he made drawings of horses dogs cows and men for pins that was his first pay and he used to go home with his jacket sleeve stuck full of them he and his brother next made figures in clay pope's homer lay on his father's window the boys were so delighted with it that they made thousands of models one taking the greeks and the other the trojans an odd volume of gibbon gave an account of the Colosseum. after the family were in bed the brothers made a model of the Colosseum and filled it with fighting gladiators as the boys grew up they were sent to their usual outdoor work following the plough and doing the usual agricultural labor but still adhering to their modeling at leisure hours at christmas time low was very much in demand everybody wanted him to make models in pastry for christmas pies the neighboring farmers especially it was capital practice he afterwards said at length low went from newcastle to london to push his way in the world of art he obtained a passage in a collier the skipper of which he knew when he reached london he slept on board the collier as long as it remained in the thames he was so great a favorite with the men that they all urged him to go back he had no friends no patronage no money what could he do with everything against him but having already gone so far he determined to proceed he would not go back at least not yet the men all wept when he took farewell of them he was alone in london alone under the shadow of st paul's his next step was to take a lodging in an obscure first floor in burley street over a greengrocer's shop and there he began to model his grand statue of milo he had to take the roof off to let milo's head out there haydn found him and was delighted with his genius i went he says to young low the sculptor who has just burst out and has produced great effect his milo is really the most extraordinary thing considering all the circumstances in modern sculpture it is another proof of the efficacy of inherent genius that low must have been poor enough at this time is evident from the fact that during the execution of his milo he did not eat meat for three months and when peter cox found him out he was tearing up his shirt to make wet rags for his figure to keep the clay moist he had a bushel and a half of coal during the whole winter 
and he used to lie down by the side of his clay model of the immortal figure damp as it was and shiver for hours till he fell asleep end of chapter 16 habits of thrift read by john greenman This is section 17 of Happy Homes and the Hearts that Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Methods of Economy. Read by John Greenman. The only true secret of assisting the poor is to make them agents in bettering their own condition. Archbishop Sumner. The methods of practicing economy are very simple. Spend less than you earn. That is the first rule. A portion should always be set apart for the future. The person who spends more than he earns is a fool. The civil law regards the spendthrift as akin to the lunatic, and frequently takes from him the management of his own affairs. The next rule is to pay ready money, and never on any account to run in debt. The person who runs in debt is apt to get cheated, and if he runs in debt to any extent, he will himself be apt to get dishonest. Who pays what he owes enriches himself. The next is never to anticipate uncertain profits by expending them before they are secured. The profits may never come, and in that case you will have taken upon yourself a load of debt which you may never get rid of. It will sit upon your shoulders like the old man in Sinbad. Another method of economy is to keep a regular account of all that you earn and of all that you expend. An orderly man will know beforehand what he requires and will be provided with the necessary means for obtaining it. Thus his domestic budget will be balanced and his expenditure kept within his income john wesley regularly adopted this course although he possessed a small income he always kept his eyes upon the state of his affairs a year before his death he wrote with a trembling hand in his journal of expenses for more than eighty-six years i have kept my accounts exactly i do not care to continue to do so any longer having the conviction that i economize all that i obtain and give all that i can that is to say all that i have it is the duty of all persons to economize their means of the young as well as of the old the duke of sully mentions in his memoirs that nothing contributed more to his fortune than the prudent economy which he practised even in his youth of always preserving some ready money in hand for the purpose of meeting circumstances of emergency is a man married then the duty of economy is still more binding his wife and children plead to him most eloquently are they in the event of his early death to be left to buffet with the world unaided the hand of charity is cold the gifts of charity are valueless compared with the gains of industry and the honest savings of frugal labor which carry with them comforts without inflicting any wound upon the feelings of the helpless and bereaved let every man therefore who can endeavor to economize and to save not to hoard but to nurse his little savings for the sake of promoting the welfare and happiness of himself while here and of others when he has departed there is a dignity in the very effort to save with a worthy purpose even though the attempt should not be crowned with eventual success it produces a well-regulated mind it gives prudence a triumph over extravagance it gives virtue the mastery over vice it puts the passions under control it drives away care it secures comfort saved money however little will serve to dry up many a tear will ward off many sorrows and heart-burnings which otherwise might prey upon us possessed of a little store of capital a man walks with a lighter step his heart beats more cheerily when interruption of work or adversity happens he can meet it he can recline on his capital which will either break his fall or prevent it altogether 
by prudential economy we can realize the dignity of man life will be a blessing and old age an honor we can ultimately under a kind of providence surrender life conscious that we have been no burden upon society but rather perhaps an acquisition and ornament to it conscious also that as we have been independent our children after us by following our example and availing themselves of the means we have left behind us will walk in like manner through the world in happiness and independence every man's first duty is to improve to educate and elevate himself helping forward his brethren at the same time by all reasonable methods each has within himself the capability of free will and free action to a large extent and the fact is proved by the multitude of men who have successfully battled with and overcome the adverse circumstances of life in which they have been placed and who have risen from the lowest depth of poverty and social debasement as if to prove what energetic man resolute of purpose can do for his own elevation progress and advancement in the world is it not a fact that the greatness of humanity the glory of communities the power of nations are the results of trials and difficulties encountered and overcome let a man resolve and determine that he will advance and the first step of advancement is already made the first step is half the battle in the very fact of advancing himself he is in the most effectual possible way advancing others he is giving them the most eloquent of all lessons that of example which teaches far more emphatically than words can teach he is doing what others are by imitation incited to do beginning with himself he is in the most emphatic manner teaching the duty of self-reform and of self-improvement and if the majority of men acted as he did how much wiser how much happier how much more prosperous as a whole would society become for society being made up of units will be happy and prosperous or the reverse exactly in the same degree as the respective individuals who compose it complaints about the inequality of conditions are as old as the world in the economy of xenophon socrates asks how is it that some men live in abundance and have something to spare while others can scarcely obtain the necessaries of life and at the same time run into debt the reason is replied isomachus because the former occupy themselves with their business while the latter neglect it the difference between men consists for the most part in intelligence conduct and energy the best character never works by chance but is under the influence of virtue prudence and forethought there are of course many failures in the world the man who looks to others for help instead of relying on himself will fail the man who is undergoing the process of perpetual waste will fail the miser the extravagant the thriftless will necessarily fail indeed most people fail because they do not deserve to succeed they set about their work in the wrong way and no amount of experience seems to improve them there is not so much in luck as some people profess to believe luck is only another word for good management in practical affairs richelieu used to say that he would not continue to employ an unlucky man in other words a man wanting in practical qualities and unable to profit by experience for failures in the past are very often the auguries of failures in the future some of the best and ablest of men are wanting in tact they will neither make allowance for circumstances nor adapt themselves to circumstances they will insist on trying to drive the wedge the broad end foremost they raise walls only to run their own heads against they make such great preparations and use such great precautions that they defeat their own object like the dutchman mentioned by washington irving who having to leap a ditch went so far back to have a good run at it that when he came up he was completely winded and had to sit down on the wrong side to recover his breath no idle or thriftless man ever became great 
it is among those who never lost a moment that we find the men who have moved and advanced the world by their learning their science or their inventions labor of some sort is one of the conditions of existence the thought has come down to us from pagan times that labor is the price which the gods have set upon all that is excellent the thought is also worthy of christian times most men have it in their power by prudent arrangements to defend themselves against adversity and to throw up a barrier against destitution they can do this by their own individual efforts or by acting on the principle of cooperation which is capable of an almost indefinite extension people of the most humble condition by combining their means and associating together are enabled in many ways to defend themselves against the pressure of poverty to promote their physical well-being and even to advance the progress of the nation a solitary individual may be able to do very little to advance and improve society but when he combines his fellows for the purpose he can do a very great deal civilization itself is but the effect of combining mr mill has said that almost all the advantages which man possesses over the inferior animals arise from his power of acting in combination with his fellows and of accomplishing by the united efforts of numbers what could not be accomplished by the detached efforts of individuals the secret of social development is to be found in cooperation and the great question of improved economical and social life can only receive a satisfactory solution through its means to effect good on a large scale men must combine their efforts and the best social system is that in which the organization for the common good is rendered the most complete in all respects the middle classes have accomplished more by the principle of cooperation than the classes who have so much greater need of it all the joint stock companies are the result of association the railways the telegraphs the banks the mines the manufactories have for the most part been established and are carried on by means of the savings of the middle classes the working classes have only begun to employ the same principle yet how much might they accomplish by this means they might cooperate in saving as well as in producing they might by putting their saved earnings together become by combination their own masters within a few years past many millions sterling have been expended in strikes for wages five hundred million dollars a year are thrown away upon drink and other unnecessary articles here is an enormous capital men who expend or waste such an amount can easily become capitalists it requires only will energy and self-denial so much money spent on buildings plant and steam engines would enable them to manufacture for themselves instead of for the benefit of individual capitalists the steam engine is impartial in its services it is no respecter of persons it will work for the benefit of the laborer as well as for the benefit of the millionaire it will work best for those who make the best use of it and who have the greatest knowledge of its powers the greater number of workmen possess little capital save their labor and as we have already seen many of them uselessly and wastefully spend most of their earnings instead of saving them and becoming capitalists by combining in large numbers for the purposes of economical working they might easily become capitalists and operate upon a large scale as society is now constituted every man is not only justified but bound in duty as a citizen to accumulate his earnings by all fair and honorable methods with a view of securing a position of ultimate competence and independence we do not say that men should save and hoard their gains for the mere sake of saving and hoarding that would be parsimony and avarice but we do say that all men ought to aim at accumulating a sufficiency enough to maintain them in comfort during the helpless years that are to come to maintain them in time of sickness and of sorrow and in old age which if it does come ought to find them with a little store of capital in hand 
sufficient to secure them from dependence upon the charity of others workmen are for the most part disposed to associate but the association is not always of a healthy kind it sometimes takes the form of unions against masters and displays itself in the strikes that are so common and usually so unfortunate workmen also strike against men of their own class for the purpose of excluding them from their special calling one of the principal objects of trades unions is to keep wages at the expense of the lower paid and unassociated working people they endeavor to prevent poor men learning their trade and thus keep the supply of labor below the demand this system may last for a time but it becomes ruinous in the end it is not the want of money that prevents skilled workmen from becoming capitalists and opening the door for the employment of laboring men who are poorer and less skilled than themselves the working people threw away two and a half millions of dollars during the preston strike after which they went back to work at the old terms the london building trades threw away over one and a half million dollars during their strike and even had they obtained the terms for which they struck it would have taken six years to make up for their loss the colliers in the forest of dean went back to work at the old terms after eleven weeks play at the loss of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars the iron workers of northumberland and durham after spending a third of a year in idleness and losing one million dollars in wages went back to work at a reduction of ten per cent the colliers and iron workers of south wales during the recent strike were idle for four months and according to lord aberdeer lost in wages alone not less than fifteen million dollars here then is abundance of money within the power of working men money which they might utilize but do not think only for a solitary million out of the fifteen million dollars which they threw away during the coal strike being devoted to the starting of collieries or iron mills or manufactories to be worked by cooperative production for the benefit of the operatives themselves with frugal habits says mr gregg the well-conditioned workman might in ten years easily have five hundred pounds in the bank and combining his savings with twenty other men similarly disposed they might have fifty thousand dollars for the purpose of starting any manufacture in which they are adepts the annual expenditure of the working classes alone on drink and tobacco is not less than three hundred million dollars every year therefore the working classes have it in their power to become capitalists simply by saving wasteful and pernicious expenditure to an extent which would enable them to start at least five hundred cotton mills or coal mines or iron works on their own account or to purchase at least five hundred thousand acres and so set up fifty thousand families each with a nice little estate of their own of ten acres on fee simple no one can dispute the facts no one can deny the inference that this is not an impracticable scheme is capable of being easily proved the practice of cooperation has long been adopted by working people throughout england a large proportion of the fishery industry has been conducted on that principle for hundreds of years fishermen join in building rigging and manning a boat the proceeds of the fish they catch at sea is divided among them so much to the boat so much to the fishermen the company of oyster dredgers of whitstable has existed time out of mind though it was only in seventeen ninety three that they were incorporated by act of parliament the tin miners of cornwall have also acted on the same principle they have mined washed and sold the tin dividing the proceeds among themselves in certain proportions most probably from the time that the phoenicians carried away the produce to their ports in the mediterranean in our own time cooperation has been practiced to a considerable extent in seventeen ninety five the hull anti-mill industrial society was founded the reasons for its association are explained in the petition addressed to the mayor and aldermen of hull by the first members of the society the petition begins thus we the poor inhabitants of the said town 
have lately experienced much trouble and sorrow in ourselves and families on the occasion of the exorbitant price of flour and though the price is much reduced at present yet we judge it needful to take every precaution to preserve ourselves from the invasions of covetous and merciless men in the future they accordingly entered into a subscription to build a mill in order to supply themselves with flour the corporation granted their petition and supported them by liberal donations the mill was built and exists to this day it now consists of more than four thousand members each holding a share of twenty-five shillings the members belong principally to the laboring classes the millers endeavored by action at law to put down the society but the attempt was successfully resisted the society manufactures flour and sells it to the members at market price dividing the profits annually among the shareholders according to the quantity consumed in each member's family the society has proved eminently remunerative many years passed before the example of the poor inhabitants of hull was followed it was only in eighteen forty seven that the co-operators of leeds purchased a flour mill and in eighteen fifty that those of rockdale did the same since which time they have manufactured flour for the benefit of their members the corn millers of leeds attempted to undersell the leeds industrial society they soon failed and the price of flour was permanently reduced the leeds mill does business amounting to more than half a million dollars yearly its capital amounts to a hundred and ten thousand dollars and it paid more than eight thousand pounds of profits and bonuses to its three thousand six hundred members in eighteen sixty six besides supplying them with flour of the best quality the rockdale district cooperative's corn mill society has also been eminently successful it supplies flour to consumers residing within a radius of about fifteen miles around rockdale it also supplies flour to sixty-two cooperative societies numbering over twelve thousand members its business in eighteen sixty six amounted to one million one hundred and twenty thousand dollars and its profits to over ninety thousand dollars the rockdale corn mill grew out of the rockdale equitable pioneers society which formed an epoch in the history of industrial cooperative institutions the equitable pioneer society was established in the year eighteen forty four at a time when trade was in a very bad condition and working people generally were heartless and hopeless as to their future state some twenty-eight or thirty men mostly flannel weavers met and formed themselves into a society for the purpose of economizing their hard-won earnings it is pretty well known that working men generally pay at least ten per cent more for the articles they consume than they need to under a sounder system professor fawcett estimates their loss at near twenty per cent than ten per cent at all events these working men wish to save this amount of profit which before went into the pockets of the distributors of the necessaries in other words into the pockets of the shopkeepers the weekly subscription was two pence each and when about fifty-two calls of two pence each had been made they found that they were able to buy a sack of oatmeal which they distributed at cost price among the members of the society the number of members grew and the subscription so increased that the society was enabled to buy tea sugar and other articles and distribute them among the members at cost price they superseded the shopkeepers and became their own tradesmen they insisted from the first on payments in cash no credit was given the society grew it established a store for the sale of food firing clothes and other necessaries in a few years the members set on foot the cooperative corn mill they increased the capital by the issue of one pound shares and began to make and sell clothes and shoes they also sold drapery but the principal trade consisted in the purchase and sale of provisions butcher's meat groceries flour and such like notwithstanding the great distress during the period of the cotton famine the society continued to prosper from the first it set apart a portion of its funds for educational purposes and established a newsroom and a library 
which now contains over six thousand volumes the society continued to increase until it possessed eleven branches for the sale of goods and stores in or near rockdale besides the original office in toad lane at the end of eighteen sixty six it had six thousand two hundred and forty six members and a capital of four hundred and ninety nine thousand five hundred and forty dollars its income for goods sold and cash received during the year was one million two hundred and forty five thousand six hundred and ten dollars and the gross profit one hundred and fifty nine thousand six hundred and fifty five dollars but this was not all two and a half per cent were appropriated for the net profits to support the newsrooms and library and there are now eleven news and reading rooms at different places in or near the town where the society carries on its business the sum devoted to this object amounting to over seven hundred pounds per annum the members play at chess and draughts and use the stereoscopic views microscopes and telescopes placed in the libraries no special arrangements have been made to promote temperance but the newsroom and library exercise a powerful and beneficial influence in promoting sobriety it has been said that the society has done more to remove drunkenness from rockdale than all that the advocates of temperance have been able to effect the example of the rockdale pioneers has exercised a powerful influence on working men throughout the northern counties of england there is scarcely a town or village but has a cooperative institution of one kind or another these societies have promoted habits of saving of thrift and of temperance they have given the people an interest in money matters and enabled them to lay out their earnings to the best advantage they have also given the working people some knowledge of business for the whole of their concerns are managed by committees selected at the general meetings of the members one of the most flourishing cooperative societies is that established at over darwin the society has erected a row of handsome buildings in the centre of the town the shops for the sale of provisions groceries clothing and other necessaries occupy the lower story over the shops are the library reading-rooms and class-rooms which are open to the members and their families the third story consists of a large public hall which is used for lectures concerts and dances there are six branches of the society established in different parts of the town a large amount of business is done and the profits are very considerable these are divided among the members in proportion to the purchases made by them the profits are for the most part reinvested in joint stock paper mills cotton mills and collieries in the neighborhood of darwin one of the most praiseworthy features of the society is the provision made for the free education of the members and their families two and a half per cent of the profits are appropriated for the purpose while inspecting the institution a few months ago we were informed that the science classes were so efficiently conducted that one of the pupils had just obtained a government scholarship of fifty pounds a year for three years including free instruction at a school of mines with a free use of the laboratories during that period there are also two other cooperative institutions in the same place and we were informed that the working people of darwin are for the most part hard-working sober and thrifty the sole secret of its success consists in ready money it gives no credit everything is done for cash the profit of the trade being divided among the members every business man knows that cash payment is the soundest method of conducting business the rockdale pioneers having discovered the secret have spread it among their class in their advice to members of this and other societies they say look well after money matters buy your goods as much as possible in the first markets or if you have the produce of your industry to sell contrive if possible to sell it in the last never depart from the principle of buying and selling for ready money beware of long reckonings in short the cooperative societies became tradesmen on a large scale and besides the pureness of the food sold their profit consisted in the discount for cash payments which was divided among their members land 
and building societies constitute another form of cooperation by their means portions of land are bought and dwelling houses are built by means of a building society a person who desires to possess a house enters the society as a member and instead of paying his rent to the landlord pays his subscriptions and interest to a committee of his friends and in course of time when his subscriptions are paid up the house is purchased and conveyed to him by the society the building society is thus a savings bank where money accumulates for a certain purpose but even those who do not purchase a house receive a dividend and bonus on their shares which sometimes amount to a considerable sum the accumulation of property has the effect which it always has upon thrifty men it makes them steady sober and diligent it weans them from revolutionary notions and makes them conservative when workmen by their industry and frugality have secured their own independence they will cease to regard the sight of others well-being as a wrong inflicted on themselves and it will no longer be possible to make political capital out of their imaginary woes it is said that there is a skeleton in every household the skeleton is locked up put away in a cupboard and rarely seen only the people inside the house know of its existence but the skeleton nevertheless cannot long be concealed it comes to light in some way or another the most common skeleton is poverty poverty says douglas gerald is the great secret kept at any pains by one half of the world from the other half when there is nothing laid by nothing save to relieve sickness when it comes nothing to alleviate the wants of old age then is the skeleton hidden away in many a cupboard in a country such as this where business is often brought to a standstill by over trading and over speculation many masters clerks and workpeople are thrown out of employment they must wait until better times come round but in the meantime how are they to live if they have accumulated no savings and have nothing laid by they are comparatively destitute it often happens that workmen lose their employment in bad times mercantile concerns become bankrupt clerks are paid off and servants are dismissed when their masters can no longer employ them if the disemployed people have been in the habit of regularly consuming all their salaries and wages without laying anything by their case is the most pitiable that can be imagined but if they have saved something at home or in the savings bank they will be enabled to break their fall they will obtain some breathing time before they again fall into employment suppose they have as much as fifty dollars saved it may seem a very little sum yet in distress it amounts to much it may even prove a man's passport to future independence we do not value money for its own sake and we should be the last to encourage a miserly desire to hoard among any class but we cannot help recognizing in money the means of life the means of comfort the means of maintaining an honest independence we would therefore recommend every young man and every young woman to begin life by learning to save to lay up for the future a certain portion of every week's earnings be it little or much to avoid consuming every week or every year the earnings of that week or year and we counsel them to do this as they would avoid the horrors of dependence destitution or beggary we would have men and women of every class able to help themselves relying upon their own resources upon their own savings for it is a true saying that a penny in the purse is better than a friend at court the first penny saved is a step in the world the fact of its being saved and laid by indicates self-denial forethought prudence wisdom it may be the germ of future happiness it may be the beginning of independence it is not the highly paid class of working men and women who invest money in the savings banks but those who earn comparatively moderate incomes thus the most numerous class of depositors in the manchester and salford savings bank is that of domestic servants after them rank clerks shopmen 
porters and miners. Only about a third part of the deposits belongs to the operatives, artisans, and mechanics. It is the same in manufacturing districts generally. A few years since, it was found that of the numerous female depositors at Dundee, only one was a factory worker. The rest were, for the most part, servants. There is another fact that is remarkable. The habit of saving does not so much prevail in those counties where wages are the highest as in those counties where wages are the lowest. Previous to the era of post office savings banks, the inhabitants of Wilts and Dorset, where wages are about the lowest in England, deposited more money in the savings banks per head of the population than they did in Lancashire and Yorkshire, where wages are about the highest in England. Taking Yorkshire itself, and dividing it into manufacturing and agricultural, the manufacturing inhabitants of the West Riding of York invested about twenty-five shillings per head of the population in the savings banks, while the agricultural population of the East Riding invested about three times that amount. A magistrate at Bilston, not connected with the employment of workmen, has mentioned the following case. I prevailed, he says, upon a workman to begin a deposit in the savings bank. He came most unwillingly. His deposits were small, although I knew his gains to be great. I encouraged him by expressing satisfaction at the course he was taking. His deposits became greater, and at the end of five years he drew out the fund he had accumulated, bought a piece of land, and has built a house upon it. I think if I had not spoken to him, the whole amount would have been spent in feasting, or clubs, or contributions to the trades unions. That man's eyes are now open, his social position is raised, he sees and feels as we do, and will influence others to follow his example. From what we have said, it will be obvious that there can be no doubt as to the ability of a large proportion of the better paid classes of working men to lay by a store of savings. When they set their minds upon any subject, they have no difficulty in finding the requisite money. A single town in Lancashire contributed $150,000 to support their fellow workmen when on a strike in an adjoining town. At a time when there are no strikes, why should they not save as much money on their own account for their own permanent comfort? Many workmen already save with this object, and what they do, all might do. We know of one large mechanical establishment situated in an agricultural district, where the temptations to useless expenditure are few, in which nearly all the men are habitual economists, and have saved sums varying from $1,000 to two thousand five hundred dollars each many factory operatives with their families might easily lay by from five to ten shillings a week which in a few years would amount to considerable sums at darwen only a short time ago an operative drew his savings out of the bank to purchase a row of cottages now become his property many others in the same place and in the neighboring towns are engaged in building cottages for themselves some by means of their contributions to building societies and others by means of their savings accumulated in the bank a respectably dressed working man when making a payment one day at the bradford savings bank which brought his account up to nearly eighty pounds informed the manager how it was that he had been induced to become a depositor he had been a drinker, but one day, accidentally finding his wife's savings bank deposit book, from which he learned that she had laid by about one hundred dollars, he said to himself, Well, now, if this can be done while I am spending, what might we do if both were saving? The man gave up his drinking, and became one of the most respectable persons of his class. I owe it all, he said, to my wife and the savings bank. The penny bank reaches a class of persons of very small means, whose ability to save is much less than that of the highly paid workmen, and who, if the money were left in their pockets, would in most cases spend it in the nearest public house. When a penny bank was established at Putney, and the deposits were added up at the end of the first year, 
a brewer who was on the committee made the remark well that represents thirty thousand pints of beer not drunk but the principal supporters of the penny banks are boys and this is their most hopeful feature for it is out of boys that men are made at huddersfield many of the lads go in bands from the mills to the penny banks emulation is well as an example urging them on they save for various purposes one to buy a chest of tools another a watch a third a grammar or a dictionary thus these institutions give help and strength in many ways and besides enabling young people to keep out of debt and honestly to pay their way furnish them with the means of performing kindly and generous acts in times of family trial and emergency it is an admirable feature of the ragged schools that almost every one of them has a penny bank connected with it for the purpose of training the scholars in good habits which they most need and it is a remarkable fact that in one year not less than forty four thousand dollars was deposited in twenty five thousand six hundred and thirty seven sums by the scholars connected with the ragged school union and when this can be done by the poor boys of the ragged schools what might not be accomplished by the highly paid operatives and mechanics of england but another capital feature in the working of penny banks as regards the cultivation of prudent habits among the people is the circumstance that the example of boys and girls depositing their spare weekly pennies has often the effect of drawing their parents after them a boy goes on for weeks paying his pence and taking home his pass-book the book shows that he has a ledger folio at the bank expressly devoted to him that his pennies are all duly entered together with the respective dates of their deposits that these savings are not lying idle but bear interest at two and a half per cent per annum and that he can have them restored to him at any time if under twenty shillings without notice and if above twenty shillings then after a week's notice has been given the book is a little history in itself and cannot fail to be interesting to the boy's brothers and sisters as well as to his parents they call him good boy and they see he is a well-conducted boy the father if he is a sensible man naturally bethinks him that if his boy can do so creditable a thing worthy of praise so might he himself accordingly on the next saturday night when the boy goes to deposit his three pence at the penny bank the father often sends his shilling thus a good beginning is often made and a habit initiated which if persevered in very shortly exercises a most salutary influence on the entire domestic condition of the family the observant mother is quick to observe the effects of this new practice upon the happiness of the home and in course of time as the younger children grow up and earn money she encourages them to follow the elder boy's example she herself takes them by the hand leads them to the penny bank and accustoms them to invest their savings there women have even more influence in such matters than men and where they exercise it the beneficial effects are much more lasting one evening a strong muscular mechanic appeared at the bradford savings bank in his working dress bringing with him three children one of them in his arms he placed on the counter their deposit books which his wife had previously been accustomed to present together with ten shillings to be equally appropriated among the three pressing to his bosom the child in his arms the man said poor things they have lost their mother since they were here last but i must do the best i can for them and he continued the good lesson to his children which his wife had begun bringing them with him each time to see their little deposits made there is an old english proverb which says he that would thrive must first ask his wife but the wife must not only let her husband thrive but help him otherwise she is not the helpmeet which is as needful for the domestic comfort and satisfaction of the working man as of every other man who undertakes the responsibility of a family women form the moral atmosphere in which we grow when children and they have a great deal to do with the life when we become men it is true that the men may hold the reins but it is generally the women who tell them which way to drive 
what rousseau said is very near the truth men will always be what women make them neglect of small things is the rock on which the great majority of the human race have split human life consists of a succession of small events each of which is comparatively unimportant and yet the happiness and success of every man depend upon the manner in which these small events are dealt with character is built up on little things little things well and honorably transacted the success of a man in business depends on his attention to little things the comfort of a household is the result of small things well arranged and duly provided for good government can only be accomplished in the same way by well-regulated provision for the doing of little things accumulations of knowledge and experience of the most valuable kind are the result of little bits of knowledge and experience carefully treasured up those who learn nothing or accumulate nothing in life are set down as failures because they have neglected little things they may themselves consider that the world has gone against them but in fact they have been their own enemies there has long been a popular belief in good luck but like many other popular notions it is gradually giving way the conviction is extending that diligence is the mother of good luck in other words that a man's success in life will be proportionate to his efforts to his industry to his attention to small things your negligent shiftless loose fellows never meet with luck because the results of industry are denied to those who will not use the proper efforts to secure them it is not luck but labor that makes men luck is ever waiting for something to turn up labor with keen eye and strong will always turns up something luck lies in bed and wishes the postman would bring him news of a legacy labor turns out at six and with busy pen or ringing hammer lays the foundation of a competence luck whines labor whistles luck relies on chance labor on character luck slips downward to self-indulgence labor strides upward and aspires to independence there are many little things in the household attention to which is indispensable to health and happiness cleanliness consists in attention to a number of apparent trifles the scrubbing of a floor the dusting of a chair the cleansing of a teacup but the general result of the whole is an atmosphere of moral and physical well-being a condition favorable to the highest growth of human character the kind of air which circulates in a house may seem a small matter for we cannot see the air and few people know anything about it yet if we do not provide a regular supply of pure air within our houses we shall inevitably suffer for our neglect a few specks of dirt may seem unimportant and a closed door or window would appear to make little difference but it may make the difference of a life destroyed by fever and therefore the little dirt and the little bad air are really very serious matters the whole of the household regulations are taken by themselves trifles but trifles tending to important results a man may work hard and earn high wages but if he allow the pennies which are the result of hard work to slip out of his fingers some going to the beer shop some this way and some that he will find that his life of hard work is little raised above a life of animal drudgery on the other hand if he take care of the pennies putting some weekly into a benefit society or an insurance fund others into a savings bank and confide the rest to his wife to be carefully laid out with a view to the comfortable maintenance and culture of his family he will soon find that his attention to small matters will abundantly repay him in increasing means in comfort at home and in a mind comparatively free from fears as to the future if a man does not know how to save his pennies or his pounds his nose will always be kept to the grindstone 
want may come upon him any day like an armed man careful saving acts like magic once begun it grows into a habit it gives a man a feeling of satisfaction of strength of security the pennies he has put aside in his savings box or in the savings bank give him an assurance of comfort in sickness or of rest in old age the man who saves has something to weather fend him against want while the man who saves not has nothing between him and bitter biting poverty a man may be disposed to save money and lay it by for sickness or for other purposes but he cannot do this unless his wife lets him or helps him a prudent frugal thrifty woman is a crown of glory to her husband she helps him in all his good resolutions she may by quiet and gentle encouragement bring out his better qualities and by her example she may implant in him noble principles which are the seeds of the highest practical virtues a man's daily life is the best test of his moral and social state take two men for instance both working at the same trade and earning the same money yet how different they may be as respects their actual condition the one looks a free man the other a slave the one lives in a snug cottage the other in a mud hovel the one has always a decent coat to his back the other is in rags the children of the one are clean well dressed and at school the children of the other are dirty filthy and often in the gutter the one possesses the ordinary comforts of life as well as many of its pleasures and conveniences perhaps a well-chosen library the other has few of the comforts of life certainly no pleasures enjoyments nor books and yet these two men earn the same wages what is the cause of the difference between them it is this the one man is intelligent and prudent the other is the reverse the one denies himself for the benefit of his wife his family and his home the other denies himself nothing but lives under the tyranny of evil habits the one is a sober man and takes pleasure in making his home attractive and his family comfortable the other cares nothing for his home and family but spends the greater part of his earnings in the gin shop or the public house the one man looks up the other looks down the standard of enjoyment of the one is high and of the other low the one man likes books which instruct and elevate his mind the other likes drink which tends to lower and brutalize him the one saves his money the other wastes it end of chapter seventeen methods of economy read by john greenman This is section 18 of Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 Courage Read by John Greenman If thou canst plan a noble deed, and never flag till it succeed, though in the strife thy heart should bleed, whatever obstacles control thine hour will come go on true soul thou'lt win the prize thou'lt reach the goal c mackey the heroic example of other days is in great part the source of the courage of each generation and men walk up composedly to the most perilous enterprises beckoned onward by the shades of the braves that were helps the world owes much to its men and women of courage we do not mean physical courage in which man is at least equaled by the bulldog nor is the bulldog considered the wisest of his species the courage that displays itself in silent effort and endeavor that dares to endure all and suffer all for truth and duty is more truly heroic than the achievements of physical valor which are rewarded by honors and titles 
or by laurels sometimes steeped in blood it is moral courage that characterizes the highest order of manhood and womanhood the courage to seek and to speak the truth the courage to be just the courage to be honest the courage to resist temptation the courage to do one's duty if men and women do not possess this virtue they have no security whatever for the preservation of any other every step of progress in the history of our race has been made in the face of opposition and difficulty and been achieved and secured by men of intrepidity and valor by leaders in the van of thought by great discoverers great patriots and great workers in all walks of life there is scarcely a great truth or doctrine but has had to fight its way to public recognition in the face of detraction calumny and persecution everywhere says hayne that a great soul gives utterance to its thoughts there also is golgotha socrates was condemned to drink the hemlock at athens in his seventy-second year because his lofty teaching ran counter to the prejudices and party spirit of his age he was charged by his accusers with corrupting the youth of athens by inciting them to despise the tutelary deities of the state he had the moral courage to brave not only the tyranny of the judges who condemned him but of the mob who could not understand him he died discoursing of the doctrine of the immortality of the soul his last words to his judges being it is now time that we depart i to die you to live but which has the better destiny is unknown to all except to god how many great men and thinkers have been persecuted in the name of religion bruno was burnt alive at rome because of his exposure of the fashionable but false philosophy of his time when the judges of the inquisition condemned him to die bruno said proudly you are more afraid to pronounce my sentence than i am to receive it there was scarcely a great discovery in astronomy in natural history or in physical science which was not once denounced as leading to infidelity the followers of copernicus were branded as unbelievers after lippershe had invented the telescope galileo took up the idea and constructed a telescope of his own with which he ascended the tower of st mark at venice to view the heavenly bodies he directed it to the planets and fixed stars which he observed with incredible delight he discovered the satellites and rings of jupiter the phases of venus and the spots on the sun he faithfully recorded the revelations that came down to him direct from the skies but all this was at variance with the received ideas of the time the inquisition undertook to regulate the astronomical science galileo was called to rome and summoned before the inquisitors to answer for the heretical doctrines he had published he was compelled to renounce his opinions he declared that he abandoned the doctrine of the earth's motion around the sun the inquisitors inserted in the prohibited index the works of galileo kepler and copernicus galileo plucked up heart again and published a new work in the form of a dialogue defending his doctrines he was summoned before the inquisition and compelled on bended knees to renounce and abjure his glorious discovery galileo wanted the courage of his opinions but he was an old man of seventy when he denied his faith galileo would not have been persecuted could he have been answered yet the truth lived and men were set on the right track of observation for all ages to come pascal said of his condemnation it is in vain that you have procured against galileo a decree from rome condemning his opinions of the earth's motion assuredly that will never prove it to be at rest and if we have unerring observations proving that it turns round not all mankind together can keep it from turning nor themselves from turning with it the life of kepler was as sad as that of galileo originally a poor boy he was admitted to the school at the monastery at malbroom and eventually became a learned man he accepted the astronomical chair at graz and devoted himself to the study of the planets 
he was afterward appointed imperial mathematician to the emperor though his salary was insufficient to maintain himself and his family he was excommunicated by the church because of some opinions he had expressed respecting transubstantiation judge he said to hoffman how far i can assist you in a place where the priest and school inspector have combined to brand me with the public stigma of heresy because in every question i take that side which seems to me consonant with the will of god kepler was then offered the professorship of mathematics at bologna but having the recantation and condemnation of galileo before him he declined the chair i might he said notably increase my fortune but living a german among germans i am accustomed to a freedom of speech and manners which if persevered in at bologna would draw upon me if not danger at least notoriety and might expose me to suspicion and party malice in sixteen nineteen kepler discovered the celebrated law which will be ever memorable in the history of science that the squares of the periodic times of the planets are to one another as the cubes of their distances he recognized with transport the absolute truth of a principle which for seventeen years had been the object of his incessant labors the die is cast he said the book is written to be read either now or by posterity i care not which it may well wait a century for a reader as god has waited six thousand years for an observer the next book kepler published the epitome of the copernican astronomy was condemned at rome and placed in the prohibited index in the meantime his mind was distracted by a far greater trouble his mother seventy-nine years old was thrown into prison condemned to torture and was about to be burned as a witch kepler immediately flew to her relief and arrived at his swabian home in time to save her from further punishment but more troubles followed the states of styria ordered all the copies of his kalandar for sixteen twenty four to be publicly burned his library was sealed up by order of the jesuits and he was compelled to leave Linz by the popular insurrection which then prevailed he went to sagan in silesia and shortly after died there of disease of the brain the result of too much study when columbus stated his views to king ferdinand the clergy declared that the theory of an antipodes was hostile to the faith the earth they said was an immense flat disk and if there was a new earth beyond the ocean then all men could not be descended from adam columbus was dismissed as a fool roger bacon the franciscan monk was persecuted on account of his studies in natural philosophy and he was charged with dealing in magic because of his investigations in chemistry his writings were condemned and he was thrown into prison where he lay for ten years during the lives of four successive popes it is even averred that he died in prison oklam the early english speculative philosopher was excommunicated and died in exile at munich where he was protected by the friendship of the emperor of germany the inquisition branded vesalius as a heretic for revealing man to man as it had before branded bruno and galileo for revealing the heavens to man vesalius had the boldness to study the structure of the human body by actual dissection a practice until then almost entirely forbidden he laid the foundations of a science but he paid for it with his life condemned by the inquisition his penalty was commuted by the intercession of the spanish king into a pilgrimage to the holy land and when on his way back while still in the prime of life he died miserably at zante of fever and want a martyr to his love of science when the novum organon appeared a hue and cry was raised against it because of its alleged tendency to produce dangerous revolutions to subvert governments and to overturn the authority of religion and one dr henry stubb wrote a book against the new philosophy denouncing the whole tribe of experimentalists as a bacon-faced generation 
even the establishment of the royal society was opposed on the ground that experimental philosophy is subversive of the christian faith even the pure and simple-minded newton of whom bishop burnett said that he had the whitest soul he ever knew who was a very infant in the purity of his mind even newton was accused of dethroning the deity by his sublime discovery of the law of gravitation and a similar charge was made against franklin for explaining the nature of the thunderbolt spinoza was excommunicated by the jews to whom he belonged because of his views of philosophy which were supposed to be adverse to religion and his life was afterwards attempted by an assassin for the same reason spinoza remained courageous and self-reliant to the last dying in obscurity and poverty the philosophy of descartes was denounced as leading to irreligion the doctrines of locke were said to produce materialism and in our own day dr buckland mr sedgwick and other leading geologists have been accused of overturning revelation with regard to the constitution and history of the earth indeed there has scarcely been a discovery in astronomy in natural history or in physical science that has not been attacked by the bigoted and narrow-minded as leading to infidelity other great discoverers though they may not have been charged with irreligion have had not less obloquy of a professional and public nature to encounter when dr harvey published his theory of the circulation of the blood his practice fell off and the medical profession stigmatized him as a fool the few good things i have been able to do said john hunter have been accomplished with the greatest difficulty and encountered the greatest opposition sir charles bell while employed in his important investigations as to the nervous system which issued in one of the greatest of physiological discoveries wrote to a friend if i were not so poor and had not so many vexations to encounter how happy would i be but he himself observed that his practice sensibly fell off after the publication of each successive stage of his discovery thus nearly every enlargement of the domain of knowledge which has made us better acquainted with the heavens with the earth and with ourselves has been established by the energy the devotion the self-sacrifice and the courage of the great spirits of past times who however much they have been opposed or reviled by their contemporaries now rank among those whom the enlightened of the human race most delight to honor nor is the unjust intolerance displayed toward men of science in the past without its lesson for the present it teaches us to be forbearant toward those who differ from us provided they observe patiently think honestly and utter their convictions freely and truthfully it was a remark of plato that the world is god's epistle to mankind and to read and study that epistle so as to elicit its true meaning can have no other effect on a well-ordered mind than to lead to a deeper impression of his power a clearer perception of his wisdom and a more grateful sense of his goodness while such has been the courage of the martyrs of science not less glorious has been the courage of the martyrs of faith the passive endurance of the man or woman who for conscience sake is found ready to suffer and to endure in solitude without so much as the encouragement of even a single sympathizing voice is an exhibition of courage of a far higher kind than that displayed in the roar of battle where even the weakest feels encouraged and inspired by the enthusiasm of sympathy and the power of numbers time would fail to tell of the deathless names of those who through faith in principles and in the face of difficulty danger and suffering have wrought righteousness and waxed valiant in the moral warfare of the world and been content to lay down their lives rather than prove false to their conscientious convictions of the truth men of this stamp inspired by a high sense of duty have in past times exhibited character in its most heroic aspects and continue to present to us some of the noblest spectacles to be seen in history even women full of tenderness and gentleness not less than men 
have in this cause been found capable of exhibiting the most unflinching courage such for instance as that of anne askew who when racked until her bones were dislocated uttered no cry moved no muscle but looked her tormentors calmly in the face and refused either to confess or to recant or such as that of latimer and ridley who instead of bewailing their hard fate and beating their breasts went as cheerfully to their death as a bridegroom to the altar the one bidding the other to be of good comfort for that we shall this day light such a candle in england by god's grace as shall never be put out or such again as that of mary dyer the quakeress hanged by the puritans of new england for preaching to the people who ascended the scaffold with a willing step and after calmly addressing those who stood about resigned herself into the hands of her persecutors and died in peace and joy not less courageous was the behavior of the good sir thomas moore who marched willingly to the scaffold and died cheerfully there rather than prove false to his conscience when moore had made his final decision to stand upon his principles he felt as if he had won a victory and said to his son-in-law roper son roper i thank our lord the field is won the duke of norfolk told him of his danger saying by the mass master moore it is perilous striving with princes the anger of a prince brings death is that all my lord said moore then the difference between you and me is this that i shall die to-day and you to-morrow martin luther was not called upon to lay down his life for his faith but from the day that he declared himself against the pope he daily ran the risk of losing it at the beginning of his great struggle he stood almost entirely alone the odds against him were tremendous on one side said he himself are learning genius numbers grandeur rank power sanctity miracles on the other wycliffe lorenzo valla augustine and luther a poor creature a man of yesterday standing well nigh alone with a few friends summoned by the emperor to appear at worms to answer the charge made against him for heresy he determined to answer in person those about him told him he would lose his life if he went and they urged him to fly no said he i will repair thither though i should find there twice as many devils as there are tiles upon the housetops warned against the bitter enmity of a certain duke george he said i will go there though for nine whole days running it rained duke george's luther was as good as his word and he set forth upon his perilous journey when he came in sight of the old bell towers of worms he stood up in his chariot and sang ein feste burg ist unser gott the marseillaise of the reformation the words and music of which he is said to have improvised only two days before shortly before the meeting of the diet an old soldier george freudensburg put his hand upon luther's shoulder and said to him good monk good monk take heed what thou doest thou art going into a harder fight than any of us have ever yet been in but luther's only answer to the veteran was that he had determined to stand upon the bible and his conscience luther's courageous defense before the diet is on record and forms one of the most glorious pages in history when finally urged by the emperor to retract he said firmly sire unless i am convinced of my error by the testimony of scripture or by manifest evidence i cannot and will not retract for we must never act contrary to our conscience such is my profession of faith and you must expect none other from me here i stand i cannot do otherwise god help me he had to do his duty to obey the orders of a power higher than that of kings and he did it at all hazards afterwards when hard pressed by his enemies at augsburg luther said that if he had five hundred heads he would lose them all rather than recant his articles concerning faith like all courageous men 
his strength only seemed to grow in proportion to the difficulties he had to encounter and overcome there is no man in germany said hutton who more utterly despises death than does luther and to his moral courage perhaps more than to that of any other single man do we owe the liberation of modern thought and the vindication of the great rights of the human understanding but it is a mistake to suppose that the days requiring self-sacrifice and suffering for conscience or the truth's sake are past modern freedom says thoreau is only the exchange of the slavery of feudality for the slavery of opinion the tyranny of a multitude is worse than the tyranny of an individual how many even in our own progressive age have suffered persecution for bravely advocating principles and doctrines which they believe to be true the decisions reached by councils and conferences are but an expression of the average or popular opinion men of earnest thought are generally far in advance of the average sentiment what wonder is it then that the most profound the best the most earnest men of every age have been men who were abused by their associates or through charges of heresy expelled from the churches william penn was of opinion that there was no greater mistake than to suppose that a country or a people were strengthened by all the people holding one opinion whether upon religious doctrine or religious practice and that a variety of opinions of professions and of practice was a strength to a people and to a government if all were alike tolerated individuality must be upheld for without individuality there can be no liberty individuality is everywhere to be spared and respected as the root of everything good even despotism does not produce its worst effects says john stuart mill so long as individuality exists under it and whatever crushes individuality is despotism by whatever name it may be called and whether it professes to be enforcing the will of god or the injunctions of men but the greater part of the courage that is needed in the world is not of a heroic kind courage may be displayed in everyday life as well as in historic fields of action there needs for example the common courage to be honest the courage to resist temptation the courage to speak the truth the courage to be what we really are and not to pretend to be what we are not the courage to live honestly within our own means and not dishonestly upon the means of others a great deal of the unhappiness and much of the vice of the world is owing to weakness and indecision of purpose in other words to lack of courage men may know what is right and yet fail to exercise the courage to do it they may understand the duty they have to do but will not summon up the requisite resolution to perform it the weak and undisciplined man is at the mercy of every temptation he cannot say no but falls before it and if his companionship be bad he will be all the easier led away by bad example into wrong-doing nothing can be more certain than that the character can only be sustained and strengthened by its own energetic action the will which is the central force of character must be trained to habits of decision otherwise it will neither be able to resist evil nor to follow good decision gives the power of standing firmly when to yield however slightly might be only the first step in a downhill course to ruin calling upon others for help in forming a decision is worse than useless a man must so train his habits as to rely upon his own powers and depend upon his own courage in moments of emergency plutarch tells of a king of macedon who in the midst of an action withdrew into the adjoining town to sacrifice to hercules while his opponent emilius at the same time that he implored the divine aid sought for victory sword in hand and won the battle and so it is ever in the actions of daily life there needs also the exercise of no small degree of moral courage to resist the corrupting influences of what is called society although mrs grundy may be a very vulgar and commonplace personage 
her influence is nevertheless prodigious most men but especially women are the moral slaves of the class or caste to which they belong there is a sort of unconscious conspiracy existing among them against each other's individuality each circle and section each rank and class has its respective customs and observances to which conformity is required at the risk of being tabooed some are immured within a bastille of fashion others of custom others of opinion and few there are who have the courage to think outside their sect to act outside their party and to step out into the free air of individual thought and action we dress and eat and follow fashion though it may be at the risk of debt ruin and misery living not so much according to our means as according to the superstitious observances of our class though we may speak contemptuously of the indians who flatten their heads and of the chinese who cramp their toes we have only to look at the deformities of fashion among ourselves to see that the reign of mrs grundy is universal it is the strong and courageous men who lead and guide and rule the world the weak and timid leave no trace behind them while the life of a single upright and energetic man is like a track of light his example is remembered and appealed to and his thoughts his spirit and his courage continue to be the inspiration of succeeding generations men often conquer difficulties because they feel they can their confidence in themselves inspires the confidence of others when caesar was at sea and a storm began to rage the captain of the ship which carried him became unmanned by fear what art thou afraid of cried the great captain thy vessel carries caesar the courage of the brave man is contagious and carries others along with it his stronger nature awes weaker natures into silence or inspires them with his own will and purpose the persistent man will not be baffled or repulsed by opposition diogenes desirous of becoming the disciple of antisthenes went and offered himself to the cynic he was refused diogenes still persisting the cynic raised his knotty staff and threatened to strike him if he did not depart strike said diogenes you will not find a stick hard enough to conquer my perseverance antisthenes overcome had not another word to say but forthwith accepted him as his pupil inspired by energy of purpose men of comparatively mediocre powers have often been enabled to accomplish extraordinary results the men who have most powerfully influenced the world have not been so much men of genius as men of strong convictions and enduring capacity for work impelled by irresistible energy and invincible determination such men for example as were mohammed luther knox calvin loyola and wesley courage combined with energy and perseverance will overcome difficulties apparently insurmountable it gives force and impulse to effort and does not permit it to retreat tyndall said of faraday that in his warm moments he formed a resolution and in his cool ones he made that resolution good perseverance working in the right direction grows with time and when steadily practiced even by the most humble will rarely fail of its reward trusting in the help of others is of comparatively little use when one of michael angelo's principal patrons died he said i begin to understand that the promises of the world are for the most part vain phantoms and that to confide in one's self and become something of worth and value is the best and safest course it is the courageous man who can best afford to be generous or rather it is his nature to be so when fairfax at the battle of naseby seized the colors from an ensign whom he had struck down in the fight he handed them to a common soldier to take care of the soldier unable to resist the temptation boasted to his comrades that he himself seized the colors and the boast was repeated to fairfax let him retain the honor said the commander i have enough beside so when douglas at the battle of bannockburn 
saw randolph his rival outnumbered and apparently overpowered by the enemy he prepared to hasten to his assistance but seeing that randolph was already driving them back he cried out hold and halt we are come too late to aid them let us not lessen the victory they have won by affecting to claim a share in it it is related of charles v that after the siege and capture of wittenberg by the imperialist army the monarch went to see the tomb of luther while reading the inscription on it one of the servile courtiers who accompanied him proposed to open the grave and give the ashes of the heretic to the winds the monarch's cheek flushed with honest indignation i war not with the dead said he let this place be respected the portrait which the great aristotle drew of the magnanimous man in other words the true gentleman more than two thousand years ago is as faithful now as it was then the magnanimous man he said will behave with moderation under both good fortune and bad he will know how to be exalted and how to be abased he will neither be delighted with success nor grieved by failure he will neither shun danger nor seek it for there are few things which he cares for he is reticent and somewhat slow of speech but speaks his mind openly and boldly when occasion calls for it he overlooks injuries he is not given to talk about himself or about others for he does not care that he himself should be praised or that other people should be blamed he does not cry out about trifles and craves help from none on the other hand mean men admire meanly they have neither modesty generosity nor magnanimity they are ready to take advantage of the weakness or defenselessness of others especially where they have themselves succeeded by unscrupulous methods in climbing to positions of authority snobs in high places are always much less tolerable than snobs of low degree because they have more frequent opportunities of making their want of manliness felt they assume greater airs and are pretentious in all that they do and the higher their elevation the more conspicuous is the incongruity of their position the higher the monkey climbs says the proverb the more he shows his tail much depends on the way in which a thing is done an act which might be taken as a kindness if done in a generous spirit when done in a grudging spirit may be felt as stingy if not harsh and even cruel when ben jonson lay sick and in poverty the king sent him a paltry message accompanied by a gratuity the sturdy plain-spoken poet's reply was i suppose he sends me this because i live in an alley tell him his soul lives in an alley from what we have said it will be obvious that to be of an enduring and courageous spirit is of great importance in the formation of character it is a source not only of usefulness in life but of happiness on the other hand to be of a timid and still more of a cowardly nature is one of the greatest misfortunes a wise man was accustomed to say that one of the principal objects he aimed at in the education of his sons and daughters was to train them in the habit of fearing nothing so much as fear and the habit of avoiding fear is doubtless capable of being trained like any other habit such as the habit of intention of diligence of study or of cheerfulness much of the fear that exists is the offspring of imagination which creates the images of evils which may happen but perhaps rarely do and thus many persons who are capable of summoning up courage enough to grapple with and overcome real dangers are paralyzed or thrown into consternation by those which are imaginary hence unless the imagination be held under strict discipline we are prone to meet evils more than halfway to suffer them by forestalment and to assume the burdens which we ourselves create education in courage is not usually included among the branches of female training and yet it is really of much greater importance than either music french or the use of the globes 
contrary to the view of sir richard steele that women should be characterized by a tender fear and inferiority which makes her lovely we would have women educated in resolution and courage as a means of rendering them more helpful more self-reliant and vastly more useful and happy there is indeed nothing attractive in timidity nothing lovable in fear all weakness whether of mind or body is equivalent to deformity and the reverse of interesting courage is graceful and dignified while fear in any form is mean and repulsive yet the utmost tenderness and gentleness are consistent with courage ari scheffer the artist once wrote to his daughter dear daughter strive to be of good courage to be gentle-hearted these are the true qualities for woman troubles everybody must expect there is but one way of looking at fate whatever that be whether blessings or afflictions to behave with dignity under both we must not lose heart or it will be the worst both for ourselves and for those whom we love to struggle and again and again to renew the conflict this is life's inheritance in sickness and sorrow none are braver and less complaining sufferers than women their courage where their hearts are concerned is indeed proverbial experience has proved that women can be as enduring as men under the heaviest trials and calamities but too little pains are taken to teach them to endure petty terrors and frivolous vexations with fortitude such little miseries if petted and indulged quickly run into sickly sensibility and become the bane of their life keeping themselves and those about them in a state of chronic discomfort the best corrective of this condition of mind is wholesome moral and mental discipline mental strength is as necessary for the development of woman's character as of man's it gives her capacity to deal with the affairs of life and presence of mind which enable her to enact with vigor and effect in moments of emergency character in a woman as in a man will always be found the best safeguard of virtue the best nurse of religion the best corrective of time personal beauty soon passes but beauty of mind and character increases in attractiveness the older it grows women have not only distinguished themselves for their passive courage but impelled by affection or the sense of duty they have become heroic when the band of conspirators who sought the life of james the second of scotland burst into his lodgings at perth the king called to the ladies who were in the chamber outside his room to keep the door as well as they could and give him time to escape the conspirators had previously destroyed the locks of the doors so that the keys could not be turned and when they reached the ladies apartment it was found that the bar also had been removed but on hearing them approach the brave catherine douglas with the hereditary courage of her family boldly thrust her arm across the door instead of the bar and held it there until her arm being broken the conspirators burst into the room with drawn swords and daggers overthrowing the ladies who though unarmed still endeavored to resist them the defense of latham house by charlotte de tremouille the worthy descendant of william of nassau and admiral coligny was another striking instance of heroic bravery on the part of a noble woman when summoned by the parliamentary forces to surrender she declared that she had been entrusted by her husband with the defence of the house and that she could not give it up without her dear lord's order but trusted in god for protection and deliverance in her arrangements for the defence she described as having left nothing with her eye to be excused afterwards by fortune or negligence and added to her former patience a most resolved fortitude the brave lady held her house and home against the enemy for a whole year during three months of which the place was strictly besieged and bombarded until at length the siege was raised after a most gallant defence by the advance of the royalist army 
nor can we forget the courage of lady franklin who has persevered to the last when the hopes of all others had died out in prosecuting the search after the franklin expedition on the occasion of the royal geographical society determining to award the founder's medal to lady franklin sir roderick murchison observed that in the course of a long friendship with her he had abundant opportunity of observing and testing the sterling qualities of a woman who had proved herself worthy of the admiration of mankind nothing daunted by failure after failure through twelve long years of hope deferred she had persevered with a singleness of purpose and a sincere devotion which were truly unparalleled and now that her last expedition under the gallant mcclintock had realized the two great facts that her husband had traversed wide seas unknown to former navigators and died in discovering a northwest passage then surely the adjudication of the medal would be hailed by the nation as one of the many recompenses to which the widow of the illustrious franklin was so eminently entitled but that devotion to duty which marks the heroic character has more often been exhibited by women in deeds of charity and mercy the greater part of these are never known for they are done in private out of the public sight and for the mere love of doing good where fame has come to them because of the success which has attended their labors in a more general sphere it has come unsought and unexpected and is often felt as a burden who has not heard of mrs fry and miss carpenter as prison visitors and reformers of mrs chisholm and miss rye as promoters of emigration and of miss nightingale and miss garrett as apostles of hospital nursing that these women should have emerged from the sphere of private and domestic life to become leaders in philanthropy indicates no small degree of moral courage on their part for to women above all others quiet and ease and retirement are most natural and welcome very few women step beyond the boundaries of home in search of a large field of usefulness but when they have desired one they have had no difficulty in finding it the ways in which men and women can help their neighbors are innumerable it needs but the willing heart and ready hand most of the philanthropic workers we have named however have scarcely been influenced by choice the duty lay in their way it seemed to be the nearest to them and they set about doing it without desire for fame or any other reward but the approval of their own conscience among prison visitors the name of sarah martin is much less known than that of mrs fry although she preceded her in the work how she was led to undertake it furnishes at the same time an illustration of womanly true-heartedness and earnest womanly courage sarah martin was the daughter of poor parents and was left an orphan at an early age she was brought up by her grandmother and earned her living by going out to families as assistant dressmaker at a shilling a day in eighteen nineteen a woman was tried and sentenced to imprisonment in yarmouth jail for cruelly beating and ill-using her child and her crime became the talk of the town the young dressmaker was much impressed by the report of the trial and the desire entered her mind of visiting the woman in jail and trying to reclaim her she had often before on passing the walls of the borough jail felt impelled to seek admission with the object of visiting the inmates reading the scriptures to them and endeavoring to lead them back to the society whose laws they had violated at length she could not resist the impulse to visit the imprisoned mother she entered the jail porch lifted the knocker and asked the jailer for admission for some reason or other she was refused but she returned repeated her request and this time she was admitted the culprit mother shortly stood before her when sarah martin told the motive of her visit the criminal burst into tears and thanked her those tears and thanks shaped the whole course of sarah martin's afterlife and the poor seamstress while maintaining herself by her needle continued to spend her leisure hours in visiting the prisoners and endeavoring to alleviate their condition she constituted herself their chaplain and schoolmistress 
for at that time they had neither she read to them and taught them to read and write she gave up an entire day in the week for this purpose besides sundays as well as other intervals of spare time she taught the women to knit to sew and to cut out the sale of the articles enabling her to buy other materials and to continue the industrial education thus begun she also taught the men to make straw hats men's and boys caps gray cotton shirts and even patchwork anything to keep them out of idleness and from preying on their own thoughts out of the earnings of the prisoners in this way she formed a fund which she applied to furnishing them with work on their discharge thus enabling them again to begin the world honestly and at the same time affording her as she herself says the advantage of observing their conduct by attending too exclusively to this prison work however sarah martin's dressmaking business fell off and the question arose with her whether in order to recover her business she was to suspend her prison work but her decision had already been made i had counted the cost she said and my mind was made up if while imparting truth to others i became exposed to temporal want the privation so momentary to an individual would not admit of comparison with following the lord in thus administering to others she now devoted six or seven hours every day to the prisoners converting what would otherwise have been a scene of dissolute idleness into a hive of orderly industry newly admitted prisoners was sometimes refractory but her persistent gentleness eventually won their respect and cooperation men old in years and crime pert london pickpockets depraved boys and dissolute sailors profligate women smugglers and the promiscuous horde of criminals which usually fill the jail of a seaport and county town all submitted to the benign influence of this good woman and under her eyes they might be seen for the first time in their lives striving to hold a pen or to master the characters in a penny primer she entered into their confidence watched wept prayed and felt for all by turns she strengthened their good resolutions cheered the hopeless and despairing and endeavored to put all and hold all in the right road of amendment for more than twenty years this good and true-hearted woman pursued her noble course with little encouragement and not much help almost her only means of subsistence consisting in an annual income of ten or twelve pounds left by her grandmother eked out by her little earnings at dressmaking during the last two years of her ministration the borough magistrates knowing that her self-imposed labors saved them the expense of a schoolmaster and chaplain made a proposal to her of an annual salary of twelve pounds a year but they did it in so indelicate a manner as to greatly wound her sensitive feelings she shrank from becoming the salaried official of the corporation and bartering for money those services which had throughout been labors of love but the jail committee coarsely informed her that if they permitted her to visit the prison she must submit to their terms or be excluded for two years therefore she received the salary of twelve pounds a year the acknowledgment of the yarmouth corporation for her services as jail chaplain and schoolmistress she was now however becoming old and infirm and the unhealthy atmosphere of the jail did much toward finally disabling her while she lay on her deathbed she resumed the exercise of a talent she had occasionally practised before in her moments of leisure the composition of sacred poetry as works of art they may not excite admiration yet never were verses written truer in spirit or fuller of christian love but her own life was a nobler poem than any she ever wrote full of true courage perseverance charity and wisdom it was indeed a commentary upon her own words the high desire that others may be blessed savors of heaven end of chapter eighteen courage read by john greenman
This is section 19 of Happy Homes and the Hearts that Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Self Control Read by John Greenman. Honor and profit do not always lie in the same sack. George Herbert. The government of one's self is the only true freedom for the individual. Frederick Perthes. Self control is only courage under another form. It may almost be regarded as the primary essence of character. It is in virtue of this quality that Shakespeare defines man as being looking before and after. It forms the chief distinction between man and the mere animal, and, indeed, there can be no true manhood without it. Self-control is at the root of all the virtues. Let a man give the reins to his impulses and passions, and from that moment he yields up his moral freedom. He is carried along the current of life and becomes the slave of his strongest desires for the time being. To be morally free, to be more than an animal, man must be able to resist instinctive impulse, and this can only be done by the exercise of self-control. Thus it is this power which constitutes the real distinction between a physical and a moral wife, and that form the primary basis of individual character. The best support of character will always be found in habit, which, according as the will is directed rightly or wrongly, as the case may be, will prove either a benignant ruler or a cruel despot. We may be its willing subject on the one hand, or its servile slave on the other. It may help us on the road to good, or it may hurry us on the road to ruin. Habit is formed by careful training, and it is astonishing how much can be accomplished by systematic discipline and drill. See how, for instance, out of the most unpromising materials, such as roughs picked up in the streets, or raw unkempt country lads taken from the plough, steady discipline and drill will bring out the unsuspected qualities of courage endurance and self-sacrifice and how in the field of battle or even on the more trying occasions of perils by sea such men carefully disciplined will exhibit the unmistakable characteristics of true bravery and heroism nor is moral discipline and drill less influential in the formation of character without it there will be no proper system and order in the regulation of the life upon it depends the cultivation of the sense of self-respect the education of the habit of obedience the development of the idea of duty the most self-reliant self-governing man is always under discipline and the more perfect the discipline the higher will be his moral condition he has to drill his desires and keep them in subjection to the higher powers of his nature they must obey the word of command of the internal monitor the conscience otherwise they will be but the mere slaves of their inclinations the sport of feeling and impulse in the supremacy of self-control says herbert spencer consists one of the perfections of the ideal man not to be impulsive not to be spurred hither and thither by each desire that in turn comes uppermost but to be self-restrained self-balanced governed by the joint decision of the feelings in council assembled before whom every action shall have been fully debated and calmly determined that it is which education moral education at least strives to produce the first seminary of moral discipline and the best as we have already shown is the home next comes the school and after that the world the great school of practical life each is preparatory to the other 
and what the man or woman becomes depends for the most part upon what has gone before if they have enjoyed the advantage of neither the home nor the school but have been allowed to grow up untrained untaught and undisciplined then woe to themselves woe to the society of which they form a part the best regulated home is always that in which the discipline is the most perfect and yet where it is the least felt moral discipline acts with the force of a law of nature those subject to it yield themselves to it unconsciously and though it shapes and forms the whole character until the life becomes crystallized in habit the influence thus exercised is for the most part unseen and almost unfelt although the moral character depends in a great degree on temperament and on physical health as well as on domestic and early training and the example of companions it is also in the power of each individual to regulate to restrain and to discipline it by watchful and persevering self-control a competent teacher has said of the propensities and habits that they are as teachable as latin and greek while they are much more essential to happiness dr johnson though himself constitutionally prone to melancholy and afflicted by it as few have been from his earliest years said that a man's being in a good or bad humor very much depends upon his will we may train ourselves in a habit of patience and contentment on the one hand or of grumbling and discontent on the other we may accustom ourselves to exaggerate small evils and to underestimate great blessings we men even become the victim of petty miseries by giving way to them thus we may educate ourselves in a happy disposition as well as in a morbid one indeed the habit of viewing things cheerfully and of thinking about life hopefully may be made to grow up in us like any other habit it was not an exaggerated estimate of dr johnson to say that the habit of looking at the best side of any event is worth far more than a thousand pounds a year if a man have not self-control he will lack patience be wanting in tact and have neither the power of governing himself nor of managing others when the quality most needed in a prime minister was the subject of conversation in the presence of mr pitt one of the speakers said it was eloquence another said it was knowledge and the third said it was toil no said pitt it is patience and patience means self-control a quality in which he himself was superb his friend george rose has said of him that he never once saw pitt out of temper yet although patience is usually regarded as a slow virtue pitt combined with it the most extraordinary readiness vigor and rapidity of thought as well as action a strong temper is not necessarily a bad temper but the stronger the temper the greater is the need of self-discipline and self-control dr johnson says men grow better as they grow older and improve with experience but this depends upon the width and depth and generousness of their nature it is not men's faults that ruin them so much as the manner in which they conduct themselves after the faults have been committed the wise will profit by the suffering they cause and eschew them for the future but there are those on whom experience exerts no ripening influence and who only grow narrower and bitterer and more vicious with time what is called strong temper in a young man often indicates a large amount of unripe energy which will expend itself in useful work if the road be fairly open to it it is said of stephen girard that when he heard of a clerk with a strong temper he would readily take him into his employment and set him to work in a room by himself girard being of opinion that such persons were the best workers and that their energy would expend itself in work if removed from the temptation to quarrel 
strong temper may only mean a strong and excitable will uncontrolled it displays itself in fitful outbreaks of passion but controlled and held in subjection like steam pent up within the organized mechanism of a steam engine the use of which is regulated and controlled by slide valves governors and levers it may become a source of energetic power and usefulness hence some of the greatest characters in history have been men of strong temper but of equally strong determination to hold their motive power under strict regulation and control cromwell also is described as having been of a wayward and violent temper in his youth cross untractable and masterless with a vast quantity of youthful energy which exploded in a variety of youthful mischiefs he even obtained the reputation of a roisterer in his native town and seemed to be rapidly going to the bad when religion in one of its most rigid forms laid hold upon his strong nature and subjected it to the iron discipline of calvinism an entirely new direction was thus given to his energy of temperament which forced an outlet for itself into public life and eventually became the dominating influence in england for a period of nearly twenty years the heroic princes of the house of nassau were all distinguished for the same qualities of self-control self-denial and determination of purpose william the silent was so called not because he was a taciturn man for he was an eloquent and powerful speaker where eloquence was necessary but because he was a man who could hold his tongue when it was wisdom not to speak and because he carefully kept his own counsel when to have revealed it might have been dangerous to the liberties of his country he was so gentle and conciliatory in his manner that his enemies even described him as timid and pusillanimous yet when the time for action came his courage was heroic his determination unconquerable the rock in the ocean says mr motley the historian of the netherlands tranquil amid raging billows was the favorite emblem by which his friends expressed their sense of his firmness mr motley compares william the silent to washington whom he in many respects resembled the american like the dutch patriot stands out in history as the very impersonation of dignity bravery purity and personal excellence his command over his feelings even in moments of great difficulty and danger was such as to convey the impression to those who did not know him intimately that he was a man of inborn calmness and almost impassiveness of disposition yet washington was by nature ardent and impetuous his mildness gentleness politeness and consideration for others were the result of rigid self-control and unwearied self-discipline which he diligently practised even from his boyhood his biographer says of him that his temperament was ardent his passions strong and amidst the multiplied scenes of temptation and excitement through which he passed it was his constant effort and ultimate triumph to check the one and subdue the other and again his passions were strong and sometimes they broke out with vehemence but he had the power of checking them in an instant perhaps self-control was the most remarkable trait of his character it was in part the effect of discipline yet he seems by nature to have possessed this power in a degree which has been denied to other men the duke of wellington's natural temper like that of napoleon was irritable in the extreme and it was only by watchful self-control that he was enabled to restrain it he studied calmness and coolness in the midst of danger like an indian chief at waterloo and elsewhere he gave his orders in the most critical moments without the slightest excitement and in a tone of voice almost more than usually subdued wordsworth the poet was in his childhood of a stiff moody and violent temper and perverse and obstinate in defying chastisement when experience of life had disciplined his temper he learned to exercise greater self-control 
but at the same time the qualities which distinguished him as a child were afterwards useful in enabling him to defy the criticism of his enemies nothing was more marked than wordsworth's self-respect and self-determination as well as his self-consciousness of power at all periods of his history henry martin the missionary was another instance of a man in whom strength of temper was only so much pent-up unripe energy as a boy he was impatient petulant and perverse but by constant wrestling against his tendency to wrong-headedness he gradually gained the requisite strength so as to entirely overcome it and to acquire what he so greatly coveted the gift of patience a man may be feeble in organization but blessed with a happy temperament his soul may be great active noble and sovereign professor tyndall has given us a fine picture of the character of faraday and of his self-denying labors in the cause of science exhibiting him as a man of strong original and even fiery nature and yet of extreme tenderness and sensibility underneath his sweetness and gentleness he says was the heat of a volcano he was a man of excitable and fiery nature and through high self-discipline he had converted the fire into a central glow and motive power of life instead of permitting it to waste itself in useless passion there was one fine feature in faraday's character which is worthy of notice one closely akin to self-control it was his self-denial by devoting himself to analytical chemistry he might have speedily realized a large fortune but he nobly resisted the temptation and preferred to follow the path of pure science taking the duration of his life into account says mr tyndall this son of a blacksmith and apprentice to a bookbinder had to decide between a fortune of seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on the one side and his undowered science on the other he chose the latter and died a poor man but his was the glory of holding aloft among the nations the scientific name of england for a period of forty years take a like instance of the self-denial of a frenchman the historian Anctil was one of the small number of literary men in france who refused to bow to the napoleonic yoke he sank into great poverty living on bread and milk and limiting his expenditure to only three sous a day i have still two sous a day left said he for the conqueror of marengo and austerlitz but if you fall sick said a friend to him you will need the help of a pension why not do as others do pay court to the emperor you have need of him to live i do not need him to die was the historian's reply but anctil did not die of poverty he lived to the age of ninety-four saying to a friend on the eve of his death come see a man who dies still full of life sir james outram exhibited the same characteristic of noble self-denial though in an altogether different sphere of life like the great king arthur he was emphatically a man who forbore his own advantage he was characterized throughout his whole career by his noble unselfishness though he might personally disapprove of the policy he was occasionally ordered to carry out he never once faltered in the path of duty thus he did not approve of the policy of invading Sinde yet his services throughout the campaign were acknowledged by general sir c napier to have been of the most brilliant character but when the war was over and the rich spoils of Sinde lay at the conqueror's feet outram said i disapprove of the policy of this war i will accept no share of the prize money not less marked was his generous self-denial when dispatched with a strong force to aid havelock in fighting his way to lucknow as superior officer he was entitled to take upon himself the chief command but recognizing what havelock had already done 
with rare disinterestedness he left to his junior officer the glory of completing the campaign offering to serve under him as a volunteer with such reputation said lord clyde as major-general outram has won for himself he can afford to share glory and honor with others but that does not lessen the value of the sacrifice he has made with such disinterested generosity if a man would get through life honorably and peaceably he must necessarily learn to practice self-denial in small things as well as great men have to bear as well as forbear the temper has to be held in subjection to the judgment and the little demons of ill-humor petulance and sarcasm kept resolutely at a distance if once they find an entrance to the mind they are very apt to return and to establish for themselves a permanent occupation there it is necessary to one's personal happiness to exercise control over one's words as well as acts for there are words that strike even harder than blows and men may speak daggers though they use none the stinging repartee that rises to the lips and which if uttered might cover an adversary with confusion how difficult it sometimes is to resist saying it heaven keep us says miss bremer in her home from the destroying power of words there are words which sever hearts more than sharp swords do there are words the point of which sting the heart through the course of a whole life thus character exhibits itself in self-control of speech as much as in anything else the wise and forbearant man will restrain his desire to say a smart or severe thing at the expense of another's feelings while the fool blurts out what he thinks and will sacrifice his friend rather than his joke even statesmen might be named who have failed through their inability to resist the temptation of saying clever and spiteful things at their adversary's expense the turn of a sentence says bentham has decided the fate of many a friendship and for aught that we know the fate of many a kingdom so when one is tempted to write a clever but harsh thing though it may be difficult to restrain it it is always better to leave it in the inkstand a goose's quill says the spanish proverb often hurts more than a lion's claw carlyle says when speaking of oliver cromwell he that cannot withal keep his mind to himself cannot practice any considerable thing whatsoever it was said of william the silent by one of his greatest enemies that an arrogant or indiscreet word was never known to fall from his lips like him washington was discretion itself in the use of speech never taking advantage of an opponent or seeking a short-lived triumph in a debate and it is said that in the long run the world comes round to and supports the wise man who knows when and how to be silent we have heard men of great experience say that they have often regretted having spoken but never once regretted holding their tongue be silent says pythagoras or say something better than silence speak fitly says george herbert or be silent wisely st francis the sales whom lee hunt styled the gentleman saint has said it is better to remain silent than to speak the truth ill-humouredly and so spoil an excellent dish by covering it with bad sauce another frenchman lacordaire characteristically puts speech first and silence next after speech he says silence is the greatest power in the world yet a word spoken in season how powerful it may be as the old welch proverb has it a golden tongue is in the mouth of the blessed there are of course times and occasions when the expression of indignation is not only justifiable but necessary we are bound to be indignant at falsehood selfishness and cruelty 
a man of true feeling fires up naturally at baseness or meanness of any sort even in cases where he may be under no obligation to speak out i would have nothing to do said perthes with a man who cannot be moved to indignation there are more good people than bad in the world and the bad get the upper hand merely because they are bolder we cannot help being pleased with a man who uses his powers with decision and we often take his side for no other reason than because he does so use them no doubt i have often repented speaking but not less often have i repented keeping silence the best corrective of intolerance in disposition is increase of wisdom and enlarged experience of life cultivated good sense will usually save men from the entanglements in which moral impatience is apt to involve them good sense consisting chiefly in that temper of mind which enables its possessor to deal with the practical affairs of life with justice judgment discretion and charity hence men of culture and experience are invariably found the most forbearant and tolerant as ignorant and narrow-minded persons are found the most unforgiving and intolerant men of large and generous natures in proportion to their practical wisdom are disposed to make allowance for the defects and disadvantages of others allowance for the controlling power of circumstances in the formation of character and the limited power of resistance of weak and fallible natures to temptation and error i see no fault committed said goethe which i also might not have committed life will always be to a great extent what we ourselves make it the cheerful man makes a cheerful world the gloomy man a gloomy one we usually find but our own temperament reflected in the dispositions of those about us if we are ourselves querulous we will find them so if we are unforgiving and uncharitable to them they will be the same to us a person returning from an evening party not long ago complained to a policeman on his beat that an ill-looking fellow was following him it turned out to be only his own shadow and such usually is human life to each of us it is for the most part but the reflection of ourselves many persons give themselves a great deal of fidget concerning what other people think of them and their peculiarities some are too much disposed to take the ill-natured side and judging by themselves infer the worst but it is very often the case that the uncharitableness of others where it really exists is but the reflection of our own want of charity and want of temper it still oftener happens that the worry we subject ourselves to has its source in our own imagination and even though those about us may think of us uncharitably we shall not mend matters by exasperating ourselves against them we may thereby only expose ourselves unnecessarily to their ill nature or caprice the ill that comes out of our mouth says george herbert oft times falls into our bosom the great and good philosopher faraday communicated the following piece of admirable advice full of practical wisdom the result of a rich experience of life in a letter to his friend professor tyndall let me as an old man who ought by this time to have profited by experience say that when i was younger i found i often misrepresented the intentions of people and that they did not mean what at the time i supposed they meant and further that as a general rule it was better to be a little dull of apprehension where phrases seemed to imply pique and quick in perception when on the contrary they seemed to imply kindly feeling the real truth never fails ultimately to appear and opposing parties if wrong are sooner convinced when replied to forbearingly than when overwhelmed 
all i mean to say is that it is better to be blind to the results of partisanship and quick to see good will one has more happiness in one's self in endeavoring to follow the things that make for peace you can hardly imagine how often i have been heated in private when opposed as i have thought unjustly and superciliously and yet i have striven and succeeded i hope in keeping down replies of the like kind and i know i have never lost by it while the painter barry was at rome he involved himself as was his wont in furious quarrels with the artists about picture painting and picture dealing upon which his friend and countryman edmund burke always the generous friend of struggling merit wrote to him kindly and sensibly believe me dear barry that the arms with which the ill dispositions of the world are to be combated and the qualities by which it is to be reconciled to us and we reconcile to it are moderation gentleness a little indulgence to others and a great deal of distrust of ourselves which are not qualities of a mean spirit as some may possibly think them but virtues of a great and noble kind and such as dignify our nature as much as they contribute to our repose and fortune for nothing can be so unworthy of a well-composed soul as to pass away life in bickerings and litigations in snarling and scuffling with every one about us we must be at peace with our species if not for their sakes at least very much for our own were it possible to conceive the existence of a tyrant who should compel his people to give up to him one-third or more of their earnings and require them at the same time to consume a commodity that should brutalize and degrade them destroy the peace and comfort of their families and sow in themselves the seeds of disease and premature death what indignation meetings what monster processions there would be what eloquent speeches and apostrophes to the spirit of liberty what appeals against a despotism so monstrous and so unnatural and yet such a tyrant really exists among us the tyrant of unrestrained appetite whom no force of arms or voices or votes can resist while men are willing to be his slave the power of this tyrant can only be overcome by moral means by self-discipline self-respect self-control there is no other way of withstanding the despotism of appetite in any of its forms no reform of institutions no extended power of voting no improved form of government no amount of scholastic instruction can possibly elevate the character of a people who voluntarily abandon themselves to sensual indulgence the pursuit of ignoble pleasure is the degradation of true happiness it saps the morals destroys the energies and degrades the manliness and robustness of individuals as of nations the courage of self-control exhibits itself in many ways but in none more clearly than in honest living men without the virtue of self-denial are not only subject to their own selfish desires but they are usually in bondage to others who are like-minded with themselves what others do they do they must live according to the artificial standard of their class spending like their neighbors regardless of the consequences at the same time that all are perhaps aspiring after a style of living higher than their means each carries the others along with him and they have not the moral courage to stop they cannot resist the temptation of living high though it may be at the expense of others and they gradually become reckless of debt until it enthralls them in all this there is great moral cowardice and want of manly independence of character 
the honorable man is frugal of his means and pays his way honestly he does not seek to pass himself off as richer than he is or by running into debt open an account with ruin as that man is not poor whose means are small but whose desires are under control so that man is rich whose means are more than sufficient for his wants when socrates saw a great quantity of riches jewels and furniture of great value carried in pomp through athens he said now do i see how many things i do not desire i can forgive everything but selfishness said perthes even the narrowest circumstances admit of greatness with reference to mine and thine and none but the very poorest need fill their daily life with thoughts of money if they have but prudence to arrange their housekeeping within the limits of their income a man may be indifferent to money because of higher considerations as faraday was who sacrificed wealth to pursue science but if he would have the enjoyments that money can purchase he must honestly earn it and not live upon the earnings of others as those do who habitually incur debts which they have no means of paying when magan always drowned in debt was asked what he paid for his wine he replied that he did not know but he believed they put something down in a book this putting down in a book has proved the ruin of a great many weak-minded people who cannot resist the temptation of taking things upon credit which they have not the present means of paying for and it would probably prove of great social benefit if the law which enables creditors to recover debts contracted under certain circumstances were altogether abolished but in the competition for trade every encouragement is given to the incurring of debt the creditor relying upon the law to aid him in the last extremity when sydney smith once went into a new neighborhood it was given out in the local papers that he was a man of high connections and he was besought on all sides for his custom but he speedily undeceived his new neighbors we are not great people at all he said we are only common honest people people that pay our debts sir walter scott was a man who was honest to the core of his nature and his strenuous and determined efforts to pay his debts or rather the debts of the firm with which he had become involved has always appeared to us one of the grandest things in biography when his publisher and printer broke down ruin seemed to stare him in the face there was no want of sympathy for him in his great misfortune and friends came forward who offered to raise money enough to enable him to arrange with his creditors no said he proudly this right hand shall work it all off if we lose everything else he wrote to a friend we will at least keep our honor unblemished while his health was already becoming undermined by overwork he went on writing like a tiger as he himself expressed it until no longer able to wield a pen and though he paid the penalty of his supreme efforts with his life he nevertheless saved his honor and his self-respect in vain his doctors told him to give up work he would not be dissuaded as for bidding me not work he said to dr abercrombie molly might just as well put the kettle on the fire and say now kettle don't boil to which he added if i were to be idle i should go mad by means of the profits realized by these tremendous efforts scott saw his debts in course of rapid diminution and he trusted that after a few more years work he would again be a free man but it was not to be he went on turning out such works as his count robert of paris with greatly impaired skill until he was prostrated by another and severer attack of palsy he now felt that the plough was nearing the end of the furrow his physical strength was gone he was not quite himself in all things 
and yet his courage and perseverance never failed i have suffered terribly he wrote in his diary though rather in body than in mind and i often wish i could lie down and sleep without waking but i will fight it out if i can end of chapter 19 self control read by john greenman this is section 20 of happy homes and the hearts that make them by samuel smiles this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 20 duty truthfulness read by john greenman i slept and dreamt that life was beauty i woke and found that life was duty be not simply good be good for something thoreau the path of duty in this world is the road to salvation in the next jewish sage duty is a thing that is due and must be paid by every man who would avoid present discredit and eventual moral insolvency it is an obligation a debt which can only be discharged by voluntary effort and resolute action in the affairs of life duty embraces man's whole existence it begins in the home where there is the duty which children owe to their parents on the one hand and the duty which parents owe to their children on the other there are in like manner the respective duties of husbands and wives of masters and servants while outside the home there are duties which men and women owe to each other as friends and neighbors as employers and employed as governors and governed duty is based upon a sense of justice justice inspired by love which is the most perfect form of goodness duty is not a sentiment but a principle pervading the life and it exhibits itself in conduct and in acts which are mainly determined by man's conscience and free will the voice of conscience speaks in duty done and without its regulating and controlling influence the brightest and greatest intellect may be merely as a light that leads astray conscience sets a man upon his feet while his will holds him upright conscience is the moral governor of the heart the governor of right action of right thought of right faith of right life and only through its dominating influence can the noble and upright character be fully developed the conscience however may speak never so loudly but without energetic will it may speak in vain the will is free to choose between the right course and the wrong one but the choice is nothing unless followed by immediate and decisive action if the sense of duty be strong and the course of action clear the courageous will upheld by the conscience enables a man to proceed on his course bravely and to accomplish his purposes in the face of all opposition and difficulty and should failure be the issue there will remain at least this satisfaction that it has been in the cause of duty be and continue poor young man said heinzelmann while others around you grow rich by fraud and disloyalty be without place or power while others beg their way upward bear the pain of disappointed hopes while others gain the accomplishment of theirs by flattery forego the gracious pressure of the hand for which others cringe and crawl wrap yourself in your own virtue and seek a friend and your daily bread if you have in your own cause grown gray with unbleached honor bless god and die when the marquis of pescara was entreated by the princes of italy to desert the spanish cause to which he was in honor bound his noble wife reminded him of his duty she wrote to him remember your honor which raises you above fortune and above kings 
by that alone and not by the splendor of titles is glory acquired that glory which it will be your happiness and pride to transmit unspotted to your posterity such was the dignified view which she took of her husband's honor and when he fell at pavia though young and beautiful and besought by many admirers she betook herself to solitude that she might lament over her husband's loss and celebrate his exploits to live really is to act energetically life is a battle to be fought valiantly inspired by high and honorable resolve a man must stand to his post and die there if need be like the old danish hero his determination should be to dare nobly to will strongly and never to falter in the path of duty the power of will be it great or small which god has given us is a divine gift and we ought neither to let it perish for want of using on the one hand nor profane it by employing it for ignoble purposes on the other robertson of brighton has truly said that man's real greatness consists not in seeking his own pleasure or fame or advancement not that every one shall save his own life not that every man shall seek his own glory but that every man shall do his own duty what most stands in the way of the performance of duty is irresolution weakness of purpose and indecision on the one side are conscience and knowledge of good and evil on the other are indolence selfishness love of pleasure or passion the weak and ill-disciplined will may remain suspended for a time between these influences but at length the balance inclines one way or the other according as the will is called into action or otherwise if it be followed to remain passive the lower influence of selfishness or passion will prevail and thus manhood suffers abdication individuality is renounced character is degraded and the man permits himself to become the mere passive slave of his senses thus the power of exercising the will promptly in obedience to the dictates of conscience and thereby resisting the impulses of the lower nature is of essential importance in moral discipline and absolutely necessary for the development of character in its best forms to acquire the habit of well-doing to resist evil propensities to fight against sensual desires to overcome inborn selfishness may require a long and persevering discipline but when once the practice of duty is learned it becomes consolidated in habit and thenceforward is comparatively easy the valiant good man is he who by the resolute exercise of his free will has so disciplined himself as to have acquired the habit of virtue as the bad man is he who by allowing his free will to remain inactive and giving the bridle to his desires and passions has acquired the habit of vice by which he becomes at last bound as by chains of iron a man can only achieve strength of purpose by the action of his own free will if he is to stand erect it must be by his own efforts for he cannot be kept propped up by the help of others he is master of himself and of his actions he can avoid falsehood and be truthful he can shun sensualism and be continent he can turn aside from doing a cruel thing and be benevolent and forgiving all these lie within the sphere of individual efforts and come within the range of self-discipline and it depends upon men themselves whether in these respects they will be free pure and good on the one hand or enslaved impure and miserable on the other the sense of duty is a sustaining power even to a courageous man it holds him upright and makes him strong it was a noble saying of pompey when his friends tried to dissuade him from embarking for rome in a storm telling him that he did so at the great peril of his life it is necessary for me to go he said 
it is not necessary for me to live what it was right that he should do he would do in the face of danger and in defiance of storms let men of all ranks said plato whether they are successful or unsuccessful whether they triumph or not let them do their duty and rest satisfied what a lesson for future ages lies in these words as might be expected of the great washington the chief motive power in his life was the spirit of duty it was the regal and commanding element in his character which gave it unity compactness and vigor when he clearly saw his duty before him he did it at all hazards and with inflexible integrity he did not do it for effect nor did he think of glory or of fame and its rewards but of the right thing to be done and the best way of doing it yet washington had a most modest opinion of himself and when offered the chief command of the american patriot army he hesitated to accept it until it was pressed upon him when acknowledging in congress the honor which had been done him in selecting him to so important a trust on the execution of which the future of his country in a great measure depended washington said i beg it may be remembered lest some unlucky event should happen unfavorable to my reputation that i this day declare with the utmost sincerity i do not think myself equal to the command i am honored with and in his letter to his wife communicating to her his appointment as commander-in-chief he said i have used every endeavor in my power to avoid it not only from my unwillingness to part with you and the family but from the consciousness of its being a trust too great for my capacity and that i should enjoy more real happiness in one month with you at home than i have the most distant prospect of finding abroad if my stay were to be seven times seven years but as it has been a kind of destiny that has thrown me upon this service i shall hope that my undertaking it is designed for some good purpose it was utterly out of my power to refuse the appointment without exposing my character to such censures as would have reflected dishonor upon myself and given pain to my friends this i am sure could not and ought not to be pleasing to you and must have lessened me considerably in my own esteem washington pursued his upright course through life first as commander-in-chief and afterwards as president never faltering in the path of duty he had no regard for popularity but held to his purpose through good and through evil report often at the risk of his power and influence thus on one occasion when the ratification of a treaty arranged by mr jay with great britain was in question washington was urged to reject it but his honor and the honor of his country was committed and he refused to do so a great outcry was raised against the treaty and for a time washington was so unpopular that he is said to have been actually stoned by the mob but he nevertheless held it to be his duty to ratify the treaty and it was carried out in despite of petitions and remonstrances from all quarters while i feel he said in answer to the remonstrance the most lively gratitude for the many instances of approbation from my country i can no otherwise deserve it than by obeying the dictates of my conscience duty was the dominant idea in nelson's mind the spirit in which he served his country was expressed in the famous watchword england expects every man to do his duty signalled by him to the fleet before going into action at trafalgar as well as in the last words that passed his lips i have done my duty i praise god for it and nelson's companion and friend the brave sensible homely-minded collingwood he who as his ship bore down into the great sea-fight said to his flag-captain just about this time our wives are going to church in england collingwood too was like his commander an ardent devotee of duty do your duty to the best of your ability was the maxim which he urged upon many young men starting on the voyage of life 
to a midshipman he once gave the following manly and sensible advice you may depend upon it that it is more in your own power than in anybody else's to promote both your comfort and advancement a strict and unwearied attention to your duty and a complacent and respectful behavior not only to your superiors but to everybody will ensure you their regard and the reward will surely come but if it should not i am convinced you have too much good sense to let disappointment sour you guard carefully against letting discontent appear in you it will be sorrow to your friends a triumph to your competitors and cannot be productive of any good conduct yourself so as to deserve the best that can come to you and the consciousness of your own proper behavior will keep you in spirits if it should not come let it be your ambition to be foremost in all duty do not be a nice observer of turns but ever present yourself ready for everything and unless your officers are very inattentive men they will not allow others to impose more duty on you than they should it is a grand thing after all this pervading spirit of duty in a nation and so long as it survives no one need despair of its future but when it has departed or become deadened and been supplanted by thirst for pleasure or self-aggrandizement or glory then woe to that nation for its dissolution is near at hand duty is closely allied to truthfulness of character and the dutiful man is above all things truthful in his words as in his actions he stays and he does the right thing in the right way and at the right time there is probably no saying of lord chesterfield that commends itself more strongly to the approval of manly-minded men than that it is truth that makes the success of the gentleman clarendon speaking of one of the noblest and purest gentlemen of his age says of falkland that he was so severe an adorer of truth that he could as easily have given himself leave to steal as to dissemble it was one of the finest things that mrs hutchinson could say of her husband that he was a thoroughly truthful and reliable man he never professed the thing he intended not nor promised what he believed out of his power nor failed in the performance of anything that was in his power to fulfill wellington was a severe admirer of truth an illustration may be given when afflicted by deafness he consulted a celebrated orist who after trying all remedies in vain determined as a last resource to eject into the ear a strong solution of caustic it caused the most intense pain but the patient bore it with his usual equanimity the family physician accidentally calling one day found the duke with flushed cheeks and bloodshot eyes and when he rose he staggered about like a drunken man the doctor asked to be permitted to look at his ear and then he found that a furious inflammation was going on which if not immediately checked must shortly reach the brain and kill him vigorous remedies were at once applied and the inflammation was checked but the hearing of that ear was completely destroyed when the orist heard of the danger his patient had run through the violence of the remedy he had employed he hastened to apsley house to express his grief and mortification but the duke merely said do not say a word more about it you did all for the best the orist said it would be his ruin when it became known that he had been the cause of so much suffering and danger to his grace but nobody need know anything about it keep your own counsel and depend upon it i won't say a word to any one then your grace will allow me to attend you as usual which will show the public that you have not withdrawn your confidence from me no replied the duke kindly but firmly i can't do that for that would be a lie he would not act a falsehood any more than he would speak one another illustration of duty and truthfulness as exhibited in the fulfillment of a promise may be added from the life of blucher when he was hastening with his army over bad roads 
to the help of wellington on the eighteenth of june eighteen fifteen he encouraged his troops by words and gestures forward children forward it is impossible it can't be done was the answer again and again he urged them children we must get on you may say it can't be done but it must be done i have promised my brother wellington promised do you hear you wouldn't have me break my word and it was done truth is the very bond of society without which it must cease to exist and dissolve into anarchy and chaos a household cannot be governed by lying nor can a nation sir thomas brown once asked do the devils lie no was his answer for then even hell could not subsist no consideration can justify the sacrifice of truth which ought to be sovereign in all the relations of life of all mean vices perhaps lying is the meanest it is in some cases the offspring of perversity and vice and in many others of sheer moral cowardice yet many persons think so lightly of it that they will order their servants to lie for them nor can they feel surprised if after such ignoble instruction they find their servants lying for themselves when pitt was in his last illness the news reached england of the great deeds of wellington in india the more i hear of his exploits said pitt the more i admire the modesty with which he receives the praises he merits for them he is the only man i ever knew that was not vain of what he had done and yet had so much reason to be so so it is said of faraday by professor tyndall that pretense of all kinds whether in life or in philosophy was hateful to him dr marshall hall was a man of like spirit courageously truthful dutiful and manly one of his most intimate friends has said of him that wherever he met with untruthfulness or sinister motive he would expose it saying i neither will nor can give my consent to a lie the question right or wrong once decided in his own mind the right was followed no matter what the sacrifice or the difficulty neither expediency nor inclination weighing one jot in the balance there was no virtue that dr arnold labored more sedulously to instill into young men than the virtue of truthfulness as being the manliest of virtues as indeed the very basis of all true manliness he designated truthfulness as moral transparency and he valued it more highly than any other quality when lying was detected he treated it as a great moral offence but when a pupil made an assertion he accepted it with confidence if you say so that is quite enough of course i believe your word by thus trusting and believing them he educated the young in truthfulness the boys at length coming to say to one another it's a shame to tell arnold a lie he always believes one one of the most striking instances that could be given of the character of the dutiful truthful laborious man is presented in the life of the late george wilson professor of technology in the university of edinburgh though we bring this illustration under the head of duty it might equally have stood under that of courage cheerfulness or industry for it is alike illustrative of these several qualities wilson's life was indeed a marvel of cheerful laboriousness exhibiting the power of the soul to triumph over the body and almost to set it at defiance it might be taken as an illustration of the saying of the whaling captain to dr kane as to the power of moral force over physical bless you sir the soul will any day lift the body out of its boots a fragile but bright and lively boy he had scarcely entered manhood ere his constitution began to exhibit signs of disease as early indeed as his seventeenth year he began to complain of melancholy and of sleeplessness supposed to be the effect of bile i don't think i shall live long he then said to a friend my mind will must work itself out and the body will soon follow it 
a strange confession for a boy to make but he gave his physical health no fair chance his life was all brain work study and competition when he took exercise it was in sudden bursts which did him more harm than good long walks in the highlands jaded and exhausted him and he returned to his brain work unrested and unrefreshed it was during one of his forced walks of some twenty-four miles in the neighborhood of stirling that he injured one of his feet and he returned home seriously ill the result was an abscess disease of the ankle joint and long agony which ended in the amputation of the right foot but he never relaxed in his labors he was now writing lecturing and teaching chemistry rheumatism and acute inflammation of the eye next attacked him and were treated by cupping and blistering unable himself to write he went on preparing his lectures which he dictated to his sister pain haunted him day and night and sleep was only forced by morphia while in this state of general prostration symptoms of pulmonary disease began to show themselves yet he continued to give the weekly lectures to which he stood committed to the edinburgh school of arts not one was shirked though their delivery before a large audience was a most exhausting duty well there's another nail put into my coffin was the remark made on throwing off his overcoat on returning home and a sleepless night almost invariably followed at twenty-seven wilson was lecturing ten eleven or more hours weekly usually with setons or open blister wounds upon him his bosom friends he used to call them he felt the shadow of death upon him and he worked as if his days were numbered don't be surprised he wrote to a friend if any morning at breakfast you hear that i am gone but while he said so he did not in the least degree indulge in the feeling of sickly sentimentality he worked on as cheerfully and hopefully as if in the very fullness of his strength to none said he is life so sweet as to those who have lost all fear to die sometimes he was compelled to desist from his labors by sheer debility occasioned by loss of blood from the lungs but after a few weeks rest and change of air he would return to his work saying the water is rising in the well again though disease had fastened on his lungs and was spreading there and though suffering from a distressing cough he went on lecturing as usual to add to his troubles when one day endeavoring to recover himself from a stumble occasioned by his lameness he overstrained his arm and broke the bone near the shoulder but he recovered from his successive accidents and illnesses in the most extraordinary way the reed bent but did not break the storm passed and it stood erect as before there was no worry or fever nor fret about him but instead cheerfulness patience and unfailing perseverance his mind amidst all his sufferings remained perfectly calm and serene he went about his daily work with an apparently charmed life as if he had the strength of many men in him yet all the while he knew he was dying his chief anxiety being to conceal his state from those about him at home to whom the knowledge of his actual condition would have been inexpressibly distressing i am cheerful among strangers he said and try to live day by day as a dying man he went on teaching as before lecturing to the architectural institute and to the school of arts one day after a lecture before the latter institute he lay down to rest and was shortly awakened by the rupture of a blood vessel which occasioned him the loss of a considerable quantity of blood he appeared at the family meals as usual and next day he lectured twice punctually fulfilling his engagements but the exertion of speaking was followed by a second attack of hemorrhage he now became seriously ill and it was doubted whether he would survive the night but he did survive and during his convalescence he was appointed to an important public office that of director of the scottish industrial museum which involved a great amount of labor as well as lecturing in his capacity of professor of technology which he held in connection with the office 
from this time forward his dear museum as he called it absorbed all his surplus energies while busily occupied in collecting models and specimens for the museum he filled up his odds and ends of time in lecturing to ragged schools ragged kirks and medical missionary societies he gave himself no rest either of mind or body and to die working was the fate he envied his mind would not give in but his poor body was forced to yield and a severe attack of hemorrhage bleeding from both lungs and stomach compelled him to relax his labors for a month or some forty days he wrote a dreadful lent the wind has blown geographically from araby the blessed but thermometrically from iceland the accursed i have been made a prisoner of war hit by an icicle in the lungs and have shivered and burned alternately for a large portion of the last month and spit blood till i grew pale with coughing now i am better and to-morrow i give my concluding lecture thankful that i have contrived notwithstanding all my troubles to carry on without missing a lecture to the last day of the faculty of arts to which i belong how long was it to last he himself began to wonder for he had long felt his life as if ebbing away at length he became languid weary and unfit to work even the writing of a letter cost him a painful effort and he felt as if to lie down and sleep were the only things worth doing yet shortly after to help a sunday school he wrote his five gateways of knowledge as a lecture and afterwards expanded it into a book he also recovered strength sufficient to enable him to proceed with his lectures to the institutions to which he belonged besides on various occasions undertaking to do other people's work i am looked upon as good as mad he wrote to his brother because on a hasty notice i took a defaulting lecturer's place at the philosophical institution and discoursed on the polarization of light but i like work it is a family weakness then followed sleepless nights days of pain and more spitting of blood my only painless moments he says were when lecturing in this state of prostration and disease the indefatigable man undertook to write the life of edward forbes and he did it like everything he undertook with admirable ability he proceeded with his lectures as usual to an association of teachers he delivered a discourse on the educational value of industrial science after he had spoken to his audience for an hour he left them to say whether he should go on or not and they cheered him on to another half hour's address it is curious he wrote the feeling of having an audience like clay in your hands to mould for a season as you please it is a terribly responsible power i do not mean for a moment to imply that i am indifferent to the good opinion of others far otherwise but to gain this is much less a concern with me than to deserve it it was not so once i had no wish for unmerited praise but i was too ready to settle that i did merit it now the word duty seems to me the biggest word in the world and is uppermost in all my serious doings this was written only about four months before his death a little later he wrote i spin my thread of life from week to week rather than from year to year constant attacks of bleeding from the lungs sapped his little remaining strength but did not altogether disable him from lecturing he was amused by one of his friends proposing to put him under trustees for the purpose of looking after his health but he would not be restrained from working so long as a vestige of strength remained one day in the autumn of eighteen fifty nine he returned from his customary lecture in the university of edinburgh with a severe pain in his side he was scarcely able to crawl upstairs medical aid was sent for and he was pronounced to be suffering from pleurisy and inflammation of the lungs his enfeebled frame was unable to resist so severe a disease and he sank peacefully to the rest he so longed for after a few days illness 
wrong not the dead with tears a glorious bright to-morrow endeth a weary life of pain and sorrow end of chapter twenty duty truthfulness read by john greenman This is section 21 of Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 Temper Read by John Greenman Heaven is a temper, not a place. Dr. Chalmers Temper is nine-tenths of Christianity. Bishop Wilson Even power itself hath not one half the might of gentleness hunt it has been said that men succeed in life quite as much by their temper as by their talents however this may be it is certain that their happiness in life depends mainly upon their equanimity of disposition their patience and forbearance and their kindness and thoughtfulness for those about them it is really true what plato says that in seeking the good of others we find our own there are some natures so happily constituted that they can find good in everything there is no calamity so great but they can educe comfort or consolation from it no sky so black but they can discover a gleam of sunshine issuing through it from some quarter or another and if the sun be not visible to their eyes they at least comfort themselves with the thought that it is there though veiled from them for some good and wise purpose such happy natures are to be envied they have a beam in the eye a beam of pleasure gladness religious cheerfulness philosophy call it what you will sunshine is about their hearts and their mind gilds with its own hues all that it looks upon when they have burdens to bear they bear them cheerfully not repining nor fretting nor wasting their energies in useless lamentations but struggling onward manfully gathering up such flowers as lie along their path let it not for a moment be supposed that men such as those we speak of are weak and unreflective the largest and most comprehensive natures are generally also the most cheerful the most loving the most hopeful the most trustful it is the wise man of large vision who is the quickest to discern the moral sunshine gleaming through the darkest cloud in present evil he sees prospective good in pain he recognizes the effort of nature to restore health in trials he finds correction and discipline and in sorrow and suffering he gathers courage knowledge and the best practical wisdom when jeremy taylor had lost all when his house had been plundered and his family driven out of doors and all his worldly estate had been sequestrated he could still write thus i am fallen into the hands of publicans and sequestrators and they have taken all from me what now let me look about me they have left me the sun and moon a loving wife and many friends to pity me and some to relieve me and i can still discourse and unless i list they have not taken away my merry countenance and my cheerful spirit and a good conscience they have still left me the providence of god and all the promises of the gospel and my religion and my hopes of heaven and my charity to them too and still i sleep and digest i eat and drink i read and meditate and he that hath so many causes of joy and so great is very much in love with sorrow and peevishness who loves all these pleasures and chooses to sit down upon his little handful of thorns although cheerfulness of disposition is very much a matter of inborn temperament it is also capable of being trained and cultivated 
like any other habit we may make the best of life or we may make the worst of it and it depends very much upon ourselves whether we extract joy or misery from it there are always two sides of life on which we can look according as we choose the bright side or the gloomy we can bring the power of the will to bear in making the choice and thus cultivate the habit of being happy or the reverse we can encourage the disposition of looking at the brightest side of things instead of the darkest and while we see the cloud let us not shut our eyes to the silver lining the beam in the eye sheds brightness beauty and joy upon life in all its phases it shines upon coldness and warms it upon suffering and comforts it upon ignorance and enlightens it upon sorrow and cheers it the beam in the eye gives lustre to intellect and brightens beauty itself without it the sunshine of life is not felt flowers bloom in vain the marvels of heaven and earth are not seen or acknowledged and creation is but a dreary lifeless soulless blank while cheerfulness of disposition is a great source of enjoyment in life it is also a great safeguard of character a devotional writer of the present day in answer to the question how are we to overcome temptations says cheerfulness is the first thing cheerfulness is the second and cheerfulness is the third it furnishes the best soil for the growth of goodness and virtue it gives brightness of heart and elasticity of spirit it is the companion of charity the nurse of patience the mother of wisdom it is also the best of moral and mental tonics the best cordial of all said dr marshall hall to one of his patients is cheerfulness and solomon has said that a merry heart doth good like a medicine when luther was once applied to for a remedy against melancholy his advice was gaiety and courage innocent gaiety and rational honorable courage are the best medicine for young men and for old men too for all men against sad thoughts next to music if not before it luther loved children and flowers the great gnarled man had a heart as tender as a woman's cheerfulness is also an excellent wearing quality it has been called the bright weather of the heart it gives harmony of soul and is a perpetual song without words it is tantamount to repose it enables nature to recruit its strength whereas worry and discontent debilitate it involving constant wear and tear how is it that we see such men as lord palmerston growing old in harness working on vigorously to the end mainly through equanimity of temper and habitual cheerfulness they have educated themselves in the habit of endurance of not being easily provoked of bearing and forbearing of hearing harsh and even unjust things said of them without indulging in undue resentment and avoiding worrying petty and self-tormenting cares an intimate friend of lord palmerston who observed him closely for twenty years has said that he never saw him angry with perhaps one exception and that was when the ministry responsible for the calamity in afghanistan of which he was one were unjustly accused by their opponents of falsehood perjury and wilful mutilation of public documents so far as can be learned from biography men of the greatest genius have been for the most part cheerful contented men not eager for reputation money or power but relishing life and keenly susceptible of enjoyment as we find reflected in their works such seem to have been homer horace virgil montaigne shakespeare cervantes healthy serene cheerfulness is apparent in their great creations among the same class of cheerful-minded men may also be mentioned luther moore bacon 
leonardo da vinci raphael and michael angela perhaps they were happy because constantly occupied and in the pleasantest of all work that of creating out of the fullness and richness of their great minds milton too though a man of many trials and sufferings must have been a man of great cheerfulness and elasticity of nature though overtaken by blindness deserted by friends and fallen upon evil days darkness before and danger's voice behind yet did he not abate heart or hope but still bore up and steered right onward henry fielding was a man borne down through life by debt and difficulty and bodily sufferings and yet lady mary wortley montague has said of him that by virtue of his cheerful disposition she was persuaded he had known more happy moments than any other person on earth johnson was of opinion that a man grew better as he grew older and that his nature mellowed with age this is certainly a much more cheerful view of human nature than that of lord chesterfield who saw life through the eyes of a cynic and held that the heart never grows better by age it only grows harder but both sayings may be true according to the point from which life is viewed and the temper by which a man is governed for while the good profiting by experience and disciplining themselves by self-control will grow better the ill-conditioned uninfluenced by experience will only grow worse sir walter scott was a man full of the milk of human kindness everybody loved him he was never five minutes in a room ere the little pets of the family whether dumb or lisping had found out his kindness for all their generation scott related to captain hall an incident of his boyhood which showed the tenderness of his nature one day a dog coming towards him he took up a big stone threw it and hit the dog the poor creature had strength enough left to crawl up to him and lick his feet although he saw its leg was broken the incident he said had given him the bitterest remorse in his after life but he added an early circumstance of that kind properly reflected on is calculated to have the best effect on one's character throughout life give me an honest laugher scott would say and he himself laughed the heart's laugh he had a kind word for everybody and his kindness acted all round him like a contagion dispelling the reserve and awe which his great name was calculated to inspire he'll come here said the keeper of the ruins of melrose abbey to washington irving he'll come here sometimes with great folks in his company and the first i'll know of it is hearing his voice calling out johnny johnny bower and when i go out i am sure to be greeted with a joke or a pleasant word he'll stand and crack and laugh with me just like an old wife and to think that of a man that has such an awful knowledge of history dr arnold was a man of the same hearty cordiality of manner full of human sympathy there was not a particle of affectation or pretense of condescension about him i never knew such a humble man as the doctor said the parish clerk at laleham he comes and shakes us by the hand as if he was one of us he used to come into my house said an old woman near foxhow and talk to me as if i were a lady sydney smith was another illustration of the power of cheerfulness he was ever ready to look on the bright side of things the darkest cloud had to him its silver lining whether working as country curate or as parish rector he was always kind laborious patient and exemplary exhibiting in every sphere of life the spirit of a christian the kindness of a pastor and the honor of a gentleman in his leisure he employed his pen on the side of justice freedom education toleration emancipation and his writings though full of common sense and bright humor are never vulgar nor did he ever pander to popularity or prejudice his good spirits thanks to his natural vivacity and stamina of constitution 
never forsook him and in his old age when borne down by disease he wrote to a friend i have gout asthma and seven other maladies but am otherwise very well in one of the last letters he wrote to lady carlyle he wrote if you hear of sixteen or eighteen pounds of flesh wanting an owner they belong to me i, I look as if a curate had been taken out of me one of the sorest trials of a man's temper and patience was that which befell abosit the natural philosopher while residing at geneva resembling in many respects a similar calamity which occurred to newton and which he bore with equal resignation among other things abosit devoted much study to the barometer and its variations with the object of deducing the general laws which regulated atmospheric pressure during twenty-seven years he made numerous observations daily recording them on sheets prepared for the purpose one day when a new servant was installed in the house she immediately proceeded to display her zeal by putting things to rights abosit's study among other rooms was made tidy and set in order when he entered it he asked of the servant what have you done with the paper that was round the barometer oh sir was the reply it was so dirty that i burned it and put in its place this paper which you will see is quite new abosit crossed his arms and after some moments of internal struggle he said in a tone of calmness and resignation you have destroyed the results of twenty-seven years labor in future touch nothing whatever in this room the study of natural history more than that of any other branch of science seems to be accompanied by unusual cheerfulness and equanimity of temper on the part of its votaries the result of which is that the life of naturalists is on the whole more prolonged than that of any other class of men of science a member of the linnean society has informed us that of fourteen members who died in eighteen seventy two were over ninety five were over eighty and two were over seventy the average of all the members who died in that year was seventy-five all large healthy natures are cheerful as well as hopeful their example is also contagious and diffusive brightening and cheering all who come within reach of their influence it was said of sir john malcolm when he appeared in a saddened camp in india that it was like a gleam of sunlight no man left him without a smile on his face he was boy malcolm still it was impossible to resist the fascination of his genial presence the true basis of cheerfulness is love hope and patience love evokes love and begets loving kindness love cherishes hopeful and generous thoughts of others it is charitable gentle and truthful it is a discerner of good it turns to the brightest side of things and its face is ever directed towards happiness it sees the glory in the grass the sunshine on the flower it encourages happy thoughts and lives in an atmosphere of cheerfulness it costs nothing and yet is invaluable for it blesses its possessor and grows up in abundant happiness in the bosoms of others even its sorrows are linked with pleasures and its very tears are sweet bentham lays it down as a principle that a man becomes rich in his own stock of pleasures in proportion to the amount he distributes to others his kindness will evoke kindness and his happiness be increased by his own benevolence kind words he says cost no more than unkind ones kind words produce kind actions not only on the part of him to whom they are addressed but on the part of him by whom they are employed and this not incidentally only but habitually in virtue of the principle of association 
it may indeed happen that the effort of beneficence may not benefit those for whom it was intended but when wisely directed it must benefit the person from whom it emanates the poet rogers used to tell a story of a little girl a great favorite with every one who knew her some one said to her why does everybody love you so much she answered i think it is because i love everybody so much this little story is capable of a very wide application for our happiness as human beings generally speaking will be found to be very much in proportion to the number of things we love and the number of things that love us and the greatest worldly success however honestly achieved will contribute comparatively little to happiness unless it be accompanied by a lively benevolence towards every human being kindness does not consist in gifts but in gentleness and generosity of spirit men may give their money which comes from the purse and withhold their kindness which comes from the heart the kindness that displays itself in giving money does not amount to much and often does quite as much harm as good but the kindness of true sympathy of thoughtful help is never without beneficent results it is the kindly dispositioned men who are the active men of the world while the selfish and the skeptical who have no love but for themselves are its idlers buffon used to say that he would give nothing for a young man who did not begin life with an enthusiasm of some sort it showed that at least he had faith in something good lofty and generous even if unattainable egotism and selfishness are always miserable companions in life and they are especially unnatural in youth the egotist is next door to a fanatic constantly occupied with self he has no thought to spare for others he refers to himself in all things thinks of himself and studies himself until his own little self becomes his own little god worst of all are the grumblers and growlers at fortune who find that whatever is is wrong and will do nothing to set matters right who declare all to be barren from dan even to bathsheba these grumblers are invariably found the least efficient helpers in the school of life as the worst workmen are usually the readiest to strike so the least industrious members of society are the readiest to complain the worst wheel of all is the one that creaks there is such a thing as the cherishing of discontent until the feeling becomes morbid the jaundiced see everything about them yellow the ill-conditioned think all things awry and the whole world out of joint all is vanity and vexation of spirit the little girl in punch who found her doll stuffed with bran and forthwith declared everything to be hollow and wanted to go into a nunnery had her counterpart in real life many full-grown people are quite as morbidly unreasonable we have to be on our guard against small troubles which by encouraging we are apt to magnify into great ones indeed the chief source of worry in the world is not real but imaginary evil small vexations and trivial afflictions in the presence of a great sorrow all petty troubles disappear but we are too ready to take some cherished misery to our bosom and to pet it there let the necessitarians argue as they may freedom of will and action is the possession of every man and woman it is sometimes our glory and very often it is our shame all depends upon the manner in which it is used we can choose to look at the bright side of things or at the dark we can follow good and eschew evil thoughts we can be wrong-headed and wrong-hearted or the reverse as we ourselves determine the world will be to each one of us very much what we make it the cheerful are its real possessors for the world belongs to those who enjoy it it must however be admitted that there are cases beyond the reach of the moralist 
once when a miserable-looking dyspeptic called upon a leading physician and laid his case before him oh said the doctor you only want a good hearty laugh go and see grimaldi alas said the miserable patient i am grimaldi so when smollett oppressed by disease travelled over europe in the hope of finding health he saw everything through his own jaundiced eyes i'll tell it said smellfungus to the world you had better tell it said stern to your physician meeting evils by anticipation is not the way to overcome them if we perpetually carry our burdens about with us they will soon bear us down under their load when evil comes we must deal with it bravely and hopefully but perthes wrote to a young man who seemed to him inclined to take trifles as well as sorrows too much to heart was doubtless good advice go forward with hope and confidence this is the advice given thee by an old man who has had a full share of the burden and heat of life's day we must ever stand upright happen what may and for this end we must cheerfully resign ourselves to the varied influences of this many-coloured life you may call this levity and you are partly right for flowers and colours are but trifles light as air but such levity is a constituent portion of our human nature without which it would sink under the weight of time while on earth we must still play with earth and with that which blooms and fades upon its breast the consciousness of this mortal life being but the way to a higher goal by no means precludes our playing with it cheerfully and indeed we must do so otherwise our energy in action will entirely fail cheerfulness also accompanies patience which is one of the main conditions of happiness and success in life he that will be served says george herbert must be patient it was said of the cheerful and patient king alfred that good fortune accompanied him like a gift of god marlborough's expectant calmness was great and a principal secret of his success as a general patience will overcome all things he wrote in seventeen o two in the midst of a great emergency while baffled and opposed by his allies he said having done all that is possible we should submit with patience last and chiefest of blessings is hope the most common of possessions for as thales the philosopher said even those who have nothing else have hope hope is the great helper of the poor it has even been styled the poor man's bread it is also the sustainer and inspirer of great deeds it is recorded of alexander the great that when he succeeded to the throne of macedon he gave away among his friends the greater part of the estates which his father had left him and when perdiccas asked him what he reserved for himself alexander answered the greatest possession of all hope end of chapter twenty one temper read by john greenman this is section twenty two of happy homes and the hearts that make them by samuel smiles this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two manner art a beautiful behavior is better than a beautiful form it gives a higher pleasure than statues and pictures it is the finest of the fine arts emerson manners are often too much neglected they are most important to men no less than to women life is too short to get over a bad manner besides manners are the shadows of virtues rev sidney smith manner is one of the principal external graces of character it is the ornament of action and often makes the commonest offices beautiful by the way in which it performs them 
it is a happy way of doing things adorning even the smallest details of life and contributing to render it as a whole agreeable and pleasant manner has a good deal to do with the estimation in which men are held by the world and it has often more influence in the government of others than qualities of much greater depth and substance a manner at once gracious and cordial is among the greatest aids to success and many there are who fail for want of it locke thought it of greater importance that an educator of youth should be well bred and well tempered than that he should be either a thorough classicist or man of science while rudeness and gruffness bar doors and shut hearts kindness and propriety of behavior in which good manners consist act as an open sesame everywhere doors unbar before them and they are a passport to the hearts of everybody young and old there is a common saying that manners make the man but this is not so true as that man makes the manners a man may be gruff and even rude and yet be good at heart and of sterling character yet he would doubtless be a much more agreeable and probably a much more useful man were he to exhibit that suavity of disposition and courtesy of manner which always gives a finish to the true gentleman a man's manner to a certain extent indicates his character it is the external exponent of his inner nature it indicates his taste his feelings and his temper as well as the society to which he has been accustomed there is a conventional manner which is of comparatively little importance but the natural manner the outcome of natural gifts improved by careful self-culture signifies a great deal grace of manner is inspired by sentiment which is a source of no slight enjoyment to a cultivated mind viewed in this light sentiment is of almost as much importance as talents and acquirements while it is even more influential in giving the direction to a man's tastes and character sympathy is the golden key that unlocks the hearts of others it not only teaches politeness and courtesy but gives insight and unfolds wisdom and may almost be regarded as the crowning grace of humanity artificial rules of politeness are of very little use what passes by the name of etiquette is often the essence of unpoliteness and untruthfulness it consists in a great measure of posture-making and is easily seen through even at best etiquette is but a substitute for good manners though it is often but their mere counterfeit good manners consist for the most part in courteousness and kindness politeness has been described as the art of showing by external signs the internal regard we have for others but one may be perfectly polite to another without necessarily paying a special regard for him good manners are neither more nor less than beautiful behavior it has been well said that a beautiful form is better than a beautiful face and a beautiful behavior is better than a beautiful form it give a higher pleasure than statues or pictures it is the finest of the fine arts the truest politeness comes of sincerity it must be the outcome of the heart or it will make no lasting impression for no amount of polish can dispense with truthfulness the natural character must be allowed to appear freed of its angularities and asperities though politeness in its best form should resemble water best when clearest most simple and without taste yet genius in a man will always cover many defects of manner and much will be excused to the strong and the original without genuineness and individuality human life would lose much of its interest and variety as well as its manliness and robustness of character true politeness especially exhibits itself in regard for the personality of others 
a man will respect the individuality of another if he wishes to be respected himself he will have due regard for his views and opinions even though they differ from his own the well-mannered man pays a compliment to another and sometimes even secures his respect by patiently listening to him he is simply tolerant and forbearant and refrains from judging harshly and harsh judgment of others will almost invariably provoke harsh judgments of ourselves the impolite impulsive man will however sometimes rather lose his friend than his joke he may surely be pronounced a very foolish person who secures another's hatred at the price of a moment's gratification it was a saying of bernal the engineer himself one of the kindest natured of men that spite and ill-nature are among the most expensive luxuries in life dr johnson once said sir a man has no more right to say an uncivil thing than to act one no more right to say a rude thing to another than to knock him down want of respect for the feelings of others usually originates in selfishness and issues in hardness and repulsiveness of manner it may not proceed from malignity so much as from want of sympathy and want of delicacy a want of that perception of and attention to those little and apparently trifling things by which pleasure is given or pain occasioned to others indeed it may be said that in self-sacrifice in the ordinary intercourse of life mainly consists the difference between being well and ill-bred without some degree of self-restraint in society a man may be found almost insufferable no one has pleasure in holding intercourse with such a person and he is a constant source of annoyance to those about him for want of self-restraint many men are engaged all their lives in fighting with difficulties of their own making and rendering success impossible by their own cross-grained rudeness while others much less gifted make their way and achieve success by simple patience equanimity and self-control it has been said that men succeed in life quite as much by their temper as by their talents however this may be it is certain that their happiness depends mainly on their temperament especially upon their disposition to be cheerful upon their complacence kindliness of manner and willingness to oblige others details of conduct which are like the small change in the intercourse of life and are always in request men may show their disregard of others in various impolite ways as for instance by neglect of propriety in dress by the absence of cleanliness or by indulging in repulsive habits the slovenly dirty person by rendering himself physically disagreeable sets the tastes and feelings of others at defiance and is rude and uncivil only under another form the perfection of manner is ease that it attracts no man's notice as such but is natural and unaffected artifice is incompatible with courteous frankness of manner rochefoucault has said that nothing so much prevents our being natural as the desire of appearing so thus we come round again to sincerity and truthfulness which find their outward expression in graciousness urbanity kindliness and consideration for the feelings of others the frank and cordial man sets those above him at their ease he warms and elevates them by his presence and wins all hearts thus manner in its highest form like character becomes a genuine motive power the love and admiration says canon kingsley which that truly brave and loving man sir sidney smith won from every one rich and poor with whom he came in contact seems to have arisen from the one fact that without perhaps having any such conscious intention he treated rich and poor his own servants and the noblemen his guests alike courteously considerately cheerfully 
affectionately so leaving a blessing and reaping a blessing wherever he went men who toil with their hands equally with those who do not may respect themselves and respect one another it is by their demeanor to each other in other words by their manners that self-respect as well as mutual respect are indicated there is scarcely a moment in their lives the enjoyment of which might not be enhanced by kindliness of this sort in the workshop in the street or at home the civil workman will exercise increased power among his class and gradually induce them to imitate him by his persistent steadiness civility and kindness one may be polite and gentle with very little money in his purse politeness goes far yet costs nothing it is the cheapest of all commodities it is the humblest of the fine arts yet it is so useful and pleasure-giving that it might almost be ranked among the humanities the french and germans of even the humblest classes are gracious in manner complacent cordial and well-bred the foreign workman lifts his cap and respectfully salutes his fellow workmen in passing there is no sacrifice of manliness in this but grace and dignity even the lowest poverty of the foreign workpeople is not misery simply because it is cheerful good taste is a true economist it may be practiced on small means and sweeten the lot of labor as well as of ease it is all the more enjoyed indeed when associated with industry and the performance of duty even the lot of poverty is elevated by taste it exhibits itself in the economies of the household it gives brightness and grace to the humblest dwelling it produces refinement it engenders good will and creates an atmosphere of cheerfulness thus good taste associated with kindliness sympathy and intelligence may elevate and adorn even the lowliest lot the first and best school of manners as of character is always the home where woman is the teacher the manners of society at large are but the reflex of the manners of our collective homes neither better nor worse yet with all the disadvantages of ungenial homes men may practice self-culture of manner as of intellect and learn by good examples to cultivate a graceful and agreeable behavior towards others most men are like so many gems in the rough which need polishing by contact with other and better natures to bring out their full beauty and lustre some have but one side polished sufficient only to show the delicate graining of the interior but to bring out the full qualities of the gem needs the discipline of experience and contact with the best examples of character in the intercourse of daily life a good deal of the success of manner consists in tact and it is because women on the whole have greater tact than men that they prove the most influential teachers they have more self-restraint than men and are naturally more gracious and polite they possess an intuitive quickness and readiness of action have a keener insight into character and exhibit greater discrimination and address in matters of social detail aptness and dexterity come to them like nature and hence well-mannered men usually receive their best culture by mixing in the society of gentle and adroit women tact is an intuitive art of manner which carries one through a difficulty better than either talent or knowledge talent says a public writer is power tact is skill talent is weight tact is momentum talent knows what to do tact knows how to do it talent makes a man respectable tact makes him respected talent is wealth tact is ready money at a gathering in australia not long since four persons met three of them were shepherds on a sheep farm one of these had taken a degree at oxford another at cambridge the third at a german university 
the fourth was their employer a squatter rich in flocks and herds but scarcely able to read or write much less to keep accounts the difference between a man of quick tact and of no tact whatever was exemplified in an interview which once took place between lord palmerston and mr bennis the sculptor at the last sitting which lord palmerston gave him bennis opened the conversation with any news my lord from france how do we stand with louis napoleon the foreign secretary raised his eyebrows for an instant and quickly replied really mr bennis i don't know i have not seen the newspapers poor bennis with many excellent qualities and much real talent was one of the many men who entirely missed their way in life through want of tact such is the power of manner combined with tact that wilkes one of the ugliest of men used to say that in winning the graces of a lady there was not more than three days difference between him and the handsomest man in england but this reference to wilkes reminds us that too much importance must not be attached to manner for it does not afford any genuine test of character the well-mannered man may like wilkes be merely acting a part and that for an immoral purpose manner like all other fine arts gives pleasure and is exceedingly agreeable to look upon but it may be assumed as a disguise as men assume a virtue though they have it not it is but the exterior sign of good conduct but may be no more than skin deep the most highly polished person may be thoroughly depraved in heart and his superfine manners may after all only consist in pleasing gestures and in fine phrases on the other hand it must be acknowledged that some of the richest and most generous natures have been wanting in the graces of courtesy and politeness as a rough rind sometimes covers the sweetest fruit so a rough exterior often conceals a kindly and hearty nature the blunt man may seem even rude in manner and yet at heart be honest kind and gentle john knox and martin luther were by no means distinguished for their urbanity they had work to do which needed strong and determined rather than well-mannered men indeed they were both thought to be unnecessarily harsh and violent in their manner and who art thou said mary queen of scots to knox that presumest to school the nobles and sovereign of this realm madam replied knox a subject born within the same it is said that his boldness or roughness more than once made queen mary weep when regent morton heard of this he said well tis better that women would weep than bearded men as knox was retiring from the queen's presence on one occasion he overheard one of the royal attendants say to another he is not afraid turning round upon them he said and why should the pleasing face of a gentleman frighten me i have looked on the faces of angry men and yet have not been afraid beyond measure when the reformer worn out by excess of labor and anxiety was at length laid to his rest the regent looking down into the open grave exclaimed in words which made a strong impression from their aptness and truth there lies he who never feared the face of man luther also was thought by some to be a mere compound of violence and ruggedness but as in the case of knox the times in which he lived were rude and violent and the work he had to do could scarcely have been accomplished with gentleness and suavity to rouse europe from its lethargy he had to speak and to write with force and even vehemence yet luther's vehemence was only in words his apparently rude exterior covered a warm heart in private life he was gentle loving and affectionate he was simple and homely even to commonness fond of all common pleasures and enjoyments he was anything but an austere man 
or a bigot for he was hearty genial and even jolly luther was the common people's hero in his lifetime and he remains so in germany to this day samuel johnson was rude and often gruff in manner but he had been brought up in a rough school poverty in early life had made him acquainted with strange companions he had wandered in the streets with savage for nights together unable between them to raise money enough to pay for a bed when his indomitable courage and industry at length secured for him a footing in society he still bore upon him the scars of his early sorrows and struggles he was by nature strong and robust and his experience made him unaccommodating and self-asserting when he was once asked why he was not invited to dine out as garrick was he answered because great lords and ladies did not like to have their mouths stopped and johnson was a notorious mouth-stopper though what he said was always worth listening to johnson's companion spoke of him as ursa major but as goldsmith generously said of him no man alive has a more tender heart he has nothing of the bear about him but his skin the kindliness of johnson's nature was shown on one occasion by the manner in which he assisted a supposed lady in crossing fleet street he gave her his arm and led her across not observing that she was in liquor at the time but the spirit of the act was not the less kind on that account on the other hand the conduct of the bookseller on whom johnson once called to solicit employment and who regarding his athletic but uncouth person told him he had better go buy a porter's knot and carry trunks in howsoever bland tones the advice might have been communicated was simply brutal while captiousness of manner and the habit of disputing and contradicting everything said is chilling and repulsive the opposite habit of assenting to and sympathizing with every statement made or emotion expressed is almost equally disagreeable it is unmanly and is felt to be dishonest it may seem difficult says richard sharp to steer always between bluntness and plain dealing between giving merited praise and lavishing indiscriminate flattery but it is very easy good humor kind-heartedness and perfect simplicity being all that are requisite to do what is right in the right way at the same time many are impolite not because they mean to be so but because they are awkward and perhaps know no better thus when gibbon had published the second and third volumes of his decline and fall the duke of cumberland met him one day and accosted him with how do you do mr gibbon i see you are always at it in the old way scribble 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 the duke probably intended to pay the author a compliment but did not know how better to do it than in this blunt and apparently rude way again many persons are thought to be stiff reserved and proud when they are only shy shyness is characteristic of most people of teutonic race from all that can be learned of shakespeare it is to be inferred that he was an exceedingly shy man the manner in which his plays were sent into the world for it is not known that he edited or authorized the publication of a single one of them and the dates at which they respectively appeared are mere matters of conjecture his appearance in his own plays in second and even third-rate parts his indifference to reputation and even his apparent aversion to be held in repute by his contemporaries his disappearance from london the seat and centre of histrionic art so soon as he had realized a moderate competency and his retirement about the age of forty for the remainder of his days to a life of obscurity in a small town in the midland counties all seemed to unite in proving the shrinking nature of the man and his unconquerable shyness but a still more recent and striking instance is that of the late archbishop whatley who in the early part of his life was painfully oppressed by the sense of shyness when at oxford his white 
rough coat and white hat obtained for him the sobriquet of the white bear and his manners according to his own account of himself corresponded with the appellation he was directed by way of remedy to copy the example of the best-mannered men he met in society but the attempt to do this only increased his shyness and he failed he found that he was all the while thinking of himself rather than of others whereas thinking of others rather than of oneself is the true essence of politeness finding that he was making no progress Watley was driven to utter despair and then he said to himself why should i endure this torture all my life to no purpose i would bear it still if there was any success to be hoped for but since there is not i will die quietly without taking any more doses i have tried my very utmost and find that i must be as awkward as a bear all my life in spite of it i will endeavor to think as little about it as a bear and make up my mind to endure what can't be cured from this time forth he struggled to shake off all consciousness as to manner and to disregard censure as much as possible in adopting this course he says i succeeded beyond my expectations for i not only got rid of the personal suffering of shyness but also of most of those faults of manner which consciousness produces and acquired at once an easy and natural manner careless indeed in the extreme from its originating in a stern defiance of opinion which i had convinced myself must be ever against me but unconscious and therefore giving expression to that good will toward men which i really feel and these i believe are the main points washington who was an englishman in his lineage was also one in his shyness he is described incidentally by mr josiah quincy as a little stiff in his person not a little formal in his manner and not particularly at ease in the presence of strangers he had the air of a country gentleman not accustomed to mix much in society perfectly polite but not easy in address and conversation and not graceful in his movements true politeness is best evinced by self-forgetfulness or self-denial in the interest of others mr garfield our martyred president was a gentleman of royal type his friend colonel rockwell says of him in the midst of his suffering he never forgets others for instance to-day he said to me rockwell there is a poor soldier's widow who came to me before this thing occurred and i promised her she would be provided for i want you to see that the matter is attended to at once he is the most docile patient i ever saw although we are not accustomed to think of modern americans as shy the most distinguished american author of our time was probably the shyest of men nathaniel hawthorne was shy to the extent of morbidity we have observed him when a stranger entered the room where he was turn his back for the purpose of avoiding recognition and yet when the crust of his shyness was broken no man could be more cordial and genial than hawthorne we observe a remark in one of hawthorne's lately published notebooks that on one occasion he met mr helps in society and found him cold and doubtless mr helps thought the same of him it was only the case of two shy men meeting each thinking the other stiff and reserved and parting before their mutual film of shyness had been removed by a little friendly intercourse we have thus far spoken of shyness as a defect but there is another way of looking at it for even shyness has its bright side and contains an element of good shy men and shy races are ungraceful and undemonstrative because as regards society at large they are comparatively unsociable they do not possess those elegances of manner acquired by free intercourse which distinguish the social graces because their tendency is to shun society rather than to seek it they are shy in the presence of strangers and shy even in their own families they hide their affections under a robe of reserve and when they do give way to their feelings it is only in some very hidden inner chamber 
and yet the feelings are there and not the less healthy and genuine that they are not made the subject of exhibition to others it was not a little characteristic of the ancient germans that the more social and demonstrative peoples by whom they were surrounded should have characterized them as the dumb men and the same designation might equally apply to the modern english as compared for example with their nimbler more communicative and vocal and in all respects more social neighbors the modern french and irish but there is one characteristic which marks the english people as it did the races from which they have mainly sprung and that is their intense love of home give the englishman a home and he is comparatively indifferent to society for the sake of a holding which he can call his own he will cross the sea plant himself on the prairie or amidst the primeval forest and make for himself a home the solitude of the wilderness has no fears for him the society of his wife and family is sufficient and he cares for no other hence it is that the people of germanic origin from whom the english and americans have alike sprung make the best of colonizers and are now rapidly extending themselves as emigrants and settlers in all parts of the habitable globe to remedy this admitted defect of grace and want of artistic taste in the english people a school has sprung up among us for the more general diffusion of fine art the beautiful has now its teachers and preachers and by some it is almost regarded in the light of a religion the beautiful is the good the beautiful is the true the beautiful is the priest of the benevolent are among their texts it is believed that by the study of art the tastes of the people may be improved that by contemplating objects of beauty their nature will become purified and that by being thereby withdrawn from sensual enjoyments their character will be refined and elevated but though such culture is calculated to be elevating and purifying in a certain degree we must not expect too much from it grace is a sweetener and embellisher of life and as such is worthy of cultivation music painting dancing and the fine arts are all sources of pleasure and though they may not be sensual yet they are sensuous and often nothing more the cultivation of a taste for beauty of form or color of sound or attitude has no necessary effect upon the cultivation of the mind or the development of the character the contemplation of fine works of art will doubtless improve the taste and excite admiration but a single noble action done in the sight of men will more influence the mind and stimulate the character to imitation than the sight of miles of statuary or acres of pictures for it is mind soul and heart not taste or art that make men great art has usually flourished most during the decadence of nations when it has been hired by wealth as the minister of luxury exquisite art and degrading corruption were contemporary in greece as well as in rome phidias and ictinus had scarcely completed the parthenon when the glory of athens had departed phidias died in prison and the spartans set up in the city the memorials of their own triumph and of athenian defeat it was the same in ancient rome where art was at its greatest height when the people were in their most degraded condition nero was an artist as well as domitian two of the greatest monsters of the empire if the beautiful had been the good commodus must have been one of the best of men but according to history he was one of the worst again the greatest period of modern roman art was that in which pope leo x flourished of whose reign it has been said that profligacy and licentiousness prevailed among the people and clergy as they had done almost uncontrolled ever since the pontificate of alexander the sixth in like manner the period at which art reached its highest point in the low countries 
was that which immediately succeeded the destruction of civil and religious liberty and the prostration of the national character under the despotism of spain if art could elevate a nation and the contemplation of the beautiful were calculated to make men good then paris ought to contain a population of the wisest and best of human beings rome also is a great city of art and yet there the virtus or valor of the ancient romans has characteristically degenerated into virtu or a taste for knick-knacks while according to recent accounts the city itself is inexpressibly foul art would even sometimes appear to have a connection with dirt and it is said of mr ruskin that when searching for works of art in venice his attendant in his explorations would sniff an ill odor and when it was strong would say now we are coming to something very old and fine meaning in art a little common education in cleanliness where it is wanting would probably be much more improving as well as wholesome than any amount of education in fine art ruffles are all very well but it is folly to cultivate them to the neglect of the shirt while therefore grace of manner politeness of behavior elegance of demeanor and all the arts that contribute to make life pleasant and beautiful are worthy of cultivation it must not be at the expense of the more solid and enduring qualities of honesty sincerity and truthfulness the fountain of beauty must be in the heart more than in the eye and if it do not tend to produce beautiful life and noble practice it will prove of comparatively little avail politeness of manner is not worth much unless it is accompanied by polite actions grace may be but skin deep very pleasant and attractive and yet very heartless art may be a source of innocent enjoyment and an important aid to higher culture but unless it leads to higher culture it may be merely sensuous and when art is merely sensuous it is enfeebling and demoralizing rather than strengthening or elevating honest courage is of greater worth than any amount of grace purity is better than elegance and cleanliness of body mind and heart than any amount of fine art while the cultivation of the graces is not to be neglected it should never be forgotten that there is something far higher and nobler to be aimed at greater than pleasure greater than art greater than wealth greater than power greater than intellect greater than genius and that is purity and excellence of character without a solid sterling basis of individual goodness all the grace elegance and art in the world would fail to save or elevate a people end of chapter twenty two manner art read by john greenman this is section twenty three of happy homes and the hearts that make them by samuel smiles this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three Companionship of Books. Books, we know, are a substantial world, both pure and good, round which, with tendrils strong as flesh and blood, our pastime and our happiness can grow. Wordsworth Not only in the common speech of men, but in all art, too which is or should be the concentrated and conserved essence of what men can speak and show biography is almost the one thing needful carlyle a man may usually be known by the books he reads as well as by the company he keeps for there is a companionship of books as well as of men and one should always live in the best company whether it be of books or of men a good book may be among the best of friends it is the same to-day as it always was and it 
will never change it is the most patient and cheerful of companions it does not turn its back upon us in times of adversity or distress it always receives us with the same kindness amusing and instructing us in youth and comforting us and consoling us in age men often discover their affinity to each other by the mutual love they have for a book just as two persons sometimes discover a friend by the admiration which both entertain for a third there is an old proverb love me love my dog but there is more wisdom in this love me love my book the book is a truer and higher bond of union men can think feel and sympathize with each other through their favorite author books said hazlitt wind into the heart the poet's verse slides into the current of our blood we read them when young we remember them when old we read there of what has happened to others we feel that it has happened to ourselves they are to be had everywhere cheap and good we breathe but the air of books we owe everything to their authors on this side of barbarism a good book is often the best urn of a life enshrining the best thoughts of which that life was capable for the world of a man's life is for the most part but the world of his thoughts thus the best books are treasuries of good words and golden thoughts which remembered and cherished become our abiding companions and comforters they are never alone said sir philip sidney that are accompanied by noble thoughts the good and true thought may in time of temptation be as an angel of mercy purifying and guarding the soul it also enshrines the germs of action for good words almost invariably inspire to good works thus sir henry lawrence prized above all other compositions wordsworth's character of the happy warrior which he endeavored to embody in his own life it was ever before him as an exemplar he thought of it continually and often quoted it to others his biographer says he tried to conform his own life and to assimilate his own character to it and he succeeded as all men succeed who are truly in earnest books possess an essence of immortality they are by far the most lasting products of human effort temples crumple into ruin pictures and statues decay but books survive time is of no account with great thoughts which are as fresh to-day as when they first passed through their authors minds ages ago what was then said and thought still speaks to us as vividly as ever from the printed page the only effect of time has been to sift and winnow out the bad products for nothing in literature can long survive but what is really good books introduce us into the best society they bring us into the presence of the greatest minds that have ever lived we hear what they said and did we see them as if they were really alive we are participators in their thoughts we sympathize with them enjoy with them grieve with them their experience becomes ours and we feel as if we were in a measure actors with them in the scenes which they describe great is the human interest felt in biography what are all the novels that find such multitudes of readers but so many fictitious biographies what are the dramas that people crowd to see but so much acted biography strange that the highest genius should be employed on the fictitious biography and so much commonplace ability on the real yet the authentic picture of any human being's life and experience ought to possess an interest greatly beyond that which is fictitious inasmuch as it has the charm of reality every person may learn something from the recorded life of another and even comparatively trivial deeds and sayings may be invested with interest as being the outcome of the lives of such beings as we ourselves are the records of the lives of good men are especially useful they influence our hearts inspire us with hope and set before us great examples and when men have done their duty through life in a great spirit their influence will never wholly pass away 
the good life says george herbert is never out of season goethe has said that there is no man so commonplace that a wise man may not learn something from him sir walter scott could not travel in a coach without gleaning some information or discovering some new trait of character in his companions dr johnson once observed that there was not a person in the streets but he should like to know his biography his experience of life his trials his difficulties his successes and his failures how much more truly might this be said of the men who have made their mark in the world's history and have created for us that great inheritance of civilization of which we are the possessors whatever relates to such men to their habits their manners their modes of living their personal history their conversation their maxims their virtues or their greatness is always full of interest of instruction of encouragement and of example the great lesson of biography is to show what man can be and do at his best a noble life put fairly on record acts like an inspiration to others it exhibits what life is capable of being made it refreshes our spirit encourages our hopes gives us new strength and courage and faith faith in others as well as in ourselves it stimulates our aspirations rouses us to action and incites us to become co-partners with them in their work to live with such men in their biographies and to be inspired by their example is to live with the best of men and to mix in the best of company history itself is best studied in biography indeed history is biography collective humanity as influenced and governed by individual men what is all history says emerson but the work of ideas a record of the incomparable energy which his infinite aspirations infuse into man in its pages it is always persons we see more than principles historical events are interesting to us mainly in connection with the feelings the sufferings and interests of those by whom they are accomplished in history we are surrounded by men long dead but whose speech and whose deeds survive we almost catch the sound of their voices and what they did constitutes the interest of history we never feel personally interested in masses of men but we feel and sympathize with the individual actors whose biographies afford the finest and most real touches in all great historical dramas among the great writers of the past probably the two that have been most influential in forming the characters of great men of action and great men of thought have been plutarch and montaigne the one by presenting heroic models for imitation the other by probing questions of constant recurrence in which the human mind in all ages has taken the deepest interest and the works of both are for the most part cast in a biographic form their most striking illustrations consisting in the exhibitions of character and experience which they contain plutarch's lives though written nearly eighteen hundred years ago like homer still holds its ground as the greatest work of its kind it was the favorite book of montaigne and to englishmen it possesses the special interest of having been shakespeare's principal authority in his great classical dramas montaigne pronounced plutarch to be the greatest master in that kind of writing the biographic and he declared that he could no sooner cast an eye upon him but he purloined either a leg or a wing alfieri was first drawn with passion to literature by reading plutarch i read said he the lives of timoleon caesar brutus polopidas more than six times with cries with tears and with such transports that i was almost furious every time that i met with one of the great traits of these great men i was seized with such vehement agitation as to be unable to sit still plutarch was also a favorite with persons of such various minds as schiller and benjamin franklin napoleon and madame roland the latter was so fascinated by the book that she carried it to church with her and read it surreptitiously during the service it has also been the nurture of heroic souls 
it was one of sir william napier's favorite books when a boy his mind was early imbued by it with a passionate admiration for the great heroes of antiquity and its influence had doubtless much to do with the formation of his character as well as the direction of his career in life it is related of him that in his last illness when feeble and exhausted his mind wandered back to plutarch's heroes and he descanted for hours to his son-in-law on the mighty deeds of alexander hannibal and caesar indeed if it were possible to poll the great body of readers in all ages whose minds have been influenced and directed by books it is probable that excepting the bible the immense majority of votes would be cast in favor of plutarch while the best and most carefully drawn of plutarch's portraits are of life size many of them are little more than busts they are well proportioned but compact and within such reasonable compass that the best of them may be read in half an hour reduced to this measure they are however greatly more imposing than a lifeless colossus or an exaggerated giant they are not overlaid by disquisition and description but the characters naturally unfold themselves montaigne indeed complained of plutarch's brevity no doubt he added but his reputation is the better for it though in the meantime we are the worse plutarch would rather we should applaud his judgment than commend his knowledge and had rather leave us with an appetite to read more than glutted with what we have already read he knew very well that a man may say too much even on the best subjects such as have lean and spare bodies stuff themselves out with clothes so they who are defective in matter endeavor to make amends with words plutarch possessed the art of delineating the more delicate features of mind and minute peculiarities of conduct as well as the foibles and defects of his heroes all of which is necessary to faithful and accurate portraiture to see him says montaigne pick out a light action in a man's life or a word that does not seem to be of any importance is itself a whole discourse he even condescends to inform us of such homely particulars as that alexander carried his head affectedly on one side that alcibiades was a dandy and had a lisp which became him giving a grace and persuasive turn to his discourse that cato had red hair and gray eyes and was a usurer and a screw selling off his old slaves when they became unfit for hard work that caesar was bald and fond of gay dress and that cicero had involuntary twitching of his nose such minute particulars may by some be thought beneath the dignity of biography but plutarch thought them requisite for the due finish of the complete portrait which he set himself to draw and it is by small details of character personal traits features habits and characteristics that we are enabled to see before us the men as they really lived plutarch's great merit consists in his attention to these little things without giving them undue preponderance or neglecting those which are of greater moment sometimes he hits off an individual trait by an anecdote which throws more light upon the character described than pages of rhetorical description would do in some cases he gives us the favorite maxim of his hero and the maxims of men often reveal their hearts then as to foibles the greatest of men are not unusually symmetrical each has his defect his twist his craze and it is by his faults that the great man reveals his common humanity we may at a distance admire him as a demigod but as we come nearer to him we find that he is but a fallible man and our brother nor are the illustrations of the defects of great men without their uses for as dr johnson observed if nothing but the bright side of characters were shown we would sit down in despondency and think it utterly impossible to imitate them in anything plutarch himself justifies his method of portraiture by averring that his design was not to write histories but lives the most glorious exploits he says 
do not always furnish us with the clearest discoveries of virtue or of vice in men sometimes a matter of much less moment an expression or a jest better informs us of their characters and inclinations than battles with the slaughter of tens of thousands and the greater arrays of armies or sieges of cities therefore as portrait painters are more exact in their lines and features of the face and the expression of the eyes in which the character is seen without troubling themselves about the other parts of the body so i must be allowed to give my more particular attention to the signs and indications of the souls of men and while i endeavor by these means to portray their lives i leave important events and great battles to be described by others things apparently trifling may stand for much in biography as well as history and slight circumstances may influence great results pascal has remarked that if cleopatra's nose had been shorter the whole face of the world would probably have been changed but for the amours of pepin the fat the saracens might have overrun europe as it was his illegitimate son charles martel who overthrew them at tours and eventually drove them out of france that sir walter scott should have sprained his foot in running round the room when a child may seem unworthy of notice in his biography yet ivanhoe old mortality and all the waverley novels depended upon it when his son intimated a desire to enter the army scott wrote to southey i have no title to combat a choice which would have been my own had not my lameness prevented so that had not scott been lame he might have fought all through the peninsular war and had his breast covered with medals but we should probably have had none of those books of his which have made his name immortal and shed so much glory upon his country talleyrand also was kept out of the army for which he had been destined by his lameness but directing his attention to the study of books and eventually of men he at length took rank among the greatest diplomatists of his time byron's club foot had probably not a little to do with determining his destiny as a poet had not his mind been embittered and made morbid by his deformity he might never have written a line he might have been the noblest fop of his day but his misshapen foot stimulated his mind roused his ardor threw him upon his own resources and we know with what result so too of scarron to whose hunchback we probably owe his cynical verse and of pope whose satire was in a measure the outcome of his deformity for he was as johnson described him protuberant behind and before as in portraiture so in biography there must be light and shade the portrait painter does not pose his sitter so as to bring out his deformities nor does the biographer give undue prominence to the defects of the character he portrays not many men are so outspoken as cromwell was when he sat to cooper for his miniature paint me as i am said he warts and all yet if we would have a faithful likeness of faces and characters they must be painted as they are biography said sir walter scott the most interesting of every species of composition loses all its interest with me when the shades and lights of the principal characters are not accurately and faithfully detailed i can no more sympathize with a mere eulogist than i can with a ranting hero on the stage while books are among the best companions of old age they are often the best inspirers of youth the first book that makes a deep impression on a young man's mind often constitutes an epoch in his life it may fire the heart stimulate the enthusiasm and by directing his efforts into unexpected channels permanently influence his character the new book in which we form an intimacy with a new friend whose mind is wiser and riper than our own may thus form an important starting point in the history of life it may sometimes almost be regarded in the light of a new birth good books are among the best of companions and by elevating the thoughts and aspirations 
they act as preservatives against low associations a natural turn for reading and intellectual pursuits says thomas hood probably preserved me from the moral shipwreck so apt to befall those who are deprived in early life of their parental pilotage my books kept me from the ring the dog-pit the tavern the saloon the closest associate of pope and addison the mind accustomed to the noble though silent discourse of shakespeare and milton will hardly seek or put up with low company and slaves it has been truly said that the best books are those which most resemble good actions they are purifying elevating and sustaining they enlarge and liberalize the mind they preserve it against vulgar worldliness they tend to produce high-minded cheerfulness and equanimity of character they fashion and shape and humanize the mind erasmus the great scholar was even of opinion that books were the necessaries of life and clothes the luxuries and he frequently postponed buying the latter until he had supplied himself with the former his greatest favorites were the writings of cicero which he says he always felt himself the better for reading i can never he says read the works of cicero on old age or friendship without fervently pressing them to my lips without being penetrated with veneration for a mind little short of inspired by god himself it was the accidental perusal of cicero's hortensius which first detached st augustine until then a profligate and abandoned sensualist from his immoral life and started him upon the course of inquiry and study which led to his becoming the greatest among the fathers of the early church sir william jones made it a practice to read through once a year the writings of cicero whose life indeed says his biographer was the greatest exemplar of his own when the good old puritan baxter came to enumerate the valuable and delightful things of which death would deprive him his mind reverted to the pleasures he had derived from books and study when i die he said i must depart not only from sensual delights but from the more manly pleasures of my studies knowledge and converse with many wise and godly men must leave my library and turn over those pleasant books no more end of chapter twenty three companionship of books read by john greenman this is section twenty four of happy homes and the hearts that make them by samuel smiles this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four companionship in marriage kindness in women not their beauteous looks shall win my love shakespeare the character of men as of women is powerfully influenced by their companionship in all the stages of life we have already spoken of the influence of the mother in forming the character of her children she makes the moral atmosphere in which they live and by which their minds and souls are nourished as their bodies are by the physical atmosphere they breathe and while woman is the natural cherisher of infancy and the instructor of childhood she is also the guide and counsellor of youth and the confidant and companion of manhood in her various relations of mother sister lover and wife in short the influence of woman more or less affects for good or for evil the entire destinies of man the respective social functions and duties of men and women are clearly defined by nature god created man and woman each to do their proper work each to fill their proper sphere neither can occupy the position nor perform the functions of the other their several vocations are perfectly distinct though companions and equals yet as regards the measure of their powers they are unequal man is stronger more muscular and of rougher fibre woman is more delicate sensitive and nervous the one excels in power of brain 
the other in qualities of heart and though the head may rule it is the heart that influences both are alike adapted for the respective functions they have to perform in life and to attempt to impose woman's work upon man would be quite as absurd as to attempt to impose man's work upon woman although man's qualities belong more to the head and woman's more to the heart yet it is not less necessary that man's heart should be cultivated as well as his head and woman's head cultivated as well as her heart a heartless man is as much out of keeping in civilized society as a stupid and unintelligent woman the cultivation of all parts of the moral and intellectual nature is requisite to form the man or woman of healthy and well-balanced character without sympathy or consideration for others man were a poor stunted sordid selfish being and without cultivated intelligence the most beautiful woman were little better than a well-dressed doll it is too much the practice to cultivate the weakness of woman rather than her strength and to render her attractive rather than self-reliant her sensibilities are developed at the expense of her health of body as well as mind she lives moves and has her being in the sympathy of others she dresses that she may attract and is burdened with accomplishments that she may be chosen weak trembling and dependent she incurs the risk of becoming a living embodiment of the italian proverb so good that she is good for nothing on the other hand the education of young men too often errs on the side of selfishness while the boy is encouraged to trust mainly to his own efforts in pushing his way in the world the girl is encouraged to rely almost entirely upon others he is educated with too exclusive reference to himself and she is educated with exclusive reference to him he is taught to be self-reliant and self-dependent while she is taught to be distrustful of herself dependent and self-sacrificing in all things thus the intellect of the one is cultivated at the expense of the affections and the affections of the other at the expense of the intellect it is unquestionable that the highest qualities of woman are displayed in her relationship to others through the medium of her affections she is the nurse whom nature has given to all humankind she takes charge of the helpless and nourishes and cherishes those we love she is the presiding genius of the fireside where she creates an atmosphere of serenity and contentment suitable for the nurture and growth of character in its best forms she is by her very constitution compassionate gentle patient and self-denying loving hopeful trustful her eye sheds brightness everywhere it shines upon coldness and warms it upon suffering and relieves it upon sorrow and cheers it woman has been styled the angel of the unfortunate she is ready to help the weak to raise the fallen to comfort the suffering it was characteristic of woman that she should have been the first to build and endow a hospital it has been said that wherever a human being is suffering his sighs call a woman to his side when mungo park lonely friendless and famished after being driven forth from an african village by the men was preparing to spend the night under a tree exposed to the rain and the wild beasts which there abounded a poor negro woman returning from the labors of the field took compassion upon him conducted him into her hut and there gave him food and succor and shelter the best productions of the poet goethe as perhaps of most poets were inspired by woman's sympathy of fraulein von klettenberg Luz said on him her influence was avowedly very great not only while at frankfurt but subsequently it was not so much the effect of religious discussion as the experience it gave him of a deeply religious nature she was neither bigot nor prude her faith was an inner light which shed mild radiance around her probably no poet owed more to the benign influence of woman than goethe but he was a man who traded in the loves of women 
women whom he had attached to him by his powers of fascination when he had no woman in his heart says his latest biographer he was like a dissecting surgeon without a subject he said of balzac that each of his best novels seemed dug out of a suffering woman's heart balzac might have returned the compliment in reference to his early fondness for natural history goethe says i remember that when a child i pulled flowers to pieces to see how the petals were inserted into the calyx or even plucked birds to observe how the feathers were inserted in their wings bettina remarked to lord houghton that he treated women in much the same fashion all his loves high and low were subjected to this kind of vivisection his powers of fascination were extraordinary and if for the purposes of art he wanted a display of strong emotion he deepened the passion without scruple or compunction but while the most characteristic qualities of woman are displayed through her sympathies and affections it is also necessary for her own happiness as a self-dependent being to develop and strengthen her character by due self-culture self-reliance and self-control it is not desirable even were it possible to close the beautiful avenues of the heart self-reliance of the best kind does not involve any limitation in the range of human sympathy but the happiness of woman as of man depends in a great measure upon her individual completeness of character and that self-dependence which springs from the due cultivation of the intellectual powers conjoined with a proper discipline of the heart and conscience will enable her to be more useful in life as well as happy to dispense blessings intelligently as well as to enjoy them and most of all those which spring from mutual dependence and social sympathy to maintain a high standard of purity in society the culture of both sexes must be in harmony and keep equal pace a pure womanhood must be accompanied by a pure manhood the same moral law applies alike to both it would be loosening the foundations of virtue to countenance the notion that because of a difference in sex man were at liberty to set morality at defiance and to do that with impunity which if done by a woman would stain her character for life to maintain a pure and virtuous condition of society therefore man as well as woman must be pure and virtuous both alike shunning all acts infringing on the heart character and conscience shunning them as poison which once imbibed can never be entirely thrown out again but mentally embitters to a greater or less extent the happiness of after life although nature spurns all formal rules and directions in affairs of love it might at all events be possible to implant in young minds such views of character as should enable them to discriminate between the true and the false and to accustom them to hold in esteem those qualities of moral purity and integrity without which life is but a scene of folly and misery it may not be possible to teach young people to love wisely but they may at least be guarded by parental advice against the frivolous and despicable passions which so often usurp its name love it has been said in the common acceptation of the term is folly but love in its purity its loftiness its unselfishness is not only a consequence but a proof of our moral excellence the sensibility to moral beauty the forgetfulness of self in the admiration engendered by it all prove its claim to a high moral influence it is the triumph of the unselfish over the selfish part of our nature it is by means of this divine passion that the world is kept ever fresh and young it is the perpetual melody of humanity it sheds an effulgence upon youth and throws a halo round age it glorifies the present by the light it casts backward and it lightens the future by the beams it casts forward the love which is the outcome of esteem and admiration has an elevation and purifying effect on the character 
it tends to emancipate one from the slavery of self it is altogether unsordid itself is its only price it inspires gentleness sympathy mutual faith and confidence true love also in a measure elevates the intellect all love renders wise in a degree says the poet browning and the most gifted minds have been the sincerest lovers great souls make all affections great they elevate and consecrate all true delights the sentiment even brings to light qualities before lying dormant and unsuspected it elevates the aspirations expands the soul and stimulates the mental powers one of the finest compliments ever paid to a woman was that of steele when he said of lady elizabeth hastings that to have loved her was a liberal education viewed in this light woman is an educator in the highest sense because above all other educators she educates humanly and lovingly it has been said that no man and no woman can be regarded as complete in their experience of life until they have been subdued into a union with the world through their affections as woman is not woman until she has known love neither is man man both are requisite to each other's completeness plato entertained the idea that lovers each sought a likeness in the other and that love was only the divorced half of the original human being entering into union with its counterpart but philosophy would here seem to be at fault for affection quite as often springs from unlikeness as from likeness in its object the true union must needs be one of mind as well as of heart and based on mutual esteem as well as mutual affection no true and enduring love says fichte can exist without esteem every other draws regret after it and is unworthy of any noble human soul one cannot really love the bad but always something that we esteem and respect as well as admire in short true union must rest on qualities of character which rule in domestic as in public life but there is something far more than mere respect and esteem in the union between man and wife the feeling on which it rests is far deeper and tenderer such indeed as never exists between men or between women in matters of affection says nathaniel hawthorne there is always an impassable gulf between man and man they can never quite grasp each other's hands and therefore man never derives any intimate help any heart sustenance from his brother man but from woman his mother his sister or his wife man enters a new world of joy and sympathy and human interest through the porch of love he enters a new world in his home the home of his own making altogether different from the home of his boyhood where each day brings with it a succession of new joys and experiences he enters also it may be a new world of trials and sorrows in which he often gathers his best culture and discipline family life says st beuf may be full of thorns and cares but they are fruitful all others are dry thorns and again if a man's home at a certain period of his life does not contain children it will probably be found filled with follies or with vices a life exclusively occupied in affairs of business insensibly tends to narrow and harden the character it is mainly occupied with self watching for advantages and guarding against sharp practice on the part of others thus the character unconsciously tends to grow suspicious and ungenerous the best corrective of such influences is always the domestic by withdrawing the mind from thoughts that are wholly gainful by taking it out of its daily rut and bringing it back to the sanctuary of home for refreshment and rest a man's real character will always be more visible in his household than anywhere else and his practical wisdom will be better exhibited by the manner in which he bears rule there than even in the larger affairs of business or public life his whole mind may be in his business but if he would be happy 
his whole heart must be in his home it is there that his genuine qualities most surely display themselves there that he shows his truthfulness his love his sympathy his consideration for others his uprightness his manliness in a word his character if affection be not the governing principle in a household domestic life may be the most intolerable of despotisms without justice also there can be neither love confidence nor respect on which all true domestic rule is founded erasmus speaks of sir thomas moore's home as a school and exercise of the christian religion no wrangling no angry word was heard in it no one was idle every one did his duty with alacrity and not without a temperate cheerfulness sir thomas won all hearts to obedience by his gentleness he was a man clothed in household goodness and he ruled so gently and wisely that his home was pervaded by an atmosphere of love and duty he himself spoke of the hourly interchange of the smaller acts of kindness with the several members of his family as having a claim upon his time as strong as those other public occupations of his life which seemed to others so much more serious and important but the man whose affections are quickened by home life does not confine his sympathies within that comparatively narrow sphere his love enlarges in the family and through the family it expands into the world love says emerson is a fire that kindling its first embers in the narrow nook of a private bosom caught from a wandering spark out of another private heart glows and enlarges until it warms and beams upon multitudes of men and women upon the universal heart of all and so lights up the whole world and nature with its generous flames it is by the regimen of domestic affection that the heart of man is best composed and regulated the home is the woman's kingdom her state her world where she governs by affection by kindness by the power of gentleness there is nothing which so settles the turbulence of a man's nature as his union in life with a high-minded woman there he finds rest contentment and happiness rest of brain and peace of spirit he will also often find in her his best counsellor for her instinctive tact will usually lead him right when his own unaided reason might be apt to go wrong the true wife is a staff to lean upon in times of trial and difficulty and she is never wanting in sympathy and solace when distress occurs or fortune frowns in the time of youth she is a comfort and an ornament of man's life and she remains a faithful helpmate in maturer years when life has ceased to be an anticipation and we live in its realities what a happy man must edmund burke have been when he could say of his home every care vanishes the moment i enter under my own roof and luther a man full of human affection speaking of his wife said i would not exchange my poverty with her for all the riches of croesus without her of marriage he observed the utmost blessing that god can confer on a man is the possession of a good and pious wife with whom he may live in peace and tranquillity to whom he may confide his whole possessions even his life and welfare and again he said to rise betimes and to marry young are what no man ever repents of doing a woman's best qualities do not reside in her intellect but in her affections she gives refreshment by her sympathies rather than by her knowledge the brain women says oliver wendell holmes never interest us like the heart women men are often so wearied with themselves that they are rather predisposed to admire qualities and tastes in others different from their own if i were suddenly asked says mr helps to give a proof of the goodness of god to us i think i should say that it is the most manifest in the exquisite difference he has made between the souls of men and women so as to create the possibility of the most comforting and charming companionship that the mind of man can imagine 
it is this characteristic sympathy of woman which gives to home its charm and to home and childhood reminiscences a sacredness which causes such songs as home sweet home and the old oaken bucket to be the favorites of all classes when samuel woodworth wrote the old oaken bucket he was living with his family in new york city one hot day he came into the house and pouring out a glass of water drained it eagerly as he set it down he exclaimed that is very refreshing but how much more refreshing would it be to take a good long draught from the old oaken bucket i left hanging in my father's well at home sell him said his wife wouldn't that be a pretty subject for a poem at this suggestion woodworth seized his pen and as the home of his childhood rose vividly to his fancy he wrote the now familiar words there are few men who have written so wisely on the subject of marriage as sir henry taylor what he says about the influence of a happy union in its relation to successful statesmanship applies to all conditions of life the true wife he says should possess such qualities as will tend to make home as much as may be a place of repose to this end she should have sense enough or worth enough to exempt her husband as much as possible from the troubles of family management and more especially from all possibility of debt she should be pleasing to his eyes and to his taste the taste goes deep into the nature of all men love is hardly a part from it and in a life of care and excitement that home which is not the seat of love cannot be a place of repose rest for the brain and peace for the spirit being only to be had through the softening of the affections the true wife takes a sympathy in her husband's pursuits she cheers him encourages him and helps him she enjoys his successes and his pleasures and makes as little as possible over his vexations in his seventy-second year faraday after a long and happy marriage wrote to his wife i long to see you dearest and to talk over things together and call to mind all the kindnesses i have received my head is full and my heart also but my recollection rapidly fails even as regards the friends that are in the room with me you will have to resume your old function of being a pillow to my mind and a rest a happy-making wife some persons are disappointed in marriage because they expect too much from it but many more because they do not bring into the co-partnership their fair share of cheerfulness kindness forbearance and common sense their imagination has perhaps pictured a condition never experienced on this side of heaven and when real life comes with its troubles and cares there is a sudden waking up as from a dream or they look for something approaching perfection in their chosen companion and discover by experience that the fairest of characters have their weaknesses the golden rule of married life is bear and forbear marriage like government is a series of compromises one must give and take refrain and restrain endure and be patient one may not be blind to another's failings but they may at least be born with good-natured forbearance of all qualities good temper is the one that wears and works the best in married life conjoined with self-control it gives patience the patience to bear and forbear to listen without retort to refrain until the angry flash has passed how true it is in marriage that the soft answer turneth away wrath it has been said that girls are very good at making nets but that it would be better still if they would learn to make cages men are often as easily caught as birds but as difficult to keep if the wife cannot make her home bright and happy so that it shall be the cleanest sweetest cheerfulest place that her husband can find refuge in a retreat from the toils and troubles of the outer world then god help the poor man for he is virtually homeless no wise person will marry for beauty mainly 
it may exercise a powerful attraction in the first place but it is found to be of comparatively little consequence afterwards not that beauty of person is to be underestimated for other things being equal handsomeness of form and beauty of features are the outward manifestations of health but to marry a handsome figure without character fine features unbeautified by sentiment or good nature is the most deplorable of mistakes as even the finest landscape seen daily becomes monotonous so does the most beautiful face unless a beautiful nature shines through it the beauty of to-day becomes commonplace to-morrow whereas goodness displayed through the most ordinary features is perennially lovely moreover this kind of beauty improves with age and time ripens rather than destroys it after the first year married people rarely think of each other's features and whether they be classically beautiful or otherwise but they never fail to be cognizant of each other's temper when i see a man says addison with a sour rivalled face i cannot forbear pitying his wife and when i meet with an open ingenuous countenance i think of the happiness of his friends his family and his relations a man's moral character is necessarily powerfully influenced by his wife a lower nature will drag him down as a higher will lift him up the former will deaden his sympathies dissipate his energies and distort his life while the latter by satisfying his affections will strengthen his moral nature and by giving him repose tend to energize his intellect not only so but a woman of high principles will insensibly elevate the aims and purposes of her husband as one of low principles will unconsciously degrade them de tocqueville was profoundly impressed by this truth he entertained the opinion that man could have no such mainstay in life as the companionship of a wife of good temper and high principle he says that in the course of his life he had seen even weak men display real public virtue because they had by their side a woman of noble character who sustained them in their career and exercised a fortifying influence on their views of public duty while on the contrary he had still oftener seen men of great and generous instincts transformed into vulgar self-seekers by contact with women of narrow natures devoted to an imbecile love of pleasure and from whose minds the grand motive of duty was altogether absent de tocqueville himself had the good fortune to be blessed with an admirable wife and in his letters to his intimate friends he spoke most gratefully of the comfort and support he derived from her sustaining courage her equanimity of temper and her nobility of character the more indeed that de tocqueville saw of the world and of practical life the more convinced he became of the necessity of healthy domestic conditions for a man's growth in virtue and goodness especially did he regard marriage as of inestimable importance in regard to man and woman's true happiness and he was accustomed to speak of his own as the wisest action of his life writing to his bosom friend de kergolay he said of all the blessings which god has given me the greatest of all in my eyes is to have lighted on marie you cannot imagine what she is in great trials usually so gentle she then becomes strong and energetic she watches me without my knowing it she softens calms and strengthens me in difficulties which disturb me but leave her serene in another letter he says i cannot describe to you the happiness yielded in the long run by the habitual society of a woman in whose soul all that is good in your own is reflected naturally and even improved when i say or do a thing which seems to me to be perfectly right i read in marie's countenance an expression of proud satisfaction which elevates me and so when my conscience reproaches me her face instantly clouds over although i have great power over her mind i see with pleasure that she awes me and so long as i love her as i do now i am sure that i shall never allow myself to be drawn into anything that is wrong m guizot was in like manner sustained and encouraged 
amidst his many vicissitudes and disappointments, by his noble wife. If he was treated with harshness by his political enemies, his consolation was in the tender affection which filled his home with sunshine. Though his public life was bracing and stimulating, he felt, nevertheless, that it was cold and calculating, and neither filled the soul nor elevated the character. Man longs for a happiness, he says in his memoirs, more complete and more tender than that which all the labors and triumphs of active exertion and public importance can bestow. What I know to-day, at the end of my race, I have felt when it began, and during its continuance. Even in the midst of great undertakings, domestic affections form the basis of life, and the most brilliant career has only superficial and incomplete enjoyments, if a stranger to the happy ties of family and friendship. We have spoken of the influence of a wife upon a man's character. There are few men strong enough to resist the influence of a lower character in a wife. If she do not sustain and elevate what is highest in his nature, she will speedily reduce him to her own level. Thus a wife may be the making or the unmaking of the best of men. Sir Samuel Romilly left behind him, in his autobiography, a touching picture of his wife, to whom he attributed no small measure of the success and happiness that accompanied him through life. For the last fifteen years, he said, my happiness has been the constant study of the most excellent of wives, a woman in whom a strong understanding, the noblest and most elevated sentiments, and the most courageous virtue, are united to the warmest affection and to the utmost delicacy of mind and heart and all these intellectual perfections are graced by the most splendid beauty that human eyes ever beheld romilly's affection and admiration for this noble woman endured to the end and when she died the shock proved greater than his sensitive nature could bear sleep left his eyelids his mind became unhinged and three days after her death the sad event occurred which brought his own valued life to a close sir francis burdett to whom romilly had been often politically opposed fell into such a state of profound melancholy on the death of his wife that he persistently refused nourishment of any kind and died before the removal of her remains from the house and husband and wife were laid side by side in the same grave not only have women been the best of companions friends and counsellors but they have in many cases been the most effective helpers of their husbands in special lines of work galvani was especially happy in his wife it is said to have been through her quick observation of the circumstance of the leg of a frog placed near an electrical machine becoming convulsed when touched by a knife that her husband was first led to investigate the science which has since become identified with his name. Lavoisier's wife also was a woman of real scientific ability, who not only shared in her husband's pursuits, but even undertook the task of engraving the plates that accompanied his elements. The late Dr. Buckland had another true helper in his wife, who assisted him with her pen, prepared and mended his fossils, and furnished many of the drawings and illustrations of his published works notwithstanding her devotion to her husband's pursuits says her son frank buckland in the preface to one of his father's works she did not neglect the education of her children but accompanied her mornings in superintending their instruction in sound and useful knowledge the sterling value of her labors they now in after life fully appreciate and feel most thankful that they were blessed with so good a mother. A still more remarkable instance of helpfulness in a wife is presented in the case of Huber, the Geneva naturalist. Huber was blind from his seventeenth year, and yet he found means to study and master a branch of natural history demanding the closest observation and the keenest eyesight. It was through the eyes of his wife that his mind worked as if they had been his own. She encouraged her husband's studies as a means of alleviating his privation, which at length he came to forget, and his life was as prolonged and happy as is usual with naturalists. 
he even went so far as to declare that he should be miserable were he to regain his eyesight i should not know he said to what extent a person in my situation could be loved besides to me my wife is always young fresh and pretty which is no light matter hubert's great work on bees is still regarded as a masterpiece embodying a vast amount of original observation on their habits and natural history indeed while reading his descriptions one would suppose that they were the work of a singularly keen-sighted man rather than of one who had been entirely blind for twenty-five years at the time at which he wrote them not less touching was the devotion of lady hamilton to the service of her husband the late sir william hamilton after he had been stricken by paralysis through overwork at the age of fifty-six she became hands eyes mind and everything to him she identified herself with his work read and consulted books for him copied out and corrected his lectures and relieved him of all business which she felt herself competent to undertake indeed her conduct as a wife was nothing short of heroic and it is probable that but for her devoted and more than wifely help and her rare practical ability the greatest of her husband's works would never have seen the light he was by nature unmethodical and disorderly and she supplied him with method and order his temperament was studious but indolent while she was active and energetic she abounded in the qualities which he most lacked he had the genius to which her vigorous nature gave the force and impulse when sir william hamilton was elected to his professorship after a severe and even bitter contest his opponents professing to regard him as a visionary predicted that he could never teach a class of students and that his appointment would prove a total failure he determined with the help of his wife to justify the choice of his supporters and to prove that his enemies were false prophets having no stock of lectures on hand each lecture of the first course was written out day by day as it was to be delivered on the following morning the wife sat up with him night after night to write out a fair copy of the lectures from the rough sheets which he drafted in the adjoining room on some occasions says his biographer the subject of the lecture would prove less easily managed than on others and then sir william would be found writing as late as nine o'clock in the morning while his faithful but wearied amanuensis had fallen asleep on a sofa sometimes the finishing touches to the lecture were left to be given just before the class hour thus helped sir william completed his course his reputation as a lecturer was established and he eventually became recognized throughout europe as one of the leading intellects of his time the woman who soothes anxiety by her presence who charms and allays irritability by her sweetness of temper is a consoler as well as a true helper niebuhr always spoke of his wife as a fellow worker with him in this sense without the peace and consolation which he found in her society his nature would have fretted in comparative uselessness her sweetness of temper and her love said he raise me above the earth and in a manner separate me from this life but she was a helper in another and more direct way niebuhr was accustomed to discuss with his wife every historical discovery every political event every novelty in literature and it was mainly for her pleasure and approbation in the first instance that he labored while preparing himself for the instruction of the world at large the wife of john stuart mill was another worthy helper of her husband though in a more abstruse department of study as we learn from his touching dedication of the treatise on liberty to the beloved and deplored memory of her who was the inspirer and in part the author of all that is best in my writings the friend and wife whose exalted sense of truth and right was my strongest incitement and whose approbation was my chief reward i dedicate this volume not less touching is the testimony borne by another great living writer to the character of his wife in the inscription upon the tombstone of mrs carlyle where are inscribed these words 
in her bright existence she had more sorrows than are common but also a soft amiability a capacity of discernment and a noble loyalty of heart which are rare for forty years she was the true and loving helpmate of her husband and by act and word unweariedly forwarded him as none else could in all of worth that he did or attempted besides being a helper woman is emphatically a consoler her sympathy is unfailing she soothes cheers and comforts never was this more true than in the case of the wife of tom hood whose tender devotions to him during a life that was a prolonged illness is one of the most affecting things in biography a woman of excellent good sense she appreciated her husband's genius and by encouragement and sympathy cheered and heartened him to renewed efforts in many a weary struggle for life she created about him an atmosphere of hope and cheerfulness and nowhere did the sunshine of her love seem so bright as when lighting up the couch of her invalid husband nor was he unconscious of her worth in one of his letters to her when absent from his side hood said i never was anything dearest till i knew you and i have been a better happier and more prosperous man ever since lay by that truth in lavender sweetest and remind me of it when i fail i am writing warmly and fondly but not without good cause first your own affectionate letter lately received next the remembrance of our dear children pledges what darling ones of our old familiar love then a delicious impulse to pour out the overflowings of my heart into yours and last not least the knowledge that your dear eyes will read what my hand is now writing perhaps there is an afterthought that whatever may befall me the wife of my bosom will have the acknowledgment of her tenderness worth excellence all that is wifely or womanly from my pen many other similar true-hearted wives rise up in the memory to recite whose praises would more than fill up our remaining space such as flaxman's wife ann denham who cheered and encouraged her husband through life in the prosecution of his art accompanying him to rome sharing in his labors and anxieties and finally in his triumphs and to whom flaxman in the fortieth year of their married life dedicated his beautiful designs illustrative of faith hope and charity in token of his deep and undimmed affection such as catherine butcher's dark-eyed kate the wife of william blake who believed her husband to be the first genius on earth worked off the impression of his plates and colored them beautifully with her own hand bore with him in all his erratic ways sympathized with him in his sorrows and joys for forty-five years and comforted him until his dying hour his last sketch made in his seventy-first year being a likeness of himself before making which seeing his wife crying by his side he said stay kate just keep as you are i will draw your portrait for you have ever been an angel to me trial and sufferings are the test of married life they bring out the real character and often tend to produce the closest union they may even be the spring of the purest happiness uninterrupted joy like uninterrupted success is not good for either man or woman when heine's wife died he began to reflect upon the loss he had sustained they had both known poverty and struggled through it hand in hand and it was his greatest sorrow that she was taken from him at the moment when fortune was beginning to smile upon him but too late for her to share in his prosperity alas said he among my griefs must i reckon even her love the strongest truest that ever inspired the heart of woman which made me the happiest of mortals and yet was to me a fountain of a thousand distresses inquietudes and cares to entire cheerfulness perhaps she never attained but for what unspeakable sweetness what exalted enrapturing joys is not love indebted to sorrow amidst growing anxieties with the torture of anguish in my heart 
i have been made even by the loss which caused me this anguish and these anxieties inexpressibly happy when tears flowed over our cheeks did not a nameless seldom felt delight stream through my breast oppressed equally by joy and sorrow there is a degree of sentiment in german love which seems strange to english readers the german betrothal is a ceremony of almost equal importance to the marriage itself and in that state the sentiments are allowed free play while english lovers are restrained shy and as if ashamed of their feelings take for instance the case of herder whom his future wife first saw in the pulpit i heard she says the voice of an angel and soul's words such as i had never heard before in the afternoon i saw him and stammered out my thanks to him from this time forth our souls were one they were betrothed long before their means would permit them to marry but at length they were united we were married says caroline the wife by the rose light of a beautiful evening we were one heart one soul herder was equally ecstatic in his language i have a wife he wrote that is the tree the consolation and the happiness of my life even in flying transient thoughts which often surprise us we are one take again the case of fichte in whose history his courtship and marriage form a beautiful episode he was a poor german student living with a family at zurich in the capacity of tutor when he first made the acquaintance of johanna maria Rahn. her position in life was higher than that of fichte nevertheless she regarded him with sincere admiration when fichte was about to leave zurich his troth plighted to her she knowing him to be very poor offered him a gift of money before setting out he was inexpressibly hurt by the offer and at first even doubted whether she could really love him but on second thought he wrote to her expressing his deep thanks but at the same time the impossibility of him accepting such a gift from her he succeeded in reaching his destination though entirely destitute of means after a long and hard struggle with the world extending over many years fichte was at length earning money enough to enable him to marry in one of his charming letters to his betrothed he said and so dearest i solemnly devote myself to thee and thank thee that thou hast thought me not unworthy to be thy companion on the journey of life there is no land of happiness here below i know it now but a land of toil where every joy but strengthens us for greater labor hand in hand we shall traverse it and encourage and strengthen each other until our spirits oh may it be together shall rise to the eternal fountain of all peace what a contrast does the courtship and married life of the blunt and practical william cobbett present to the aesthetical and sentimental love of these highly refined germans when he first set eyes upon the girl that was afterwards to become his wife she was only thirteen years old and he was twenty-one a sergeant major in a foot regiment stationed at st john's in new brunswick he was passing the door of her father's house one day in winter and saw the girl out in the snow scrubbing a washing tub he said at once to himself that's the girl for me he made her acquaintance and resolved that she should be his wife so soon as he could get discharged from the army on the eve of the girl's return to woolwich with her father who was a sergeant major in the artillery cobbett sent her a hundred and fifty guineas which he had saved in order that she might be able to live without hard work until his return to england the girl departed taking with her the money and five years later cobbett obtained his discharge on reaching london he made haste to call upon the sergeant major's daughter i found he says my little girl a servant of all work and hard work it was at five pounds a year in the house of a captain brissac and without hardly saying a word about the matter she put into my hands the whole of my hundred and fifty guineas unbroken admiration of her conduct was now added to love of her person and cobbett shortly after married the girl who proved an excellent wife he was indeed never tired of speaking her praises 
and it was his pride to attribute to her all the comfort and much of the success of his after life end of chapter 24 companionship in marriage read by john greenman This is section 25 of Happy Homes and the Hearts that Make Them by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 Examples, Models. Read by John Greenman. Children may be strangled, but deeds never. They have an indestructible life, both in and out of our consciousness. George Eliot there is no action of man in this life which is not the beginning of so long a chain of consequences as that no human providence is high enough to give us a prospect to the end thomas of malmesbury example is one of the most potent of instructors though it teaches without a tongue it is the practical school of mankind working by action which is always more forcible than words precept may point to us the way but it is silent continuous example conveyed to us by habits and living with us in fact that carries us along good advice has its weight but without the accompaniment of a good example it is of comparatively small influence and it will be found that the common saying of do as i say not as i do is usually reversed in the actual experience of life all persons are more or less apt to learn through the eye rather than the ear and whatever is seen in fact makes a far deeper impression than anything that is merely read or heard this is especially the case in early youth when the eye is the chief inlet of knowledge whatever children see they unconsciously imitate they insensibly come to resemble those who are about them as insects take the color of the leaves they feed on hence the vast importance of domestic training for whatever may be the efficiency of schools the examples set in our homes must always be a vastly greater influence in forming the characters of our future men and women the home is the crystal of society the nucleus of national character and from that source be it pure or tainted issue the habits principles and maxims which govern public as well as private life the nation comes from the nursery example in conduct therefore even in apparently trivial matters is of no light moment inasmuch as it is constantly becoming inwoven with the lives of others and contributing to form their natures for better or for worse the characters of parents are thus constantly repeated in their children and the acts of affection discipline industry and self-control which they daily exemplify live and act when all else which may have been learned through the ear has long been forgotten hence a wise man was accustomed to speak of his children as his future state even the mute action and unconscious look of a parent may give a stamp to the character which is never effaced and who can tell how much evil action has been stayed by the thought of some good parent whose memory their children may not sully by the commission of an unworthy deed or the indulgence of an impure thought the veriest trifles thus become of importance in influencing the characters of men a kiss from my mother said west made me a painter it is on direction of such seeming trifles when children that the future happiness and success of men mainly depend farwell buxton when occupying an eminent and influential station in life wrote to his mother i constantly feel especially in action and exertion for others the effects of principles early implanted by you in my mind buxton was also accustomed to remember with gratitude the obligations which he owed to an illiterate man a gamekeeper named abraham plasto with whom he played and rode and sported a man who could neither read nor write but was full of natural good sense and mother wit 
what made him particularly valuable says buxton were his principles of integrity and honor he never said or did a thing in the absence of my mother of which she would have disapproved he always held up the highest standard of integrity and filled our youthful minds with sentiments as pure and as generous as could be found in the writings of seneca or cicero such was my first instructor and i must add my best early impressions are most lasting and hence it is that parents cannot be too guarded in the example set before children the rev john newton's career is a striking example of the permanency of early impressions his devout mother died when he was but six years of age although this event practically ended his moral education the instruction received in those early years was not lost though apparently forgotten amid the dissipation of his seafaring life the impressions received were never wholly dismissed though the immediate cause of his reform was a dream at sea yet the efficient cause was the quiet and apparently uneventful years of earliest childhood spent in a humble cottage home a curious circumstance is related by a survivor of the wreck of the central america which sailed from havana in eighteen forty seven and sunk in mid-ocean he had been some hours in the water and floated away from the rest when the voice of his mother sounded in his ears years had passed away since he a thoughtless child had stolen one evening into the room of a dying sister and devoured some grapes which had been placed beside her bed for her refreshment during the night terrified at his selfishness he had slunk off to his chamber but his mother guessing who was the guilty intruder had come to him and said johnny did you eat sister's grapes and now those words uttered in a reproachful tone again sounded distinctly in his ear and he saw the pale face and tearful eyes of his mother as she turned away and left him the act had wounded his conscience but had long since been forgotten now however it rose upon his mind with a clearness and force which were appalling lord langdale looking back upon the admirable example set him by his mother declared if the whole world were put into one scale and my mother into the other the world would kick the beam mrs pennock in her old age was accustomed to call to mind the personal influence exercised by her mother upon the society amidst which she moved when she entered a room it had the effect of immediately raising the tone of the conversation and as if purifying the moral atmosphere all seeming to breathe more freely and stand more erectly in her presence says the daughter i became for the time transformed into another person so much does the moral health depend upon the moral atmosphere that is breathed and so great is the influence daily exercised by parents over their children by living a life before their eyes that perhaps the best system of parental instruction might be summed up in these two words improve thyself there is indeed an essence of immortality in the life of man even in this world no individual in the universe stands alone he is a component part of a system of mutual dependencies and by his several acts he either increases or diminishes the sum of human good now and for ever as the present is rooted in the past and the lives and examples of our forefathers still to a great extent influence us so are we by our daily acts contributing to form the condition and character of the future man is a fruit formed and ripened by the culture of all the foregoing centuries and the living generation continues the magnetic current of action and example destined to bind the remotest past with the most distant future no man's acts die utterly and though his body may resolve into dust and air his good or his bad deeds will still be bringing forth fruit after their kind and influencing future generations for all time to come it is in this momentous and solemn fact that the great peril and responsibility of human existence lies thus every act we do or word we utter as well as every act we witness or word we hear 
carries with it an influence which extends over and gives a color not only to the whole of our future life but makes itself felt upon the whole frame of society we may not and indeed cannot possibly trace the influence working itself into action in its various ramifications amongst our children our friends or associates yet there it is assuredly working on for ever and herein lies the great significance of setting forth a good example a silent teaching which even the poorest and least significant person can practice in his daily life there is no one so humble but that he owes to others this simple but priceless instruction even the meanest condition may thus be made useful for the light set in a low place shines as faithfully as that set upon a hill everywhere and under almost all circumstances however externally adverse in moorland districts in cottage hamlets in the close alleys of great towns the true man may grow he who tills a space of earth scarce bigger than is needed for his grave may work as faithfully and to as good purpose as the heir of thousands the commonest workshop may thus be a school of industry science and good morals on the one hand or of idleness folly and depravity on the other it all depends on the individual men and the use they make of the opportunities for good which offer themselves a life well spent a character uprightly sustained is no slight legacy to leave to one's children and to the world for it is the most eloquent lesson of virtue and the severest reproof of vice while it continues an enduring source of the best kind of riches well for those who can say as pope did in rejoinder to the sarcasm of lord hervey i think it enough that my parents such as they were never cost me a blush and that their son such as he is never cost them a tear true-hearted persons even in the humblest station in life who are energetic doers may give an impulse to good works out of all proportion apparently to their actual station in society thomas wright might have talked about the reclamation of criminals and john pounds about the necessity for ragged schools and yet done nothing instead of which they simply set to work without any other idea in their minds than that of doing not talking and how the example of even the poorest man may tell upon society hear what dr guthrie the apostle of the ragged school movement says of the influence which the example of john pounds the humble portsmouth cobbler exercised upon his own working career the interest i have been led to take in this cause is an example of how a man's destiny his course of life like that of a river may be determined and affected by very trivial circumstances it is rather curious at least it is interesting to me to remember that it was by a picture i was first led to take an interest in ragged schools by a picture in an old obscure decaying burg that stands on the shores of the firth of forth the birthplace of thomas chalmers i went to see this place many years ago and going into an inn for refreshment i found the room covered with pictures of shepherdesses with their crooks and sailors in holiday attire not particularly interesting but above the chimney-piece there was a large print more respectable than its neighbors which represented a cobbler's room the cobbler was there himself spectacles on nose an old shoe between his knees the massive forehead and firm mouth indicating great determination of character and beneath his bushy eyebrows benevolence gleamed out on a number of poor ragged boys and girls who stood at their lessons round the busy cobbler my curiosity was awakened and in the inscription i read how this man john pounds a cobbler in portsmouth taking pity on the multitude of poor ragged children left by ministers and magistrates and ladies and gentlemen to go to ruin on the streets how like a good shepherd he gathered in these wretched outcasts how he had trained them to god and to the world and how while earning his daily bread by the sweat of his brow 
he had rescued from misery and saved to society not less than five hundred of these children i felt ashamed of myself i felt reproved for the little i had done my feelings were touched i was astonished at this man's achievements and i well remember in the enthusiasm of the moment saying to my companion that man is an honor to humanity and deserves the tallest monument ever raised within the shores of britain i took up that man's history and i found it animated by the spirit of him who had compassion on the multitude john pounds was a man of tact besides and like paul if he could not win a poor boy any other way he won him by art he would be seen chasing a ragged boy along the quays and compelling him to come to school not by the power of a policeman but by the power of a hot potato he knew the love an irishman had for a potato and john pounds might be seen running holding under the boy's nose a potato like an irishman very hot and with a coat as ragged as himself when the day comes when honor will be done to whom honor is due i can fancy the crowd of those whose fame poets have sung and to whose memory monuments have been raised dividing like the wave and passing the great and the noble and the mighty of the land this poor obscure old man stepping forward and receiving the especial notice of him who said inasmuch as ye did it to one of the least of these ye did it also to me the education of character is very much a question of models we mould ourselves so unconsciously after the characters manners habits and opinions of those who are about us good rules may do much but good models far more for in the latter we have instruction in action wisdom at work good admonition and bad example only build with one hand and pull down with the other hence the vast importance of exercising great care in the selection of companions especially in youth there is a magnetic affinity in young persons which insensibly tends to assimilate them to each other's likeness mr edgeworth was so strongly convinced that from sympathy they involuntarily imitated or caught the tone of the company they frequented that he held it to be of the most essential importance that they should be taught to select the very best models no company or good company was his motto lord collingwood writing to a young friend said hold it as a maxim that you had better be alone than in mean company let your companions be such as yourself or superior for the worth of a man will always be ruled by that of his company it was a remark of the famous dr sydenham that everybody some time or other would be the better or the worse for having but spoken to a good or a bad man as sir peter lely made it a rule never to look at a bad picture if he could help it believing that whenever he did so his pencil caught a taint from it so whoever chooses to gaze often upon a debased specimen of humanity or to frequent his society cannot help gradually assimilating himself to that sort of model it is therefore advisable for young men to seek the fellowship of the good and always to aim at a higher standard than themselves francis horner speaking of the advantages to himself of direct personal intercourse with high-minded intelligent men said i cannot hesitate to decide that i have derived more intellectual improvement from them than from all the books i have turned over contact with the good never fails to impart good and we carry away with us some of the blessing as travellers garments retain the odour of the flowers and shrubs through which they have passed those who knew the late john sterling intimately have spoken of the beneficial influence which he exercised on all with whom he came into personal contact many owed to him their first awakening to a higher being from him they learnt what they were and what they ought to be mr trench says of him it was impossible to come in contact with his noble nature without feeling one's self in some measure ennobled and lifted up as i ever felt when i left him into a higher region of objects and aims than that in which one is tempted habitually to dwell 
it is thus that the noble character always acts we become insensibly elevated by him and cannot help feeling as he does and acquiring the habit of looking at things in the same light such is the magical action and reaction of minds upon each other the chief use of biography consists in the noble models of character in which it abounds our great forefathers still live among us in the records of their lives as well as in the acts they have done which live also still sit by us at table and hold us by the hand furnishing examples for our benefit which we may still study admire and imitate indeed whoever has left behind him the record of a noble life has bequeathed to posterity an enduring source of good for it serves as a model for others to form themselves by in all time to come still breathing fresh life into men helping them to reproduce his life anew and to illustrate his character in other forms hence a book containing the life of a true man is full of precious seed it is a still living voice it is an intellect to use milton's words it is the precious life-blood of a master spirit embalmed and treasured up on purpose to a life beyond life franklin was accustomed to attribute his usefulness and eminence to his having early read cotton mather's essays to do good a book which grew out of mather's own life and see how good example draws other men after it and propagates itself through future generations in all lands for samuel drew avers that he framed his own life and especially his business habits after the model left on record by benjamin franklin thus it is impossible to say where a good example may not reach or where it will end if indeed it have an end hence the advantage in literature as in life of keeping the best society reading the best books and wisely admiring and imitating the best things we find in them in literature said lord dudley i am fond of confining myself to the best company which consists chiefly of my old acquaintance with whom i am desirous of becoming more intimate and i suspect that nine times out of ten it is more profitable if not more agreeable to read an old book over again than to read a new one for the first time sometimes a book containing a noble exemplar of life taken up at random merely with the object of reading it as a pastime has been known to call forth energies whose existence had not before been suspected loyola when a soldier serving at the siege of pampeluna and laid up by a dangerous wound in his leg asked for a book to divert his thoughts the lives of the saints was brought to him and its perusal so inflamed his mind that he determined thenceforth to devote himself to the founding of a religious order luther in like manner was inspired to undertake the great labors of his life by a perusal of the life and writings of john huss dr wolf was stimulated to enter upon his missionary career by reading the life of francis xavier and the book fired his youthful bosom with a passion the most sincere and ardent to devote himself to the enterprise of his life william carey also got the first idea of entering upon his sublime labors as a missionary from a perusal of the voyages of captain cook of condorcet's eloge of haller horner said i never rise from the account of such men without a sort of thrilling palpitation about me which i know not whether i should call admiration ambition or despair and speaking of the discourses of sir joshua reynolds he said next to the writings of bacon there is no book which has more powerfully impelled me to self-culture he is one of the first men of genius who has condescended to inform the world of the steps by which greatness is attained the confidence with which he asserts the omnipotence of human labor has the effect of familiarizing his reader with the idea that genius is an acquisition rather than a gift whilst with all there is blended so naturally and eloquently the most elevated and passionate admiration of excellence that upon the whole there is no book of a more inflammatory effect it is remarkable that reynolds himself attributed his first passionate impulse towards the study of art to reading richardson's account of a great painter 
and hayden was in like manner afterwards inflamed to follow the same pursuit by reading the career of reynolds thus the brave and inspiring life of one man lights a flame in the minds of others of like faculties and impulse and where there is equally vigorous effort like distinction and success will almost surely follow thus the chain of example is carried down through time in an endless succession of links admiration exciting imitation and perpetuating the true aristocracy of genius dr arnold was a noble and a cheerful worker throwing himself into the great business of his life the training and teaching of young men with his whole heart and soul it is stated in his admirable biography that the most remarkable thing in the lalum circle was the wonderful healthiness of tone which prevailed there it was a place where a newcomer at once felt that a great and earnest work was going forward every pupil was made to feel that there was a work for him to do that his happiness as well as his duty lay in doing that work well hence an indescribable zest was communicated to a young man's feeling about life a strange joy came over him on discerning that he had the means of being useful and thus of being happy and a deep respect and ardent attachment sprang up towards him who had taught him thus to value life and his own self and his work and mission in the world all this was founded on the breadth and comprehensiveness of arnold's character as well as his striking truth and reality on the unfeigned regard he had for work of all kinds and the sense he had of its value both for the complex aggregate of society and the growth and protection of the individual in all this there was no excitement no predilection for one class of work above another no enthusiasm for any one-sided object but a humble profound and most religious consciousness that work is the appointed calling of man on earth the end for which his various faculties were given the element in which his nature is ordained to develop itself and in which his progressive advance toward heaven is to lie end of chapter twenty five examples models read by john greenman this is section twenty six of happy homes and the hearts that make them by samuel smiles this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six character the true gentleman that which raises a country that which strengthens a country and that which dignifies a country that which spreads her power creates her moral influence and makes her respected and submitted to bends the heart of millions and bows down the pride of nations to her the instrument of obedience the fountain of supremacy the true throne crown and sceptre of a nation this aristocracy is not an aristocracy of blood not an aristocracy of fashion not an aristocracy of talent only it is an aristocracy of character that is the true heraldry of man the london times the crown and glory of life is character it is the noblest possession of a man constituting a rank in itself and an estate in the general good will dignifying every station and exalting every position in society it exercises a greater power than wealth and secures all the honor without the jealousies of fame it carries with it an influence which always tells for it is the result of proved honor rectitude and consistency qualities which perhaps more than any other command the general confidence and respect of mankind character is human nature in its best form it is moral order embodied in the individual men of character are not only the conscience of society but in every well-governed state they are its best motive power for it is moral qualities in the main which rule the world even in war napoleon said the moral is to the physical as ten to one 
the strength the industry and the civilization of nations all depend upon individual character and the very foundations of civil security rest upon it laws and institutions are but its outgrowth in the just balance of nature individuals nations and races will obtain just so much as they deserve and no more and as effect finds its cause so surely does quality of character amongst a people produce its befitting results though a man have comparatively little culture slender abilities and but small wealth yet if his character be of sterling worth he will always command an influence whether it be in the workshop the counting-house the mart or the senate canning wisely wrote in eighteen o one my road must be through character to power i will try no other course and i am sanguine enough to believe that this course though not perhaps the quickest is the surest you may admire men of intellect but something more is necessary before you will trust them hence lord john russell once observed in a sentence full of truth it is the nature of party in england to ask the assistance of men of genius but to follow the guidance of men of character this was strikingly illustrated in the career of the late francis horner a man of whom sidney smith said that the ten commandments were stamped upon his countenance the valuable and peculiar light says lord cockburn in which his history is calculated to inspire every right-minded youth is this he died at the age of thirty-eight possessed of greater public influence than any other private man and admired beloved trusted and deplored by all except the heartless or the base no greater homage was ever paid in parliament to any deceased member now let every young man ask how was this attained by rank he was the son of an edinburgh merchant by wealth neither he nor any of his relations ever had a superfluous sixpence by office he held but one and only for a few years of no influence and with very little pay by talents his were not splendid and he had no genius cautious and slow his only ambition was to be right by eloquence he spoke in a calm good taste without any of the oratory that either terrifies or seduces by any fascination of manner his was only correct and agreeable by what then was it merely by sense industry good principles and a good heart qualities which no well-constituted mind need ever despair of attaining it was the force of his character that raised him and this character not impressed upon him by nature but formed out of no peculiarly fine elements by himself there were many in the house of commons of far greater ability and eloquence but no one surpassed him in the combination of an adequate portion of these with moral worth horner was born to show what moderate powers unaided by anything whatever except culture and goodness may achieve even when these powers are displayed amidst the competition and jealousy of public life franklin also attributed his success as a public man not to his talents or his powers of speaking for these were but moderate but to his known integrity of character hence it was he says that i had so much weight with my fellow-citizens i was but a bad speaker never eloquent subject to much hesitation in my choice of words hardly correct in language and yet i generally carried my point the rules of conduct followed by lord erskine a man of sterling independence of principle and scrupulous adherence to truth are worthy of being engraven on every young man's heart it was a first command and counsel of my earliest youth he said always to do what my conscience told me to be a duty and to leave the consequences to god i shall carry with me the memory and i trust the practice of this parental lesson to the grave i have hitherto followed it 
and i have no reason to complain that my obedience to it has been a temporal sacrifice i have found it on the contrary the road to prosperity and wealth and i shall point out the same path to my children for their pursuit every man is bound to aim at the possession of a good character as one of the highest objects of life the very effort to secure it by worthy means will furnish him with a motive of exertion and his idea of manhood in proportion as it is elevated will steady and animate his motive it is well to have a high standard of life even though we may not be able altogether to realize it the youth says mr disraeli who does not look up will look down and the spirit that does not soar is destined perhaps to grovel he who has a high standard of living and thinking will surely do better than he who has none at all pluck at a gown of gold says the scotch proverb and you may get a sleeve on t whoever tries for the highest results cannot fail to reach a point far in advance of that from which he started and though the end attained may fall short of that proposed still the very effort to rise of itself cannot fail to prove permanently beneficial there is a truthfulness in action as well as in words which is essential to uprightness of character a man must really be what he seems or proposes to be when a gentleman wrote to granville sharp that from respect for his great virtues he had named one of his sons after him sharp replied i must request you to teach him a favorite maxim of the family whose name you have given him always endeavor to be really what you would wish to appear this maxim as my father informed me was carefully and humbly practised by his father whose sincerity as a plain and honest man thereby became the principal feature of his character both in public and private life every man who respects himself and values the respect of others will carry out the maxim in act doing honestly what he proposes to do putting the highest character into his work slighting nothing but priding himself upon his integrity and conscientiousness the true character acts rightly whether in secret or in the sight of men that boy was well trained who when asked why he did not pocket some pears for nobody was there to see replied yes there was i was there to see myself and i don't intend ever to see myself do a dishonest thing this is a simple but not inappropriate illustration of principle or conscience dominating in the character and exercising a noble protectorate over it not merely a passive influence but an active power regulating the life such a principle goes on moulding the character hourly and daily growing with a force that operates every moment without this dominating influence character has no protection but is constantly liable to fall away before temptation and every such temptation succumb to every act of meanness or dishonesty however slight causes self-degradation and here it may be observed how greatly the character may be strengthened and supported by the cultivation of good habits man it has been said is a bundle of habits and habit is second nature metastasio entertained so strong an opinion as to the power of repetition in act and thought that he said all is habit in mankind even virtue itself butler in his analogy impresses the importance of careful self-discipline and firm resistance to temptation as tending to make virtue habitual so that at length it may become more easy to do good than to give way to sin as habits belonging to the body he said are produced by external acts so habits of the mind are produced by the execution of inward practical purposes i e carrying them into act or acting upon them the principles of obedience veracity justice and charity and again lord brougham says when enforcing the immense importance of training and example in youth 
i trust everything under god to habit on which in all ages the lawgiver as well as the schoolmaster has mainly placed his reliance habit which makes everything easy and casts the difficulties upon the deviation from a wonted course thus making sobriety a habit and intemperance will be hateful make prudence a habit and reckless profligacy will become revolting to every principle of conduct which regulates the life of the individual hence the necessity for the greatest care and watchfulness against the inroad of any evil habit for the character is always weakest at that point at which it has once given way and it is long before a principle restored can become so firm as one that has never been moved it is a fine remark of a russian writer that habits are a necklace of pearls untie the knot and the whole unthreads wherever formed habit acts involuntarily and without effort and it is only when you oppose it that you find how powerful it has become what is done once and again soon gives facility and proneness the habit at first may seem to have no more strength than a spider's web but once formed it binds as with a chain of iron the small events of life taken singly may seem exceedingly unimportant like snow that falls silently flake by flake yet accumulated these snowflakes form the avalanche self-respect self-help application industry integrity all are the nature of habits not beliefs principles in fact are but the names which we assign to habits for the principles are words but the habits are the things themselves benefactors or tyrants according as they are good or evil it thus happens as we grow older a portion of our free activity and individuality becomes suspended in habit our actions become the nature of fate and we are bound by the chains which we have woven around ourselves it is indeed scarcely possible to overestimate the importance of training the young to virtuous habits in them they are the easiest formed and when formed they last for life like letters cut on the bark of a tree they grow and widen with age train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it remember said lord collingwood to a young man whom he loved before you are five-and-twenty you must establish a character that will serve you all your life as habit strengthens with age and character becomes formed any turning into a new path becomes more and more difficult hence it is often harder to unlearn than to learn and for this reason the grecian flute-player was justified who charged double fees to those pupils who had been taught by an inferior master to uproot an old habit is sometimes a more painful thing and vastly more difficult than to wrench out a tooth try and reform a habitually indolent or improvident or drunken person and in a large majority of cases you will fail for the habit in each case has wound itself in and through life until it has become an integral part of it and cannot be uprooted as daylight can be seen through very small holes so little things will illustrate a person's character indeed character consists in little acts well and honorably performed daily life being the quarry from which we built it up and rough hew the habits which form it one of the most marked tests of character is the manner in which we conduct ourselves towards others a graceful behavior towards superiors inferiors and equals is a constant source of pleasure it pleases others because it indicates respect for their personality but it gives tenfold more pleasure to ourselves every man may to a large extent be a self-educator in good behavior as in everything else he can be civil and kind if he will though he have not a penny in his purse gentleness in society is like the silent influence of light which gives color to all nature 
it is far more powerful than loudness or force and far more fruitful it pushes its way quietly and persistently like the tiniest daffodil in spring which raises the clod and thrusts it aside by the simple persistency of growing morals and manners which give color to life are of much greater importance than laws which are but their manifestations the law touches us here and there but manners are about us everywhere pervading society like the air we breathe good manners as we call them are neither more nor less than good behavior consisting of courtesy and kindness benevolence being the preponderating element in all kinds of mutually beneficial and pleasant intercourse amongst human beings civility said lady montague costs nothing and buys everything the cheapest of all things is kindness its exercise requiring the least possible trouble and self-sacrifice win hearts said burley to queen elizabeth and you have all men's hearts and purses if we would only let nature act kindly free from affectation and artifice the results on social good humor and happiness would be incalculable the little courtesies which form the small change of life may separately appear of little intrinsic value but they acquire their importance from repetition and accumulation they are like the spare minutes or the groat a day which proverbially produce such momentous results in the course of a year or in a lifetime manners are the ornament of action and there is a way of speaking a kind word or of doing a kind thing which greatly enhances their value what seems to be done with a grudge or as an act of condescension is scarcely accepted as a favor yet there are men who pride themselves upon their gruffness and though they may possess virtue and capacity their manner is often such as to render them almost insufferable it is difficult to like a man who though he may not pull your nose habitually wounds your self-respect and takes a pride in saying disagreeable things to you there are others who are dreadfully condescending and cannot avoid seizing upon every small opportunity of making their greatness felt when abernethy was canvassing for the office of surgeon to st bartholomew hospital he called upon such a person a rich grocer one of the governors the great man behind the counter seeing the great surgeon enter immediately assumed the grand air towards the supposed suppliant for his vote i presume sir you want my vote and interest at this momentous epoch of your life abernethy who hated humbugs and felt nettled at the tone replied no i don't i want a pennyworth of figs come look sharp and wrap them up i want to be off the cultivation of manner though in excess it is foppish and foolish is highly necessary in a person who has occasion to negotiate with others in matters of business affability and good breeding may even be regarded as essential to the success of a man in any eminent station and in large sphere of life for the want of it has not unfrequently been found in a great measure to neutralize the results of much industry integrity and honesty of character there are no doubt a few strong tolerant minds which can bear with defects and angularities of manner and look only to the more genuine qualities but the world at large is not so forbearant and cannot help forming its judgments and likings mainly according to outward conduct another mode of displaying true politeness is consideration for the opinions of others it has been said of dogmatism that it is only puppyism come to its full growth and certainly the worst form this quality can assume is that of opinionativeness and arrogance let men agree to differ and when they do differ bear and forbear principles and opinions may be maintained with perfect suavity without coming to blows or uttering hard words and there are circumstances in which words are blows and inflict wounds far less easy to heal as bearing upon this point 
we quote an instructive little parable spoken some time since by an itinerant preacher of the evangelical alliance on the borders of wales as i was going to the hills said he early one misty morning i saw something moving on a mountain side so strange looking that i took it for a monster when i came nearer to it i found it was a man when i came up to him i found he was my brother the inbred politeness which springs from right-heartedness and kindly feelings is of no exclusive rank or station the mechanic who works at the bench may possess it as well as the clergyman or the peer it is by no means a necessary condition of labor that it should in any respect be either rough or coarse the politeness and refinement which distinguish all classes of the people in many continental countries show that those qualities might become ours too as doubtless they will become with increased culture and more general social intercourse without sacrificing any of our more genuine qualities as men from the highest to the lowest the richest to the poorest to no rank or condition in life has nature denied her highest boon the great heart there never yet existed a gentleman but was lord of a great heart and this may exhibit itself under the hodden gray of the peasant as well as under the laced coat of the noble robert burns was once taken to task by a young edinburgh blood with whom he was walking for recognizing an honest farmer in the open street why you fantastic gumrel exclaimed burns it was not the great coat the scone bonnet and the saunders boot hose that i spoke to but the man that was in them and the man sir for true worth would weigh down you and me and ten more such any day there may be a homeliness in externals which may seem vulgar to those who cannot discern the heart beneath but to the right-minded character will always have its clear insignia william and charles grant were the sons of a farmer in Invernessshire, whom a sudden flood stripped of everything even to the very soil which he tilled the farmer and his sons with the world before them where to choose made their way southward in search of employment until they arrived in the neighborhood of bury in lancashire from the crown of the hill near walmsley they surveyed the wide extent of country which lay before them the river irwell making its circuitous course through the valley they were utter strangers in the neighborhood and knew not which way to turn to decide their course they put up a stick and agreed to pursue the direction in which it fell thus their decision was made and they journeyed on accordingly until they reached the village of ramsbottom not far distant they found employment in a print work in which william served his apprenticeship and they commended themselves to their employers by their diligence sobriety and strict integrity they plodded on rising from one station to another until at length the two men themselves became employers and after many long years of industry enterprise and benevolence they became rich honored and respected by all who knew them their cotton mills and print works gave employment to a large population their well-directed diligence made the valley teem with activity joy health and opulence out of their abundant wealth they gave liberally to all worthy objects erecting churches founding schools and in all ways promoting the well-being of the class of workingmen from which they had sprung they afterwards erected on the top of the hill above walmsley a lofty tower in commemoration of the early event of their history which had determined the place of their settlement the brothers grant became widely celebrated for their benevolence and their various goodness and it is said that mr dickens had them in his mind's eye when he delineated the character of the brothers cheeryble one amongst many anecdotes of a similar kind may be cited to show that the character was by no means exaggerated a manchester warehouseman published an exceedingly scurrilous pamphlet against the firm of grant brothers holding up the elder partner to ridicule as billy button william was informed by some one of the nature of the pamphlet and his observation was that the man would live to repent of it oh said the libeller when informed of the remark he thinks that some time or other i shall be in his debt but i will take good care of that 
it happens however that men in business do not always foresee who shall be their creditor and it so turned out that the grant's libeller became a bankrupt and could not complete his certificate and begin business again without obtaining their signature it seemed to him a hopeless case to call upon that firm for any favor but the pressing claims of his family forced him to make the application he appeared before the man whom he had ridiculed as billy button accordingly he told his tale and produced his certificate you wrote a pamphlet against us once said mr grant the supplicant expected to see his document thrown into the fire instead of which grant signed the name of the firm and thus completed the necessary certificate we make it a rule said he handing it back never to refuse signing the certificate of an honest tradesman and we have never heard that you were anything else the tears started into the man's eyes ah continued mr grant you see my saying was true that you would live to repent writing that pamphlet i did not mean it as a threat i only meant that some day you would know us better and repent having tried to injure us i do i do indeed repent it well well you know us now but how do you get on what are you going to do the poor man stated that he had friends who would assist him when his certificate was obtained but how are you off in the meantime the answer was that having given up every farthing to his creditors he had been compelled to stint his family in even the common necessaries of life that he might be enabled to pay for his certificate my good fellow this will never do your wife and family must not suffer in this way be kind enough to take this ten pound note to your wife from me there there now don't cry it will be all well with you yet keep up your spirits set to work like a man and you will raise your head among the best of us the overpowered man endeavored with choking utterance to express his gratitude but in vain and putting his hand to his face he went out of the room sobbing like a child the true gentleman is one whose nature has been fashioned after the highest models it is a grand old name that of gentleman and has been recognized as a rank and power in all stages of society the gentleman is always a gentleman said the old french general to his regiment of scottish gentry at roussillon and invariably proves himself such in need and in danger to possess this character is a dignity of itself commanding the instinctive homage of every generous mind and those who will not bow to titular rank will yet do homage to the gentleman his qualities depend not upon fashion or manners but upon moral worth not on personal possessions but on personal qualities riches and rank have no necessary connection with genuine gentlemanly qualities the poor man may be a true gentleman in spirit and in daily life he may be honest truthful upright polite temperate courageous self-respecting and self-helping that is be a true gentleman the poor man with a rich spirit is in all ways superior to the rich man with a poor spirit the brave and gentle character may be found under the humblest garb here is an old illustration but a fine one once on a time when the adige suddenly overflowed its banks the bridge of verona was carried away with the exception of the centre arch on which stood a house whose inhabitants supplicated help from the windows while the foundations were visibly giving way i will give a hundred french louis said the count spolverini who stood by to any person who will venture to deliver these poor unfortunate people a young peasant came forth from the crowd seized a boat and pushed into the stream he gained the pier received the whole family into the boat and made for the shore where he landed them in safety here is your money my brave young fellow said the count no was the answer of the young man i do not sell my life give the money to this poor family who have need of it here spoke the true spirit of the gentleman though he was in the garb of a peasant not less touching was the heroic conduct of a party of deal boatmen in rescuing the crew of a collier brig in the downs but a short time ago a sudden storm which set in from the northeast 
drove several ships from their anchors and it being low water one of them struck the ground at a considerable distance from the shore when the sea made a clean breach over her there was not a vestige of hope for the vessel such was the fury of the wind and the violence of the waves there was nothing to tempt the boatmen on shore to risk their lives in saving either ship or crew for not a farthing of salvage was to be looked for but the daring intrepidity of the deal boatmen was not wanting at this critical moment no sooner had the brig grounded than simon pritchard one of the many persons assembled along the beach threw off his coat and called out who will come with me and try to save that crew instantly twenty men sprang forward with i will and i but seven only were wanted and running down a galley punt into the surf they leapt in and dashed through the breakers amidst the cheers of those on shore how the boat lived in such a sea seemed a miracle but in a few minutes impelled by the strong arms of these gallant men she flew on and reached the stranded ship catching her on the top of a wave and in less than a quarter of an hour from the time the boat left the shore the six men who composed the crew of the collier were landed safe on walmer beach a nobler instance of the indomitable courage and disinterested heroism on the part of the deal boatmen brave though they are always known to be perhaps cannot be cited and we have pleasure in here placing it on record there are many tests by which a gentleman may be known but there is one that never fails how does he exercise power over those subordinate to him how does he conduct himself toward women and children how does the officer treat his men the employer his servants the master his pupils and man in every station those who are weaker than himself the discretion forbearance and kindliness with which power in such cases is used may indeed be regarded as the crucial test of gentlemanly character when lamotte was one day passing through a crowd he accidentally trod upon the foot of a young fellow who forthwith struck him on the face ah sir said lamotte you will surely be sorry for what you have done when you know that i am blind he who bullies those who are not in a position to resist may be a snob but cannot be a gentleman he who tyrannizes over the weak and helpless may be a coward but no true man the tyrant it has been said is but a slave turned inside out gentleness is indeed the best test of gentlemanliness a consideration for the feelings of others for his inferiors and dependents as well as his equals and respect for their self-respect will pervade the true gentleman's whole conduct he will rather himself suffer a small injury than by an uncharitable construction of another's behavior incur the risk of committing a great wrong he will be forbearant of the weaknesses the failings and the errors of those whose advantages in life have not been equal to his own he will be merciful even to his beast he will not boast of his wealth or his strength or his gifts he will not be puffed up by success or unduly depressed by failure he will not obtrude his views upon others but speak his mind freely when occasion calls for it he will not confer favors with a patronizing air sir walter scott once said of lord lothian he is a man from whom one may receive a favor and that's saying a great deal in these days lord chatham has said that the gentleman is characterized by his sacrifice of self and preference of others to himself in the little daily occurrences of life in illustration of this ruling spirit of considerateness in a noble character we may cite the anecdote of the gallant sir ralph abercrombie of whom it is related that when mortally wounded in the battle of aboukir he was carried in a litter on board the ship and to ease his pain a soldier's blanket was placed under his head from which he experienced considerable relief he asked what it was it's only a soldier's blanket was the reply whose blanket is it said he half lifting himself up only one of the men's i wish to know the name of the man whose blanket it is it is duncan roy's of the forty-second sir ralph then see that duncan roy gets his blanket this very night even to ease his dying agony the general would not deprive the private soldier of his blanket for one night 
the incident is as good in its way as that of the dying sydney handing his cup of water to the private soldier on the field of zutphen end of chapter twenty six character the true gentleman read by john greenman this is section twenty seven of happy homes in the hearts that make them by samuel smiles this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty seven the discipline of experience read by john greenman be the day weary or be the day long at length it ringeth to even song ancient couplet practical wisdom is only to be learned in the school of experience precepts and instructions are useful so far as they go but without the discipline of real life they remain of the nature of theory only the hard facts of existence have to be faced to give that touch of truth to character which can never be imparted by reading or tuition but only by contact with the broad instincts of common men and women to be worth anything character must be capable of standing firm upon its feet in the world of daily work temptation and trial and able to bear the wear and tear of actual life cloistered virtues do not count for much the life that rejoices in solitude may be only rejoicing in selfishness seclusion may indicate contempt for others though more usually it means indolence cowardice or self-indulgence to every human being belongs his fair share of manful toil and human duty and it cannot be shirked without loss to the individual himself as well as to the community to which he belongs it is only by mixing in the daily life of the world and taking part in its affairs that practical knowledge can be acquired and wisdom learned it is there that we find our chief sphere of duty that we learn the discipline of work and that we educate ourselves in that patience diligence and endurance which shape and consolidate the character there we encounter the difficulties trials and temptations which according as we deal with them give a color to our entire afterlife and there too we become subject to the great discipline of suffering from which we learn far more than from the safe seclusion of the study or the cloister contact with others is also requisite to enable a man to know himself it is only by mixing freely in the world that one can form a proper estimate of his own capacity without such experience one is apt to become conceited puffed up and arrogant at all events he will remain ignorant of himself though he may heretofore have enjoyed no other company any one who would profit by experience will never be above asking help he who thinks himself already too wise to learn of others will never succeed in doing anything either good or great we have to keep our minds and hearts open and never be ashamed to learn with the assistance of those who are wiser and more experienced than ourselves the man made wise by experience endeavors to judge correctly of the things which come under his observation and form the subject of his daily life what we call common sense is for the most part but the result of common experience wisely improved nor is great ability necessary to acquire it so much as patience accuracy and watchfulness hazlitt thought the most sensible people to be met with are intelligent men of business and of the world who argue from what they see and know instead of spinning cobweb distinctions of what things ought to be for the same reason women often display more good sense than men having fewer pretensions and judging of things naturally by the involuntary impression they make on the mind their intuitive powers are quicker their perceptions more acute their sympathies more lively and their manners more adaptive to particular ends hence their greater tact as displayed in the management of others women of apparently slender intellectual powers often contriving to control and regulate the conduct of men of even the most impractical nature 
pope paid a high compliment to the tact and good sense of mary queen of william the third when he described her as possessing not a science but what was worth all else prudence the whole of life may be regarded as a great school of experience in which men and women are the pupils as in a school many of the lessons learned there must needs be taken on trust we may not understand them and may possibly think it hard that we have to learn them especially where the teachers are trials sorrows temptations and difficulties and yet we must not only accept their lessons but recognize them as being divinely appointed the results of experience are of course only to be achieved by living and living is a question of time the man of experience learns to rely upon time as his helper time and i against any two was a maxim of cardinal mazarin time has been described as a beautifier and as a consoler but it is also a teacher it is the food of experience the soil of wisdom it may be the friend or the enemy of youth and time will sit beside the old as a consoler or as a tormentor according as it has been used or misused and the past life has been well or ill spent time says george herbert is the rider that breaks youth to the young how bright the new world looks how full of novelty of enjoyment of pleasure but as years pass we find the world to be a place of sorrow as well as of joy as we proceed through life many dark vistas open upon us of toil suffering difficulty perhaps misfortune and failure happy they who can pass through and amidst such trials with a firm mind and pure heart encountering trials with cheerfulness and standing erect beneath even the heaviest burden a little youthful ardor is a great help in life and is useful as an energetic motive power it is gradually cooled down by time no matter how glowing it has been while it is trained and subdued by experience but it is a healthy and hopeful indication of character to be encouraged in the right direction and not to be sneered down and repressed it is a sign of a vigorous unselfish nature as egotism is of a narrow and selfish one and to begin life with egotism and self-sufficiency is fatal to all breadth and vigor of character life in such a case would be like a year in which there was no spring without a generous seed-time there will be an unflowering summer and an unproductive harvest and youth is the springtime of life in which if there be not a fair share of enthusiasm little will be attempted and still less done it also considerably helps the working quality inspiring confidence and hope and carrying one through the dry details of business and duty with cheerfulness and joy it is the due admixture of romance and reality said sir henry lawrence that best carries a man through life the quality of romance or enthusiasm is to be valued as an energy imparted to the human mind to prompt and sustain its noblest efforts sir henry always urged upon young men not that they should repress enthusiasm but sedulously cultivate and direct the feeling as one implanted for wise and noble purpose when the two faculties of romance and reality he said are duly blended reality pursues a straight rough path to a desirable and practicable result while romance beguiles the road by pointing out its beauties by bestowing a deep and practical conviction that even in this dark and material existence there may be found a joy with which a stranger intermeddleth not a light that shineth more and more into the perfect day the apprenticeship of difficulty is one which the greatest of men have had to serve it is usually the best stimulus and discipline of character it often evokes powers of action that but for it would have remained dormant as comets are sometimes revealed by eclipses so heroes are brought to light by sudden calamity it seems as if in certain cases 
genius like iron struck by the flint needed the sharp and sudden blow of adversity to bring out the divine spark there are natures which blossom and ripen amidst trials which would only wither and decay in an atmosphere of ease and comfort thus it is good for men to be roused into action and stiffened into self-reliance by difficulty rather than to slumber away their lives in useless apathy and indolence it is the struggle that is the condition of victory if there were no difficulties there would be no need of efforts if there were no temptations there would be no training in self-control and but little merit in virtue if there were no trial and suffering there would be no education in patience and resignation thus difficulty adversity and suffering are not all evil but often the best source of strength discipline and virtue the spaniards are even said to have meanly rejoiced in the poverty of cervantes but for which they supposed the production of his great works might have been prevented when the archbishop of toledo visited the french ambassador at madrid the gentlemen in the suite of the latter expressed their high admiration of the writings of the author of don quixote and intimated their desire of becoming acquainted with one who had given them so much pleasure the answer they received was that cervantes had borne arms in the service of his country and was now old and poor what exclaimed one of the frenchmen is not senor cervantes in good circumstances why is he not maintained then out of the public treasury heaven forbid was the reply that his necessities should ever be relieved if it is those which make him right since it is his poverty that makes the world rich i remember says northcote when mr locke of newbury park first came over from italy and old dr moore who had a very high opinion of him was crying up his drawings and asked me if i did not think he would make a great painter i said no never why not because he has six thousand a year no doubt thomas gray would have given us many other literary productions equal or superior to his elegy had he been persecuted by the stings and arrows of outrageous fortune instead of being possessed of a patrimony which enabled him to follow a life of retirement devoting most of his time to literary acquisition he possessed one of the best stored minds of his age his elegy written in a country churchyard is of itself sufficient to immortalize his name it was written immediately after his return from a long journey abroad in which he wandered over much of europe the changes which his few years of absence wrought among those he had been accustomed to meet flushed with life's hopes and busy cares the reminiscences called up by the newly made inscriptions in the old familiar churchyard no doubt gave inspiration to the now familiar lines it is a mistake to suppose that men succeed through success they much oftener succeed through failure by far the best experience of men is made up of their remembered failures in dealing with others in the affairs of life such failures in sensible men incite better self-management and greater tact and self-control as a means of avoiding them in the future ask the diplomatist and he will tell you that he has learned his art through being baffled defeated thwarted and circumvented far more than from having succeeded precept study advice and example could never have taught them so well as failure has done it has disciplined them experimentally and taught them what to do as well as what not to do which is often still more important in diplomacy many have to make up their minds to encounter failure again and again before they succeed but if they have pluck the failure will only serve to rouse their courage and stimulate them to renewed efforts talma the greatest of actors was hissed off the stage when he first appeared on it la cordere one of the greatest preachers of modern times only acquired celebrity after repeated failures montalembert said of his first public appearance in the church of saint roche he failed completely and on coming out everyone said though he may be a man of talent he will never be a preacher 
again and again he tried until he succeeded and only two years after his debut la cordere was preaching in notre dame to audiences such as few french orators have addressed since the time of bossuet and massillon thus it is not ease and facility that tries men and brings out the good that is in them so much as trial and difficulty adversity is the touchstone of character as some herbs need to be crushed to give forth their sweetest odor so some natures must be tried by suffering to evoke the excellence that is in them hence trials often unmask virtues and bring to light hidden graces men apparently useless and purposeless when placed in positions of difficulty and responsibility have exhibited powers of character before unsuspected and where we before saw only pliancy and self-indulgence we now see strength valor and self-denial as there are no blessings which may not be perverted into evils so there are no trials which may not be converted into blessings all depends on the manner in which we profit by them or otherwise perfect happiness is not to be looked for in this world if it could be secured it would be found profitless the hollowest of all gospels is the gospel of ease and comfort difficulty and even failure are far better teachers sir humphrey davy said even in private life too much prosperity either injures the moral man and occasions conduct which ends in suffering or it is accompanied by the workings of envy calumny and malevolence of others life all sunshine without shade all happiness without sorrow all pleasure without pain were not life at all at least not human life take the lot of the happiest it is a tangled yarn it is made up of sorrows and joys and the joys are all the sweeter because of the sorrows bereavements and blessings one following another making us sad and blessed by turns even death itself makes life more loving it binds us more closely together while here dr thomas brown has argued that death is one of the necessary conditions of human happiness and he supports his argument with great force and eloquence but when death comes into a household we do not philosophize we only feel the eyes that are full of tears do not see though in course of time they come to see more clearly and brightly than those that have never known sorrow the wise person gradually learns not to expect too much from life while he strives for success by worthy methods he will be prepared for failures he will keep his mind open to enjoyment but submit patiently to suffering wailings and complainings of life are never any use only cheerful and continuous working in right paths are of real avail nor will the wise man expect too much from those about him if he would live at peace with others he will bear and forbear and even the best have often foibles of character which have to be endured sympathized with and perhaps pitied who is perfect who does not suffer from some thorn in the flesh who does not stand in need of toleration of forbearance of forgiveness what the poor imprisoned queen caroline matilda of denmark wrote on her chapel window ought to be the prayer of all oh keep me innocent make others great then how much does the disposition of every human being depend upon their innate constitution and their early surroundings the comfort or discomfort of the homes in which they have been brought up their inherited characteristics and the examples good or bad to which they have been exposed through life regard for such considerations should teach charity and forbearance to all men at the same time life will always be to a large extent what we ourselves make it each mind makes its own little world the cheerful mind makes it pleasant and the discontented mind makes it miserable my mind to me a kingdom is applies alike to the peasant as to the monarch the one may be in his heart a king as the other may be a slave life is for the most part but the mirror of our own individual selves 
our mind gives to all situations to all fortunes high or low their real characters to the good the world is good to the bad it is bad if our views of life be elevated if we regard it as a sphere of useful effort of high living and high thinking of working for others good as well as our own it will be joyful hopeful and blessed if on the contrary we regard it merely as affording opportunities for self-seeking pleasure and aggrandizement it will be full of toil anxiety and disappointment there is much in life that while in this state we can never comprehend there is indeed a great deal of mystery in life much that we see as in a glass darkly but though we may not apprehend the full meaning of the discipline of trial through which the best have to pass we must have faith in the completeness of the design of which our little individual lives form a part we have each to do our duty in that sphere of life in which we have been placed duty alone is true there is no true action but in its accomplishment duty is the end and aim of the highest life the truest pleasure of all is that derived from the consciousness of its fulfillment of all others it is the one that is most thoroughly satisfying and the least accompanied by regret and disappointment in the words of george herbert the consciousness of duty performed gives us music at midnight this above all to thine own self be true and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man shakespeare might i give counsel to any young man i would say to him try to frequent the company of your betters in books and in life that is the most wholesome society learn to admire rightly the great pleasure of life is that note what great men admired they admired great things narrow spirits admire basely and worship meanly w m thackeray man is his own star and the soul that can render an honest and a perfect man commands all light all influence all fate nothing to him falls early or too late our acts our angels are or good or ill our fatal shadows that walk by us still beaumont and fletcher end of chapter twenty seven the discipline of experience and end of happy homes in the hearts that make them by samuel smiles read by john greenman